This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.com. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, 431 BC. Translated by Richard Crawley. Chapter 1. Book 1. Chapter 1. The State of Greece from the Earliest Times to the Commencement of the Peloponnesian War. Thucydides, an Athenian, wrote the history of the war between the Peloponnesians and the Athenians, beginning at the moment that it broke out, and believing that it would be a great war and more worthy of relation than any that had preceded it. This belief was not without its grounds. The preparations of both the combatants were in every department in the last state of perfection, and he could see the rest of the Hellenic race taking sides in the quarrel. Those who delayed doing so at once having it in contemplation. Indeed, this was the greatest movement yet known in history, not only of the Hellenes, but of a large part of the barbarian world. I had almost said of mankind, for though the events of remote antiquity, and even those that more immediately preceded the war, could not lapse of time be clearly ascertained, yet the evidences which an inquiry carried as far back as was practicable leads me to trust, all point to the conclusion that there was nothing on a great scale, either in war or in other matters. For instance, it is evident that the country now called Hellas had in ancient times no settled population. On the contrary, migrations were of frequent occurrence, the several tribes readily abandoning their homes under the pressure of superior numbers. Without commerce, without freedom of communication either by land or sea, cultivating no more of their territory than the exigencies of life required, destitute of capital, never planting their land, for they could not tell when an invader might come and take it all away, and when he did come, they had no walls to stop him. Thinking that the necessities of daily sustenance could be supplied at one place as well as another, they cared little for shifting their habitation, and consequently neither built large cities nor attained to any other form of greatness. The richest soils were always most subject to this change of masters, such as the district now called Thessaly, Boeotia, most of the Peloponnese, Arcadia excepted, and the most fertile parts of the rest of Hellas. The goodness of the land favored the aggrandizement of particular individuals, and thus created faction which proved a fertile source of ruin. It also invited invasion. Accordingly, Attica, from the poverty of its soil, enjoying from a very remote period freedom from faction, never changed its inhabitants. And here is no inconsiderable exemplification of my assertion that the migrations were the cause of there being no correspondent growth in other parts. The most powerful victims of war or faction from the rest of Hellas took refuge with the Athenians as a safe retreat, and at an early period, becoming naturalized, swelled the already large population of the city to such a height that Attica became at last too small to hold them, and they had to send out colonies to Ionia. There is also another circumstance that contributes not a little to my conviction of the weakness of ancient times. Before the Trojan War there is no indication of any common action in Hellas, nor indeed of the universal prevalence of the name. On the contrary, before the time of Helen, son of Deucalion, no such appellation existed, but the country went by the names of the different tribes, in particular of the Pelasgian. It was not till Helen and his sons grew strong in Phthios, and were invited as allies into the other cities, that one by one they gradually acquired from the connection the name of Hellenes. Though a long time elapsed before that name could fasten itself upon all. The best proof of this is furnished by Homer. Born long after the Trojan War, he nowhere calls all of them by that name, nor indeed any of them except the followers of Achilles, from Phthiotis, who were the original Hellenes. In his poems they are called Danaeans, Argives, and Achaeans. He does not even use the term barbarian, probably because the Hellenes had not yet been marked off from the rest of the world by one distinctive 
appellation. It appears, therefore, that the several Hellenic communities, comprising not only those who first acquired the name, city by city, as they came to understand each other, but also those who assumed it afterwards as the name of the whole people, were before the Trojan War prevented by their want of strength and the absence of mutual intercourse from displaying any collective action. Indeed, they could not unite for this expedition till they had gained increased familiarity with the sea. And the first person known to us by tradition as having established a navy is Minos. He made himself master of what is now called the Hellenic Sea, and ruled over the Cyclades, into most of which he sent the first colonies, expelling the Carians and appointing his own sons as governors, and thus did his best to put down piracy in those waters a necessary step to secure the revenues for his own use. For in earliest times the Hellenes and the barbarians off of the coast and islands, as communication by sea became more common, were tempted to turn pirates, under the conduct of their most powerful men, the motives being to serve their own cupidity and to support the needy. They would fall upon a town unprotected by walls and consisting of a mere collection of villages, and would plunder it. Indeed, this came to be the main source of their livelihood, no disgrace being yet attached to such an achievement, but even some glory. An illustration of this is furnished by the honor with which some of the inhabitants of the continent still regard a successful marauder, and by the question we find the old poets everywhere representing the people as asking of voyagers, are they pirates, as if those who are asked the question would have no idea of disclaiming the imputation, or their interrogators of reproaching them for it. The same rapine prevailed also by land. And even at the present day, many of Hellas still follow the old fashion, the Ozolian, Locrians, for instance, the Aetolians, the Acarnians, and that region of the continent. And the custom of carrying arms is still kept up among those continentals, from the old practical habits. The whole of Hellas used once to carry arms, their habitations being unprotected, and their communications with each other unsafe. Indeed, to wear arms was as much a part of everyday life with them as with the barbarians, and the fact that the people in these parts of Hellas are still living in the old way points to a time when the same mode of life was once equally common to all. The Athenians were the first to lay aside their weapons, and to adopt an easier and more luxurious mode of life. Indeed, it is only lately that their rich old men left off the luxury of wearing undergarments of linen, and fastening a knot of their hair with a tie of golden grasshoppers, a fashion which spread to their Ionian kindred, and long prevailed among the old men there. On the contrary, a modest style of dressing, more in conformity with modern ideas, was first adopted by the Lacedaemonians, the rich doing their best to assimilate their way of life to that of the common people. They also set the example of contending naked, publicly stripping and anointing themselves with oil in their gymnastic exercises. Formerly, even in the Olympic contests, the athletes who contended wore belts across their middles, and it is but a few years since that the practice ceased. To this day, among some of the barbarians, especially in Asia, when prizes for boxing and wrestling are offered, belts are worn by the combatants, and there are many other points in which a likeness might be shown between the life of the Hellenic world of old and the barbarian of today. With respect to their towns, later on, at an era of increased facilities of navigation and a greater supply of capital, we find the shores becoming the site of walled towns, and the isthmuses being occupied for the purposes of commerce and defense against a neighbor. But the old towns, on account of the great prevalence of piracy, were built away from the sea, whether on the islands or the continent, and still remain in their old sites, for the pirates used to plunder one another and indeed all coast populations, whether seafaring or not. The islanders, too, were great pirates. These islanders were Carians and Phoenicians, by whom most of the islands were colonized, as was proved by the following fact. During the purification of Delos by Athens in this war, again, all the graves in the island were taken up, and it was found that above half their inmates were Carians. They were identified by the fashion of the arms buried with them, and by the method of interment, which was the same as the Carians still follow. But as soon as Minos had formed his navy, communication by sea became easier, as he colonized most of the islands, and thus expelled the malefactors. 
The coast population now began to apply themselves more closely to the acquisition of wealth, and their life became more settled. Some even began to build themselves walls on the strength of their newly acquired riches, for the love of gain would reconcile the weaker to the dominion of the stronger, and the possession of capital enabled the more powerful to reduce the smaller towns to subjection. And it was at a somewhat later stage of this development that they went on to the expedition against Troy. What enabled Agamemnon to raise the armament was more, in my opinion, his superiority in strength than the oaths of Tyndareus, which bound the suitors to follow him. Indeed, the account given by those Peloponnesians who have been the recipients of the most creditable tradition is this. First of all, Pelops, arriving among a needy population from Asia with vast wealth, acquired such power that, stranger though he was, the country was called after him. And this power, fortune, saw fit materially to increase in the hands of his descendants. Aristheus had been killed in Attica by the Heraclids. Atreus was his mother's brother, and to the hands of his relation, who had left his father on account of the death of Chrysippus. Aristheus, when he set out on his expedition, had committed Mycenae and the government. As time went on and Aristheus did not return, Atreus complied with the wishes of the Mycenaeans, who were influenced by fear of the Heraclids. Besides, his power seemed considerable, and he had not neglected to court the favor of the populace, and assumed the scepter of Mycenae and the rest of the dominions of Aristheus. And so the power of the descendants of Pelops came to be greater than that of the descendants of Perseus. To all this Ag Agamemnon succeeded. He also had a navy far stronger than his contemporaries, so that, in my opinion, fear was quite as strong an element as love in the formation of the Confederate expedition. The strength of his navy is shown by the fact that his own was the largest contingent, and that of the Arcadians was furnished by him. This at least is what Homer says, if his testimony is deemed sufficient. Besides, in his account of the transmission of the scepter, he calls him of many an isle, and of all Ar Argos king. Now, Agamemnon's was a continental power, and he could not have been master of any except the adjacent islands, and these would not be many, but through the possession of a fleet. And from this expedition we may infer the character of earlier enterprises. Now Mycenae may have been a small place, and many of the towns of that age may appear comparatively insignificant. But no exact observer would therefore feel justified in rejecting the estimate given by the poets and by tradition of the magnitude of the armament. For I suppose, if Lacedaemon were to become desolate, and the temples and the foundations of the public buildings were left, that as time went on, there would be a strong disposition with posterity to refuse to accept her fame as a true exponent of her power. And yet they occupy two-fifths of the Peloponnese, and lead the whole, not to speak of their numerous allies without. Still, as the city is neither built in a compact form, nor adorned with magnificent temples and public edifices, but composed of villages after the old fashion of Hellas, there would be an, impre an impression of inadequacy. Whereas, if Athens were to suffer the same misfortune, I suppose that any inference from the appearance presented to the eye would make her power to be twice as great as it is. We have therefore no right to be skeptical, nor to content ourselves with an inspection of a town to the exclusion of a consideration of its power. But we may safely conclude that the armament in question surpassed all before it, as it fell short of modern efforts, if we can here also accept the testimony of Homer's poems, in which, without allowing for the exaggeration which a poet would feel himself licensed to employ, we can see that it was far from equaling ours. He has represented it as consisting of twelve hundred vessels, the Boeotian complement of each ship being a hundred and twenty men, that of the ships of Philoctetes fifty. By this, I conceive, he meant to convey the maximum and the minimum complement. At any rate, he does not specify the amount of any others in his catalogue of the ships. That they were all rowers, as well as warriors, we see from his account of the ships of Philoctetes, in which all the men at the oar are bowmen. Now it is improbable that many supernumeraries sailed, if we accept the kings and high officers, especially as they had to cross the open sea with munitions of war and ships, 
Moreover, they had no decks, but were equipped in the old piratical fashion. So that if we strike the average of the largest and the smallest ships, the number of those who sailed will appear inconsiderable, representing, as they did, the whole force of Hellas. And this was due not so much to scarcity of men as of money. Difficulty of subsistence made the invaders reduce the numbers of the army to a point at which it might live on the country during the prosecution of the war. Even after the victory they obtained on their arrival, and a victory there must have been, or the fortifications of the naval camp could never have been built, there is no indication of their whole force having been employed. On the contrary, they seem to have turned to cultivation of the Chersonese, and to piracy from want of supplies. This was what really enabled the Trojans to keep the field for ten years against them, the dispersion of the enemy making them always a match for the detachment left behind. If they had brought plenty of supplies with them and had persevered in the war without scattering for piracy and agriculture, they would have easily defeated the Trojans in the field, since they could hold their own against them with the division on service. In short, if they had stuck to the siege, the capture of Troy would have cost them less time and less trouble. But as want of money proved the weakness of earlier expeditions, so, from the same cause, even the one in question, more famous than its predecessors, may be pronounced on the evidence of what it affected to have been inferior to its renown, and the current opinion about it formed under the tuition of the poets. Even after the Trojan War, Hellas was still engaged in removing and settling, and thus could not attain to the quiet which must precede growth. The late return of the Hellenes from Ilium caused many revolutions, and factions ensued almost everywhere, and it was the citizens thus driven into exile who founded the cities. Sixty years after the capture of Ilium, the modern Boeotians were driven out of Arn by the Thessalians, and settled in the present Boeotia. The former Cadmice, though there was a division of them there before, some of whom joined the expedition to Ilium. Twenty years later the Dorians and the Heraclids became masters of the Peloponnese, so that much had to be done and many years had to elapse before Hellas could attain to a durable tranquillity, undisturbed by removals, and could begin to send out colonies, as Athens did to Ionia and most of the islands, and the Peloponnesians to most of Italy and Sicily, and some places in the rest of Hellas. All these places were founded subsequently to the war with Troy. But as the power of Hellas grew, and the acquisition of wealth became more an object, the revenues of the states increasing, tyrannies were by their means established almost everywhere, the old form of government being hereditary monarchy with definite prerogatives. And Hellas began to fit out fleets and apply herself more closely to the sea. It is said that the Corinthians were the first to approach the modern style of naval architecture, and that Corinth was the first place in Hellas where galleys were built. And we have Amenocles, a Corinthian shipwright, making four ships for the Samians. Dating from the end of this war, it is nearly three hundred years ago that Amenocles went to Samos. Again, the earliest sea fight in history was between the Corinthians and Corcyrians. This was about two hundred and sixty years ago, dating from the same time. Planted on an isthmus, Corinth had from time out of mind been a commercial emporium, as formerly almost all communication between the Hellenes within and without Peloponnese was carried on overland, and the Corinthian territory was the highway through which it travelled. She had consequently great money resources, as is shown by the epithet wealthy, bestowed by the old poets on the place. And this enabled her, when traffic by sea became more common, to procure her navy and put down piracy, and as she could offer a mart for both branches of the trade, she acquired for herself all the power which a large revenue affords. Subsequently, the Ionians attained to great naval strength in the reign of Cyrus, the first king of the Persians, and of his son, Cambyses. And though while they were at war with the former, commanded for a while the Ionian Sea. Polycrates, also the tyrant of Samos, had a powerful navy in the reign of Cambyses, with which he reduced many of the islands, and among them Rhenia, which he concentrated to the Delian Apollo. About this time also the Phocians, while they were founding Marseille, defeated the Carthaginians in a sea fight. These were the most powerful navies, 
and even these, although so many generations had elapsed since the Trojan War, seem to have been principally composed of the old fifty oars and longboats, and to have counted few galleys among their ranks. Indeed, it was only shortly the Persian War, and the death of Darius, the successor of Cambyses, that the Sicilian tyrants and the Corcyraeans acquired any large number of galleys. For after these there were no navies of any account in Hellas, till the expedition of Xerxes, Aegina, Athens, and others may have possessed a few vessels. But they were principally fifty oars. It was quite at the end of this period that the war with Aegina and the prospect of the barbarian invasion enabled Themistocles to persuade the Athenians to build the fleet with which they fought at Salamis, and even these vessels had not complete decks. The navies, then, of the Hellenes during the period we have traversed were what I have described. All their insignificance did not prevent their being an element of the greatest power to those who cultivated them, alike in revenue and in dominion. They were the means by which the islands were reached and reduced, those of the smallest area following the easiest prey. Wars by land, there were none, none at least by which power was acquired. We have the usual border contests, but of distant expeditions with conquest for object we hear nothing among the Hellenes. There was no union of subject cities round a great state, no spontaneous combination of equals for confederate expeditions. What fighting there was consisted merely of local warfare between rival neighbors. The nearest approach to a coalition took place in the old war between Chalcis and Eretria. This was a quarrel in which the rest of the Hellenic name did to some extent take sides. Various, too, were the obstacles which the national growth encountered in various localities. The power of the Ionians was advancing with rapid strides, when it came into collision with Persia, under King Cyrus, who after having dethroned Croesus and overrun everything between the Halys and the sea, stopped not till he had reduced the cities of the coast. The islands being only left to be subdued by Darius and the Phoenician navy. Again, wherever there were tyrants, their habit of providing simply for themselves, of looking solely to their personal comfort and family aggrandizement, made safety the great aim of their policy, and prevented anything great proceeding from them, though they would each have their affairs with their immediate neighbors. All this is only true of the mother country, for in Sicily they attained to very great power. Thus for a long time everywhere in Hellas do we find causes which make the states alike incapable of combination for great national ends, or of any vigorous action of their own. But at last a time came when the tyrants of Athens and the far older tyrannies of the rest of Hellas were, with the exception of those in Sicily, once and for all put down by Lacedaemon. For this city, though after the settlement of the Dorians, its present inhabitants, it suffered from factions for an unparalleled length of time, still at a very early period obtained good laws, and enjoyed a freedom from tyrants which was unbroken. It has possessed the same form of government for more than four hundred years, reckoning to the end of the late war, and has thus been in a position to arrange the affairs of the other states. Not many years after the deposition of the tyrants, the Battle of Marathon was fought between the Medes and the Athenians. Ten years afterwards, the barbarian returned with the armada for the subjugation of Hellas. In the face of this great danger, the command of the confederate Hellenes was assumed by the Lacedaemonians, in virtue of their superior power, and the Athenians, having made up their minds to abandon their city, broke up their homes, threw themselves into their ships, and became a naval people. This coalition, after repulsing the barbarian, soon afterwards split into two sections, which included the Hellenes, who had revolted from the king, as well as those who had aided him in the war. At the end of one stood Athens, at the head of the other Lacedaemon. One the first naval, the other the first military power in Hellas. For a short time the league held together, till the Lacedaemonians and Athenians quarreled and made war upon each other with their allies, a duel into which all the Hellenes sooner or later were drawn, though some might at first remain neutral so that the whole period from the Median War to this, with some peaceful intervals, was spent by each power in war, either with its rival or with its own revolted allies, and consequently afforded them constant practice in military matters, and that experience which is learnt in the school of danger. 
The policy of Lacedaemon was not to exact tribute from her allies, but merely to secure their subservience to her interests by establishing oligarchies among them. Athens, on the contrary, had by degrees deprived hers of their ships, and imposed instead contributions and money on all except Chios and Lesbos. Both found their resources for this war separately to exceed the sum of their strength when the alliance flourished intact. Having now given the result of my inquiries into early times, I grant that there will be a difficulty in believing every particular detail. The way that most men deal with traditions, even traditions of their own country, is to receive them all alike as they are delivered, without applying any critical test whatever. The general Athenian public fancy that Hipparchus was a tyrant when he fell by the hands of Harmodius, and Aristogiton, not knowing that Hippias, the eldest of the sons of Pisistratus, was really supreme, and that Hipparchus and Thessalus were his brothers, and that Harmodius and Aristogiton, suspecting on the very day, nay, at the very moment fixed on for the deed, that information had been conveyed to Hippias by their accomplices, concluding that he had been warned and did not attack him, yet not liking to be apprehended and risk their lives for nothing, fell upon Hipparchus near the temple of the daughters of Laos, and slew him as he was arranging the Panathenic procession. There are many other unfounded ideas current among the rest of the Hellenes, even on matters of contemporary history, which have not been obscured by time. For instance, there is the notion that the Lacedaemonian kings have two votes each, the fact being that they have only one, and that there is a company of Petain, there being simply no such thing. So little pains do the vulgar take in the investigation of truth, accepting readily the first story that comes to hand. On the whole, however, the conclusions I have drawn from the proofs quoted may, I believe, safely be relied upon. Assuredly, they will not be disturbed either by the lays of a poet displaying the exaggeration of his craft, or by the compositions of the chroniclers that are attractive at truth's expense. The subjects they treat of being out of the reach of evidence, and time having robbed most of them of historical value by enthroning them in the region of legend. Turning from these, we can rest satisfied with having proceeded upon the clearest data, and having arrived at conclusions as exact as can be expected in matters of such antiquity, to come to this war, despite the known disposition of the actors in a struggle to overrate its importance, and when it is over to return to their admiration of earlier events, Yet an, ad an examination of the facts will show that it was much greater than the wars which preceded it. With, with reference to the speeches in this history, some were delivered before the war began, others while it was going on, some I heard myself, others I got from various quarters. It was in all cases difficult to carry them word for word in one's memory, so my habit has been to make the speakers say what was in my opinion demanded of them by the various occasions of course as hearing as closely as possible to the general sense of what they really said. And with reference to the narrative of events, far from permitting myself to derive it from the first source that came to hand, I did not even trust my own impressions, but it rests partly on what I saw myself, partly on what others saw for me, the accuracy of the report being always tried by the most severe and detailed tests possible. My conclusions have cost me some labor from the want of coincidence between accounts of the same occurrences by different eyewitnesses, arising sometimes from imperfect memory, sometimes from undue partiality for one side or the other. The absence of romance in my history will, I fear, detract somewhat from its interests, but if it be judged useful by those inquirers who desire an exact knowledge of the past as an aid to the interpretation of the future, which in the course of human things must resemble if it does not reflect it, I shall be content. In fine, I have written my work not as an essay which is to win the applause of the moment, but as a possession for all time. The Median War, the greatest achievement of past times, yet found a speedy decision in two actions by sea and two by land. The Peloponnesian War was prolonged to an immense length, and, long as it was, it was short, without parallel, for the misfortunes that it brought upon Hellas. Never had so many cities been taken and laid desolate, here by the barbarians, here by the parties contending, the old inhabitants being sometimes removed to make room for others. Never was there so much banishing and bloodshedding. Now, on the field of battle, 
now in the strife of faction. Old stories of occurrences handed down by tradition, but scantily confirmed by experience, suddenly ceased to be credible. There were earthquakes of unparalleled extent and violence. Eclipses of the sun occurred with a frequency unrecorded in previous history. There were great droughts in sundry places and consequent famines, and that most calamitous and awfully fatal visitation, the plague. All this came upon them with the late war, which was begun by the Athenians and the Peloponnesians, by the dissolution of the thirty years' truce made after the conquest of Euboea. To the question why they broke the treaty, I answer by placing first an account of their grounds of complaint and points of difference that no one may ever have to ask the immediate cause which plunged the Hellenes into a war of such magnitude. The real cause I consider to be the one which was formerly most kept out of sight, the growth of the power of Athens, and the alarm which this inspired in Lacedaemon, made the war inevitable. Still it is well to give the grounds alleged by either side which led to the dissolution of the treaty and the breaking out of the, out of the war. This is the end of chapter 1. Chapter 2 Causes of the War The Affair of Epidamnus The Affair of Potidaea The city of Epidamnus stands on the right of the entrance of the Ionic Gulf. Its vicinity is inhabited by the Tolantians, an Illyrian people. The place is a colony of, from Corsera, founded by Thalius, son of Eratocleides, of the family of the Heraclids, who had, according to ancient usage, been summoned for the purpose from Corinth, the mother country. The colonists were joined by some Corinthians and others of the Dorian race. Now, as time went on, the city of Epidamnus became great and populous, but falling a prey to factions arising, it is said, from a war with her neighbors, the barbarians, she became much enfeebled and lost a considerable amount of her power. The last act before the war was the expulsion of the nobles by the people. The exiled party joined the barbarians and proceeded to plunder those in the city by sea and land, and the Epidamnians, finding themselves hard-pressed, sent ambassadors to Corsera, beseeching their mother country not to allow them to perish, but to make up matters between them and the exiles, and to rid them of the war with the barbarians. The ambassadors seated themselves in the temple of Hera as suppli suppliants, and made the above request to the Corsarians. But the Corsarians refused to accept their supplication, and they were dismissed without having effected anything. When the Epidamnians found that no help could be expected from Corsera, they were in a strait what to do next. So they sent to Delphi and inquired of the god whether they should deliver their city to the Corinthians and endeavor to obtain some assistance from their founders. The answer he gave them was to deliver the city and place themselves under Corinthian protection. So the Epidamnians went to Corinth and delivered over the colony in obedience to the commands of the oracle. They showed that their founder came from Corinth and revealed the answer of the god, and they begged them not to allow them to perish, but to assist them. This the Corinthians consented to do. Believing the colony to belong as much to themselves as to the Corsarians, they felt it to be a kind of duty to undertake their protection. Besides, they hated the Corsarians for their contempt of the mother country. Instead of meeting with the usual honors accorded to the parent city by every other colony at public assemblies, such as precedence at sacrifices, Corinth found herself treated with contempt by a power which in point of wealth could stand comparison with any, even of the richest communities in Hellas, which possessed great military strength and which sometimes could not repress a pride in the high naval position of an island whose nautical renown dated from the days of its old inhabitants, the Phaeacians. This was one reason of the care that they lavished on their fleet, which became very efficient. Indeed, they began the war with a force of a hundred and twenty galleys. All these grievances made Corinth eager to send the promised aid to the Epidamnus. Advertisement was made for volunteer settlers, and a force of Imbraciates, Lucadians, and Corinthians was dispatched. They marched by land to Apollonia, a Corinthian colony, 
the route by sea being avoided from fear of Corsarian interruption. When the Corsarians heard of the arrival of the settlers and troops in Epidamnus, and the surrender of the colony to Corinth, they took fire. Instantly putting to sea with five and twenty ships, which were quickly followed by others, they insolently commanded the Epidamnians to receive back the banished nobles. It must be premised that the Epidamnian exiles had come to Corsera, and, pointing to the sepulchres of their ancestors, had appealed to their kindred to restore them, and to dismiss the Corinthian garrison and settlers. But to all this the Epidamnians turned a deaf ear. Upon this, the Corsarians commenced operations against them with a fleet of forty sail. They took with them the exiles with a view to their restoration, and also secured the services of the Illyrians. Settling down before the city, they issued a proclamation to the effect that any of the natives that chose and the foreigners might depart unharmed, with the alternative of being treated as enemies. On their refusal, the Corsarians proceeded to besiege the city, which stands on an isthmus, and the Corinthians, receiving intelligence of the investment of Epidamnus, got together an armament and proclaimed a colony to Epidamnus, perfect political equality being agreed to all who chose to go. Any who were not prepared to sail at once might, by paying down the sum of fifty Corinthian drachmae, have a share in the colony without leaving Corinth. Great numbers took advantage of this proclamation, some being ready to start directly, others paying the requisite forfeit. In case of their passage, being disputed by the Corsarians, several cities were asked to lend them a convoy. Megara prepared to accompany them with eight ships, Pale in Cephalonia with four, Epidorus furnished five, Hermione one, Treason two, Lucas ten, and Ambracia eight. The Thebans and Phileasians were asked for money, the Aeleans for hulls as well, while Corinth herself furnished thirty ships and three thousand heavy infantry. When the Corsarians heard of their preparations, they came to Corinth with envoys from Lacedaemon and Sicyon, whom they persuaded to accompany them, and bade her recall the garrison and settlers, as she had nothing to do with Epidamnus. If, however, she had any claims to make, they were willing to submit the matter to the arbitration of such of the cities in Peloponnese as should be cho chosen by mutual agreement, and that the colony should remain with the city to whom the arbitrators might assign it. They were also willing to refer the matter to the oracle at Delphi. If, in defiance to their protestations, war was appealed to, they should be themselves compelled by this violence to seek friends in quarters where they had no desire to seek them, and to make even old ties give way to the necessity of assistance. The answer they got from Corinth was that, if they would withdraw their fleet and the barbarians from Epidamnus, negotiation might be possible. But, while the town was still being besieged, going before arbitrators was out of the question. The Corsarians retorted that if Corinth would withdraw her troops from Epidamnus, they would withdraw theirs, or they were ready to let both parties remain in status quo, an armistice being concluded till judgment could be given. Turning a deaf ear on all these proposals, when their ships were manned and their allies had come in, the Corinthians sent a herald before them to declare war, and, getting under way with seventy-five ships and two thousand heavy infantry, sailed for Epidamnus to give battle to the Corsarians. The fleet was under the command of Aristius, son of Felicus, Callicrates, son of Callias, and Timonor, son of Timathenes. The troops under that of Architimus, son of Eurytimus, and Isarchidas, son of Isarchus. When they had reached Actium, in the territory of Anactorium, at the mouth of the mouth of the Gulf of Ambracia, where the temple of Apollo stands, the Corsarians sent on a herald in a light boat to warn them not to sail against them. Meanwhile, they proceeded to man their ships, all of which had been equipped for action, the old vessels being undergirded to make them seaworthy. On the return of the herald without any peaceful answer from the Corinthians, their ships being now manned, they put out to sea to meet the enemy with a fleet of eight, eighty sail. Forty were engaged in the siege of Epidamnus, formed line, and went into action, and gained a decisive victory and destroyed fifteen of the Corinthian vessels. The same day had seen Epidamnus compelled by its besiegers to capitulate. 
the conditions being that the foreigners should be sold and the Corinthians kept as prisoners of war, till their fate should otherwise be decided. After the engagement, the Corsarians set up a trophy on Leukimi, a headland of Corsira, and slew all their captives except the Corinthians, whom they kept as prisoners of war. Defeated at sea, the Corinthians and their allies repaired home, and left the Corsarians masters of all the sea about those parts. Sailing to Leucas, a Corinthian colony, they ravaged their territory and burnt Silene, the harbor of Eleans, because they had furnished ships and money to Corinth. For almost the whole of the period that followed the battle, they remained masters of the sea, and the allies of Corinth were harassed by Corsarian cruisers. At last Corinth, roused by the sufferings of her allies, sent out ships and troops in the fall of the summer, who formed an encampment at Actium and about Chimerium, in Thesporitis, for the protection of Lucas and the rest of the friendly cities. The Corsarians, on their part, formed a similar station on Leukemi. Neither party made any movement, but they remained confronting each other till the end of the summer, and winter was at hand before either of them returned home. Corinth, exasperated by the war with the Corsarians, spent the whole of the year after the engagement, and that succeeding it, in building ships, and in straining every nerve to form an efficient fleet, rowers being drawn from the Peloponnese, and the rest of Hellas, by the inducement of large bounties. The Corsarians, alarmed at the news of their preparations, being without a single ally in Hellas, for they had not enrolled themselves either in the Athenian or in the Lacedaemonian confederacy, decided to repair to Athens in order to enter into an alliance and to endeavor to procure support from her. Corinth also, hearing of their intentions, sent an embassy to Athens to prevent the Corsarian navy from being joined by the Athenian, and her prospect of ordering the war according to her wishes being thus impeded. An assembly was convoked, and the rival advocates appeared. The Corsarians spoke as follows. Athenians, when a people that have not rendered any important service or support to their neighbors in times past, for which they might claim to be repaid, appear before them as we now appear before you to solicit their assistance, they may fairly be required to satisfy certain preliminary conditions. They should show first that it is expedient or at least safe to grant their request, next that they will retain a lasting sense of the kindness, but if they cannot clearly establish any of these points, they must not be annoyed if they meet with rebuff. Now the Corsarians believe that with their petition for assistance they can also give you a satisfactory answer on these points, and they have therefore dispatched us hither. It has so happened that our policy as regards you with respect to this request turns out to be inconsistent, and as regards our interests to be at the present crisis inexpedient. We say inconsistent because a power which has never in the whole of her past history been willing to ally herself with any of her neighbors is now found asking them to ally themselves with her. And we say inexpedient, because in our present war with Corinth it has left us in a position of entire isolation, and what once seemed the wise precaution of refusing to involve ourselves in alliances with other powers, lest we should also involve ourselves in risks of their choosing, has now proved to be folly and weakness. It is true that in the late naval engagement we drove back the Corinthians from our shores single-handed, but they have now got together a still larger armament from Peloponnese and the rest of Hellas, and we, seeing our utter inability to cope with them without foreign aid, and the magnitude of the danger which subjection to them implies, find it necessary to ask help from you and from every other power, and we hope to be excused if we forswear our old principle of complete political isolation, a principle which was not adopted with any sinister in intention, but was rather the consequence of an error in judgment. Now, there are many reasons why in the event of your compliance you will congratulate yourselves on this request having been made to you. First, because your assistance will be rendered to a power which, herself inoffensive, is a victim to the injustice of others. Secondly, because all that we most value is at stake in the present contest, and your welcome of us under these circumstances will be a proof of goodwill, which will ever keep alive the gratitude you will lay upon our hearts. Thirdly, Yourselves accepted, we are the greatest naval power in Hellas. Moreover, you can conceive a stroke of good fortune more rare in itself, or more disheartening to your enemies, than that the power whose adhesion you would have valued above much material and moral strength should present herself self-invited, should deliver herself into your hands without danger and without expense, and should lastly put you in the way of gaining a high character in the eyes of the world. 
the gratitude of those whom you shall assist, and a great accession of strength for yourselves. You may search all history without finding many instances of a people gaining all these advantages at once, or many instances of a power that comes in quest of assistance, being in a position to give the people whose alliance she solicits as much safety and honor as she will receive. But it will be urged that it is only in the case of war that we shall be found useful. To this we answer that if any of you imagine that the war is far off, he is grievously mistaken, and is blind to the fact that Lacedaemon regards you with jealousy and desires a war, and that Corinth is powerful there. The same, remember, that is your enemy, and is even now trying to subdue us as a preliminary to attacking you. And this she does to prevent our becoming united by a common enmity, and her having us both on her hands, and also to ensure getting the start of you in one of two ways, either by crippling our power, or by making its strength her own. Now it is our policy to be beforehand with her, that is, for Corsera to make an offer of alliance and for you to accept it. In fact, we ought to form plans against her instead of waiting to defeat the plans she forms against us. If she asserts that for you to receive a colony of hers into alliance is not right, let her know that every colony that is well treated honors its parent state, but becomes estranged from it by injustice. For colonists are not sent, sent forth on the understanding that they are to be the slaves of those that remain behind, but that, they, but that they are to be their equals, and that Corinth was injuring us is clear. Invited to refer to the dispute about Epidamnus to arbitration, they chose to prosecute their complaints war rather by it than by a fair trial, and let their conduct towards us, who are their kindred, be a warning to you not to be misled by their deceit, nor to yield to their direct requests. Concessions to adversaries only end in self-reproach, and the more strictly they are avoided, the greater will be the chance of security. If it be urged that your reception of, of us will be a breach of the treaty existing between you and Lacedaemon, the answer is clear, that we are a neutral state, and that one of the express provisions of that treaty is that it shall be competent for any Hellenic state that is neutral to join whichever side it pleases and it is intolerable for Corinth to be allowed to obtain men for her navy, not only from her allies, but also from the rest of Hellas, no small number being furnished by your own subjects. While we are to be excluded both from the alliance left open to us by treaty, and from any assistance that we might get from other quarters, and you are to be accused of political immorality if you, if political immorality if you comply with our request, on the other hand, we shall have much greater cause to complain of you if you do not comply with it. If we, who are in peril and are no enemies of yours, meet with a repulse at your hands, while Corinth, who is the aggressor and your enemy, not only meets with no hindrance from you, but is even allowed to draw material for war from your dependencies, this ought not to be. But you should either forbid her enlisting men in your dominions, or you should lend us too what help you may think advisable. But your real policy is to afford us avowed countenance and support. The advantages of this course, as we premised in the beginning of our speech, are many. We mention one that is perhaps the chief. Could there be a clearer guarantee of our good faith than is offered by the fact that the power which is at enmity with you is also at enmity with us, and that that power is fully able to punish defection? And there is a wide difference between declining the alliance of an inland and of a maritime power. For your first endeavor you should be to prevent, if possible, the existence of any naval power except your own. Failing this, to secure the friendship of the strongest that does exist. And if any of you believe that what we urge is expedient, but fear to act upon this belief, lest it should lead to a breach of the treaty, you must remember that on the one hand, whatever your fears, your strength will be formidable to your antagonists. On the other, whatever the confidence you derive from re refusing to receive us, your weakness will have no terrors for a strong enemy. You must also remember that your decision is for Athens no less than for Corsera, and that you are not making the best provision for her interests, if, at a time when you are anxiously scanning the horizon that you may be in readiness for the breaking out of the war which is all but upon you, you hesitate to attach to your side a place whose adhesion or estrangement is alike pregnant with the most vital consequences for it lies conveniently for the coast navigation in the direction of Italy and Sicily, being able to bar the passage of naval reinforcements from thence to the Peloponnese, and from Peloponnese thither. And it is in other respects a most desirable station, 
To sum up as shortly as possible, embracing both general and particular considerations, let this show you the folly of sacrificing us. Remember that there are but three considerable naval powers in Hellas, Athens, Corsira, and Corinth, and that if you allow two of these three to become one, and Corinth to secure us for herself, you will have to hold the sea against the united fleets of Corsira and Peloponnese. But if you receive us, you will have our ships to reinforce you in the struggle. Such were the words of the Corsirians. After they had finished, the Corinthians spoke as follows. These Corsirians in the speech we have just heard do not confine themselves to the question of their reception into your alliance. They also talk of our being guilty of injustice, and their being the victims of an unjustifiable war. It becomes necessary for us to touch upon both these points. Before we proceed to the rest of what we have to say, that you may have a more correct idea of the grounds of our claim, and have a good cause to reject their petition. According to them, their old policy of refusing all offers of alliance was a policy of moderation. It was, in fact, adopted for bad ends, not for good. Indeed, their conduct is such as to make them by no means desirous of having allies present to witness it, or of having the shame of asking their concurrence. Besides, their geographical situation makes them independent of others, and consequently the decision in cases where they injure any lies with, not with judges appointed by mutual agreement, but with themselves, because, while they seldom make voyages to their neighbors, they are constantly being visited by foreign vessels which are compelled to put into Corsera. In short, the object that they propose to themselves in their specious policy of, avoid, of complete isolation is not to avoid sharing in the crimes of others, but to secure monopoly of crime to themselves. The license of outrage wherever they can compel, of fraud wherever they can elude, and the enjoyment of their gains without shame. And yet if they were the honest men they pretend to be, the less hold that others had upon them, the stronger would be the light in which they might have put their honesty, by giving and taking what was just. But such has not been their conduct either towards others or towards us. The attitude of our colony towards us has always been one of estrangement, and is now one of hostility. For, say they, we have not sent out to be ill-treated. We rejoin that we did not found the colony to be insulted by them, but to be their head, and not to be regarded, and to be regarded with a proper respect. At any rate, our other colonies honor us, and we are much beloved by our colonists. And, clearly, if the majority are satisfied with us, these can have no good reason for dissatisfaction, in which they stand alone. And we are not acting improperly in making war against them, nor are we making war against them without having received signal provo provocation. Besides, if we were in the wrong, it would be honorable in them to give way to our wishes, and disgraceful for us to trample on their moderation. But in the pride and license of wealth they have sinned again and again against us, and ever more deeply than when Epidamnus, our dependency, which they took no steps to claim in its distress upon our coming to relieve it, was by them seized, and is now held by force of arms. As to their allegation that they wished the question to be first submitted to arbitration, it is obvious that a challenge coming from the party who is safe in a commanding position cannot gain the credit due only to him who, before appealing to arms, in deeds as well as words, places himself on a level with his adversary. In their case, it was not before they laid siege to the place, but after they at length understood that we should not tamely suffer it, that they thought of the speci specious word arbitration. And not satisfied with their own misconduct there, they appear here now requiring you to join with them in a, not in alliance but in crime, and to receive them in spite of their being at enmity with us. But it was when they stood firmest that they should have made overtures to you, and not at a time when we have been wronged and they are in peril, nor yet at a time when you will be admitting to a share in your protection those who never admitted you to a share in their power, and will be incurring an equal amount of blame from us with those in whose offenses you had no hand. No, they should have shared their power with you before they asked you to share their, your fortunes with them. So then the rea reality of the grievances we come to complain of, and the violence and rapacity of our opponents, have both been proved. But that you cannot equitably receive them, this you have still to learn. It may be true that one of the provisions of the treaty is that it shall be competent for any state, whose name was not down on the list, to join whichever side it pleases. 
But this agreement is not meant for those whose object in joining is the injury of other powers, but for those whose need of support does not arise from the fact of defection, and whose adhesion will not bring to that power that is mad enough to receive them war instead of peace. Which will be the case with you if you refuse to listen to us, for you cannot become their auxiliary and remain our friend. If you join in their attack, you must share the punishment with which the defenders inflict on them. And yet you have the best possible right to be neutral, or, failing this, you should on the contrary join us against them. Corinth is at least in treaty with you. With Corsera you were never even in truce, but do not lay down the principle that defection is to be patronized. Did we on the defection of the Samians record our vote against you, when the rest of the Peloponnesian powers were equally divided on the question whether they should assist them? No. We told them to their face that every power has a right to punish its own allies. Why, if you make it your policy to receive and assist all offenders, you will find that just as many of your dependencies will come over to us, and the principle that you establish will press less heavily on us than on yourselves. This, then, is what Hellenic law entitles us to demand as a right, but we have also advice to offer, and claims on your gratitude, which, since there is no danger of our injuring you, as we are not enemies, and since our friendship does not amount to very frequent intercourse, we say ought to be liquidated at the present juncture. When you were in want of ships of war for the war against the Aegeanetans before the Persian invasion, Corinth supplied you with twenty vessels. That good turn, and the line we took on the Samian question, when we were the cause of the Peloponnesians refusing to assist them, enabled you to conquer Aegina and to punish Samos. And we acted thus at crises when, if ever, men are wont in their efforts against their enemies to forget everything for the sake of victory, regarding him who assists them then as a friend, even if thus far he has been a foe, and him who opposes them then as a foe, even if he has thus far been a friend. Indeed, they allow their real interests to suffer from their absorbing preoccupation in the struggle. Weigh well these considerations, and let your youth learn what they are from their elders, and let them determine to do unto us as we have done unto you, and let them not acknowledge the justice of what we say, but dispute its wisdom in the contingency of war. Not only is the straightest path, generally speaking, the wisest, but the coming of the war, which the Corsarians have used as a bugbear to persuade you to do wrong, is still uncertain, and it is not worth while to be carried away by it into gaining the instant and declared enmity of Corinth. It were, rather, wise to try and counteract the unfavorable impression which your conduct to Megara has created, for kindness opportunely shown has a greater power of removing old grievances than the facts of the case may warrant. And do not be seduced by the prospect of a great naval alliance. Abstinence from all injustice to other first-rate powers is a greater tower of strength than anything that can be gained by the sacrifice of permanent tranquility for an apparent temporary advantage. It is now our turn to benefit by the principle that we laid down at Lacedaemon, that every power has a right to punish her own allies. We now claim to receive the same from you, and protest against your rewarding us for benefiting you by our vote, by injuring us by yours. On the contrary, return us like for like, remembering that this is that very crisis into which he who lends aid is most a friend, and he who opposes aid is most a foe. And for these Corsarians, neither receive them into alliance in our dispute, nor be their abettors in crime. So do, and you will act as we have a right to expect of you, and at the same time best consult your own interests. Such were the words of the Corinthians. When the Athenians had heard both out, two assemblies were held. In the first, there was a manifest disposition to listen to the representations of Corinth. In the second, Public feeling had changed, and an alliance with Corsera was decided on, with certain reservations. It was to be a defensive, not an offensive alliance. It did not involve a breach of the treaty with the Peloponnese. Athens could not be required to join Corsera in any attack upon Corinth. But each of these contracting parties had a right to the other's assistance against invasion, whether of his own territory or that of an ally. For it began now to be felt that the coming of the Peloponnesian War was only a question of time, and no one was willing to see a naval power of such magnitude as Corsera sacrificed to Corinth. 
though if they could let them weaken each other by mutual conflict, it would be no bad preparation for the struggle which Athens might one day have to wage with Corinth and the other naval powers. At the same time, the island seemed to lie conveniently on the coasting passage to Italy and Sicily. With these views, Athens received Corsera into alliance, and, on the departure of the Corinthians, not long afterwards, sent ten ships to their assistance. They were commanded by Lacedaemonius, the son of Simon, Diotimus, the son of Strombicus, and Proteus, the son of Epicles. Their instructions were to avoid collision with the Corinthian fleet, except under certain circumstances. If it sailed to Corsera and threatened a landing on her coast, or in any of her possessions, they were to do their utmost to prevent it. These instructions were prompted by an anxiety to avoid a breach of the treaty. Meanwhile, the Corinthians completed their preparations and sailed for Corsera with 150 ships. Of these, Ellis furnished 10, Megara 12, Lucas 10, Ambracia 27, and Actorium 1, and Corinth herself 90. Each of these contingents has a t- had its own admiral, the Corinthian being under the command of Xenocleides, son of Euthycles, with four colleagues. Sailing from Lucas, they made land at the part of the continent opposite Cor- Corsera. They anchored in the harbor of Chimerium, in the territory of Thesprotus, above which, at some distance from the sea, lies the city of Hephir, in the Elian district. But this city, the Acherusian lake, pours its waters into the sea. It gets its name from the river Acheron, which flows through Thesprotus and falls into the lake. There also the river Thiamis flows, forming the boundary between Thesprotus and Kestrine, and between these rivers rises the point of Chimerium. In this part of the continent, the Corinthians now came to anchor and formed an encampment. When the Corsarians saw them coming, they manned a hundred and ten ships commanded by Machaides, Asimides and Eurobatus, and stationed themselves at one of the Sabota Isles, the ten Athenian ships being present. On Point Leucomy, they posted their land forces, and a thousand heavy infantry who had come from Zathensis to their assistance. Nor were the Corinthians on the mainland without their allies. The barbarians flocked in large numbers to their assistance, the inhabitants of this part of the continent being old allies of theirs. When the Corinthian preparations were completed, they took three days' provisions and put them out from Chimerium by night, ready for action. Sailing with the dawn, they sighted the Corsarian fleet out at sea, and coming toward them. When they perceived each other, both sides formed in order of battle. On the Corsarian right wing lay the Athenian ships, the rest of the line being occupied by their own vessels formed in three squadrons, each of which was commanded by one of the three admirals. Such was the Corsarian formation. The Corinthian was as follows. On the right wing lay the Megarian and Ambrosiate ships. In the center, the rest of the allies in order. But the left was composed of the best sailors in the Corinthian navy to encounter the Athenians in the right wing of the Corsarians. As soon as the signals were raised on either side, they joined battle. Both sides had a large number of heavy infantry on their decks and a large number of archers and darters, the old and perfect armament still prevailing. The sea fight was an obstinate one though not remarkable for its science. Indeed, it was more like a battle by land. Whenever they charged each other, the multitude and crush of the vessels made it by no means easy to get loose. Besides, their hopes of victory lay principally in the heavy infantry on the decks, who stood and fought in order, the ships remaining stationary. The maneuver of breaking the line was not tried. In short, strength and pluck had more share in the fight than science. Everywhere, tumult reigned, the battle being one scene of confusion, Meanwhile, the Athenian ships, by coming up to the Corsarians whenever they were pressed, served to alarm the enemy, though their commanders could not join in the battle from fear of their instructions. The right wing of the Corinthians suffered most. The Corsarians routed it, and chased them in disorder to the continent with twenty ships, sailed up to their camp, and burnt the tents which were found empty, and plundered the stuff. So in this quarter the Corinthians and their allies were defeated and the Corsarians were victorious. But where the Corinthians themselves were on the left, they gained a decided success, the scanty forces of the Corsarians being further weakened by the want of the twenty ships absent on the pursuit. Seeing the Corsarians hard-pressed, the Athenians began at length to assist them more unequivocally. At first, it is true, 
they refrained from charging any ships. But when the rout was becoming patent, and the Corinthians were pressing on, the time at last came when every one set to, and all the distinction was laid aside, and it came to this point, that the Corinthians and Athenians raised their hands against each other. After the rout, the Corinthians, instead of employing themselves in lashing fast and hauling after them the hulls of the vessels which they had doubled, disabled, turned their attention to the men, whom they butchered as they sailed through, not caring so much to make prisoners. Some even of their own friends were slain by them, by mistake, in their ignorance of the defeat of the right wing. For the number of the ships on both sides, and the distance to which they covered the sea, made it difficult, after they had once joined, to distinguish between the conquering and the conquered, this battle proving far greater than any before it, any at least between Hellenes, for the number of vessels engaged. After the Corinthians had chased the Corsarians to their land, they turned to the wrecks and their dead, most of whom they had succeeded in getting hold of in conveying to Sabata, the rendezvous point of the land forces furnished by their barbarian allies. Sabata, it must be known, is a desert harbor of Thesprotus. This task over, they mustered anew and sailed against the Corsarians, who on their part advanced to meet them with all their ships that were fit for service and remaining to them, accompanied by the Athenian vessels, fearing that they might attempt a landing in their territory. It was by this time getting late, and the paean had been sung for the attack, when the Corinthians suddenly began to back water. They had, they had observed twenty Athenian ships sailing up, which had been sent out afterwards to reinforce the ten vessels by the Athenians, who feared, as it turned out justly, the defeat of the Corsarians and the inability of their handful of ships to protect them. These ships were thus seen by the Corinthians first. They suspected that they were from Athens, and that those which they saw were not all, but that there were more behind. They accordingly began to retire. The Corsarians, meanwhile, had not sighted them, as they were advancing from a point which they could not so well see, and were wondering why the Corinthians were backing water, when some caught sight of them, and cried out that there were ships in sight ahead. Upon this they also retired, for it was now getting dark, and the, reti and the retreat of the Corinthians had suspended hostilities. Thus they parted from one, and one e from each other, and the battle ceased with the night. The Corsarians were in their camp at Leucomy, when these twenty ships from Athens, under the command of Glaucon, the son of Leagris, and at and Dosides, son of Leagoras, bore on through the corpses and the wrecks, and sailed up to the camp, not long after they were sighted. It was now night, and the Corsarians feared that they might be hostile vessels. But they soon knew them, and the ships came to anchor. The next day the thirty Athenian vessels put out to sea, accompanied by all the Corsarian ships that were seaworthy, and sailed to the harbor at Sabota, where the Corinthians lay, to see if they would engage. The Corinthians put out from land, and formed a line in the open sea, but beyond this made no further movement, having no intention of assuming the offensive. For they saw reinforcements arrive fresh from Athens, and themselves confronted by numerous difficulties, such as the necessity of guarding the prisoners whom they had on board, and the want of all means of refitting their ships in a desert place. What they were thinking more about was how their voyage home was to be effected. They feared that the Athenians might consider that the treaty was dissolved by the collision which had occurred, and forbid their departure. Accordingly, they, they resolved to put some men on board a boat, and send them without a herald's wand to the Athenians as an experiment. Having done so, they spoke as follows. You do wrong, Athenians, to begin war and break the treaty. Engaged in chastising our enemies, we find you placing yourselves in the path in arms against us. Now, if your intentions are to prevent us sailing to Corsera, or anywhere else that we may wish, and if you are for breaking the treaty, first take us here that are here and treat us as enemies. Such was what they said, and all the Corsarian armament that were within hearing immediately called out to take them and kill them. But the Athenians answered as follows, Neither are we beginning war, Peloponnesians, nor are we breaking the treaty, but these Corsarians are our allies, and we are come to help them. So if you want to sail anywhere else, we place no obstacle in your way. But if you are going to sail against Corsera or any of her possessions, we shall do our best to stop you. Receiving this answer from the Athenians, the Corinthians commenced preparations for their voyage home, and set up a trophy in Sabata on the continent, while the Corsarians took up the wrecks and dead that had been carried out to them by the current, and by a wind which rose in the night and scattered them in all directions, and set up their trophy in Sabata on, on the island as victors. 
The reasons each side had for claiming the victory were these. The Corinthians had been victorious in the sea fight until night, and having thus been enabled to carry off most wrecks and dead, they were in possession of no fewer than a thousand prisoners of war, and had sunk close upon seventy vessels. The Corsarians had destroyed about thirty ships, and after the arrival of the Athenians had taken up the wrecks and dead on their side, they had besides seen the Corinthians retire before them, backing water on sight of the Athenian vessels, and upon the arrival of the Athenians refused to sail out against them from Sabata. Thus both sides claimed the victory. The Corinthians on the voyage home took Anactorium, which stands at the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf. The place was taken by treachery, being common ground to the Corsarians and Corinthians. After establishing a Corinthian settlers there, they retired home. Eight hundred of the Corsarians were slaves. These they sold. Two hundred and fifty they retained in captivity, and treated with great attention, in the hope that they might bring over their country to Corinth on their return, most of them being, as it happened, men of very high position in Corsura. In this way, Corsura maintained her political existence in the war with Corinth, and the Athenian vessels left the island. This was the first cause of the war that Corinth had against the Athenians, i.e. that they had fought against them with the Corsarians in time of treaty. Almost immediately after this, fresh differences arose between the Athenians and Peloponnesians and contributed to the, their share to the war. Corinth was forming schemes for retaliation, and Athens suspected her hostility. The Potidaeans, who inhabit the Isthmus of Pellene, being a Corinthian colony, but tributary allies of Athens, were ordered to raise the wall looking towards Pellene, to give hostages, to dismiss the Corinthian magistrates, and in future not to receive the person sent from Corinth, annually to succeed them. It was feared that they might be persuaded by Paradacus and the Corinthians to revolt, and might draw the rest of the allies in the direction of Thrace to revolt with them. These precautions against the Potidaeans were taken by the Athenians immediately after the battle at Corsera. Not only was Corinth at length openly hostile, but Perdiccas, son of Alexander, king of the Macedonians, had from an old friend and ally been made an enemy. He had been made an enemy by the Athenians entering into alliance with his brother Philip and Derdas, who were in league against him. In his alarm he had sent to Lacedaemon to try and involve the Athenians in a war with the Peloponnesians, and was endeavouring to win over Corinth in order to bring about the revolt of Potidaea. He also made overtures to the Chalcidians in the direction of Thrace, and to the Bataeans to persuade them to join in the revolt. For he thought if these places on the border could be made his allies, it would be easier to carry on the war with their cooperation. Live to all of this, and wishing to anticipate the revolt of the cities, the Athenians acted as follows. They were just then sending off thirty ships and a thousand heavy infantry for his country under the command of Archistratus, son of Lycomedes, with four colleagues. They instructed the captains to take hostages of the Potidaeans, to raise the wall, and to be on their guard against the revolt of the neighboring cities. Meanwhile, the Potidaeans sent envoys to Athens on the chance of persuading them to take no new steps in their matters. They also went to Lacedaemon with the Corinthians to secure support in case of need. Failing after prolonged negotiation to obtain anything satisfactory from the Athenians, being unable, for all they could say, to prevent the vessels that were destined for Macedonia from also sailing against them, and receiving from the Lacedaemonian government a promise to invade Attica. If the Athenians should attack Potidaea, the Potidaeans, thus favored by the mo moment, at last entered into a league with the Chalcidians and Bataeans, and revolted. And Perdiccas induced the Chalcidians to abandon and demolish their towns on the seaboard, and, settling inland at Olynthias, to make that one city a strong place. Meanwhile, to those who followed his advice, he gave a part of his territory in Mygdonia around Lake Bulby, as a place of abode while the war against the Athenians should last. They accordingly demolished their towns, removed inland, and prepared for war. The thirty ships of the Athenians, arriving before the Thracian places, found Potidaea and the rest in revolt. Their commanders, considering it to be quite impossible with their present force to carry on war with Perdiccas, and with the confederate towns as well, turned to Macedonia, their original destination, and having established themselves there, carried on war in cooperation with Philip and the brothers of Derdas, who had invaded the country from the interior. Meanwhile, the Corinthians, with Potidaea in revolt and the Athenian ships on the coast of Macedonia, 
alarmed for the safety of the place, and thinking it its danger theirs, sent volunteers from Corinth, and mercenaries from the rest of the Peloponnese, to the number of sixteen hundred heavy infantry in all, and four hundred light troops. Aristeus, son of Adamantus, who was always a steady friend to the Potidians, took command of the expedition, and it was principally for love of him that most of the men from Corinth volunteered. They arrived in Thrace forty days after the revolt of Potidia. The Athenians also immediately received the news of the revolt of the cities. On being informed that Aristeus and his reinforcements were on their way, they sent two thousand heavy infantry of their own citizens, and forty ships against the places in revolt, under the command of Callias, son of Calliades, and four colleagues. They arrived in Macedonia at first, and found the th- force of a thousand men that had been first sent out, just become masters of Thermi, and besieging Pydna. Accordingly, they also joined in the investment, and besieged Pydna for a while. Subsequently, they came to terms, and concluded a forced alliance with Perdiccas, hastened by the calls of Potidia and by the arrival of Aristeus at that place. They withdrew from Macedonia, going to Baroia, and thence to Strepsa, and after a futile attempt on the latter place, they pursued by land their march to Potidia with three thousand heavy infantry of their own citizens, besides a number of their allies, and six hundred Macedonian horsemen, the followers of Philip and Pausanias. With these sailed seventy ships along the coast. Advancing by short marches on the third day, they arrived at Gigonus, where they encamped. Meanwhile, the Potidians and the Peloponnesians with Aristeus were camped on the side looking towards Olynthus on the Isthmus, in expectation of the Athenians, and had established their market outside the city. The allies had chosen Aristeus, general of all the infantry, while the command of the cavalry was given to Perdiccas, who had at once left the alliance of the Athenians and gone back to that of the Potidians, having disputed Aeolius as his general. The plan of Aristeus was to keep his own force on the Isthmus, and await the attack of the Athenians, leaving the Chalcidians and the allies outside the Isthmus, and the two hundred cavalry from Perdiccas in Olynthus to act upon the Athenian rear, on the occasion of their advancing against him, and thus to place the enemy between two fires. While Callias the Athenian general and his colleagues dispatched the Macedonian horse and a few of the allies to Olynthus, to prevent any movement being made from that quarter, the Athenians themselves broke up their camp and marched against Potidia. After they had arrived at the Isthmus, and saw the enemy preparing for battle, they formed against him, and soon afterwards engaged. The wing of Aristeus, with the Corinthians and other picked troops around him, routed the wing opposed to it, and followed for a considerable distance in pursuit. But the rest of the army of the Potidians and of the Peloponnesians was defeated by the Athenians, and took refuge within the fortifications. Returning from the pursuit, Aristeus perceived the defeat of the rest of the army. Being at a loss which of the two risks to choose, whether to go to Olympus or to Potidia, he at last determined to draw his men into as small a space as possible, and force his way with a run into Potidia. Not without difficulty, through a storm of missiles he passed along by the breakwater through the sea, and brought off most of his men safe, though a few were lost, Meanwhile, the auxiliaries of the Potidians from Olynthus, which is about seven miles off and in sight of Potidia, where the battle began and the signals were raised, advanced a little way to render assistance, and the Macedonian horse formed against them to prevent it. But on victory speedily declaring for the Athenians, and the signals being taken down, they retired back within the wall, and the Macedonians returned to the Athenians. Thus there were no cavalry present on either side. After the battle, the Athenians set up a trophy, and gave back their dead to the Potidians under truce. The Potidians and their allies had close upon three hundred killed, the Athenians a hundred and fifty of their own citizens, and Callias their general. The wall on the side of the Isthmus had now works at once raised against it, and manned by the Athenians. That on the side of Pelene had no works raised against it. They did not think themselves strong enough at once to keep a garrison on the, in the Isthmus, and to cross over to Pelene and raise works there. They were afraid that the Potidians and their allies might take advantage of their division to attack them. Meanwhile, the Athenians at home, learning there were no works at Pallene, some time afterwards sent off sixteen hundred heavy infantry of their own citizens under, under the command of Formio, son of Asopius. Arrived at Pallene, he fixed his headquarters at Aphitis, and led his army against Potidia by short marches, 
ravishing the country as he advanced. No one venturing to meet him in the field, he raised works against the wall on the side of Pallene. So at length Potidaea was strongly invested on either side, and from the sea by the ships cooperating in the blockade. Aristius, seeing its investment complete, and having no hope of its salvation, except in the event of some movement from the Peloponnese, or of some other improbable contingency, advised all except fifteen hundred to watch for a wind and sail out of the place, in order that their provisions might last the longer. He was willing to be himself one of those who remained. Unable to persuade them, and desirous of acting on the next alternative, and of having things outside in the best posture possible, he eluded the guardianships, the guardships of the Athenians and sailed out. Remaining among the Chalcidians, he continued to carry on the war. In particular, he laid an ambuscade near the city of the Cimmerians, and cut off many of them. He also communicated with Peloponnese, and tried to contrive some method by which he might be brought, help might be brought. Meanwhile, after the completion of the investment of Potidaea, Formio next employed his sixteen hundred men in ravaging Chalcidia and Bodicea. Some of the towns also were taken by him. This is the end of chapter two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.com. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, 431 BC. Translated by Richard Crawley. Book 1. Chapter 3. Congress of the Peloponnesian Confederacy at Lacedaemon. The Athenians and Peloponnesians had these antecedent grounds of complaint against each other. The complaint of Corinth was that her colony of Potidaea and Corinthian and Peloponnesian citizens within it were being besieged. That of Athens against the Peloponnesians, that they had incited a town of hers, a member of her alliance and a contributor to her revenue, to revolt, and had come and were openly fighting against her on the side of the Potidaeans. For all this, war had not yet broken out. There was still truce for a while, for this was a private enterprise on the part of Corinth. But the siege of Potidaea put an end to her inaction. She had men inside it. Besides, she feared for the place. Immediately summoning the allies to Lacedaemon, she came and loudly accused Athens of breach of the treaty and aggression on the rights of Peloponnese. With her, the Aegeanidans, formerly unrepresented from fear of Athens, in secret proved not the least urgent of the advocates for war, asserting that they had not the independence guaranteed to them by the treaty. After extending the summons to any of their allies, and others who might have complaints to make of Athenian aggression, the Lacedaemons held their ordinary assembly, and invited them to speak. There were many who came forward and made their several accusations, among them the Megarians, in a long list of grievances, called special attention to the fact of their exclusion from the ports of the Athenian Empire and the market of Athens, in defiance of the treaty. Last of all, the Corinthians came forward, and having let those who preceded them inflame the Lacedaemonians, now followed with a speech to this effect. Lacedaemonians, the confidence which you feel in your constitution and social order inclines you to receive any reflections of ours on other powers with a certain skepticism. Hence springs your moderation. But hence also the rather limited knowledge which you betray in dealing with foreign politics. Time after time was our voice raised to warn you of the blows about to be dealt us by Athens, and time after time, instead of taking the trouble to ascertain the worth of our communications, you contented yourselves with suspecting the speakers of being inspired by private interest. And so, instead of calling these allies together before the blow fell, you have delayed to do so till we are smarting under it, allies among whom we have not the worst title to speak, as having the greatest complaints to make, complaints of Athenian outrage and Lacedaemonian neglect. Now if these assaults on the rights of Hellas had been made in the dark, you might be unac unacquainted with the facts and it would be our duty to enlighten you. As it is, long speeches are not needed where you see servitude accomplished for some of us, meditated for others, 
in particular for our allies, and prolonged preparations in the aggressor against the hour of war? Or what, pray, is the meaning of their reception of Corsera by fraud, and their holding it against us by force? What of the siege of Potidea? Places one of which lies most conveniently for any action against the Thracian towns, while the other would have contributed a very large navy to the Peloponnesians. For all this you are responsible. You it was who first allowed them to fortify their city after the Median War, and afterwards to erect the long walls. You who, then and now, are always depriving of freedom not only those whom they have enslaved, but also those who have as yet been your allies. For the true author of the subjugation of a people is not so much the immediate agent as the power which permits it having the means to prevent it, particularly if that power aspires to the glory of being the liberator of Hellas. We are at last assembled. It has not been easy to assemble, nor even now are our, our objects defined. We ought not to still be inquiring into the fact of our wrongs but into the means of our defense. For the aggressors which with matured plans to oppose our indecision have cast threats aside and betaken themselves to action. And we know what are the paths by which Athenian aggression travels, and how insidious it is its progress. A degree of confidence she may feel from the idea that your bluntness of perception prevents your noticing her but it is nothing to the impulse which her advance will receive from the knowledge that you see, but do not care to interfere. You, Lacedaemonians, of all the Hellenes are alone inactive, and defend yourselves not by doing anything, but by looking as if you would do something. You alone wait till the power of an enemy is becoming twice its original size, instead of crushing it in its infancy, and yet the world used to say that you were to be depended upon, but in your case, we fear, it said more than the truth. The Mede, we ourselves know, had time to come from the ends of the earth to Peloponnese, without any force of yours worthy of the name advancing to meet him. But this was a distant enemy. Well, Athens at all events is a near neighbor, and yet Athens you utterly disregard. Against Athens, you prefer to act on the defensive instead of on the offensive and to make it an affair of chances by deferring the struggle till she has grown far stronger than at first, and yet you know that on the whole the rock on which the barbarian was wrecked was himself, and that if our present enemy Athens has not again and again annihilated us, we owe it more to her blunders than to your protection. Indeed, expectations from you have before now been the ruin of some, whose faith induced them to omit preparation. We hope that none of you will consider these words of remonstrance to be rather words of hostility. Men remonstrate with friends who are in error, accusations they reserve for enemies who have wronged them. Besides, we consider that we have as good a right as any one to point out a neighbor's faults, particularly when we contemplate the great contrast between the two national characters, a contrast of which, as far as we can see, you have little perception. Having never yet considered what sort of antagonists you will encounter in the Athenians, how widely, how absolutely different from yourselves, the Athenians are addicted to innovation, and their designs are characterized by swiftness alike in conception and execution. You have a genius for keeping what you have got, accompanied by a total want of invention, and when forced to act you never go far enough. Again, they are adventurous beyond their power and daring beyond their judgment, and in danger they are sanguine. Your want is to attempt less than is justified by your power, to mistrust even what is sanctioned by your judgment, and to fancy that from danger there is no release. Further, there is promptitude on their side against procrastination on yours. They are never at home, you are never from it, for they hope by their absence to extend their acquisitions, you fear by your advance to endanger what you have left behind. They are swift to follow up a success, and slow to recoil from a reverse. Their bodies they spend ungrudgingly in their country's cause. Their intellect they jealously husband to be employed in her service. A scheme unexecuted is with them a positive loss. A successful enterprise, a comparative failure. The deficiency created by the miscarriage of an undertaking 
is soon filled up by fresh hopes, for they alone are enabled to call a thing hoped for a thing got, by the speed with which they act upon their resolutions. Thus they toil on in trouble and danger all the days of their life, with little opportunity for enjoying, being ever engaged in getting. Their only idea of a holiday is to do what the occasion demands, and to them the laborious occupation is less of a misfortune than the peace of a quiet life. To describe their right character in a word, one might truly say that they were born into the world to take no rest for themselves and to give none to others. Such is Athens, your antagonist, and yet, Lacedaemonians, you still delay, and fail to see that peace stays longest with those who are not more careful to use their power justly than to show their determination not to submit to injustice. On the contrary, your ideal of fair dealing is based on the principle that, if you do not injure others, you need not risk your own fortunes in preventing others from injuring you. Now you could scarcely have succeeded in such a policy even with a neighbor like yourselves. But, in the present instance, as we have just shown, your habits are old-fashioned as compared with theirs. It is the law as in art, so in politics, that improvements ever prevail, and though fixed usages may be best for undisturbed communities, constant necessities of action must be accompanied by the constant improvement of methods. Thus it happens that the vast experience of Athens has carried her further than you on the path of innovation. Here, at least, let your procrastination end. For the present, assist your allies and Potidaea in particular, as you promised, by a speedy invasion of Attica, and do not sacrifice friends and kindred to their bitterest enemies, and drive the rest of us in despair to some other alliance. Such a step would not be condemned either by the gods who received our oaths, or by the men who witnessed them. The breach of a treaty cannot be laid to the people whom desertion compels to seek new relations, but to the power that fails to assist its confederate. But if you will only act, we will stand by you. It would be unnatural for us to change, and never should we meet with such a conge congenial ally. For these reasons choose the right course and endeavor not to let Peloponnese under your supremacy degenerate from the prestige that it enjoyed under that of your ancestors. Such were the words of the Corinthians. There happened to be Athenian envoys present at Lacedaemon on other business. On hearing the speeches they thought themselves called upon to come before the Lacedaemonians. Their intention was not to offer a defense on any of the charges which the, which the cities brought against them, but to show on a comprehensive view that it was not a matter to be hastily decided upon, but one that demanded further consideration. There was also a wish to call attention to the great power of Athens, and to refresh the memory of the old and enlighten the ignorance of the young, from a notion that their words might have the effect of inducing them to prefer tranquility to war. So they came to the Lacedaemonians, and said that they too, if there was no objection, wished to speak to the assembly. They replied by inviting them to come forward. The Athenians advanced and spoke as follows. The object of our mission here was not to argue with your allies, but to attend to the matters on which our state dispatched us. However, the vehemence of the outcry that we hear against us has prevailed on us to come forward. It is not to combat the accusations of the cities. Indeed, you are not the judges before whom either we or they can plead but to prevent your taking the wrong course on matters of great importance, by yielding too readily to the persuasions of your allies. We also wish to show on a review of the whole indictment that we have a fair title to our possessions, and that our country has claims to consideration. We need not refer to remote antiquity. There we could appeal to the voice of tradition, but not to the experience of our audience. But to the Median War and contemporary history we must refer although we are rather tired of continually bringing the subject forward. In our action during that war, we ran great risk to obtain certain advantages. You had your share in the solid results. Do not try to rob us of all share in the good that the glory may do us. However, the story shall be told not so much to deprecate hostility as to testify against it, and to show, if you are so ill-advised as to enter into a struggle with Athens, what sort of antagonist she is likely to prove. 
We assert that at Marathon we were at the front, and faced the barbarian single-handed, that when he came the second time, unable to cope with him by land, we went on board our ships with all our people, and joined in the action at Salamis. This prevented his taking the Peloponnesian states in detail, and ravaging them with his fleet, when the multitude of his vessels would have made any combination for self-defense impossible. The best proof of this was furnished by the invader himself. Defeated at sea, he considered his power to be no longer what it had been, and retired as speedily as possible with the greater part of his army. Such, then, was the result of the matter, and it was clearly proved that it was on the fleet of Hellas that her cause depended. Well, to this result we contributed three very useful elements. The largest number of ships, the ablest commander, and the most unhesitating patriotism. Our contingent of ships was little less than two-thirds of the four, whole four hundred. The commander was Themistocles, through whom chiefly it was that the battle took place in the straits, the acknowledged salvation of our cause. Indeed, this was the reason of your receiving him with honors, such as had never been accorded to any foreign visitor. While for daring patriotism we had no competitors, receiving no reinforcements from behind, seeing everything in front of us already subjugated, we had the spirit, after abandoning our city, after sacrificing our property, instead of deserting the remainder of the League or depriving them of our services by dispersing, to throw ourselves into our ships and meet the danger, without a thought of resenting your neglect to assist us. We assert, therefore, that we conferred on you quite as much as we received, for you had a stake to fight for. The cities which you had left were still filled with your homes and you had the prospect of enjoying them again, and your coming was prompted quite as much by fear for yourselves as for us. At all events, you never appeared till we had nothing left to lose, but we left behind us a city that was a city no longer, and staked our lives for a city that had an existence only in desperate hope, and so bore our full share in your deliverance and in ours. But if we had copied others, and allowed fears for our territory to make us give in our adhesion, to the Mede before you came, or if we had suffered our ruin to break our spirit and prevent us embarking in our ships, your naval inferiority would, would have made a sea fight unnecessary, and his objects would have been peaceably obtained. Surely, Lacedaemonians, neither by the patriotism that we displayed at that crisis, nor by the wisdom of our councils, do we merit our extreme unpopularity with the Hellenes. Not at least unpopularity for our empire. That empire we acquired by no violent means, but because you were unwilling to prosecute to its conclusion the war against the barbarian, and because the allies attached themselves to us, and simultaneously asked us to assume command. And the nature of the case first compelled us to advance our empire to its present height, fear being our principal motive, though honor and interest afterwards came in. And at last, when almost all hated us, when some had already revolted and had been subdued, when you had ceased to be the friends that you once were, and had become objects of suspicion and dislike, it appeared no longer safe to give up our empire, especially as all who left us would fall to you. And no one can quarrel with a people for making, in matters of tremendous risk, the best provision that it can for its interest. You, at all events, Lacedaemonians, have used your supremacy to settle the states in Peloponnese, as is agreeable to you. And if at the period of which we were speaking you had persevered to the end of the matter, and, in, and had incurred hatred in your command, we are sure that you would have made yourselves just as galling to the Allies, and would have been forced to choose between a strong government and danger to yourselves. It follows that it was not a very wonderful action, or contrary to the common practice of mankind. If we did accept an empire that was offered to us, and refused to give it up under the pressure of three of the strongest motives, fear, honor, and interest. And it was not we who set the example, for it has always been law that the weaker should be subject to the stronger. Besides, we believed ourselves to be worthy of our position, and so you thought us till now, when calculations of interest have made you take up the cry of justice, a consideration with no one ever yet brought forward to hinder his ambition when he had a chance of gaining anything by might and praise is due to all who, 
if not so superior to human nature as to refuse dominion, yet respect justice more than their position compels them to. We imagine that our moderation would be best demonstrated by the conduct of others who should be placed in our position, but even our equity has very unreasonably subjected us to condemnation instead of approval. Our abatement of our rights in the contract trials with our allies, and our causing them to be decided by impartial laws at Athens, have gained us the character of being litigious, and none care to inquire why this reproach is not brought against other imperial powers, who treat their subjects with less moderation than we do, the secret being that where force can be used, law is not needed. But our subjects are so habituated to associate with us as equals, that any defeat whatever that clashes with their notions of justice, whether it proceeds from a legal judgment or from the power which our empire gives us, makes them forget to be grateful for allowing for being allowed to retain most of their possessions, and more vexed at a part being taken than if we had from the first cast law aside and openly gratified our, gratified our covetousness. If we had done so, not even would they have disputed that the weaker must give way to the stronger. Men's indignation, it seems, is more excited by legal wrong than by violent wrong. The first looks like being cheated by an equal the second like being compelled by the superior. At all events, they contrive to put up with much worse treatment than this from the Mede, yet they think our rule severe, and this is to be expected, for the present always weighs heavy on the conquered. This at least is certain. If you were to succeed in overthrowing us and in taking our place, you would speedily lose the popularity with which fear of us has invested you. If your policy of today is it all to tally with the sample of that you gave of it during the brief period of your command against the Mede? Not only is your life at home regulated by rules and institutions incompatible with those of others, but your citizens abroad act neither on these rules, nor on those which are recognized by the rest of Hellas. Take time, then, in forming your resolution, as the matter is of great importance and do not be persuaded by the opinions and complaints of others to bring, bring trouble on yourselves, but consider the vast influence of accident and war before you are engaged in it. As it continues, it generally becomes an affair of chances, chances from which neither of us is exempt, and whose event we must risk in the dark. It is a common mistake in going to war to begin at the wrong end, to act first and wait for disaster to discuss the matter. But we are not yet by any means so misguided, nor, so far as we can see, are you. Accordingly, while it is still open to us both to choose, all right, choose a right, we bid you not to dissolve the treaty, or to break your oaths, but to have our differences settled by arbitration according to our agreement. Or else we take the gods who heard the oaths to witness, and if you begin hostilities, whatever line of action you choose, we will try not to be behind hand in repelling you. Such were the words of the Athenians. After the Lacedaemonians had heard the complaints of the allies against the Athenians, and the observations of the latter, they made all withdraw, and consulted by themselves on the question before them. The opinions of the majority all led to the same conclusion. The Athenians were open aggressors, and war must be declared at once. But Archidamus, the Lacedaemonian king, came forward, who had the reputation of being at once a wise and a moderate man, and made the following speech. I have not lived so long, Lacedaemonians, without having had the experience of many wars, and I see those among you of the same age as myself who will not fall into the common misfortune of longing for war from inexperience or from a belief in its advantage and its safety. This, the war on which you are now debating, would be one of the greatest magnitude, on a sober consideration of the matter. In a struggle with Peloponnesians and neighbors, our strength is one of the same character and it is possible to move swiftly on the different points. But a struggle with a people who live in a distant land, who have also an extraordinary familiarity with the sea, and who are in the highest state of preparation in every other department, with wealth, private and public, with ships and horses and heavy infantry, and a population such as no one other Hellenic place can equal, and lastly a number of tributary allies, what can justify us in rashly beginning such a struggle? Wherein is our trust that we should rush in unprepared? Is it in our ships? 
there we are inferior. While if we are to practice and become a match for them, time must intervene. Is it in our money? There we have a far greater deficiency. We neither have it in our treasury, nor are we ready to contribute it from our private funds. Confidence might possibly be felt in our superiority in heavy infantry and population, which will enable us to invade and devastate their lands. But the Athenians have plenty of other land in their empire, and can import what they want by sea. Again, if we are to attempt an insurrection of their allies, these will have to be supported with a fleet, most of them being islanders. What, then, is to be our war? For unless we can either beat them at sea, or deprive them of the revenues which feed their navy, we shall meet with little but disaster. Meanwhile, our honor will be pledged to, keep, to keeping on, particularly if it be the opinion that we began the quarrel. For let us never be elated by the fatal hope of the war being quickly ended by the devastation of their lands. I fear, rather, that we may leave it as a legacy to our children. So improbable is it that the Athenian spirit will be the slave of their land, or Athenian experience be cowed by war. Not that I would bid you to be so unfeeling as to suffer them to injure your allies, and to refrain from unmasking their intrigues, but I do bid you not to take up arms at once, but to send and remonstrate with them in a tone not too suggestive of war, nor again too suggestive of submission, and to employ the interval in perfecting our own preparations. The means will be, first, the acquisition of allies. Hellenic or barbarian, it matters not, so long as they are an accession to our strength, naval or pecuniary. I say Hellenic or barbarian, because the odium of such an accession to all who like us are the objects of the designs of the Athenians is taken away by the law of self-preservation. And secondly, the development of our home resources. If they listen to our assembly, so much the better. But if not, after the lapse of two or three years, our position will have become materially strengthened and we can then attack them if we think proper. Perhaps by that time the sight of our preparations, backed by language equally insignificant, will have disposed them to submission, while their land is still untouched, and while their counsels may be directed to the retention of advantages as, as yet undestroyed. For the only light in which you can view their land is that of a hostage in your hands, a hostage the more valuable the better it is cultivated. This you ought to spare as long as possible, and not make them desperate, and so increase the difficulty of dealing with them. For if while still unprepared, hurried away by the complaints of our allies, we are induced to lay it waste, have a care that we do not bring deep disgrace and deep perplexity upon Peloponnese. Complaints, whether of communities or individuals, it is impossible. It is possible to, to adjust. But war undertaken by a coalition for sectional interests, whose progress there is no means of foreseeing, does not easily admit of creditable settlement. And none need think it cowardice for a number of confederates to pause before they attack a single city. The Athenians have allies as numerous as our own, and allies that pay tribute. And war is a matter not so much of arms as of money, which makes arms of use. And this is more than ever true in a struggle between a continental and a maritime power. First, then, let us provide money, and not allow ourselves to be carried away by the talk of our allies before we have done so, as we shall have the largest share of responsibility for the consequences, be they good or bad. We also have a right to a tranquil inquiry respecting them. And the slowness and procrastination, the parts of our character that are most assailed by their criticism, need not make you blush. If we undertake the war without preparation, we should by hastening its commencement only delay its conclusion. Further, a free and a famous city has through all time been ours. The quality which they condemn is really nothing but a wise moderation, thanks to its possession. We alone do not become insolent in success and give way less than others in misfortune. We are not carried away by the pleasure of hearing ourselves cheered on to risks which our judgment condemns. Nor, if annoyed, are we any the more convinced by attempts to exacerbate us by accusation. We are both warlike and wise, and it is our sense of order that makes us so. We are warlike because self-control contains honor as a chief constituent, and honor bravery. And we are wise because we are educated with too little learning to despise the laws, and with too severe a self-control to disobey them. 
and are brought up not to be too knowing in useless matters, such as the knowledge which can give a specious criticism of an enemy's plans and theory, but fails to assail them with equal success in practice, but are taught to consider that the schemes of our enemies are not dissimilar to our own, and that the freaks of chance are not determinable by calculation. In practice, we always base our preparations against an enemy on the assumption that his plans are good. Indeed, it is right to rest our hopes, not on a belief in his blunders, but on the soundness of our provisions. Nor ought we to believe that there is much difference between man and man, but to think that the superiority lies with him who was reared in the severest school. These practices, then, which our ancestors have delivered to us, and by whose maintenance we have always profited, must not be given up, and we must not be hurried into deciding in a day's brief space a question which concerns many lives and fortunes and many cities, and in which honor is deeply involved, but we must decide calmly. This is our strength, peculiarly enables us to do. As for the Athenians, send to them on the matter of Potidea, send on the matter of the alleged wrongs of the allies, particularly as they are prepared with legal satisfaction, and to proceed against one who offers arbitration as against a wrongdoer, law forbids. Meanwhile, do not omit a preparation for war. This decision will be the best for yourselves, the most terrible to your opponents. Such were the words of Archidamus. Last came forward Thenelides, one of the ephors for that year, and spoke to the Lacedaemonians as follows. The long speech of the Athenians I do not pretend to understand. They said a good deal in praise of themselves, but nowhere denied that they are injuring our allies in Peloponnese. And yet if they behaved well against the Mede then, but ill towards us now, they deserve double punishment for having ceased to be good and for having become bad. We meanwhile are the same then and now, and shall not, if we are wise, disregard the wrongs of our allies or put off till tomorrow the duty of assisting those who must suffer today. Others have much money and ships and horses, but we have good allies whom we must not give up to the Athenians, nor by lawsuits and words decide the matter, as it is anything but in word that we are harmed, but render instant and powerful help. And let us not be told that it is fitting for us to deliberate under injustice. Long deliberation is rather fitting for those who have injustice in contemplation. Vote, therefore, Lacedaemonians, for war, as the honor of Sparta demands, and neither allow the further aggrandizement of Athens, nor betray our allies to ruin, but with the gods let us advance against the aggressors. With these words he, as Ephor, himself put the question to the assembly of the Lacedaemonians. He said that he could not determine which was the loudest acclamation. Their mode of decision is by acclamation, not by voting. The fact being that he wished to make them declare their opinion openly, and thus to increase their ardor for war. Accordingly, he said, All Lacedaemonians who are of opinion that the treaty has been broken and that Athens is guilty, leave your seats and go there, pointing out a certain place. All who are of the opposite opinion, there. They accordingly stood up and divided, and those who held that the treaty had been broken were in a decided majority. Summoning their allies, they told them that their opinion was that Athens had been guilty of injustice, but that they wished to convoke all the allies and put it to the vote, in order that they might make war if they decided to do so on a common resolution. Having thus gained their point, the delegates returned home at once. The Athenian envoys a little later, when they had dispatched the objectives of their mission. This decision of the assembly, judging that the treaty had been broken, was made in the fourteenth year of the thirty years' truce, which was entered into after the affair of Euboea. The Lacedaemonians voted that the treaty had been broken, and that the war must be declared, not so much because they were persuaded by the arguments of the allies, as because they feared the growth of the power of the Athenians, seeing most of Hellas already subject to them. This is the end of chapter 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Translated by Richard Crawley Book One Chapter Four From the End of the Persian to the Beginning of the Peloponnesian War The Progress from Supremacy to Empire the way in which Athens came to be placed in the circumstances under which her power grew was this. After the Medes had returned from Europe, defeated by sea and land by the Hellenes, and after those of them who had fled with their ships to Mycale had been destroyed, Leotychides, king of the Lacedaemonians, the commander of the Hellenes at Mycale, departed home with the allies from Peloponnese. But the Athenians and the allies from Ionia and Hellespont, who had now revolted from the king, remained and laid siege to Sestos, which was still held by the Medes. After wintering before it, they became masters of the place on its evacuation by the barbarians, and after this they sailed away from Hellespont to their respective cities. Meanwhile, the Athenian people, after the departure of the barbarian from their country, at once proceeded to carry over their children and wives, and such property as they had left, from the places where they had, been, they had deposited them, and prepared to rebuild their city and their walls. For only isolated portions of the circumference had been left standing, and most of the houses were in ruins, though a few remained in which the Persian grandees had taken up their quarters. Perceiving what they were going to do, the Lacedaemonians sent out an embassy to Athens. They would have themselves preferred to see neither her nor any other city in possession of a wall, though here they acted principally at the instigation of their allies, who were alarmed at the strength of her newly acquired navy and the valor which she had displayed in the war with the Medes. They begged her not only to abstain from building walls for herself, but also to join them in throwing down the walls that still held together of the ultra-Peloponnesian cities. The real meaning of their advice, the suspicion that it contained against the Athenians, was not proclaimed. It was urged that so the barbarian, in the event of a third invasion, would not have any strong place, such as he now had in Thebes. For his base of operations, and that the Peloponnese would suffice for all as a base for retreat and offense. After the Lacedaemonians had thus spoken, they were, on the advice of Themistocles, immediately dismissed by the Athenians, with the answer that ambassadors should be sent to Sparta to discuss the question. Themistocles told the Athenians to send him off with all speed to Lacedaemon, but not to dispatch his colleagues as soon as they had selected them, but to wait until they had raised their wall to the height from which defense was possible. Meanwhile, the whole population in the city was to labor at the wall, the Athenians, their wives, and their children, sparing no edifice, private or public, which might be of any use to the work, but throwing all down. After giving these instructions, and adding that he would be responsible for all other matters there, he departed. Arrived at Lacedaemon, he did not seek an audience with the authorities, but tried to gain time and made excuses. When any of the government asked him why he did not appear in the assembly, he would say that he was waiting for his colleagues, who had been detained in Athens by some engagement. However, that he expected their speedy arrival, and wondered that they were not yet there. At first the Lacedaemonians trusted the words of Themistocles, through their friendship for him, but when others arrived, all distinctly declaring that the work was going on, and already attaining some elevation, they did not know how to disbelieve it. Aware of this, he told them that rumors are deceptive, and should not be trusted. They should send some reputable persons from Sparta to inspect whose report might be trusted. They dispatched them accordingly. Concerning these, Themistocles secretly sent word to the Athenians to detain them as far as possible, without putting them under open constraint, and not to let them go until they had themselves returned. 
for his colleagues had now joined him. Abronicus, son of Lysicles, and Aristides, son of Lysimachus, with the news that the wall was sufficiently advanced, and he feared that when the Lacedaemonians heard the facts, they might refuse to let them go. So the Athenians detained the envoys according to his message, and Themistocles had an audience with the Lacedaemonians, and at last openly told them that Athens was now fortified sufficiently to protect its inhabitants. That any embassy which the Lacedaemonians or their allies might wish to send to them should in future proceed on the assumption that the people to whom they were going was able to distinguish both its own and the general interests. That when the Athenians thought fit to abandon their city and to embark in their ships, they ventured on that perilous step without consulting them, and that, on the other hand, wherever they had deliberated with the Lacedaemonians, they had proved themselves to be in judgment second to none. That they now thought it fit that their city should have a wall, and that this would be more for the advantage of both the citizens of Athens and the Hellenic Confederacy. For without equal military strength it was impossible to contribute equal or fair counsel to the common interest. It followed, he observed, either that all the members of the Confederacy should be without walls, or that the present step should be considered a right one. The Lacedaemonians did not betray any open signs of anger against the Athenians at what they had heard. The embassy, it seems, was prompted not by a desire to obstruct but to guide the counsels of their government. Besides, Spartan feeling was at that time very friendly towards Athens on account of the patriotism which she had displayed in the struggle with the Mede. Still, the defeat of their wishes could not but cause them secret annoyance. The envoys of each state departed home without complaint. In this way the Athenians walled their city in a little while. To this day the building shows signs of the haste of its execution. The foundations are laid of stones of all kinds, and in some places not wrought or fitted, but placed just in the order in which they were brought by the different hands. And many columns, too, from tombs and sculptured stones were put in with the rest, for the bounds of the city were extended at every point of the circumference. And so they laid hands on everything, without exception in their haste. Themistocles also persuaded them to finish the walls of Piraeus, which had been begun before, in his year of office as Archon, being influenced alike by the fineness of a locality that has three natural harbors, and by the great start which the Athenians would gain in the acquisition of power by becoming a naval people. For he first ventured to tell them to stick to the sea, and forthwith began to lay the foundations of empire. It was by his advice, too, that they built the walls of that thickness which can still be discerned round Piraeus the stones being brought up by two wagons meeting each other. Between the walls thus formed there was neither rubble nor mortar, but great stones hewn square and fit fitted together, cramped to each other on the out outside with iron and, land and lead. About half the height that he intended was finished. His idea was by their size and thickness to keep off the attacks of an enemy. He thought that they might be adequately defended by a small garrison of invalids, and the rest be freed for service in the fleet. For the fleet claimed most of his attention. He saw, as I think, that the approach by sea was easier for the king's army than that by land. He also thought Piraeus more valuable than the upper city. Indeed, he was always advising the Athenians, if a day should come when they were hard-pressed by land, to go down into Piraeus and defy the world with their fleet. Thus, therefore, the Athenians completed their wall, and commenced their other buildings immediately after the retreat of the Mede. Meanwhile, Pausanias, son of Cleambrotus, was sent out from Lacedaemon as commander-in-chief of the Hellenes, with twenty ships from Peloponnese. With him sailed the Athenians with thirty ships, and a number of the other allies. They made an expedition against Cyprus, and subdued most of the island and afterwards against Byzantium, which was in the hands of the Medes, and compelled it to surrender. This event took place while the Spartans were still supreme. But the violence of Pisanias had already begun to be disagreeable to the Hellenes, particularly to the Ionians and the newly liberated populations. 
These resorted to the Athenians and requested them as their kinsmen to become their leaders, and to stop any attempt at violence on the part of Pausanias. The Athenians accepted their overtures, and determined to put down any attempt of the kind to settle everything else as their interests might seem to demand. In the meantime, the Lacedaemonians recalled Pausanias for an investigation of the reports which had reached them. Manifold and grave accusations had been brought against him by Hellenes arriving in Sparta, and, to all appearance, there had been in him more of the mimicry of a despot than of the attitude of a general. As it happened, his recall came just at the time when the hatred which he had inspired had induced the allies to desert him. The soldiers from Peloponnese accepted, and to range themselves by the side of the Athenians. On his arrival at Lacedaemon, he was censured for his private acts of oppression, but was acquitted on the heaviest counts and pronounced not guilty. It must be known that the charge of Medism formed one of the principal, and to all appearance one of the best founded, articles against him. The Lacedaemonians did not, however, restore him to his command, but sent out Dorcas and certain others with, with a small force, who found the allies no longer inclined to concede to the supremacy. Perceiving this, they departed, and the Lacedaemonians did not send out any to succeed them. They feared for those who went out a deterioration similar to that observable in Pausanias. Besides, they desired to be rid of the Median war, and were satisfied of the competency of the Athenians for the position, and of their friendship at the time toward themselves. The Athenians, having thus succeeded to the supremacy by the voluntary act of the allies through their hatred of Parsanius, fixed which cities were to contribute money against the barbarian, which ships, their professed object being to retaliate for their sufferings by ravaging the king's country. Now was the time that the office of Treasurers for Hellas was first instituted by the Athenians. These officers received the tribute, as the money contributed was called. The tribute was first fixed at 460 talents. The common treasury was at Delos, and the congresses were held in the temple. Their supremacy commenced with independent allies who acted on the resolutions of a common congress. It was marked by the following undertakings in war and in administration during the interval between the Median and the present war against the barbarian, against their own rebel allies, and against the Peloponnesian powers, which would come in contact with them on various occasions. My excuse for relating these events, and for venturing on this digression, is that this passage of history has been omitted by all my predecessors, who have confined themselves either to Hellenic history before the Median War, or the Median War itself. Hellenicus, it is true, did touch on these events in his Athenian history, but he is somewhat concise and not accurate in his dates. Besides, the history of these events contains an ex explanation of the growth of the Athenian Empire. First, the Athenians besieged and captured Ion on the Strymon from the Medes, and made slaves of the inhabitants, being under the command of Simon, son of Miltiades. Next, they enslaved Cyros, the island in the Aegean, containing a Dolopian population, and colonized it themselves. This was followed by a war against Chrysis in which the rest of Euboea remained neutral, in which was ended by surrender on conditions. After this, Naxus left the confederacy, and a war ensued, and she had to return after a siege. This was the first instant of the engagement being broken by the subjugation of an allied city, a precedent which was followed by that of the rest in, order, in the order which circumstances prescribed. Of all the causes of defection, that connected with arrears of tribute and vessels, and with failure of service, was the chief. For the Athenians were very severe and exacting, and made themselves offensive by applying the screw of necessity to men who were not used to, and in fact not disposed for any continuous labor. In some other respects, the Athenians were not the old popular rulers they had been at first, and if they had more than their fair share of service, it was correspondingly easy for them to reduce any that tried to leave the confederacy. For this the allies had themselves to blame. The wish to get off service, making most of the arrangement to pay their share of the expense in money instead of in ships, and so to avoid having to leave their homes. 
Thus, while Athens was increasing her navy with the funds which they contributed, a revolt always found them without resources or experience for war. Next we come to the actions by land and by sea at the river Eurymedon, between the Athenians and their allies, and the Medes, when the Athenians won both battles on the same day under the conduct of Simon, son of Miltiades, and captured and destroyed the whole Phoenician fleet, consisting of two hundred vessels. Some time afterwards occurred the defection of the Thasians, caused by disagreements about the marts on the opposite coast of Thrace, and about the mine in their possession. Sailing with a fleet to Thassos, the Athenians defeated them at sea and effected a landing on the island. About the same time, they sent ten thousand settlers of their own citizens and the allies to settle the place then called Aenea Hodoi, or Nine Ways, now Amphipolis. They succeeded in gaining possession of the Aenea Hodoi from the, Ade from the Edonians, but on advancing into the interior of Thrace were cut off in Derbescus, a town of the Edonians, by the assembled Thracians, who regarded the settlement of the place and Hadoi as an act of hostility. Meanwhile, the Thasians, being defeated in the field and suffering siege, appealed to Lacedaemon, and desired her to assist them by an invasion of Attica. Without informing Athens, she promised and intended to do so, but was prevented by the occurrence of the earthquake accompanied by the secession of the Helots and the Thuriots and Athenians of the Perioisi to Ithom. Most of the Helots were the descendants of the old Messenians that were enslaved in the famous war, and so all of them came to be called Messenians. So the Lacedaemonians, being engaged in war with the rebels in Ithom, the Thasians in the third year of the siege obtained terms from the, from the Athenians by raising their walls, delivering up their ships, and arranging to pay the monies demanded at once, and tribute in the future, giving up their possessions on the continent together with the mine. The Lacedaemonians, meanwhile, finding the war against the rebels in Athome likely to last, invoked the aid of their allies, and especially of the Athenians, who came in some force under the command of Simon. The reason for this pressing summons lay in their reputed skill in siege operations. A long siege had taught the Lacedaemonians their own deficiency in this art, else they would have taken the place by assault. The first open quarrel between the Lacedaemonians and the Athenians arose out of this expedition. The Lacedaemonians, when assault failed to take the place, apprehensive of the enterprising and revolutionary character of the Athenians, and further looking upon them as of alien extraction, began to fear that if they remained, they might be tempted by the besieged in Athome to attempt some political changes. They accordingly dismissed them alone of the allies, without declaring their suspicions, but merely saying that they had now no need of them. But the Athenians, aware that their dismissal did not proceed from the more honorable reason of the two, but from suspicions which had been conceived, went away deeply offended, and conscious of having done nothing to merit such treatment from the Lacedaemonians. And the instant that they returned home, they broke off the alliance which had been made against the Mede, and allied themselves with Sparta's enemy, Argos, each of the contracting parties taking the same oaths and making the same alliance with the Thessalians. Meanwhile, the rebels in Ithome, unwilling to prolong further a ten years' resistance, surrendered to Lacedaemon, the conditions being that they should depart from Peloponnese under safe conduct and should never set foot in it again. Anyone who might hereafter be found there was to be the slave of his captor. It must be known that the Lacedaemonians had an old oracle from Delphi to the effect that they should let go the suppliant of Zeus at Ithome. So they went forth with their children and their wives, and being received by Athens from the hatred that she now felt for the Lacedaemonians, were located at Napictus, which she had lately taken from the Ozolian Locrians. The Athenians received another addition to their confederacy in the Megarians who left the Lacedaemonian alliance, annoyed by a war about boundaries forced on them by Corinth. The Athenians occupied Megara and Pegai, and built the Megarians their long walls from the city to Nisaea, in which they placed an Athenian garrison. This was the principal cause of the Corinthians conceiving such a deadly hatred against Athens. Meanwhile, Inaros, son of Semecticus, a Libyan king of the Libyans on the Egyptian border, 
having his headquarters at Maria, the town above Pharos, caused a revolt of almost the whole of Egypt from King Artaxerxes, and, placing himself at, his, at its head, invited the Athenians to his assistance. Abandoning a Cyprian expedition upon which they happened to be engaged with two hundred ships of their own and their allies, they arrived in Egypt and sailed the sea into the Nile, and making themselves masters of the river and two-thirds of Memphis, addressed themselves to the attack of the remaining third, which is called White Castle. Within it were Persians and Medes who had taken refuge there, and Egyptians who had not joined the rebellion. Meanwhile the Athenians, making a descent from their fleet upon Helii, were engaged by a force of Corinthians and Epidarians, and the Corinthians were victorious. Afterward, the Athenians engaged Peloponnesian fleet off Secrophalia, and the Athenians were victorious. Subsequently, war broke out between Aegina and Athens, and there was a great battle at sea off Aegina between the Athenians and the Aegeanetans, each being aided by their allies in which victory remained with the Athenians, who took seventy of the enemy's ships, and landed in the country and commenced a siege under the command of Leocrates, son of Strobius. Upon this, the Peloponnesians, desirous of aiding the Aegeanetans, threw into Aegina a force of three hundred heavy infantry, who had before been serving with the Corinthians and Epidarians. Meanwhile, the Corinthians and their allies occupied the heights of Gerenea, and marched down into the Megarid, in the belief that, with a large force absent in Aegina and Egypt, Athens would be unable to help the Megarians without raising the siege of Aegina. But the Athenians, instead of moving the army of Aegina, raised a force of the old and young men that had been left in the city, and marched into the Megarid under the command of Myronides. After a drawn battle with the Corinthians, the rival hosts parted, each with the impression that they had gained the victory. The Athenians, however, if anything, had rather the advantage, and on the departure of the Corinthians set up a trophy. Urged by the taunts of the elders in their city, the Corinthians made their preparations, and about twelve days afterwards came and set up their trophy as victors. Sallying out from Megara, the Athenians cut off the party that was employed in erecting the trophy, and engaged and defeated the rest. In the retreat of the vanquished army, considerable division, pressed by the pursuers and mistaking the road, dashed into a field on some private property, with a deep trench all around it, and no way out. Being acquainted with the place, the Athenians hemmed their front with heavy infantry, and, placing the light troops round in a circle, stoned all who had gone in. Corinth here suffered a severe blow. The bulk of her army continued its retreat home. About this time the Athenians began to build the long walls to the sea, that towards Phalerum, and that towards Piraeus. Meanwhile, the Phocians made an expedition against Doris, the old home of the Lacedaemonians, containing the towns of Boeum, Catinium, and Erinium. They had taken one of these towns when the Lacedaemonians under Nicomedes, son of Cleombrotus, commanding for King Pleistoanax, son of Pausanias, who was still a minor, came to the aid of the Dorians with fifteen hundred heavy infantry of their own, and ten thousand of their allies. After compelling the Phocians to restore the town on conditions, they began their retreat. The route by sea across the Crissian Gulf exposed them to the risk of being stopped by the Athenian fleet, that across Geronea seemed scarcely safe. The Athenians holding Megara and Pagai for the pass was a difficult one, and was always guarded by the Athenians. And, in the present instance, the Lacedaemonians had information that they meant to dispute their passage, so they resolved to remain in Boeotia, and to consider which would be the safest line of march. They had also another reason for this resolve. Secret encouragement had been given them by a party in Athens, who hoped to put an end to the reign of democracy and the building of the Long Walls. Meanwhile, the Athenians marched against them with their whole levy and a thousand Argives, and the respective contingents of the rest of their allies. Altogether there were fourteen thousand strong. The march was prompted by the notion that the Lacedaemonians were at a loss how to effect their passage, and also by suspicions of an attempt to overthrow the democracy. Some cavalry also joined the Athenians from their Thessalian allies, but these went over to the Lacedaemonians during the battle. 
The battle was fought at Tanagra in Boeotia. After a heavy loss on both sides, victory declared for the Lacedaemonians and their allies. After entering the Megarid and cutting down the fruit trees, the Lacedaemonians returned home across Gerania and the Isthmus. Sixty-two days after the battle of the, the Athenians marched into Boeotia under the command of Myronides, defeated the Boeotians in, a, in battle at Enophita, and became masters of Boeotia and Phocis. They dismantled the walls of the Tanagrians, took a hundred of the richest men of, of the Opuntian Locrians as hostages, and finished their own long walls. This was followed by the surrender of the Genetians to Athens on conditions. They pulled down their walls, gave up their ships, and agreed to pay tribute in the future. The Athenians sailed round Peloponnese under Tolmides, son of Tomlaeus, burnt the arsenal of Lacedaemon, took Chalcis, a town of the Corinthians, and in a desert upon Sicyon defeated the Sicyonians in battle. Meanwhile, the Athenians in Egypt and their allies were still there, and encountered all the vicissitudes of war. First, the Athenians were masters of Egypt, and the king sent Megabazus, a Persian, to Lacedaemon with money to bribe the Peloponnesians to invade Attica, and so draw off the Athenians from Egypt. Finding that the matter made no progress, and that the money was only being wasted, he recalled Megabazus, that the remainder of the money, and sent Megabazus, son of Zopreus, a Persian, with a large army to Egypt. Arriving by land, he defeated the Egyptians and their allies in a battle, and drove the Hellenes out of Memphis, and at length shut them up in the island of Prosipotus, where he besieged them for a year and six months. At last, draining the canal of its waters, which he diverted into another channel, he left their ships high and dry, and joined most of the island to the mainland, and then marched over on foot and captured it. Thus the enterprise of the Hellenes came to ruin after six years of war. Of all that large host, a few traveling through Libya reached Cyrene in safety, but most of them perished. And thus Egypt returned to its subjection to the king, except Amartius, the king of the marshes, whom they were unable to capture from the extent of the marsh. The marshmen, being also the most warlike of the Egyptians. Inaros, the Libyan king, the sole author of the Egyptian revolt, was betrayed, taken, and crucified. Meanwhile, a relieving squadron of fifty vessels had sailed from Athens and the rest of the confederacy for Egypt. They put into shore at the Mendesian mouth of the Niles, in total ignorance of what had occurred. Attacked on the land side by the troops, and from the sea by the Phoenician navy, most of the ships were destroyed. The few remaining were saved by retreat. Such was the end of the great expedition of the Athenians and their allies to Egypt. Meanwhile, Orestes, son of Ephecratitis, the Thessalian king, being in exile from Thessaly, persuaded the Athenians to restore him. Taking with them the Boeotians and Phocians, their allies, the Athenians marched to Pharsalus in Thessaly. They became masters of the country, though only in the immediate vicinity of the camp, beyond which they could, could not go for fear of the Thessalian cavalry. But they failed to take the city or to attain any of the other objects of their expedition, and returned home with Orestes without having effected anything. Not long after this, a thousand of the Athenians embarked in the vessels that were at Pagai. Pagai, it must be remembered, was now theirs, and sailed along the coast to Sicyon under the command of Pericles, son of Xanthippus. Landing in Sicyon, and defeating the Sicyonians who engaged them, they immediately took with them the Achaeans, and, sailing across, marched against and laid siege to Anaidi in Acarnania. Failing, however, to take it, they returned home. Three years afterwards, a truce was made between the Peloponnesians and the Athenians for five years. Released from Hellenic war, the Athenians made an expedition to Cyprus, with two hundred vessels of their own and their allies, under the command of Simon. Sixty of these were detached as Egypt, at the instance of Amartius, the king of the marshes. The rest laid siege to Kidium, from which, however, they were compelled to retire by the death of Simon and by scarcity of provisions. Sailing off Salamis in Cyprus, they fought with the Phoenicians, Cyprians, and Cilicians by land and sea, and, being victorious on both elements, departed home, 
and with them the returned squadron from Egypt. After this, the Lacedaemonians marched out on a sacred war, and, becoming masters of the temple at Delphi, it in the hands of the Delphians, immediately after their retreat, the Athenians marched out, became masters of the temple, and placed it in the hands of the Phocians. Some time after this, Orchomenus, Chironia, and some other places in Boeotia, being in the hands of the Boeotian exiles, the Athenians marched against the above-mentioned hostile places, which with a thousand Athenian heavy infantry and the allied contingents, under, under the command of Tolmides, son of Tolmaeus. They took Chironia and made slaves of the inhabitants, and, leaving a garrison, commenced their return. On their road, they were attacked at Chironia by the Boeotian exiles from Orchomenes, with some Locrians and Euboean exiles and others who were of the same way of thinking, were defeated in battle, and some killed, others taken captive. The Athenians evacuated all Boeotia by a treaty providing for the recovery of the men, and the exiled Boeotians returned, and with all the rest regained their independence. This was soon afterwards followed by the revolt of Euboea from Athens. Pericles had already crossed over with an army of Athenians to the island, when news was brought to him that Megara had, had revolted, that the Peloponnesians were on the point of invading Attica, and that the Athenian garrison had been cut off by the Megarians, with the exception of a few who had taken refuge in Nicaea. The Megarians had introduced the Corinthians, Sicyonians, and Epidorians into the town before they revolted. Meanwhile, Pericles brought his army back in all haste from Euboea. After this, the Peloponnesians marched into Attica as far as Eleusis and Thrius, ravaging the country under the conduct of King Plastoinax, the son of Pausanias, and without advancing farther, returned home. The Athenians then crossed over again to Euboea, under the command of Pericles, and subdued the whole of the island. All but Histia was settled by convention. The Histians they expelled from their homes and occupied their territory themselves. Not long after their return from Euboea, they made a truce with the Lacedaemonians, and their allies for thirty years, giving up the posts which they occupied in Peloponnese, Nicaea, Pegaea, Troizen, and Achaia. In the sixth year of the truce, war broke out between the Samians and Milesians, about Prien. Worsted in the war, the Milesians came to Athens with loud complaints against the Samians. In this they were joined by certain private persons from Samos itself, who wished to revolutionize the government. Accordingly, the Athenians sailed to Samos with forty ships and set up a democracy, took hostages from the Samians, fifty boys and as many men, lodged them in Lemnos, and after leaving a garrison in the island returned home. But some of the Samians had not remained in the island, but had fled to the continent. Making an agreement with the most powerful of those in the city, and an alliance with Pisithinus, son of Histaspes, the then satrap of Sardis, they got together a force of seven hundred mercenaries, and under cover of night crossed over to Samos. Their first step was to raise on the commons, most of whom they secured. Their next to steal their hostages from Lemnos, after which they revolted, gave up the Athenian garrison, left with them and its commanders to Pisithinus, and instantly prepared for an expedition against Miletus. The Byzantines also revolted with them. As soon as the Athenians heard the news, they sailed with sixty ships against Samos. Sixteen of these went to Caria to look, out, to look out for the Phoenician fleet, and to Chios and Lesbos, carrying round orders for reinforcements, and so never engaged. But forty-four ships under the command of Pericles, with nine colleagues, gave battle, off the island of Tragia, to seventy Samian vessels, of which twenty were transports as they were sailing from Miletus. Victory remained with the Athenians, reinforced afterwards by forty ships from Athens and twenty-five Chian and Lesbian vessels. The Athenians landed, and having the superiority by land, invested the city with three walls. It was also invested from the sea. Meanwhile, Pericles took sixty ships from the blockading squadron and departed in haste for Canis and Caria. Intelligence having been brought in on the approach of the Phoenician fleet to the aid of the Samians, indeed. Stesagoras and others had left the island with five ships to bring them. 
But in the meantime the Samians made a sudden sally and fell on the camp, which they found unfortified. Destroying the lookout vessels and engaging and defeating such as were being launched to meet them, they remained masters of their own seas for fourteen days, and carried in and carried out what they pleased. But on the arrival of Pericles they were once more shut up. Fresh reinforcements arrived afterwards. Forty ships from Athens from, with Thucydides, Hagnon, and Formio, twenty with Tlepolemus and Anticles, and thirty vessels from Chios and Lesbos. After a brief attempt at fighting, the Samians, unable to hold out, were reduced after a nine-month siege and surrendered on conditions. They raised their walls, gave hostages, delivered up their ships, and arranged to pay the expenses of the war by installment. The Byzantines also agreed to be subject as before. This is the end of chapter 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Translated by Richard Crawley Book 1, Chapter 5 Second Congress at Lacedaemon Preparations for War and Diplomatic Skirmishes Ceylon, Pausanias, Themistocles After this, though not many years later, we at length come to what has already related the affairs of Corsera and Potidaea, and the events that served as a pretext for the present war. All these actions of the Hellenes against each other and the barbarian occurred in the fifty years' interval between the retreat of Xerxes and the beginning of the present war. During this interval, the Athenians succeeded in placing their empire on a firmer basis, and advanced their own home power to a very great height. The Lacedaemonians, though fully aware of it, opposed it only for a little while, but remained inactive during most of the period, being of old slow to go to war except under the pressure of necessity, and in the present instance being hampered by wars at home. Until the growth of the Athenian power could be no longer ignored, and their confederacy became the object of its encroachments. They then felt they could endure it no longer, but that the time had come for them to throw themselves heart and soul upon the hostile power, and break it, if they could, by commencing the present war. And though the Lacedaemonians had made up their own minds on the fact of the breach of the treaty and the guilt of the Athenians, yet they sent to Delphi and inquired of the god whether it would be well with them if they went to war, and, as it is reported, received from him the answer that if they put their whole strength into the war, victory would be theirs, and the promise that he himself would be with them, whether invoked or uninvoked. Still, they wished to summon their allies again, and to take their vote on the propriety of making war. After the ambassadors from the Confederates had arrived, and a Congress had been convened, they all spoke their minds, most of them denouncing the Athenians and demanding that the war should begin, in particular the Corinthians. They had before, on their own account, canvassed the cities in detail to induce them to vote for the war in the fear that it might come too late to save Potidaea. They were present also on this occasion, and came forward the last, and made the following speech. Fellow allies, we can no longer accuse the Lacedaemonians of having failed in their duty. They have not only voted for war themselves, but have assembled us here for that purpose. We say their duty, for supremacy has its duties. Besides equitably administering private interests, Leaders are required to show a special care for the common welfare in return for the special honors accorded to them by all in other ways. For ourselves, all who have already had dealings with the Athenians require no warning to be on their guard against them. The states more inland and out of the highway of communication should understand that. If they omit to support the coast powers, the result will be to injure the transit of their produce for exportation and the reception and exchange of their imports from the sea. And they must not be careless judges of what is now said, 
as if it had nothing to do with them, but must expect that the sacrifice of the powers on the coast will one day be followed by the extension of the danger to the interior, and must recognize that their own interests are deeply involved in this discussion. For these reasons they should not hesitate to exchange peace for war. If wise men remain quiet while they are not injured, brave men abandon peace for war when they are injured, returning to an understanding on a favorable opportunity. In fact, they are neither intoxicated by their success in war, nor disposed to take an injury for the sake of the delightful tranquility of peace. Indeed, to falter for the sake of such delights is, if you remain inactive, the quickest way of losing the sweets of repose to which you cling. While to conceive extravagant, pretentious success in war is to forget how hollow is the confidence by which you are elated. For if many ill-conceived plans have succeeded through the still greater fatuity of an opponent, many more, apparently well laid, have on the contrary ended in disgrace. The confidence with which we form our schemes is never completely justified in their execution. Speculation is carried on in safety, but, when it comes to action, fear causes failure. To apply these rules to ourselves, if we are now kindling war, it is under the pressure of injury, with adequate grounds of complaint, and after we have chastised the Athenians, we will in season desist. We have many reasons to expect success. First, superiority in numbers and in military experience, and second, our general and unvarying obedience in the execution of orders. The naval strength which they possess shall be raised by us from our respective antecedent resources, and from the monies at Olympia and Delphi. Alone from these enables us to seduce their foreign sailors by the offer of higher pay, for the power of Athens is more mercenary than national. While ours will not be exposed to the same risk, as its strength lies more in men than in money. A single defeat at sea is in all likelihood their ruin. Should they hold out, in that case there will be the more time for us to exercise ourselves in naval matters, and as soon as we have arrived in an equality in science, we need scarcely ask whether we shall be their superiors in courage. For the advantages that we have by nature they cannot acquire by education, while their superiority in science must be removed by our practice. The money required for these objects shall be provided by our contributions. Nothing indeed could be more monstrous than the suggestion that, while their allies never tire of contributing for their own servitude, we should refuse to spend for vengeance and self-preservation the treasure by which such refusal we shall forfeit to Athenian rapacity and see employed for our own ruin. We have also other ways of carrying on the war, such as revolt of their allies, the surest method of depriving them of their revenues, which are the source of their strength, and establishment of fortified positions in their country, and various operations which cannot be foreseen at present. For war of all things proceeds least upon definite rules, but draws principally upon itself for contrivances to meet an emergency, and in such cases the party who faces the struggle and keeps his temper best meets with most security, and he who loses his temper about it with correspondent disaster. Let us also reflect that if it was merely a number of disputes of territory between rival neighbors, it might be borne. But here we have an enemy in Athens that is a match for our whole coalition, and more than a match for any of its members, so that unless as a body, and as individual nationalities, and individual cities, we make a unanimous stand against her, she will easily conquer us, divided and in detail. That conquest, terrible as it may sound, would, it must be known, have no other end than slavery, pure and simple a world which Peloponnese cannot even hear whispered without disgrace, or without disgrace see so many states abused by one. Meanwhile, the opinion would be either that we were justly so used, or that we put up with it from cowardice, and were proving degenerate sons, and not even securing for ourselves the freedom which our fathers gave to Hellas, and in allowing the establishment in Hellas of a tyrant state. Though in individual states we think it our duty to put down sole rulers, and we do not know how this conduct can be held free from three of the gravest failings, want of sense, of courage, or of vigilance. For we do not suppose that you have taken refuge in that contempt of an enemy which has proved so fatal in so many instances, a feeling which from the numbers that it has ruined has come to be called not contemptuous, but contemptible. 
There is, however, no advantage in reflections on the past further than may be of service to the present. For the future we must provide by maintaining what the present gives us and redoubling our efforts. It is hereditary to us to win virtue as the fruit of labor, and you must not change the habit, even though you should have a slight advantage in wealth and resources. For it is not right that what was won in want should be lost in plenty. No, we must boldly advance to the war for many reasons. The God has commanded it and promised to be with us, and the rest of Hellas will all join in the struggle, part from fear, part from interest. You will be the first to break a treaty, which the God, in advising us to go to war, judges to be violated already, but rather to support a treaty that has been outraged. Indeed, treaties are broken not by resistance, but by aggression. Your position, therefore, from whatever quarter you may view it, will amply justify you in going to war. And this step we recommend in the interests of all, bearing in mind that identity of interest is the surest of bonds, whether between states or individuals. Delay not, therefore, to assist Potidia, a Dorian city besieged by Ionians, which is quite a reversal of the order of things nor to assert the freedom of the rest. It is impossible for us to wait any longer when waiting can only mean immediate disaster for some of us, and, if it comes to be known that we have conferred but do not venture to protect ourselves, like disaster in the near future for the rest. Delay not, fellow allies, but, convinced of the necessity of the crisis and the wisdom of this council, vote for the war, undeterred by its immediate terrors, but looking beyond to the lasting peace by which it will be succeeded. Out of war, peace gains fresh stability, but to refuse to abandon repose for war is not so sure a method of avoiding danger. We must believe that the tyrant city that has been established in Hellas has been established against all alike, with a program of universal empire, part fulfilled, part in contemplation. Let us not attack and reduce it, and win future security for ourselves and freedom for the Hellenes who are now enslaved? Such were the words of the Corinthians. The Lacedaemonians, having now heard all, give their opinion, took the vote of all the allied states present in order, great and small alike, and the majority voted for war. This decided, it was still impossible for them to commence at once, from their want of preparation, but it was resolved that the means requisite were to be procured by the different states, and that there was to be no delay. And indeed, in spite of the time occupied with the necessary arrangements, less than a year elapsed before Attica was invaded, and the war openly begun. This interval was spent in sending embassies to Athens, charged with complaints, in order to obtain as good a pretext for war as possible, in the event of her paying no attention to them. The first Lacedaemonian assembly was to order the Athenians to drive out the curse of the goddess the history of which is as follows. In former generations there was an Athenian of the name of Cylon, a victor at the Olympic Games, of good birth and powerful position, who had married a daughter of Theagenes, a Megarian, at that time tyrant of Megara. Now this Cylon was inquiring at Delphi, when he was told by the god to seize the Acropolis of Athens on the grand festival of Zeus. Accordingly, procuring a force from Theagenes, and persuading his friends to join him, when the Olympic festival in Peloponnese came, he seized the Acropolis, with the intention of making himself tyrant, thinking that this was the grand festival of Zeus, and also an occasion appropriate for a victor at the Olympic Games. Whether the grand festival that was meant was in Attica or elsewhere was a question which he never thought of, and which the oracle did not offer to solve. For the Athenians also have a festival which is called the grand festival of Zeus, Milikios or Gracious, or also the Diasia. It is celebrated outside the city, and the whole people sacrifice not real victims, but a number of bloodless offerings peculiar to the country. However, fancying he had chosen the right time, he made the attempt. As soon as the Athenians perceived it, they flocked in, one and all, from the country, and sat down, and laid siege to the citadel. But as time went on, Weary of the labor of the blockade, most of them departed, the responsibility of keeping guard being left to the nine archons, with plenary powers to arrange everything according to their good judgment. It must be known that at that time most political functions were discharged by the nine archons. 
Meanwhile, Cylon and his besieged companions were distressed for want of food and water. Accordingly, Cylon and his brother made their escape, but the rest, being hard-pressed and sometimes even dying of famine, seated themselves as suppliants at the altar in the Acropolis. The Athenians, who were charged with the duty of keeping guard, when they saw them at the point of death in the temple, raised them up on the understanding that no harm should be done to them, led them out, and slew them. Some, who as they passed by took refuge at the altars of the awful goddesses, were dispatched on the spot. From this deed the men who killed them were called accursed, and guilty against the goddess, they and their descendants. Accordingly, these cursed ones were driven out by the Athenians, driven out again by Cleomenes of Lacedaemon and an Athenian faction. The living were driven out, and the bones of the dead were taken up. Thus they were cast out. For all that, they came back afterwards, and their descendants are still in the city. This, then, was the curse that the Lacedaemonians ordered them to drive out. They were actuated primarily, as they pretended, by a care for the honor of the gods, but they also knew that Pericles, son of Xanthippus, was connected with the curse on his mother's side, and they thought that this banishment would materially advance their designs on Athens. Not that they really hoped to succeed in procuring this. They had rather thought to create a prejudice against him in the eyes of his countrymen, from the feeling that the war would be partly caused by his misfortune. For being the most powerful man of his time, and the leading Athenian statesman, he opposed the Lacedaemonians in everything, and would have no concessions, but ever urged the Athenians on to war. The Athenians retorted by ordering the Lacedaemonians to drive out the curse of Teneris. The Lacedaemonians had once raised up some helot suppliants from the temple of Poseidon at Teneris, led them away and slain them, for which they believed the great earthquake at Sparta to have been a retribution. The Athenians also ordered them to drive out the curse of the goddess of the brazen house, the history of which is as follows. After Pausanias, the Lacedaemonian had been recalled by the Spartans from his command in the Hellespont. This is his first recall, and had been tried by them and acquitted. Not being again sent out in public capacity, he took a galley of Hermione on his own responsibility. Without the authority of the Lacedaemonians, and arrived as a private person in the Hellespont. He came ostensibly for the Hellenic War, really to carry on his intrigues with the king, which he had begun before his recall, being ambitious of reigning over Hellas. The circumstance which first enabled him to lay the king under an obligation, and to make a beginning of the whole design, was this. Some connections and kinsmen of the king had been taken in Byzantium, on its capture from the Medes, when he was first there after the return from Cyprus. These captives he sent off to the king without the knowledge of the rest of the allies, the account being that they had escaped from him. He managed this with the help of Gongolus, an Eretrian, whom he had placed in charge of Byzantium and the prisoners. He also gave Gongolus a letter for the king, the contents of which were as follows, as was afterwards discovered. Asanius, the general of Sparta, anxious to do you a favor, Send to you these, his prisoners of war. I propose also, with your approval, to marry your daughter, and to make Sparta and the rest of Hellas subject to you. I may say I think I am able to do this, with your cooperation. Accordingly, if any of this please you, send a safe man to the sea, through whom we may in future conduct our correspondence. This was all that was revealed in the writing, and Xerxes was pleased with the letter. He sent off Artabazus, son of Pharnaces, to the sea with orders to supersede Megabates, the previous governor in the satrapy of Dasgileon, and to send over as quickly as possible to Pausanias at Byzantium a letter which he entrusted to him, to show him the royal signet, and to execute any commission which he might receive from Pausanias on the king's matters with all care and fidelity. Artabazus, on his arrival, carried the king's orders into effect, and sent over the letter which contained the following answer. Thus saith King Xerxes to Pausanias, For the men whom you have saved for me across the sea from Byzantium, an obligation is laid up for you in our house, recorded forever, and with your proposals I am well pleased. 
let neither night or day stop you from diligently performing any of your promises to me. Neither for cost of gold nor of silver let them be hindered, nor yet for number of troops. Wherever it may be that their presence is needed, but with Artabasis, an honorable man whom I send you, boldly advance my objects and yours, as may be most for the honor and interest of us both. Before held in high honor by the Hellenes as the hero of Plataea, Pausanias, after the receipt of this letter, became prouder than ever, and could no longer live in the usual style, but went out of Byzantium in a median dress, was attended on his march through Thrace by a bodyguard of Medes and Egyptians, kept a Persian table, and was quite unable to contain his intentions, but betrayed by his conduct in trifles what his ambition looked one day to enact on a grander scale. He also made himself difficult of access, and displayed so violent a temper to every one without exception that no one could come near him. Indeed, this was the principal reason why the Confederacy went over to the Athenians. The above-mentioned conduct, coming to the ears of the Lacedaemonians, occasioned his first recall, and after his second voyage out in the ship of Hermione, without their orders, he gave proofs of similar behavior. Besieged and expelled from Byzantium by the Athenians, he did not return to Sparta, but news came that he had settled at Colonae in the Troad, and was intriguing with the barbarians, and that his stay there was for no good purpose. And the ephors, no, no longer hesitating, sent him a herald and a sick tale, with orders to accompany the herald or be declared a public enemy. Anxious above everything to avoid suspicion, and confident that he could quash the charge by means of money, he returned a second time to Sparta, at first thrown into prison by the ephors, whose powers enabled them to do this to the king, soon compromised the matter and came out again, and offered himself for trial to any who wished to institute an inquiry concerning him. Now the Spartans had no tangible proof against him, neither his enemies nor the nation, of that indubitable kind required for the punishment of a member of the royal family, and at that moment in high office. He being regent for his first cousin, King Pleistarchus, Leonidas' son, who was still a minor. But by his contempt of the laws and imitation of the barbarians, he gave grounds for much suspicion of his being discounted with things established. All the occasions on which he had in any way departed from the regular customs were passed in review, and it was remembered that he had taken upon himself to have inscribed on the tripod at Delphi which was dedicated by the Hellenes as the first fruits of the spoil of the Medes, the following couplet. The Mede, defeated, great Pausanias raised this monument, that Phoebus might be praised. At the time the Lacedaemonians had at once erased the couplet, and inscribed the names of the cities that had aided in the overthrow of the barbarian and dedicated the offer. Yet it was considered that Pausanias had here been guilty of a grave offense, which, interpreted by the light of the attitude, which he had since assumed, gained a new significance, and seemed to be quite in keeping with his present schemes. Besides, they were informed that he was even intriguing with the helots. And such indeed was the fact, for he promised them freedom and citizenship if they would join him in the insurrection, and would help him to carry out his plans to the end. Even now, mistrusting the evidence, even of the helots themselves, the ephors would not consent to take any decided step against him, in accordance with their regular custom towards themselves, namely, to be slow in taking any irrevocable resolve in the matter of a Spartan citizen without indisputable proof. At last, it is said, the person who was going to carry to Artabasis the last letter for the king, a man of Argolis, once the favorite and most trusty servant of Pausanias, turned informer. Alarmed by the reflection that none of the previous messengers had ever returned, having counterfeited the seal, in order that, if he found himself mistaken in his surmises, or if Pausanias should ask to make some correction, he might not be discovered. He undid the letter, and found the postscript that he had suspected, i.e. an order to put him to death. On being shown the letter, the ephors now felt more certain. Still, they wished to hear Pausanias commit himself with their own ears. Accordingly, the man went by appointment to Teneris as a suppliant, and there built himself a hut divided into two by a partition, within which he concealed some of the ephors and let them hear the whole matter plainly. For Pausanias came to him and asked him the reason of his suppliant position, 
and then the man reproached him with the order that he had written concerning him, and one by one declared all the rest of the circumstances, how he who had never yet brought him into any danger while employed as agent between him and the king, was yet just like the mass of his servants to be rewarded with death. Admitting all this, and telling him not to be angry about the matter, Pausanias gave him the pledge of raising him up from the temple, and begged him to set off as quickly as possible, and not to hinder the business in hand. The ephors listened carefully, and then departed, taking no action for the moment, but having at last attained certainty, were preparing to arrest him in the city. It is reported that, as he was about to be arrested in the street, he saw from the face of one of the ephors what was coming. Another, too, made him a secret signal and betrayed it to him from kindness. Setting off with a run for the temple of the goddess of the brazen house, the enclosure of which was near at hand, he succeeded in taking sanctuary before they took him, and entering into a small chamber which formed part of the temple to avoid being exposed to the weather, lay still there. The force, for the moment distanced in the pursuit, afterwards took off the roof of the chamber, and having made sure that he was inside, shut him in, barricaded the doors, and staying before the place, reduced him by starvation. When they found that he was on the point of expiring, just as he was, in the chamber, they brought him out of the temple, while the breath was still in him, and as soon as he was brought out, he died. They were going to throw him into the Gaiades, where they cast criminals, but finally decided to inter him somewhere near. But the god at Delphi afterwards ordered the Lacedaemonians to remove the tomb to the place of his death, where he now lies in the consecrated ground, as an inscription on a monument declares, and as what had been done was a curse to them, to give back two bodies instead of one to the goddess of the brazen house. So they had two brazen statues made, and dedicated themselves as a substitute for Pausanias. The Athenians retorted by telling the Lacedaemonians to drive out what the god himself had pronounced to be a curse, to return to the medism of Pausanias. Matter was found in the course of the inquiry to implicate Themistocles, and the Lacedaemonians accordingly sent envoys to the Athenians and required them to punish him as they had punished Pausanias. The Athenians consented to do so, but he had, as it happened, been ostracized, and, with a residence at Argos, was in the habit of visiting other parts of Peloponnese. So they sent with the Lacedaemonians, who were ready to join in the pursuit, persons with instructions to take him wherever they found him. But the Mystocles got scent of their intentions, and fled from Peloponnese to Corsera, which was under obligations towards him. But the Corsarians alleged that they could not venture to shelter him at the cost of offending Athens and Lacedaemon, and they conveyed him over to the continent opposite. Pursued by the officers who hung on the report of his movements, at a loss where to turn, he was compelled to stop at the house of Admetus, the Molossian king, though they were not on friendly terms. Admetus happened not to be indoors, but his wife, to whom he had made himself a suppliant, instructed him to take their child in his arms and sit down by the hearth. Soon afterwards Admetus came in, and Themistocles told him who he was, and begged him not to revenge on Themistocles in exile any opposition which his request might have experienced from Themistocles at Athens. Indeed, he was now far too low for his revenge. Retaliation was only honorable between equals. Besides, his opposition to the king had only affected the success of a request, not the safety of his person. If the king were to give him up to the pursuers that he mentioned, and the fate which they intended for him, he would just be consigning him to certain death. The king listened to him, and raised him up with his son, as he was sitting with him in his arms, after the most effectual method of supplication, and on the arrival of the Lacedaemonians not long afterwards, refused to give him up for anything they could say, but sent him off by land to the other sea to Pydna in Alexander's domains, as he wished to go to the Persian king. There he met with a merchantman on the point of starting for Ionia. Going on board, he was carried by a storm to the Athenian squadron which was blockading Naxos. In his alarm, he was luckily unknown to the people in the vessel. He told the master who he was and what he was flying for, and said that if he refused to save him, he would declare that he was taking him for a bribe. Meanwhile, their safety consisted in letting no one leave the ship until a favorable time for sailing should arise. If he complied with his wishes, he promised him a proper recompense. 
The master acted as he desired, and after lying to for a day and a night out of reach of the squadron, at length arrived at Ephesus. After having rewarded him with a present of money, as soon as he received some from his friends at Athens and from his secret hordes at Argos, Themistocles started inland with one of the coast Persians, and sent a letter to King Artaxerxes, Xerxes' son, who had just come to the throne. Its contents were as follows. I, Themistocles, am come to you, who did your house more harm than any of the Hellenes, when I was compelled to defend myself against your father's invasion. Harm, however, far surpassed by the good that I did him during his retreat, which brought no danger from me but much for him. For the past, you are a good turn in my debt. Here he mentioned the warning sent to Xerxes from Salamis to retreat, as well as his finding the bridges unbroken, which, as he falsely pretended, was due to him. For the present, able to do you great service, I am here, pursued by the Hellenes for my friendship for you. However, I desire a year's grace, when I shall be able to declare in person the objects of my coming. It is said that the king approved his intention, and told him to do as he said. He employed the interval in making what progress he could in the study of the Persian tongue, and of the customs of the country. Arrived at court at the end of the year, he attained to very high consideration there, such as no Hellene has ever possessed before or since. Partly from his splendid antecedents, partly from the hopes which he held out of effecting for him the subjugation of Hellas, but principally by the proof which experience daily gave of his capacity. For Themistocles was a man who exhibited the most indubitable signs of genius. Indeed, in this particular he has a claim on our admiration quite extraordinary and unparalleled. By his own native capacity, alike unformed and unsupplemented by study, he was at once the best judge in those sudden crises which admit of little or no deliberation, and the best prophet of the future, even to its most distant possibilities. An able theoretical expositor of all that came within the sphere of his practice, he was not without the power of passing an adequate judgment in matters in which he had no experience. He could also excellently divine the good and evil which lay hid in the unseen future. In fine, whether we consider the extent of his natural powers, or the slightness of his application, this extraordinary man must be allowed to have surpassed all others in the faculty of intuitively meeting an emergency. Disease was the real cause of his death, though there is a story of his having ended his life by poison, on finding himself unable to fulfill his promises to the king. However this may be, there is a monument to him in the marketplace of Asiatic Magnesia. He was governor of the district, the king having given him Magnesia, which brought in fifty talents a year, for bread, Lampsicus, which was considered to be the richest wine country, for wine, and Myos for other provisions. His bones, it is said, were conveyed home by his relatives in accordance with his wishes, and interred in Attic ground. This was done without the knowledge of the Athenians, as it is against the law to bury in Attica an outlaw for treason. So ends the history of Pausanias and Themistocles, the Lacedaemonian and the Athenian, the most famous men of their time in Hellas. To return to the Lacedaemonians, the history of their first embassy, the injunctions which it conveyed, and the rejoinder which it provoked, concerning the expulsion of the accursed persons, have been relayed already. It was followed by a second, which ordered Athens to raise the siege of Potidaea and to respect the independence of Aegina. Above all, it gave her most distinctly to understand that war might be prevented by the revocation of the Megara decree excluding the Megarians from the use of Athenian harbors and of the market of Athens. But Athens was not inclined either to revoke the decree or to entertain their other proposals. She accused the Megarians of pushing their cultivation into the consecrated ground and the unenclosed land on the border, and of harboring her runaway slaves. At last an embassy arrived with the Lacedaemonian ultimatum. The ambassadors were Ramphius, Melesippus, and Agassander. Not a word was said on any of the old subjects. There was simply this. Lacedaemon wishes the peace to continue, and there is no reason why it should not, if you would leave the Hellenes independent. Upon this the Athenians held an assembly, and laid the matter before their consideration. It was resolved to deliberate once and for all on all their demands, and to give them an answer. There were many speakers who came forward and gave their support to one side or the other, 
urging the necessity of war, or the revocation of the decree and the following of allowing it to stand in the way of peace. Among them came Pericles, son of Xanthippus, the first man of his time at Athens, ablest alike in counsel and in action, and gave the following advice. There is one principle, Athenians, which I hold to through everything, and that is the principle of no concession to the Peloponnesians. I know that the spirit which inspires men while they are being persuaded to make war is not always retained in action, that as circumstances change, resolutions change. Yet I see that now as before the same, almost literally the same, counsel is demanded of me, and I put it to those of you who are allowing yourselves to be persuaded to support the national resolves even in the case of reverses or to forfeit all credit for their wisdom in the event of success. For sometimes the course of things is as arbitrary as the plans of man. Indeed, this is why we usually blame chance for whatever does not happen as we expected. Now it was clear before that Lacedaemon entertained designs against us. It is still more clear now. The treaty provides that we shall mutually submit our differences to legal settlement, and that we shall meanwhile each keep what we have. Yet the Lacedaemonians never yet made us any such offer, never yet would accept from us any such offer. On the contrary, they wish complaints to be settled by war instead of by negotiation. And in the end, we find them here dropping the tone of expostulation and adopting that of command. They order us to raise the siege of Potidaea, to let Aegina to be independent, to revoke the Megara decree, and they conclude with an ultimatum warning us to leave the Hellenes independent. I hope that you will none of you think that we shall be going to war for a trifle if we refuse to revoke the Megara decree, which appears in front of their complaints, and the revocation of which is to save us from war, or let any feeling of self-reproach linger in your minds, as if you went to war for slight cause. Why, this trifle contains the whole seal and trial of your resolution. If you give way, you will instantly have to meet some greater demand, as having been frightened into obedience in the first instance while a firm refusal will make them clearly understand that they must treat you more as equals. Make your decision, therefore, at once, either to submit before you are harmed, or if we are to go to war, as I for one think we ought, to do so without caring whether the ostensible cause be great or small, resolved against making concessions or consenting to a precarious tenure of our possessions. For all claims from an equal, urged upon a neighbor, as commands before any attempt at legal settlement, be they great or be they small, have only one meaning, and that is slavery. As to the war and the resources of either party, a detailed comparison will not show you the inferiority of Athens. Personally engaged in the cultivation of their land, without funds either private or public, the Peloponnesians are also without experience in long wars across sea, from the strict limit which poverty imposes on their attacks upon each other. Powers of this description are quite incapable of either manning a fleet or sending out an army. They cannot afford the absence from their homes, the expenditure from their own funds, and besides, they have not command of the sea. Capital, it must be remembered, maintains a war more than forced contributions. Farmers are a class of men that are always more ready to serve in person than in purse. Confident that the former will survive the dangers, they are by no means so sure that the latter will not be prematurely exhausted, especially if the war lasts longer than they expect, which it very likely will. In a single battle, the Peloponnesians and their allies may be able to defy all Hellas, but they are incapacitated from carrying on a war against a power different in character from their own, by the want of the single council chamber requisite to prompt and vigorous action, and the substitution of a diet composed of various races in which every state possesses an equal vote, and each presses its own ends, a condition of things which generally results in no action at all. The great wish of some is to avenge themselves on some particular enemy, the great wish of others to save their own pocket. Slow in assembling, they devote a very small fraction of the time to the considerations of any public object, most of it to the prosecution of their own objects. Meanwhile, each fancies that no harm will come of his neglect, that it is the business of somebody else to look after this matter, or that. And so, by the same notion being entertained by all separately, the common cause imperceptibly decays. 
but the principal point is the hindrance that they will experience from the want of money. The slowness with which it comes in will cause delay, but the opportunities of war wait for no man. Again, we need not be alarmed either at the possibility of their raising fortifications in Attica or at their navy. It would be difficult for any system of fortifications to establish a rival city, even in time of peace, much more surely in an enemy's country, with Athens just as much fortified against it as it against Athens. While a mere post might be able to do some harm to the country by incursions and by the facilities which it would afford for desertion, but can never prevent our sailing into their country and raising fortifications there, and making reprisals with our powerful fleet, for our naval skill is of more use to us for service on land than their military skill for service at sea. Familiarity with the sea they will not find an easy acquisition. If you who have been practicing at it ever since the Median invasion have not yet brought it to perfection, is there any chance of anything considerable being affected by an agricultural, unseafaring population who will besides be prevented from practicing by the constant presence of strong squadrons of observation from Athens? With a small squadron, they might hazard an engagement, encouraging their ignorance by numbers. But the restraint of a strong force will prevent their moving, and through want of practice they will grow more clumsy and consequently more timid. It must be kept in mind that seamanship, just like anything else, is a matter of art, and will not admit of being taken up occasionally as an occupation for times of leisure. On the contrary, it is so exacting as to leave leisure for nothing else. Even if they were to touch the monies at Olympia or Delphi, and try to seduce our foreign sailors by the temptation of higher pay, that would only be a serious danger if we could not still be a match for them by embarking our own citizens and the aliens resident among us. But in fact, by this means, we are always a match for them, and best of all, we have a larger and higher class of native coxswains and sailors among our own citizens than all the rest of Hellas. And to say nothing of the danger of such a step, None of our foreign sailors would consent to become an outlaw from this country, and to take service with them and their hosts, for the sake of a few days' high pay. This, I think, is a tolerably fair account of the position of the Peloponnesians. That of Athens is free from the defects that I have criticized in them, and has other advantages of its own, which they can show nothing to equal. If they march against our country, we will sail against theirs and it will be then found that the desolation of the whole of Attica is not the same as that of even a fraction of Peloponnese, for they will not be able to supply the deficiency except by a battle. While we have plenty of land, both on the islands and the continent, the rule of the sea is indeed a great matter. Consider for a moment. Suppose that we were islanders. Can you conceive a more impregnable position? Well, this in future should, as far as possible, be our conception of our position. Dismissing all thoughts of our land and houses, we must vigilantly guard the sea and the city. No irritation that we may feel for the former must provoke us to a battle with the numerical superiority of the Peloponnesians. A victory would only be succeeded by another battle against the same superiority. A reverse involves the loss of our allies, the source of our strength, who will not remain quiet a day after we become unable to march against them. We must cry not over the loss of houses and land, but of men's lives. Since houses and land do not gain men, but men them. And if I had thought that I could persuade you, I would have bid you go out and lay them waste with your own hands, and show the Peloponnesians that this at any rate will not make you submit. I have many other reasons to hope for a favorable issue, if you can consent not to combine schemes of fresh conquest with the conduct of the war and will abstain from willfully involving yourselves in other dangers. Indeed, I am more afraid of our own blunders than of the enemy's devices. But these matters shall be explained in another speech, as events require. For the present, dismiss these men with the answer that we will allow Megara the use of our market and harbors, when the Lacedaemonians suspend their alien acts in favor of us and our allies, there being nothing in the treaty to prevent either one or the other, that we will leave the cities independent, if independent we found them when we made the treaty. And when the Lacedaemonians grant to their cities an independence not involving subservience to Lacedaemonian interests, but such as each severally may desire, that we are willing to give the legal satisfaction which our agreements specify, 
and that we shall not commence hostilities, but shall resist those who do commence them. This is an answer agreeable at once to the rights and the dignity of Athens. It must be thoroughly understood that war is a necessity, but that the more readily we accept it, the less will be the ardor of our opponents, and that out of the greatest dangers, communities and individuals acquire the greatest glory. Did not our fathers resist the Medes, not only with resources far different from ours, but even when those resources had been abandoned? And more by wisdom than by fortune, more by daring than by strength, did not they beat off the barbarian and advance their affairs to their present height? We must not fall behind them, but must we resist our enemies in any way and every way, and attempt to hand down our power to our posterity unimpaired. Such were the words of Pericles. The Athenians, persuaded of the wisdom of his advice, voted as he desired, and answered the Lacedaemonians as he recommended, both on the separate points and in the general. They would do nothing on dictation, but were ready to have the complaint settled in a fair and impartial manner by the legal method, for which the terms of the truce prescribed. So the envoys departed home and did not return again. These were the charges and differences existing between the rival powers before the war arising immediately from the affair at Epidamnus and Corsira. Still intercourse continued in spite of them, and mutual communication. It was carried on without heralds, but not without suspicion, as events were occurring which were equivalent to a breach of the treaty and matter for war. This is the end of Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Translated by Richard Crawley Book 2 Chapter 6 Beginning of the Peloponnesian War First Invasion of Attica Funeral Oration of Pericles the war between the Athenians and Peloponnesians and the allies on either side now really begins. For now, all intercourse except through the medium of heralds ceased, and hostilities were commenced and prosecuted without intermission. The history follows the chronological order of events by summers and winters. The Thirty Years' Truce, which was entered into after the conquest of Euboea, lasted fourteen years. In the fifteenth, in the forty-eighth year of the priestesship of Chrysus at Argos, in the effort of Anesius at Sparta, in the last month but two of the archonship of Pythodorus at Athens, and six months after the battle of Potidaea, just as the beginning of spring, a Theban force a little over three hundred strong, under the command of their Botarchs, Pythandalus, son of Philades, and Diamparus, son of Onet Turides, about the first watch of the night, made an armed entry into Plataea, a town of Boeotia, in alliance with Athens. The gates were opened to them by a Plataean called Naclides, who, with his party, had invited them in, meaning to put to death the citizens of the opposite party, bring over the city to Thebes, and thus obtain power for themselves. This was arranged through Eurymachus, son of Leontiades, a person of great influence at Thebes, for Plataea had always been at variance with Thebes, and the latter, foreseeing that war was at hand, wished to surprise her old enemy in time of peace, before hostilities had actually broken out. Indeed, this was how they got in so easily without being observed, as no guard had been posted. After the soldiers had grounded arms in the marketplace, those who had invited them in wished them to set to work at once and go to their enemies' houses. This, however, the Thebans refused to do, but determined to make a conciliatory proclamation, and if possible to come to a friendly understanding with the citizens. Their herald accordingly invited any who wished to resume their old place in the confederacy of their countrymen to ground arms with them, for they thought that in this way the city would readily join them. On becoming aware of the presence of the Thebans within their gates, and of the sudden occupation of the town, 
the Plataeans concluded in their alarm that more had entered than was really the case, the night preventing their seeing them. They accordingly came to terms, and, accepting the proposal, made no movement, especially as the Thebans offered none of them any violence. But somehow or other, during the negotiations, they discovered the scanty numbers of the Thebans, and decided that they could easily attack and overpower them, the mass of the Plataeans being averse to revolting from Athens. At all events, they resolved to attempt it. Digging through the party walls of the houses, they thus managed to join each other without being seen, going through the streets, in which they placed wagons without the beasts in them, to serve as a barricade, and arranged everything else as seemed convenient for the occasion. When everything had been done that circumstances permitted, they watched their opportunity and went out of their houses against the enemy. It was still night, the daybreak was at hand. In daylight it was thought that their attack could be met by men full of courage and on equal terms with their assailants, while in darkness it would fall upon panic-stricken troops, who would also be at, at a disadvantage from their enemy's knowledge of the locality. So they made their assault at once, and came to close quarters as quickly as they could. The Thebans, finding themselves outwitted, immediately closed up to repel all attacks made upon them. Twice or thrice they beat back their assailants, but the men shouted and charged them. The women and slaves screamed and yelled from the houses and pelted them with stones and tiles. Besides, it had been raining hard all night, and so at last their courage gave way, and they turned and fled through the town. Most of the fugitives were quite ignorant of the right ways out, and this, with the mud and the darkness caused by the moon being in her last quarter, and the fact that their pursuers knew their way about and could easily stop their escape, proved fatal to many. The only gate open was the one by which they had entered, and this was shut by one of the Plataeans driving the spike of a javelin into the bar instead of the bolt, so that even here there was no longer any means of exit. They were now chased all over the town. Some got on the wall and threw themselves over, in most cases with a fatal result. One party managed to find a deserted gate, and obtaining an axe from a woman, cut through the bar. But as they were, obser were soon observed, only a few succeeded in getting out. Others were cut off in detail in different parts of the city. The most numerous and compact body rushed into a large building next to the city wall, the doors on the side of the street happened to be open, and the Thebans fancied that they were the gates of the town, and that there was a passage right through to the outside. The Plataeans, seeing their enemies in a trap, now consulted whether they should set fire to the building and burn them just as they were, or whether there was anything else that they could do with them, until at length these and the rest of the Theban survivors found wandering about the town agreed to an unconditional surrender of themselves and their arms to the Plataeans. While such was the fate of the party in Plataea, the rest of the Thebans who were to have joined them with all their forces before daybreak, in case of anything miscarrying with the body that had entered, received the news of the affair on the road, and pressed forward to their succor. Now Plataea is nearly eight miles from Thebes, and their march delayed by the rain that had fallen in the night, for the river Esopus had risen and was not easy of passage. And so, hoping to march in the rain, and being hindered in, the crossing, in crossing the river, they arrived too late, and found the whole party either slain or captive. When they learned what had happened, they at once formed a design against the Plataeans, outside the city. As the attack had been made in time of peace, and was perfectly unexpected, there were of course men and stock in the fields, and the Thebans wished, if possible, to have some prisoners to exchange against their countrymen in the town, should any chance to have been taken alive. Such was their plan. But the Plataeans suspected their intention almost before it was formed, and becoming alarmed for their fellow citizens outside the town, sent a herald to the Thebans, reproaching them for their unscrupulous attempt to seize their city in time of peace, and warning them against any outrage on those outside. Should the warning be disregarded, they threatened to put to death the men they had in their hands, but added that, on the Thebans retiring from their territory, they would surrender the prisoners to their friends. This is the Theban account of the matter. And they say that they had an oath given them. The Plataeans, on the other hand, do not admit any promise of an immediate surrender, but make it contingent upon subsequent negotiation. The oath they deny altogether. 
Be this as it may, upon the Thebans retiring from their territory without committing any injury, the Plataeans hastily got in whatever they had in the country, and immediately put the men to death. The prisoners were a hundred and eighty in number, Eurymachus, the person with whom the traitors had negotiated, being one. This done, the Plataeans sent a messenger to Athens, gave back the dead to the Thebans under a truce, and arranged things in the city as seemed best to meet the present emergency. The Athenians, meanwhile, having had word of the affair sent them immediately after its occurrence, had instantly seized all the Boeotians in Attica, and sent a herald to the Plataeans to forbid their proceeding to extremities with their Theban prisoners without instructions from Athens. The news of the men's death had of course not arrived, the first messenger having left Plataea just when the Thebans entered it, the second just after their defeat and capture, so there was no later news. Thus the Athenians sent orders in ignorance of the facts, and the herald on his arrival found the men slain. After this, the Athenians marched to Plataea and brought in provisions, and left a garrison in the place, also taking away the women and children and such of the men as were least efficient. After the affair at Plataea, the treaty had been broken by an overt act, and Athens at once prepared for war, as did the Lacedaemon and her allies. They resolved to send embassies to the king, and to such of the barbarian powers as either party could look to for assistance, and tried to ally themselves with the independent states at home. Lacedaemon, in addition to the existing maritime, gave orders to the states that they had declared for her in Italy and Sicily to build vessels up to a grand total of five hundred, the quota of each city being determined by its size, and also to provide a specified sum of money. Till these were ready, they were to remain neutral and to admit single Athenian ships into their harbors. Athens, on her part, reviewed her existing confederacy, and sent embassies to the places more immediately, round Peloponnese, Corsira, Cephalenia, Acarnania, and Zacynthus, perceiving that if these could be relied on, she could carry the war all around Peloponnese, and if both sides nourished the boldest hopes and put forth their utmost strength for the war, this was only natural. Zeal is always at its height at the commencement of an undertaking, and on this particular occasion Peloponnese and Athens were both full of young men whose inexperience made them eager to take up arms, while the rest of Hellas stood straining with excitement at the conflict of its leading cities. Everywhere predictions were being recited and oracles being chanted by such persons as collect them. And this is not only in the contending cities. Further, some, while before this, there was an earthquake at Delos, for the first time in the memory of the Hellenes. This was said and thought to be ominous of the events impending. Indeed, nothing of the kind that happened was allowed to pass without remark. The good wishes of men made greatly for the Lacedaemonians, especially as they proclaimed themselves the liberators of Hellas. No private or public effort that could help them in speech or action was omitted, each thinking that the cause suffered wherever he could not himself see to it. So general was the indignation felt against Athens, whether by those who wished to escape from her empire, or were apprehensive of being absorbed by it. Such were the preparations, and such the feelings with which the contest opened. The allies of the two belligerents were the following. These were the allies of Lacedaemon. All the Peloponnesians within the Isthmus, except the Argives and Achaeans, who were neutral, Pellene being the only Achaean city that first joined the war, though her example was afterward followed by the rest. Outside Peloponnese, the Megarians, Locrians, Boeotians, Phocians, Ambrosiates, Leucadians, and Actorians. Of these, ships were furnished by the Corinthians, Megarians, Sicyonians, Pellenians, Eleans, Ambrosiates, and Leucadians, and cavalry by the Boeotians, Phocians, and Locrians. The other states sent infantry. This was the Lacedaemonian confederacy. That of Athens comprised the Chians, Lesbians, Plataeans, the Mycenaeans in Napactus, most of the Arcanians, the Corsirians, Zacynthians, and some tributary cities in the following countries, 
Caria upon the sea with her Dorian neighbors, Ionia, the Hellespont, the Thracian towns, the islands lying between Peloponnese and Crete toward the east, and all the Cyclades except Melos and Thera. Of these, ships were furnished by Chios, Lesbos, and Corsira, infantry and money by the rest. Such were the allies of either party and the resources for the war. Immediately after the affair at Plataea, Lacedaemon sent round orders to the cities in Peloponnese and the rest of her confederacy to prepare troops and the provisions requisite for a foreign campaign, in order to invade Attica. The several states were ready at the time appointed and assembled at the Isthmus, the contingent of each city being two-thirds of its whole force. After the whole army had mustered, the Lacedaemonian king, Archidemus, the leader of the expedition, called together the generals of all the states and the principal persons and officers, and exhorted them as follows. Peloponnesians and allies, our fathers made many campaigns both within and without Peloponnese, and the elder men among us here are not without experience in war. Yet we have never set out with a larger force than the present, and if our numbers and efficiency are remarkable, so also is the power of the state against which we march. We ought not, then, to show ourselves inferior to our ancestors, or unequal to our own reputation, for the hopes and attention of all Hellas are bent upon the present effort, and its sympathy is with the enemy of the hated Athens. Therefore, numerous as the invading army may appear to be, and certain as some may think it that our adversary will not meet us in the field, this is no sort of justification for the least negligence upon the march, but the officers and men of each particular city should always be prepared for the advent of danger in their own quarters. The course of war cannot be foreseen, and its attacks are generally dictated by the impulse of the moment, and where overweening self-confidence has despised preparation, a wise apprehension often been able to make head against superior numbers. Not that confidence is out of place in an army of invasion, but in an enemy's country it should also be accompanied by the precautions of apprehension. Troops will, by this combination, be best inspired for dealing a blow, and best secured against receiving one. In the present instance, the city against which we are going, far from being so impotent for defense, is on the contrary most excellently equipped at all points, so that we have every reason to expect that they will take the field against us, and that if they have not set out already before we are there, they will certainly do so when they see us in their territory, wasting and destroying their property. For men are always exasperated at suffering injuries to which they are not accustomed, and on seeing them inflicted before their very eyes, and where least inclined for reflection, rush with the greatest heat to action. The Athenians are the very people of all others to do this, as they aspire to rule the rest of the world, and are more in the habit of invading and ravaging their neighbor's territory than of seeing their own treated in the like fashion. Considering, therefore, the power of the state against which we are marching, and the greatness of the reputation which, according to the event, we shall win or lose for our ancestors and ourselves. Remember as you follow where you may be led to regard discipline and vigilance as of the first importance, and to obey with alacrity the orders transmitted to you. As nothing contributes so much to the credit and safety of an army as the union of large bodies by a single discipline, with this brief speech dismissing the assembly, Archidamus first sent off Melesippus, son of Diacritus, a Spartan, to Athens, in case she should be more inclined to submit on seeing the Peloponnesians actually on the march. But the Athenians did not admit into the city or to their assembly, Pericles having already carried a motion against admitting either herald or embassy from the Lacedaemonians after they had once marched out. Their herald was accordingly sent away without an audience, and ordered to be beyond the frontier that same day. In future, if those who sent him had a proposition to make, they must retire to their own territory before they dispatched embassies to Athens. An escort was sent with Melesippus to prevent his holding communication with anyone. When he reached the frontier and was just going to be dismissed, he departed with these words, This day will be the beginning of great misfortunes to the Hellenes. As soon as he arrived at camp, and Archidamus learnt that the Athenians had still no thoughts of submitting, 
he at length began his march, and advanced with his army into their territory. Meanwhile, the Boeotians, sending their contingent and cavalry to join the Peloponnesian expedition, went to Plataea with the remainder and laid waste the country. While the Peloponnesians were still mustering at the Isthmus, or on the march before they invaded Attica, Pericles, son of Xanthippus, one of the ten generals of the Athenians, finding that the invasion was to take place, conceived the idea that Archidamus, who happened to be his friend, might possibly pass by his estate without ravaging it. This he might do, either from a personal wish to oblige him, or acting under instructions from Lacedaemon for the purposes of creating a prejudice against him, as had been before attempted in the demand for the expulsion of the accursed family. He accordingly took the precaution of announcing to the Athenians in the assembly that, although Archidamus was his friend, yet this friendship should not extend to the detriment of the state, and that in many cases the enemy should make his houses and lands an exception to the rest, and not pillage them. He at once gave them up to be public property, so that they should not bring him into suspicion. He also gave the citizens some advice on their present affairs in the same strain as before. They were to prepare for the war, and to carry in their property from the country. They were not to go out to battle, but to come into the city and guard it, and get ready their fleet in which their real strength lay. They were also to, to keep a tight rein on their allies, the strength of Athens being derived from the money brought in by their payments, and success in war depending principally upon conduct and capital. They had no reason to despond. Apart from the other sources of income, an average revenue of six hundred talents of silver was drawn from the tribute of the allies, and there were still six thousand talents of coined silver in the Acropolis, out of nine thousand seven hundred that had once been there, from which the money had been taken for, for the porch of the Acropolis, the other public buildings, and for Potidea. This did not include the uncoined gold and silver in public and private offerings, the sacred vessels for the processions and games, the median spoils, and similar resources to the amount of five hundred talents. To this he added the treasures of the other temples. These were by no means inconsiderable, and might fairly be used. Nay, if they were ever absolutely driven to it, they might take even the gold ornaments of Athene herself, for the statue contained forty talents of pure gold, and it was all removable. This might be used for self-preservation, and must every penny of it be restored. Such was their financial position, surely a satisfactory one. They then had an army of 13,000 heavy infantry, besides 16,000 more in the garrisons and on home duty at Athens. This was at first the number of men on guard in the event of an invasion. It was composed of the oldest and youngest levies, and the resident aliens who had heavy armor. The Phileric Wall ran up to four miles, before it joined that round, that round the city, and of this last nearly five had a guard, although part of it was left without one, that between the Long Wall and the Phaleric. Then there were the Long Walls to Piraeus, a distance of some four miles and a half, the outer of which was manned. Lastly, the circumference of Piraeus with Munichia was nearly seven miles and a half, only half of this, however, was guarded. Pericles also showed them that they had twelve hundred horse, including mounted archers, with sixteen hundred archers unmounted, and three hundred galleys fit for service. Such were the resources of Athens in the different departments when the Peloponnesian invasion was impending, and hostilities were being commenced. Pericles also urged his usual arguments for expecting a favorable issue to the war. The Athenians listened to his advice, and began to carry in their wives and children from the country, and all their household furniture, even to the woodwork of their houses, which they took down. Their sheep and cattle they sent over to Euboea and the adjacent islands, but they found it hard to move, as most of them had always been used to living in the country. From very early times, this had been more the case with the Athenians than with others. Under Cecrops and the first kings, down to the reign of, Th of Theseus, Attica had always consisted of a number of independent townships, each with its own town hall and magistrates. Except in times of danger, the king at Athens was not consulted. In ordinary seasons, they carried on their government and settled their affairs without his interference. Sometimes even they waged war against him, as in the case of the Ulysseans, with Eumolpus against Erechtheus. 
In Theseus, however, they had a king of equal intelligence and power, and one of the chief features in his organization of the country was to abolish the council chambers and magistrates of the petty cities, and to merge them in the single council chamber and town hall of the present capital. Individuals might still enjoy their private property just as before, but they were henceforth compelled to have only one political center, Athens, which thus counted all the inhabitants of Attica among her cities, citizens, so that when Theseus died he left a great state behind him. Indeed, from him dates the Senosia, or Feast of Union, which is paid for by the state, and which the Athenians still keep in honor of the goddess. Before this, the city consisted of the present citadel and the district beneath it looking rather towards the south. This is shown by the fact that the temples of the other deities, besides that of Athene, are in the citadel, and even these that are outside it are mostly situated in this quarter of the city, as that of the Olympian Zeus, of the Pythian Apollo, of Earth, and of Dionys Dionysus in the marshes, the same in whose honor the older Dionysia are to this day celebrated in the month of Anthestrion, not only by the Athenians, but also by their Ionian descendants. There are also other ancient temples in this quarter. The fountain, too, which, since the alteration made by the tyrants, has been called Anacronius, or Nine Pipes, but which, when the spring was open, went by the name of Kalarujo, or Fair Water, was in these days, from being so near, used for the most important offices. Indeed, the old fashion of using the water before marriage, and for other sacred purposes, is still kept up. Again, from their old residence in that quarter, the citadel is still known among Athenians as the city. The Athenians thus long lived scattered over Attica in independent townships. Even after the centralization of Theseus, old habits still prevailed, and from the early times down to the present, War, present war, most Athenians still lived in the country with their families and households, and were consequently not at all inclined to move now, especially as they had only just restored their establishments after the Median invasion. Deep was their trouble and discontent at abandoning their houses and their hereditary temples of the ancient constitution, and, they, and at having to change their habits of life and to bid farewell to what each regarded as his native city. When they arrived in Athens, although a few had houses of their own to go to, or could find an asylum with friends or relatives, by far the greater number had to take up their dwelling in the parts of the city that were not built over, and in the temples and chapels of the heroes, except the Acropolis, and the temple of the Eleusian Damiter, and such other places as were always kept closed. The occupation of the plot of ground lying below the citadel, called the Pelasgian, had been forbidden by a curse, and there was also an ominous fragment of a Pythian oracle which said, Leave the Pelasgian parcel desolate, woe worth the day the men that inhabit it. Yet this too was now built over in the necessity of the moment, and in my opinion, if the oracle proved true, it was in the opposite sense to what was expected, for the misfortunes of the state did not arise from the unlawful occupation, but the necessity of the occupation from the war and though the god did not mention this, he foresaw that it would be an evil day for Athens in which the plot came to be inhabited. Many also took up their quarters in the towns, in the towers of the walls, or wherever else they could. For when they were all come in, the city proved too small to hold them, though afterwards they divided the long walls and a great part of Piraeus into lots and settled there. All this while great attention was being given to the war. The allies were being mustered in an armament of a hundred ships equipped for Peloponnese. Such was the state of preparations at Athens. Meanwhile, the army of the Peloponnesians was advancing. The first town they came to in Attica was Onio, where they were they to enter the country. Sitting down before it, they prepared to assault the wall with engines and otherwise. Onio, standing upon the Athenian and Boeotian border, was of course a walled town and was used as a fortress by the Athenians in time of war. So the Peloponnesians prepared their assault, and wasted some valuable time before the place. This delay brought the gravest censure upon Archidamus. Even during the levying of the war, 
he had credit for weakness and Athenian sympathies by the half measures he had advocated. And after the army had assembled, he had further injured himself in public estimation by his loitering up the isthmus and the slowness with which the rest of the march had been conducted. But all this was as nothing to the delay at Onio. During this interval, the Athenians were carrying in their property, and it was the belief of the Peloponnesians that a quick advance would have found everything still out, had it not been for his procrastination. Such was the feeling of the army towards Archidamus during the siege. But he, it is said, expected that the Athenians would shrink from letting their lands be wasted, and would make their submission while it was still uninjured, and this was why he waited. But after he had assaulted Onio, and every possible attempt to take it had failed, as no herald came from Athens, he at last broke up his camp and invaded Attica. This was about eighty days after the Theban attempt upon Plataea, just in the middle of summer, when the corn was ripe, and Archidamus, son of Zeusus, king of Lacedaemon, was in command. In camping in Eleusis and the Thriasian plain, they began their ravages, and putting to flight some Athenian horse at a place called Rite, or the brooks, they then advanced, keeping Mount Aegilus on their right through Cropia until they reached Acarnae, the largest town of the Athenian deems or townships. Sitting down before it, they formed a camp there, and continued their ravages for a long while. The reason why Archidamus remained in order of battle at Acarnae during this incursion, instead of descending into the plain, is said to have been this. He hoped that the Athenians might possibly be tempted by the multitude of their youth and the un unprecedented efficiency of their service, to come out to battle and attempt to stop the devastation of their lands. Accordingly, as they had met him at Eleusis or the Three Asian Plain, he tried if they could be provoked to a sally by the spectacle of a camp at Acarnae. He thought the place itself a good position for encamping, and it seemed likely that such an important part of the state as the three thousand heavy infantry of the Acarnians would refuse to submit the ruin of their property and would force a battle on the rest of the citizens. On the other hand, should the Athenians not take to the field during this incursion, he could then fearlessly ravage the plain in future invasions, and extend his advance up to the very walls of Athens. After the Acarnians had lost their own property, they would be less willing to risk themselves for that of their neighbors, and so there would be division in the Athenian councils. These, are, these were the motives of Archidamus for remaining at Acarnae, in the meanwhile, as long as the army was at Eleusis and the Thriasian plain, hopes were still entertained of its not advancing any nearer. It was remembered that Pliastonax, son of Pausanias, king of Lacedaemon, had invaded Attica with a Peloponnesian army fourteen years before, but had retreated without advancing farther than Eleusis and Thria, which indeed proved the cause of his exile from Sparta, as it was thought he had been bribed to retreat. But when they saw the army at Acarnae, barely seven miles from Athens, they lost all patience. The territory of Athens was being ravaged before the very eyes of the Athenians, a sight which the young men had never seen before, and the old only in the Median wars. And it was naturally thought a grievous insult, and the determination was universal, especially among the young men, to sally forth and stop it. Knots were formed in the street, and engaged in hot discussion. For if the proposed sally was warmly recommended, it was also in some cases opposed. Oracles of the most various import were recited by the collectors, and found eager listeners in one or other of the disputants. Foremost in pressing for the sally were the Acarnians, as constituting no small part of the army of the state, and as, as it was their land that was being ravaged. In short, the whole city was in a most excited state. Pericles was the object of general indignation. His previous counsels were totally forgotten. He was abused for not leading out the army which he commanded, and was made responsible for the whole of the public suffering. He, meanwhile, seeing anger and infatuation just now in the ascendant, and of his wisdom in refusing a sally, would not call either assembly or meeting of the people, fearing the fatal results of a debate inspired by passion and not by prudence. Accordingly, he addressed himself to the defense of the city, and kept it as quiet as possible, though he constantly sent out cavalry to prevent raids on the lands near the city from flying parties of the enemy. There was a trifling affair at Phrygia, 
between a squadron of the Athenian horse with the Thessalians and the Boeotian cavalry, in which the former had rather the best of it, until the heavy infantry advanced to the support of the Boeotians, when the Thessalians and Athenians were routed and lost a few men, whose bodies, however, were recovered the same day without a truce. The next day the Peloponnesians set up a trophy. Ancient alliance brought the Thessalians to the aid of Athens, those who came being the Larissians, Pharsalians, Crononians, Parasians, Gertonians, and Phrians. The Larissian commanders were Polymedes and Aristonus, two party leaders in Larissa. The Pharsalian general was Menon. Each of their other cities also had its own commander. In the meantime, the Peloponnesians, as the Athenians did not come out to engage them, broke up from Acharnae and ravaged some of the deems between Mount Parnes and Brilessus. While they were in Attica, the Athenians sent off the hundred ships which they had been preparing round Peloponnese, with a, with a thousand heavy infantry and four hundred archers on board, under the command of Carcinus, son of Xenotimus, Proteus, son of Epicles, and Socrates, son of Antigenes. This armament weighed anchor and started on its cruise, and the Peloponnesians, after remaining in Attica as long as their provisions lasted, retired through Boeotia by a different road to that which they had entered. As they passed Europus, they ravaged the territory of Gria, which is held by the Europeans from Athens, and reaching Peloponnese, broke up to their respective cities. After they had retired, the Athenians set guards by land and sea at the points at which they intended to have regular stations during the war. They also resolved to set apart a special fund of a thousand talents from the monies in the Acropolis. This was not to be spent, but the current expenses of war were to be otherwise provided for. If any one should move or put to the vote a proposition for using the money for any purpose whatever, except that of defending the city in the event of the enemy bringing a fleet to make an attack by sea, it should be a capital offense. With this sum of money, they also set aside a special fleet of one hundred galleys, the best ships of each year, with their captains. None of these were to be used except with the money and against the same peril, should such peril arise. Meanwhile, the Athenians in the, in the hundred ships round Peloponnese, reinforced by a Corsarian squadron of fifty vessels, and some others of the allies in those parts, cruised about the coasts, and ravaged the country. Among other places they landed in Lysonia, and made an assault upon Methon, there being no garrison in the place, and the wall being weak. But it so happened that Brasidas, son of Tellus, a Spartan, was in command of a guard for the defense of the district. Hearing of the attack, he hurried with a hundred heavy infantry to the assistance of the besieged, and dashing the army of the Athenians which was scattered over the country and had its attention turned to the wall, threw himself into Methone. He lost a few men in making good his entrance, but saved the place and won the thanks of Sparta by his exploit, being thus the first officer who obtained this notice during the war. The Athenians at once weighed anchor and continued their cruise. Touching at Phaia and Elis, they ravaged the country for two days and defeated a picked force of three hundred men that had come from the Vale of Elis, in the immediate neighborhood, to the rescue. But a stiff squall came down upon them, and not liking to face it in a place where there was no harbor, most of them got on board their ships, and, doubling point Isithus, sailed into the port of Phia. In the meantime, the Messenians, and some others who could not get on board, marched over by land and took Phia. The fleet afterwards sailed round and picked them up, and then put to sea. Phia being evacuated, as the main army of the Aeleans had now come up. The Athenians continued their cruise and ravaged other places on the coast. About the same time, the Athenians sent thirty ships to cruise round Locris and also to guard Euboea. Cleopompus, son of Clinius, being in command. Making descents from the fleet, he ravaged certain places on the sea coast, and captured Thronium, and took hostages from it. He also defeated Alope, the Elocrians that had assembled to resist him. During the summer, the Athenians also expelled the Aegeanetans with their wives and children from Aegina, on the ground of their having been the chief agents in bringing the war upon them. Besides, 
Aegina lies so near Peloponnese that it seemed safer to send colonists of their own to hold it, and shortly afterwards the settlers were sent out. The banished Aeginetans found an asylum in Theria, which was given them by the Lacedaemon, not only on account of her, of her quarrel with Athens, but also because the Aeginetans had laid her under obligations at the time of the earthquake and the revolt of the Helots. The territory of Thyria is on the frontier of Argolis and Laconia, reaching down to the sea. Those of the Aeginetans who did not settle here were scattered all over the rest of Hellas. The same summer, at the beginning of a new lunar month, the only time, by the way, at which it appears possible, the sun was eclipsed after noon. After it had assumed the form of a crescent and some of the stars had come out, it returned to its natural shape. During the same summer, Nymphodorus, son of Pythes, an Abderite, whose sister Cetalces had married, was made their proxenus by the Athenians and sent for to Athens. They had hitherto considered him their enemy, but he had great influence with Cetalces, and they wished this prince to become their ally. Cetalces was the son of Teres, and king of the Thracians. Teres, the father of Cetalces, was the first to establish the great kingdom of the Adrissians on a scale quite unknown to the rest of Thrace, a large population of the Thraces being independent. This Teres in no way related to Tereus, who married Pandian's daughter Procne from Athens, nor indeed did they belong to the same part of Thrace. Tereus lived in Dolus, part of what is now called Phocis, but which at that time was inhabited by Thracians. It was in this land that the women perpetrated the outrage upon Itis, and many of the poets, when they mention the nightingale, call it the Dolian bird. Besides, Pandion, in contracting an alliance for his daughter, would consider the advantages of mutual assistance, and would naturally prefer a match at the above moderate distance to the journey of many days which separates Athens from the Adrissians. Again, the names are different, and this Tyrius was king of the Odrysians, the first, by the way, who attained to any power. Cetalces, his son, was now sat as an ally by the Athenians, who desired his aid in the reduction of the Thracian towns and of Perdiccas. Coming to Athens, Nymphodorus concluded the alliance with Cetalces, and made his son Sadocus an Athenian citizen, and promised to finish the war in Thrace by persuading Cetalces to send the Athenians a force of Thracian horse and targeteers. He also reconciled them with Perdixus, and induced them to restore Thermid to him, upon which Perdixus at once joined the Athenians and Formio in an expedition against the Chalcidians. Thus Cetalces, son of Teres, king of the Thracians, and Perdixus, son of Alexander, king of the Macedonians, became allies of Athens. Meanwhile, the Athenians in the hundred vessels were still cruising round Peloponnese. After taking Solium, a town belonging to Corinth, and presenting the city and territory to the Acarnians of Polaria, they stormed Astacus, expelled its tyrant Evarchus, and gained the place for their confederacy. Next they sailed to the island of Cephalenia, and brought it over without using force. Cephalenia lies off Arcanarnia and Lucas, and consists of four states, the Paleans, Cranians, Samians, and Proneans. Not long afterwards, the fleet returned to Athens. Toward the autumn of this year, the Athenians invaded the Megarid with their whole levy, resident aliens included, under the command of Pericles, son of Xanthippus. The Athenians in the hundred ships around Peloponnese, on their journey home, had just reached Aegina, and hearing that the citizens at home were in full force at Megara, now sailed over and joined them. This was without doubt the largest army of Athenians ever assembled, the state being still in the flower of her strength, and yet unvisited by the plague. Full ten thousand heavy infantry were in the field, all Athenian citizens, besides the three thousand before Potidaea. Then the resident aliens who joined in the incursion were at least three thousand strong, besides which there was a multitude of light troops. They ravaged the greater part of the territory, and then retired. Other incursions into the Megarid were afterwards made by the Athenians annually during the war, sometimes only with cavalry, sometimes with all their forces. This went on until the capture of Nicaea. 
Atalanta, too, the desert island off the Opuntian coast, was towards the end of this summer converted into a fortified post by the Athenians, in order to prevent privateers issuing from Opus and the rest of Locris and plundering Euboea. Such were the events of this summer after the return of the Peloponnesians from Attica. In the ensuing winter, the Carnanian Evarchus, wishing to return to Astacus, persuaded the Corinthians to sail over with forty ships and fifteen hundred heavy infantry and restore him, himself also hiring some mercenaries. In command of the force were Euphemides, son of Aristonymus, Timoxenus, son of Temocrates, and Eumachus, son of Chrysus, who sailed over and restored him, and after failing in an attempt on some places on the Acarnanian coast, which they were desirous of gaining, began their voyage home. Coasting along shore, they touched at Cephalenia and made a descent on the Cranian territory, and losing some men by the treachery of the Cranians, who fell suddenly upon them after having agreed to treat, put to sea somewhat hurriedly and returned home. In the same winter the Athenians gave a funeral, at the public cost, to those who had first fallen in this war. It was a custom of their ancestors, and the matter of it is as follows. Three days before the ceremony, the bones of the dead are laid out in a tent which has been erected, and their friends bring to their relatives such offerings as they please. In the funeral procession, cypress coffins are borne in cars, one for each tribe the bones of the deceased being placed in the coffin of their tribe. Among these is carried one empty bier, decked for the missing, that is, for those whose bodies could not be recovered. Any citizen or stranger who pleases joins in the procession, and the female relatives are there to wail at the burial. The dead are laid in the public sepulchre in the beautiful suburb of the city, in which those who fall in war are always buried, with the exception of those slain at Marathon, who for their singular and extraordinary valor were interred on the spot where they fell. After the bodies had been laid in the earth, a man chosen by the state, of approved wisdom and eminent reputation, pronounces over them an appropriate panegyric, after which all retire. Such is the manner of the burying, and throughout the whole of the war, whenever the occasion arose, the established custom was observed. Meanwhile, these were the first that had fallen, and Pericles, son of Xanthippus, was chosen to pronounce their elogium. When the first time arrived, he advanced from the sepulchre to an elevated platform in order to be heard by as many of the crowd as possible, and spoke as follows. Most of my predecessors in this place have commended him who made this speech part of the law, telling us that it is well that it should be delivered at the burial of those who fall in battle. For myself, I should have thought that the worth which had displayed itself in deeds would be sufficiently rewarded by honors also shown by deeds, such as you now see in this funeral prepared at the people's cost. And I could have wished that the reputations of many brave men were not to be imperiled in the mouth of a single individual, to stand or fall according as he spoke well or ill. For it is hard to speak properly upon a subject where it is even difficult to convince your hearers that you are speaking the truth. On the one hand, the friend who is familiar with every fact of the story may think that some point has not been set forth with that fullness which he wishes and knows it to deserve. On the other, he who is a stranger to the matter may be led by envy to suspect exaggeration if he hears anything above his own nature. For men can endure to hear others praised only so long as they can severally persuade themselves of their own ability to equal the actions recounted. When this point is passed, envy comes in, and with it incredulity. However, since our ancestors have stamped this custom with their approval, it becomes my duty to obey the law and to try to satisfy your several wishes and opinions as best I may. I shall begin with our ancestors. It is both just and proper that they should have the honor of the first mention on an occasion like the present. They dwelt in the country without break in the succession from generation to generation, and handed it down free to the present time by their valor. And if our more remote ancestors deserve praise, much more do our own fathers, who added to their inheritance the empire which we now possess, 
and spared no pains to be able to leave their acquisitions to us of the present generation. Lastly, there are a few parts of our dominions that have not been augmented by those of us here, who are still more or less in the vigor of life, while the mother country has been furnished by us with everything that can enable her to depend on her own resources, whether for war or peace. That part of our history which tells us of the military achievements which gave us our several possessions, or of the ready valor with which either we or our fathers stemmed the tide of Hellenic or foreign aggression, is a theme too familiar to my hearers for me to dilate on, and I shall therefore pass it by. But what was the road by which we reached our position? What the form of government under which our greatness grew? What the national habits out of which it sprang? These are questions which I may try to solve before I proceed to my panegyric upon these men, since I think this to be a subject which on the present occasion a speaker may properly dwell, and to which the whole assemblage, whether citizens or foreigners, may listen with advantage. Our constitution does not copy the laws of neighboring states. We are rather a pattern to others than imitators ourselves. Its administration favors the many instead of the few. This is why it is called a democracy. If we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all in their private differences. If no social standing, advancement in public life falls to reputation for capacity, class considerations not being allowed to interfere with merit. Nor again does poverty bar the way. If a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. The freedom which we enjoy in our government extends also to our ordinary life. There, far from exercising a jealous surveillance over each other, we do not feel called upon to be angry with our neighbor for doing what he likes, or even to indulge in those injurious looks which cannot fail to be offensive, although they inflict no positive penalty. But all this ease in our private relations does not make us lawless as citizens. Against this fear is our chief safeguard teaching us to obey the magistrates and the laws, particularly such as regard the protection of the injured, whether they are actually on the statute book, or belong to that code which, although unwritten, yet cannot be broken without acknowledged disgrace. Further, we provide plenty of means for the mind to refresh itself from business. We celebrate games and sacrifices all the year round, and the elegance of our private establishments forms a daily source of pleasure and helps to banish the spleen while the magnitude of our city draws the produce of the world into our harbor, so that to the Athenian the fruits of other countries are as familiar a luxury as those of his own. If we turn to our military policy, there also we differ from our antagonists. We throw open our city to the world, and never by alien acts exclude foreigners from any opportunity of learning or observing, although the eyes of an enemy may occasionally profit by our liberality. Trusting less in system and policy than to the native spirit of our citizens. While in education, where our rivals from their very cradles by a painful discipline seek after manliness, at Athens we live exactly as we please, and yet are just as ready to encounter every legitimate danger. In proof of this, it must be noticed that the Lacedaemonians do not invade our country alone, but bring with them all their confederates while we Athenians advance unsupported into the territory of a neighbor, and fighting upon a foreign soil, usually vanquish with ease men who are defending their homes. Our united force was never yet encountered by any enemy, because we have at once to attend to our, ma our marine and to dispatch our citizens by land upon a hundred different services, so that wherever they engage with some such fraction of our strength, a success against a detachment is magnified into a victory over the nation and a defeat into a reverse suffered at the hands of our entire people. And yet with habits not of labor, but of ease, and courage not of art, but of nature, we are still willing to encounter danger. We have the double advantage of escaping the experience of hardships in anticipation, and of facing them in the hour of need, as fearlessly as those who are never free from them. Nor are these the only points in which our city is worthy of admiration. We cultivate refinement without extravagance, and knowledge without effeminacy. Wealth we employ more for use than for show, and place the real disgrace of poverty not in owning to the fact, but in declining the struggle against it. Our public men have, 
besides politics, there are private affairs to attend to, and our ordinary citizens, though occupied with the pursuits of industry, are still fair judges of public matters. For, unlike any other nation, regarding him who takes no part in these duties not as an unambitious, but as useless, we Athenians are able to judge at all events if we cannot originate, and, instead of looking on discussion as a stumbling block in the way of action, we think it an indispensable preliminary to any wise action at all. Again, in our enterprises we present the singular spectacle of daring and deliberation, each carried to its highest point, and both united in the same persons. Although usually decision is the fruit of ignorance, hesitation of reflection. But the palm of courage will surely be adjudged most justly to those who best know the difference between hardship and pleasure, and yet are never tempted to shrink from danger. In generosity we are equally singular, acquiring our friends by conferring, not by receiving, favors. Yet, of course, the doer of the favor is the firmer friend of the two, in order by continued kindness to keep the recipient in his debt, while the debtor feels less keenly from the very consciousness that the return he makes will be a payment, not a free gift. And it is only the Athenians who, fearless of consequences, confer their benefits not from calculations of expediency, but in the confidence of liberality. In short, I say that as a city we are the school of Hellas, while I doubt if the world can produce a man who, where he has only himself to depend upon, is equal to so many emergencies, and graced by so happy a versatility as the Athenian. And that this is no mere boast thrown out for the occasion, but plain matter of fact, the power of the state acquired by these habits proves. For Athens alone of her contemporaries is found when tested to be greater than her reputation, and alone gives no occasion to her assailants to blush at the antagonist by whom they have been worsted, or to her subjects to question her title by merit to rule. Rather, the admiration of the present and succeeding ages will be ours, since we have not left our power without witness, but have shown it by mighty proofs, and far from needing a Homer for our panegyrist, or other of his craft whose verses might charm for the moment, only for the impression which they gave to melt at the touch of fact, we have forced every sea and land to be the highway of our daring, and everywhere, whether for evil or for good, have left imperishable monuments behind us. Such is the Athens for which these men, in the assertion of their resolve not to lose her, nobly fought and died, and well may every one of their survivors be ready to suffer in her cause. Indeed, if I have dwelt at some length upon the character of our country, it has been to show that our stake in the struggle is not the same as theirs who have no such blessings to lose, and also that the panegyric of the men over whom I, whom I am now speaking might be by definite proofs established. That panegyric is now in a great measure complete, for the Athens that I have celebrated is only what the heroism of these and their like have made her, men whose fame, unlike that of most Hellenes, will be found to be only commensurate with their deserts. And if a test of worth be wanted, it is to be found in their closing scene, and this not only in cases in which it set the final seal upon their merit, but also in those which it gave the first intimation of their having any. For there is justice in the claim that steadfastness in his country's battles should be as a cloak to cover a man's other imperfections. Since the good action has blotted out the bad, and his merit as a citizen more than outweighed his demerits as an individual. But none of these allowed either wealth, with its prospect of future employment, to unnerve his spirit, or poverty, with its hope of a day of freedom and riches, to tempt him to shrink from danger. No. Holding that vengeance upon their enemies was more to be desired than any personal blessings, and reckoning this to be the most glorious of hazards, they joyfully determined to accept the risk, to make sure of their vengeance, and to let their wishes wait. And while committing to hope the uncertainty of final success, in the business before them they thought fit to act boldly and trust in themselves. Thus, choosing to die resisting rather than live submitting, they fled only from dishonor, but met danger face to face, and after one brief moment, while at the summit of their fortune, escaped, not from their fear, but from their glory. So died these men, as became Athenians. You, their survivors, must determine to have as unfaltering a resolution in the field, though you may pray that it may have a happier issue, and not contented with ideas derived only from words of the advantages which are bound up with the defense of your country. 
though these would furnish a valuable text to a speaker even before an audience so alive to them as the present. You must yourselves realize the power of Athens, and feed your eyes upon her from day to day, till the love of her fills your hearts. And then, when all her greatness shall break upon you, you must reflect that it was by courage, sense of duty, and a keen feeling of honor in action that men were enabled to win all this, and that no personal failure in an enterprise could make them consent to deprive their country of their valor. But they laid it at her feet as the most glorious contribution that they could offer. For this offering their lives made in common, by them all, they each of them individually received that renown which never grows old, and for a sepulchre, not so much that in that in which their bones have been deposited, but that noblest of shrines wherein their glory is laid up to be eternally remembered upon every occasion on which deed or story shall call for its commemoration. For heroes have the whole earth for their tomb, and in lands far from their own, where the column with its epitaph declares it, there is enshrined in every breast a record unwritten, with no tablet to preserve it, except that of the heart. These take as your model, and, judging happiness to be the fruit of, of freedom, and freedom of valor, of valor, never decline the dangers of war, for it is not the miserable that would most justly be unsparing of their lives. These have nothing to hope for. It is rather they to whom contributed life, continued life may bring reverses as yet unknown, and to whom a fall, if it came, would be most tremendous in its consequences. And surely, to a man of spirit, the degradation of cowardice must be immeasurably more grievous than the unfelt death which strikes him in the midst of his strength and patriotism. Comfort, therefore, not condolence, is what I have to offer to the parents of the dead who may be here. Numberless are the chances to which, as they know, the life of a man is subject. But fortunate indeed are they who draw for their lot a death so glorious as that which has caused your mourning, and to whom life has been so exactly measured as to terminate in the happiness in which it has been passed. Still I know that this is a hard saying, especially when those are in, are in question of whom you will constantly be reminded, by seeing in the homes of others blessings of which once you also boasted. For grief is felt not so much for the want of what we have never known, as for the loss of that to which we have been long accustomed. Yet you, who are still of an age to beget children, must bear up in the hope of having others in their stead. Not only will they help you to forget those whom you have lost, but will be to the state at once a reinforcement and a security. For never can a fair or just policy be expected of the citizen who does not, like his fellows, bring to the decision the interests and apprehensions of a father. While those of you who have pressed your prime must congratulate yourselves with the thought that the best part of your life was fortunate, and that the brief span that remains will be cheered by the fame of the departed. For it is only the love of honor that never grows old, and honor it is, not gain, as some would have it, that rejoices the heart of age and helplessness. Turning to the sons or brothers of the dead, I see an arduous struggle before you. When a man is gone, all are wont to praise him, and should your merit be ever so transcendent, you will still find it difficult not merely to overtake, but even to approach their renown. The living have envy to contend with, while those who are no longer in our path are honored with a good will into which rivalry does not enter. On the other hand, if I must say anything on the subject of female excellence to those of you who will now be in widowhood, it will be all comprised in this brief exhortation. Great will be your glory in not falling short of your natural character, and greatest will be hers who is least talked of among the men, whether for good or for bad. My task now is finished. I have performed it to the best of my ability, and in word at least the requirements of the law are now satisfied. If deeds be in question, those who are here interred have received part of their honors already, and for the rest, their children will be brought up till manhood at the public expense. The state thus offers a valuable prize, as the garland of victory in this race of valor, for the reward both of those who have fallen and their survivors. And where the rewards for merit are greatest, there are found the best citizens. And now that you have brought to a close your lamentations for your relatives, you may depart. This is the end of chapter 6. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Translated by Richard Crawley Book 2, Chapter 7 Second Year of the War The Plague of Athens Position and Policy of Pericles Fall of Potidaea Such was the funeral that took place during this winter, with which the first year of the war came to an end. In the first days of summer, the Lacedaemonians and their allies, with two-thirds of their forces as before, invaded Attica, under the command of Archidamus, son of Zeusidamus, king of Lacedaemon, and sat down and laid waste to the country. Not many days after their arrival in Attica, the plague first began to show itself among the Athenians. It was said that it had broken out in many places previously in the neighborhood of Lemnos and elsewhere, but a pestilence of such extent and mortality was nowhere remembered. Neither were the physicians at first of any service, ignorant as they were of the proper way to treat it, but they died themselves the most thickly, as they visited the sick most often. Nor did any human art succeed any better. Supplications in the temples, divinations, and so forth were found equally futile, till the overwhelming nature of the disaster at last put a stop to them altogether. It first began, it is said, in the parts of Ethiopia above Egypt, and thence descended into Egypt and Libya and into most of the king's country. Suddenly falling upon Athens, it first attacked the population in Piraeus, which was the occasion of their saying that the Peloponnesians had poisoned the reservoirs, there being as yet no walls there, and afterwards appeared in the upper city, when the deaths became much more frequent. All speculation as to its origin and its causes, if causes can be found adequate to produce so great a disturbance, I leave to other writers, whether lay or professional. For myself, I shall simply set down its nature, and explain the symptoms by which perhaps it may be recognized by the student, if it should ever break out again. This I can the better do, as I had the disease myself, and watched its operation in the case of others. That year, then, is admitted to have been otherwise unprecedentedly free from sickness, and such few cases as occurred all determined in this. As a rule, however, there were no ostensible cause, but people in good health were all of a sudden attacked by violent heats in the head, and redness and inflammation in the eyes, the inward parts, such as the throat or tongue, becoming bloody and emitting an unnatural and fetid breath. These symptoms were followed by sneezing and hoarseness, after which the pain soon reached the chest and produced a hard cough. When it fixed in the stomach, it upset it, and discharges of bile of every kind named by physicians ensued, accompanied by very great distress. In most cases also an ineffectual retching followed, producing violent spasms, which in some cases ceased soon after, in others much later. Externally the body was not very hot in the touch, nor pale in its appearance, but reddish, livid, and breaking out into small pustules and ulcers. But internally it burned so, the patient could not bear to have on him clothing or linen even of the very lightest description, or indeed to be otherwise than stark naked. What they would have liked best would have been to throw themselves into cold water, as indeed was done by some of the neglected sick who plunged into the rain tanks in the agonies of unquenchable thirst, though it made no difference whether they drank little or much. Besides this, the miserable feeling of not being able to rest or sleep never ceased to torment them. The body, meanwhile, did not waste away so long as the distemper was at its height, but held out to a marvel against its ravages, so that when they succumbed, as in most cases, on the seventh or eighth day, to the internal inflammation. They had still some strength in them. But if they passed this stage, and the disease descended further into the bowels, inducing a violent ulceration there accompanied by severe diarrhea, this brought on a weakness which was generally fatal. 
for the disorder first settled in the head, ran its course from thence through the whole of the body, and, even where it did not prove mortal, it still left its mark on the extremities, for it settled in the privy parts, the fingers and the toes, and many escaped with the loss of these, some too with that of their eyes. Others again were seized with an entire loss of memory on their first recovery, and did not know either themselves or their friends. But while the nature of the distemper was such as to baffle all description, and its attacks almost too grievous for human nature to endure, it was still in the following circumstance that its difference from all ordinary disorders was most clearly shown. All the birds and beasts that prey upon human bodies either abstained from touching them, though there were many lying unburied, or died after tasting them. In proof of this, it was noticed that birds of this kind actually disappeared. They were not about the bodies, or indeed to be seen at all. But of course the effects which I have mentioned could best be studied in a domestic animal like the dog. Such then, if we pass over the varieties of particular cases, which were many and peculiar, were the general features of the distemper. Meanwhile, the town enjoyed an immunity from all the ordinary disorders, or if any case occurred, it ended in this. Some died in neglect, others in the midst of every attention. No remedy was found that could be used as a specific, for what did good in one case did harm in another. Strong and weak constitutions proved equally incapable of resistance all alike being swept away, although dieted with the utmost precaution. By far the most terrible feature in the malady was the dejection which ensued when any one felt himself sickening, for the despair into which they instantly fell took away their power of resistance, and left them a much easier prey to the disorder. Besides which, there was the awful spectacle of men dying like sheep, through having caught the infection in nursing each other. This caused the greatest mortality. On the one hand, if they were afraid to visit each other, they perished from neglect. Indeed, many houses were emptied of the inmates for want of a nurse. On the other, if they ventured to do so, death was the consequence. This was especially the case which such as made any pretensions to goodness. Honor made them unsparing of themselves and their attendants in their friends' houses where even the members of the family were at last worn out by the moans of the dying, and succumbed to the force of the disaster. Yet it was with those who had recovered from the disease that the sick and the dying found their most compassion. These knew what it was from experience, and had now no fear for themselves, for the same man was never attacked twice, never at least fatally. And such persons not only received the congratulations of others, but themselves also, in the elation of the moment, half entertained the vain hope that they were for the future safe from any disease whatsoever. An aggravation of the existing calamity was the influx from the country into the city, and this was especially felt by the new arrivals. As there were no houses to receive them, they had to be lodged at the hot season of the year in stifling cabins, where the mortality raged without restraint. The bodies of dying men lay one upon another, and half-dead creatures reeled about the streets and gathered round all the fountains in their longing for water. The sacred places also in which they had quartered themselves were full of corpses of persons that had died there, just as they were, for as the disaster passed all bounds, men, not knowing what was to become of them, became utterly careless of everything, whether sacred or profane. All the burial rites before in use were entirely upset, and they buried the bodies as best they could. Many from want of the proper appliances, though, so many of their friends having died already, had recourse to the most shameless sepultures, sometimes getting the start of those who had raised a pile. They threw their own dead body upon the stranger's pyre and ignited it. Sometimes they tossed the corpse which they were carrying on the top of another that was burning and so went off. Nor was this the only form of lawless extravagance which owed its origin to the plague. Men now coolly ventured on what they formerly had done in a corner, and not just as they pleased, 
seeing the rapid transitions produced by persons in prosperity suddenly dying, and those who before had nothing succeeding to their property. So they resolved to spend quickly and enjoy themselves, regarding their lives and riches alike as things of a day. Perseverance in what men called honor was popular with none. It was so uncertain whether they would be spared to attain the object. But it was settled that present enjoyment, and all that contributed to it, was both honorable and useful. Fear of gods or law of man there was none to restrain them. As for the first, they judged it to be just the same whether they worshipped them or, or not, as they saw all alike perishing. And for the last, no one expected to live to be brought to trial for his offenses, but each felt that a far severer sentence had already been passed upon them all and hung over their heads. And before this fell, it was only reasonable to enjoy life a little. Such was the nature of the calamity, and heavily did it weigh on the Athenians, death raging within the city and devastation without. Among other things which they remembered in their distress was, very naturally, the following verse which the old men said had long ago been uttered. A Dorian war shall come, and with it death. So a dispute arose as to whether dearth and not death had not been the word in the verse. But at the present juncture it was, of course, decided in favor of the latter. For the people made their recollection fit in with their sufferings. I fancy, however, that if another Dorian war should ever afterwards come upon us, and a dearth should happen to accompany it, the verse will probably be read accordingly. The oracle also which had given to the Lacedaemonians was now remembered by those who knew of it. When the god was asked whether they should go to war, he answered that if they put their might into it, victory would be theirs, and that he would himself be with them. With this oracle, events were supposed to tally, for the plague broke out as soon as the Peloponnesians invaded Attica, and never entering Peloponnese, not at least to an extent worth noticing, committed its worst ravages at Athens, and next to Athens, at the most populous of the other towns. Such was the history of the plague. After ravaging the plain, the Peloponnesians advanced into the Perellian region as far as Lorium, where the Athenian silver mines are, and first laid waste the side looking towards Peloponnese, next that which faces Euboea and Andros. But Pericles, who was still a general, held the same opinion as in the former invasion, and would not let the Athenians march out against them. However, while they were still in the plain, and had not yet entered the Perellian land, he had prepared an armament of a hundred ships for Peloponnese, and when all was ready to put out to sea. On board the ships he took four thousand Athenian heavy infantry, and three hundred cavalry and horse transports, and then for the first time made out of old galleys, fifty Chian and Lesbian vessels also joining the expedition. When this Athenian armament put out to sea, they left the Peloponnesians in Attica, in the Perellian region. Arriving at Epidaurus in Peloponnese, they ravaged most of the territory, and even had hopes of taking the town by an assault. In this, however, they were not successful. Putting out from Epidaurus, they laid waste the territory of Trozen, Helaeus, and Hermione, all towns on the coast of Peloponnese, and thence sailing to Persia, a maritime town in Laconia, ravaged part of its territory, and took and sacked the place itself, after which they returned home, but found the Peloponnesians gone, and no longer in Attica. During the whole time that the Peloponnesians were in Attica, and the Athenians on the expedition in their ships, men kept dying of the plague, both in the armament and in Athens. Indeed, it was actually asserted that the departure of the Peloponnesians was hastened by fear of the disorder, as they heard from deserters that it was in the city, and also could see the burials going on. Yet in this invasion they remained longer than in any other, and ravaged the whole country, for they were about forty days in Attica. The same summer Hagnon, son of Nicias, and Cleopompus, son of Clinius, the colleagues of Pericles, took the armament of which he had lately made use, and went off upon an expedition against the Chalcidians 
in the direction of Thrace and Potidaea, which was still under siege. As soon as they arrived, they brought up their engines against Potidaea and tried every means of taking it, but did not succeed either in capturing the city or in doing anything else worthy of their preparations. For the plague attacked them here also, and committed such havoc as to cripple them completely. Even the previously healthy soldiers of the former expedition catching the infection from Hegnon's troops. While Formio and the sixteen hundred men whom they commanded only escaped by being no longer in the neighborhood of the Chalcidians, the end of it was that Hegnon returned with his ships to Athens, having lost one thousand and fifty out of four thousand heavy infantry in about four days. Though the soldiers stationed there before remained in the country and carried on the siege of Potidaea. After the second invasion of the Peloponnesians, a change came over the spirit of the Athenians. Their land had now been twice laid waste, and war and pestilence at once pressed heavy upon them. They began to find fault with Pericles, as the author of the war and the cause of all their misfortunes, and became eager to come to terms with Lacedaemon, and actually sent ambassadors thither, who did not, however, succeed in their mission. Their despair was now complete, and all vented itself upon Pericles. When he saw them exasperated at the present turn of affairs, and acting exactly as he had anticipated, he called an assembly, being, it must be remembered, still general, with the double object of restoring confidence and of leading them from these angry feelings to a calmer and more helpful state of mind. He accordingly came forward and spoke as follows. I was not unprepared for the indignation of which I have been the object, as I know its causes, and I have called an assembly for the purpose of reminding you upon certain points, and of protesting against your being unreasonably irritated with me, or cowed by your sufferings. I am of the opinion that national greatness is, is more for the advantage of private citizens than any individual well-being coupled with public humiliation. A man may be personally ever so well off, and yet if his country be ruined, he must be ruined with it, whereas a flourishing commonwealth always affords chances of salvation to unfortunate individuals. Since then, a state can support the misfortunes of private citizens, while they cannot support hers. It is surely the duty of every one to be forward in her defense, and not like you to be so confounded with your domestic afflictions as to give up all thoughts of the common safety, and to blame me for having counseled war, and yourselves for having voted it. And yet, if you are angry with me, it is with one who, as I believe, is second to no man either in knowledge of the proper policy, or in the ability to expound it, and who is moreover not only a patriot, but an honest one. A man possessing that knowledge, without that faculty of exposition, might as well have no idea at all on the matter. If he had both these gifts, but no love for his country, he would be but a cold advocate for her interests. While were his patriotism not proof against bribery, everything would go for a price. So that if you thought that I was even moderately distinguished for these qualities, when you took my advice and went to war, there is certainly no reason now why I should be charged with having done wrong. For those, of course, who have a free choice in the matter, and whose fortunes are not at stake, war is the greatest of follies. But if the only choice was being submission with loss of independence, and danger with hope of preserving that independence, in such a case it is he who will not accept the risk that deserves blame, not he who will. I am the same man and do not alter. It is you who change, since in fact you took my advice while unhurt and waited for misfortune to repent of it. And the apparent error of my policy lies in the infirmity of your resolution, since the suffering that it entails is being felt by every one among you, while its advantage is still remote and obscure to all. And a great and sudden reverse having befallen you, your mind is too much depressed to persevere in your resolves. For before what is sudden, unexpected, and least within calculation, the spirit quails. And putting all else aside, the plague has certainly been an emergency of this kind. Born, however, as you are, citizens of a great state, and brought up, as you have been, with habits equal to your birth, you should be ready to face the greatest disasters, 
and still to keep unimpaired the luster of your name. For the judgment of mankind is as relentless to the weakness that falls short of a recognized renown as it is jealous of the arrogance that aspires higher than its due. Cease then to grieve for your private afflictions, and address yourself instead to the safety of the commonwealth. If you shrink before the exertions which the war makes necessary, and fear that after all they may not have a happy result, you know the reasons by which I have often demonstrated to you the groundlessness of your apprehensions. If those are not enough, I will now reveal an advantage arising from the greatness of your dominion, which I think has never yet suggested itself to you, which I never mentioned in my previous speeches, and which has so bold a sound that I could scarcely adventure it now, were it not for the unnatural depression which I see around me. You perhaps think that your empire extends only over your allies. I will declare to you the truth. The visible field of action has two parts, land and sea. In the whole of one of these you are completely supreme, not merely as far as you use it at present, but also to what further extent you may think fit. In fine, your naval resources are such that your vessels may go where they please, without the king or any other nation on earth being able to stop them, so that although you may think it a great privation to lose the use of your land and houses, still you must see that this power is something widely different and instead of fretting on their account, you should really regard them in the light of the gardens and other accessories that embellish a great fortune, and as, in comparison, of little moment. You should know, too, that liberty preserved by your efforts will easily recover for us what we have lost, while, the knee once bowed, even what you have will pass from you, your fathers receiving those possessions not from others, but from themselves did not let slip what their labor had acquired, but delivered them safely to you. And in this respect, at least, you must prove yourselves their equals, remembering that to lose what one has got is more disgraceful than to be balked in getting. And you must confront your enemies not merely with spirit, but with disdain. Confidence, indeed, a blissful ignorance can impart, a, even to a coward's breast. But disdain is the privilege of those who, like us, have been assured by reflection of their superiority to their adversary. And where the chances are the same, knowledge fortifies courage by the contempt which is its consequence, its trust being placed, not in hope, which is the prop of the desperate, but in a judgment grounded upon existing resources, whose anticipations are more to be depended upon. Again, your country has a right to your services in sustaining the glories of her position. These are a common source of pride to you all, and you cannot decline the burdens of empire and still expect to share its honors. You should remember also that what you are fighting against is not merely slavery as an exchange for independence, but also loss of empire and danger from the animosities incurred in its exercise. Besides, to recede is no longer possible if indeed any of you in the alarm of the moment has become enamored of the honesty of such an unambitious part. For what you hold is, to speak somewhat plainly, a tyranny. To take it perhaps was wrong, but to let it go is unsafe. And men of these retiring views, making converts of others, would quickly ruin a state. Indeed, the result would be the same if they could live independent by themselves. For the retiring and unambitious are never secure without vigorous protectors at their side. In fine, such qualities are useless to an imperial city, though they may help a dependency to an unmolested servitude. But you must not be seduced by citizens like these, or angry with me, who, if I voted for war, only did as you did yourselves, in spite of the enemy having invaded your country, and done what you could be certain that he would do, if you refused to comply with his demands. And although besides what we counted for, the plague has come upon us, the only point indeed at, in which our calculation has been at fault. It is this, I know, that has had a large share in making me more unpopular than I should otherwise have been, quite undeservedly, unless you are also prepared to give me the credit of any success with which chance may present you. Besides, 
The hand of heaven must be borne with resignation, that of the enemy with fortitude. This was the old way at Athens, and do not you prevent it being so still. Remember, too, that if your country has the greatest name in all the world, it is because she never bent before disaster, because she has expended more life and effort in war than any other city, and has won for herself a power greater than any hitherto known the memory of which will descend to the latest posterity. Even if now, in obedience to the general law of decay, we should ever be forced to yield, still it will be remembered that we held rule over more Hellenes than any other Hellenic state, that we sustained the greatest wars against their united or separate powers, and inhabited a city unrivaled by any other in resources or magnitude. These glories may incur the censure of the slow and unambitious, but in the breast of energy they will awake emulation, and in those who must remain without them an envious regret. Hatred and unpopularity at the moment have fallen to the lot of all who have aspired to rule others. But where odium must be incurred, true wisdom incurs it for the highest objects. Hatred also is short-lived, but that which makes the splendor of the present and the glory of the future remains forever unforgotten. Make your decision, therefore, for glory then, and honor now, and attain both objects by instant and zealous effort. Do not send heralds to Lacedaemon, and do not betray any sign of being oppressed by your present sufferings, since they whose minds are least sensitive to calamity, and whose hands are most quick to meet it, are the greatest men and the greatest communities. Such were the arguments by which Pericles tried to cure the Athenians of their anger against him, and to divert their thoughts from their immediate afflictions. As a community he succeeded in convincing them. They not only gave up all idea of sending to Lacedaemon, but applied themselves with increased energy to the war. Still, as private individuals, they could not help smarting under their sufferings, the common people having been deprived of the little that they were possessed. While the higher orders had lost fine properties, with costly establishments and buildings in the country, and, worst of all, had war instead of peace. In fact, the public feeling against him did not subside until he had been fined. Not long afterwards, however, according to the way of the multitude, they again elected him general and committed all their affairs to his hands, having now become less sensitive to their private and domestic afflictions, and understanding that he was the best man of all for the public necessities. For as long as he was at the head of the state, during the peace, he pursued a moderate and conservative policy, and in his time its greatness was at its height. When the war broke out, here also he seems to have rightly gauged the power of his country. He outlived its commencement two years and six months, and the correctness of his provisions respecting it became better known by his death. He told them to wait quietly, to pay attention to their marine to attempt no new conquests, and to expose the city to no hazards during the war, and doing this, promised them a favorable result. What they did was the very contrary, allowing private ambitions and private interests, in matters apparently quite foreign to the war, to lead them into projects unjust both to themselves and to their allies, projects whose success would only conduce to the honor and advantage of private persons and whose failure entailed certain disaster on the country in the war. The causes of this are not far to seek. Pericles, indeed, by his rank, ability, and known integrity, was enabled to exercise an independent control over the multitude. In short, to lead them instead of being led by them, for as he never sought power by improper means, he was never compelled to flatter them, but on the contrary, enjoyed so high an estimation that he could afford to anger them by contradiction. Whenever he saw them unseasonably and insolently elated, he would with a word reduce them to alarm. On the other hand, if they fell victims to a panic, he could at once restore them to confidence. In short, what was nominally a democracy became in his hands government by the first citizen. With his successors it was different, more on a level with one another, and each grasping at supremacy, they ended by committing even the conduct of state affairs to the whims of the multitude. This, as might have been expected in a great and sovereign state, 
produced a host of blunders, and amongst them the Sicilian expedition. Though this failed not so much through a miscalculation of the power of those against whom it was sent, as through a fault in the senders in not taking the best measures afterwards to assist those who had gone out, but choosing rather to occupy themselves with private cabals for the leadership of the commons, by which they not only paralyzed operations in the field, but also first introduced civil discord at home. Yet, after losing most of their fleet besides other forces in Sicily, and with faction already dominant in the city, they could still for three years make head against their original adversaries, joined not only by the Sicilians, but also by their own allies, nearly all in revolt, and at last by the king's son Cyrus, who furnished the funds for the Peloponnesian navy. Nor did they finally succumb till they fell the victims of their own intestine disorders. So superfluously abundant were the resources from which the genius of Pericles foresaw an easy triumph in the war over the unaided forces of the Peloponnesians. During the same summer, the Lacedaemonians and their allies made an expedition with a hundred ships against Sassathus, an island lying off the coast of Elis, peopled by a colony of Achaeans from Peloponnese and in alliance with Athens. There were a thousand Lacedaemonian heavy infantry on board, and Snamus, a Spartan, as admiral. They made a descent from their ships, and ravaged most of the country, but as the inhabitants would not submit, they sailed back home. At the end of the same summer the Corinthian, Aristius, and Aristus, Nicholas, and Stratodemus, envoys from Lacedaemon, to Magoras, a Tegean, and a private individual named Paulus from Argos, on their way to Asia to persuade the king to supply funds and join in the war, came to Sesalces, son of Teres, in Thrace, with the idea of inducing him, if possible, to forsake the alliance of Athens and to march on Potidaea, then besieged by an Athenian force, and also of getting conveyed by his means to their destination across the Hellespont, to Pharnabazus, who was to send them up the country to the king. But there chanced to be with Satalces some Athenian ambassadors, Lercus, son of Calamachus, and Aminides, son of Philemon, who persuaded Satalces' son, Sadocus, the new Athenian citizen, to put the men into their hands and thus prevent their crossing over to the king and doing their part to injure the country of his choice. He accordingly had them seized, as they were traveling through Thrace to the vessel in which they were to cross the Hellespont, by a party whom he had sent on with Laarchus and Aminides, and gave orders for their delivery to the Athenian ambassadors, by whom they were brought to Athens. On their arrival the Athenians, afraid that Aristius, who had been notably the prime mover in the previous affairs of Potidaea and their Thracian possessions, might live to do them still more mischief if he escaped, slew them all on the same day, without giving them a trial or hearing the defense which they wished to offer, and cast their bodies into a pit, thinking themselves justified in using in retaliation the same war mode of warfare which the Lacedaemonians had begun, when they slew and cast into pits all the Athenian and allied traders whom they caught on board the merchantmen round Peloponnese. Indeed, at the outset of the war, the Lacedaemonians butchered as enemies all whom they took on the sea, whether allies of Athens or neutrals. About the same time, towards the close of the summer, the Ambraciot forces, with a number of barbarians that they had raised, marched against the Amphilochian Argos and the rest of that country. The origin of their enmity towards the Argives was this. This Argos and the rest of Amphilochia were colonized by Amphilochus, son of Amphiaris. Dissatisfied with the state of affairs at home on his return thither after the Trojan War, he built the city in the Ambracian Gulf, and named it Argos, after his own country. This was the largest town in Amphilochia, and its inhabitants the most powerful. Under the pressure of misfortune, many generations afterwards, they called in the Ambrosiates, their neighbors, on the Amphilochian border, to join their colony, and it was by this union with the Ambrosiates that they learnt their present Hellenic speech, the rest of the Amphilochians being barbarians. After a time, the Ambrosiates expelled the Argives and held the city themselves. 
Upon this the Amphilochians gave themselves over to the Acarnanians, and the two together called the Athenians, who sent them Formio as general and thirty ships, upon whose arrival they took Argos by storm, and made slaves of the Ambrosians, and the Amphilochians and Acarnanians inhabited the town in common. After this began the alliance between the Athenians and the Acarnanians. The enmity of the Ambrosians against the Argives thus commenced with the enslavement of their citizens. And afterwards, during the war, they collected this armament among themselves and the Achaeonians and other of the neighboring barbarians. Arrived before Argos, they became masters of the country, but not being successful in their attacks upon the town, returned home and dispersed among their different peoples. Such were the events of the summer. The ensuing winter, the Athenians sent twenty ships round Peloponnese, under the command of Formio, who stationed himself at Napecatus, and kept watch against any one sailing in or out of Corinth and the Crissian Gulf. Six others went to Caria and Lycia under Melisander, to collect tribute in those parts, and also to prevent the Peloponnesian privateers from taking up their station in those waters, and molesting the passage of the merchantmen from Phasilus and Phoenicia and the adjoining continent. However, Messalander, going up the country into Lycia with a force of Athenians from the ships and the allies, was defeated and killed in battle, with the loss of a number of his troops. The same winter the Potidians at length found themselves no longer able to hold out against their besiegers. The inroads of the Peloponnesians into Attica had not had the desired effect of making the Athenians rise the siege. Provisions there were none left, and so far had distressed for food gone in Potidia that, besides a number of other horrors, instances had even occurred of the people having eaten one another. In this extremity, they at last made proposals for capitulating to the Athenian generals in command against them. Xenophon, son of Euripides, Hestiodorus, son of Aristocleides, and Phenomachus, son of Callimachus. The generals accepted their proposals, seeing the sufferings of the army in so exposed a position, besides which the state had already spent two thousand talents upon the siege. The terms of the capitulation were as follows. A free passage out for themselves, their children, wives, and auxiliaries, with one garment apiece, the women with two, and a fixed sum of money for their journey. Under this treaty they went out to Chalcides and other places, according as was their power. The Athenians, however, blamed the generals for granting terms without instructions from home, being of opinion that the place would have had to surrender at discretion. They afterwards sent settlers of their own to Potidia and colonized it. Such were the events of the winter, and so ended the second year of this war, which Thucydides was the historian. This is the end of chapter 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Chapter 8 Third Year of the War Investment of Plataea Naval Victories of Formio Thracian interruption into Macedonia under Cetelces. The next summer, the Peloponnesians and their allies, instead of invading Attica, marched against Plataea, under the command of Archidamus, son of Zeusidamus, king of the Lacedaemonians. He had encamped his army, and was about to lay waste the country, when the Plataeans hastened to send envoys to him, and spoke as follows. Archidamus and Lacedaemonians. In invading the Plataean territory, you do what is wrong in itself, and worthy neither of yourselves nor of the fathers who begot you. Pausanias, son of Cleombrotus, your countryman, after freeing Hellas from the Medes with the help of those Hellenes who were willing to undertake the risk of the battle fought near our city, offered sacrifice to Zeus the Liberator in the marketplace of Plataea and calling all the allies together restored to the Plataeans their city and territory, and declared it independent and inviolate against aggression or conquest. 
Should any such be attempted, the allies present were to help according to their power. Your fathers rewarded us thus for the courage and patriotism that we displayed at that perilous epoch. But you do just the contrary, coming with our bitterest enemies, the Thebans, to enslave us. We appeal, therefore, to the gods to whom the oaths were then made, to the gods of your ancestors, and lastly, to those of our country, and call upon you to refrain from violating our territory or transgressing the oaths, and to let us live independent, as Pausanias decreed. The Plataeans had got thus far when they were cut short by Archidamus, saying, There is justice, Plataeans, in what you say, if you act up to your words. According to the grant of Pausanias, continue to be independent yourselves, and join in freeing those of your fellow countrymen who, after sharing in the perils of that period, joined in the oaths to you, and are now subject to the Athenians, for it is to free them and the rest that all this provision and war has been made. I wish that you would share our labors and abide by the oaths yourselves. If this is impossible, do what we have already required of you. Remain neutral, enjoying your own, Join neither side, but receive both as friends, neither as allies for the war. With thus we shall be satisfied. Such were the words of Archidamus. The Plataeans, after hearing what he had to say, went into the city and acquainted the people with what had passed, and presently returned for answer that it was impossible for them to do what he proposed, without consulting the Athenians, with whom their children and wives now were. Besides which, they had their fears for the town. After his departure, what was to prevent the Athenians from coming and taking it out of their hands, or the Thebans, who would be included in the oaths, from taking advantage of the proposed neutrality to make a second attempt to seize the city? Upon these points he tried to reassure them by saying, You have only to deliver over the city and houses to us, Lacedaemonians, to point out the boundaries of your land. The number of your fruit trees and whatever else can be numerically stated, and yourselves to withdraw wherever you like as long as the war shall last. When it is over, we will restore you to whatever we received, and in the interim hold it in trust and keep it in cultivation, paying you a sufficient allowance. What they had heard what he had to say, they re entered the city, and after consulting with the people, said that they wished first to acquaint the Athenians with this proposal, and in the event of their approving to accede to it. In the meantime they asked him to grant them a truce and not to lay waste their country. He accordingly granted a truce for the number of days requisite for the journey, and meanwhile abstained from ravaging their territory. The Plataean envoys went to Athens, and consulted with the Athenians, and returned with the following message to those in the city. The Athenians say, Plataeans, that they never hitherto, since we became their allies, on any occasion abandon us to an enemy, nor will they now neglect us, but will help us according to their ability, and they adjure you by the oaths which your father swore to keep the alliance unaltered. On the delivery of this message by the envoys, the Plataeans resolved not to be unfaithful to the Athenians, but to endure, if it must be, seeing their lands laid waste in any other trials that might come to them, and not to send out again, but to answer from the wall that it was impossible for them to do as the Lacedaemonians proposed. As soon as he had received this answer, King Archidamus proceeded first to make a solemn appeal to the gods and heroes of the country in words following. Ye gods and heroes of the Plataean territory, be my witnesses that not as aggressors originally nor until these had first departed from the common oath did we invade this land, in which our fathers offered you their prayers before defeating the Medes, and which you made auspicious to the Hellenic arms. Nor shall we be aggressors in the measures to which we may now resort, since we have made many fair proposals but have not been successful. Graciously accord that those who were the first to offend may be punished for it, and that vengeance may be attained by those who would righteously inflict it. After this appeal to the gods, Archidamus put his army in motion. First he enclosed the town with a palisade, formed of the fruit trees which they cut, 
down to prevent further egress from Plataea. Next they threw up a mound against the city, hoping that the largeness of the force employed which would ensure the speedy reduction of the place. They accordingly cut down timber from Cytherion, and built it up on either side, laying it like lattice work to serve as a wall to keep the mound from spreading abroad, and carried it wood and stones and earth and whatever other material might help to complete it. They continued to work at the mound for seventy days and nights without intermission, being divided into relief parties to allow of some being employed in carrying while others took sleep and refreshment. The Lacedaemonian officer attached to each contingent keeping the men to the work. But the Plataeans, observing the progress of the mound, constructed a wall of wood, and fixed it upon that part of the city wall against which the mound was being erected, and built up bricks inside it which they took from the neighboring houses. The timbers served to bind the building together, and to prevent its becoming weak as it advanced in height. It had also a covering of skins and hides, which protected the woodwork against the attacks of burning missiles, and allowed the men to work in safety. Thus the wall was raised to a great height, and the mound opposite made no less rapid progress. The Plataeans also thought of another expedient. They pulled out part of the wall upon which the mound abutted, and carried the earth into the city. Discovering this, the Peloponnesians twisted up clay in wattles of reed and threw it into the breach formed in the mound, in order to give it consistency and prevent its being carried away like the soil. Stopped in this way, the Plataeans changed their mode of operation, and digging a mine from the town calculated their way under the mound, and began to carry off its material as before. This went on for a long while without the enemy outside finding it out, so that for all they threw on top of their mound, they made no progress in proportion being carried away from beneath and constantly settling down in the vacuum. But the Plataeans, fearing that even thus they might not be able to hold out against the superior numbers of the enemy, had yet another invention. They stopped working at the large building in front of the mound, and starting at either end of it, inside from the old low wall, built a new one in the form of a crescent, running in towards the town, in order that in the event of the great wall being taken, this might remain, and the enemy have to throw up a fresh mound against it, and as they advanced within, might not only have their trouble over again, but also be exposed to missile on their flanks. While raising the mound, the Peloponnesians also brought up engines against the city, one of which was brought up upon the mound against the great building and shook down a good piece of it, to the no small alarm of the Plataeans. Others were advanced against different parts of the wall, but were lassoed and broken by the Plataeans, who also hung up great beams by long iron chains from either extremity of two poles laid on the wall and projecting over it, and drew them up at an angle whenever any point was threatened by the engine, and loosing their hold let the beam go with its chain slack, so that it fell with a run and snapped off the nose of the battering ram. After this the Peloponnesians, finding that their engines effected nothing, that their mound was met by the counterwork, concluded that their present means of offense were unequal to the taking of the city, and prepared for its circumvallation. First, however, they determined to try the effects of fire, and see whether they could not, with the help of a wind, burn the town, as it was not a large one. Indeed, they thought of every possible expedient by which the place might be reduced without the expense of a blockade. They accordingly brought faggots of brushwood, and threw them from the mound, first into the space between it and the wall. And this soon becoming full from the number of hands at work, they next heaped the faggots up as far into the town as they could reach from the top, and then lighted the wood by setting fire to it with sulfur and pitch. The consequence was a fire greater than anyone had ever yet seen produced by human agency, though it could not, of course, be compared to the spontaneous conflagrations sometimes known to occur through the wind rubbing the branches of a mountain forest together. And this fire was not only remarkable for its magnitude, but was also, at the end of so many perils, within an ace of proving fatal to the Plataeans. A great part of the town became entirely inaccessible, and had a wind blown upon it, 
in accordance with the hopes of the enemy. Nothing could have saved them. As it was, there was also a story of heavy rain and thunder having come on by which the fire was put out and the danger averted. Failing in this last attempt, the Peloponnesians left a portion of their forces on the spot, dismissing the rest, and built a wall of circumvallation around the town, dividing the ground among the various cities present, a ditch being made within and without the lines, from which they got their bricks. All being finished by about the rising of Arcturus, they left men enough to man half the wall, the rest being manned by the Boeotians, and drawing off their army dispersed to their several cities. The Plataeans had before sent off their wives and children and oldest men and the mass of the non-combatants to Athens, so that the number of the besieged left in the place comprised four hundred of their own citizens, eighty Athenians, and a hundred and ten women to bake their bread. This was the sum total at the commencement of the siege, and there was no one else before within the walls, bond or free. Such were the arrangements made for the blockade of Plataea. The same summer, and simultaneously with the expedition against Plataea, the Athenians marched with two thousand heavy infantry and two hundred horse against the Chalcidians in the direction of Thrace and the Batiians, just as the corn was getting ripe, under the command of Xenophon, son of Euripides, with two colleagues. Arriving before Spartalus in Batiaea, they destroyed the corn and had some hopes of the city coming over through the intrigues of a faction within. But those of a different way of thinking had sent to Olynthus, and a garrison of heavy infantry and other troops arrived accordingly. These issuing from Spartalus were engaged by the Athenians in front of the town. The Chalcidian heavy infantry and some auxiliaries with them were beaten and retreated into Spartalus, but the Chalcidian horse and light troops defeated the horse and light troops of the Athenians. The Chalcidians had already a few targeteers from Crusus, and presently after the battle were joined by some others from Olynthus, upon seeing whom the light troops from Spartalus, emboldened by this accession and by their previous success, with the help of the Chalcidian horse and the reinforcement just arrived again attacked the Athenians, who retired upon the two divisions which they had left with their baggage. Whenever the Athenians advanced, their adversary gave way, pressing them with missiles the instant they began to retire. The Chalcidian horse also, riding up and charging them just as they pleased, at last caused a panic amongst them and routed and pursued them to a great distance. The Athenians took refuge in Potidaea and afterwards recovered their dead under truce, and returned to Athens with the remnant of their army, four hundred and thirty men and all the generals having fallen. The Chalcidians and Batians set up a trophy, took up their dead, and dispersed to their several cities. The same summer, not long after this, the Ambrosiates and Caonians, being desirous of reducing the whole of Acarnania and detaching it from Athens, persuaded the Lacedaemonians to equip a fleet from their confederacy and send a thousand heavy infantry to Acarnania, representing that, if a combined movement were made by land and sea, the coast Acarnanians would be unable to march, and the conquest of Zacythus and Cephalania easily following on the possession of Acarnania, the crews round Peloponnese would be no longer so convenient for the Athenians. Besides which there was a hope of taking Nepactus. The Lacedaemonians accordingly at once sent off a few vessels with Snamus, who was still high admiral, and the heavy infantry on board, and sent round orders for the fleet to equip as quickly as possible and sailed to Lucas. The Corinthians were the most forward in the business, the Ambrosiates being a colony of theirs, while the ships from Corinth, Sicyon, and the neighborhood were getting ready, and those from Lucas, Anactorium, and Ambracia, which had arrived before, were waiting for them at Lucas, Snamus and his thousand heavy infantry had run into the gulf, giving the slip to Formio, the commander of the Athenian squadron stationed off Nepactus, and began at once to prepare for the land expedition. The Hellenic troops with him consisted of the Ambrosiates, Leucadians, and Actorians, and the thousand Peloponnesians with whom he came, the barbarian of a thousand Caonians, who, belonging to a nation that has no king, were led by Photis and Nicanor, 
the two members of the royal family to whom the chieftainship for that year had been confided. With the Caonians came also some Thesprotians, who, like them, without a king, some Molossians, Atintanians, led by Sablinthus, the guardian of King Tharps, who was still a minor, and some Paravians, under their king Erodius, accompanied by a thousand Orestians, subjects of King Anticus, and placed by him under the command of Erodus. There were also a thousand Macedonians, sent by Perdixus, without the knowledge of the Athenians, but they arrived too late. With this force, Namus sent out, without waiting for the fleet from Corinth. Passing through the territory of Amphilochian Argos, and sacking the open village of Limnia, they advanced to the Stratus, the Acarnanian capital. His once taken, the rest of the country, they felt convinced, would speedily follow. The Acarnanians, finding themselves invaded by a large army by land, and from the sea threatened by a hostile fleet, made no combined attempt at resistance, but remained to defend their homes, and sent for help to Formio, who replied that, when a fleet was on the point of sailing from Corinth, it was impossible for him to leave Nepactus unprotected. The Peloponnesians, meanwhile, and their allies advanced upon Stratus in three divisions, with the intention of encamping near it and attempting the wall by force if they failed to succeed by negotiation. The order of march was as follows. The center was occupied by the Caonians and the rest of the barbarians, with the Lucadians and Actorians and their followers on the right, and Snamus with the Peloponnesians and Ambrosiates on the left, each division being a long way off from, and sometimes even out of sight from, the others. The Hellenes advanced in good order, keeping a look at till they encamped in a good position, but the Caonians, filled with self-confidence in having the highest character for courage among the tribes of that part of the continent, without waiting to occupy their camp, rushed on with the rest of the barbarians, in the idea that they should take the town by assault and obtain the sole glory of the enterprise. While they were coming on, the Stratians, becoming aware of how things stood, and thinking that the, end, that the defeat of this division would considerably dishearten the Hellenes behind it, occupied the environs of the town with ambuscades, and as soon as they approached engaged them at close quarters from the city and the ambuscades. A panic seizing the Caonians, great numbers of them were slain, and as soon as they were seen to give way, the rest of the barbarians turned and fled. Owing to the distance by which their allies had preceded them, neither of the Hellenic divisions knew anything of the battle, but fancied they were hastening off to encamp. However, when the flying barbarians broke in upon them, they opened their ranks to receive them, brought their divisions together, and stopped quiet where they were for the day. The Stratians not offering to engage them, as the rest of the Acarnanians had not yet arrived, but contenting themselves with sl slinging at them from a distance, which distressed them greatly, as there was no stirring without their armor. The Acarnanians would seem to excel in this mode of warfare. As soon as night fell, Snamus hastily drew his army to the river Anapus, about nine miles from Stratus, recovering his dead next day under truce, and being there joined by the friendly Onidiae, fell back upon their city before the enemy's reinforcements came up. From hence each returned home, and the Stratians set up a trophy for the battle with the barbarians. Meanwhile the fleet from Corinth, and the rest of the confederates in the Crissian Gulf, which was to have cooperated with Snamus and prevented the coast or Carnanians from joining their countrymen in the interior, was disabled from doing so by being compelled about the same time as the battle at Stratus to fight with Formio and the twenty Athenian vessels stationed at Nepactus. For they were watched, as they coasted along of, of the gulf, by Formio, who wished to attack in the open sea. But the Corinthians and allies had started for Carnania without any idea of fighting at sea, and with vessels more like transports for carrying soldiers, besides which, they never dreamed of the twenty Athenian ships venturing to engage their forty-seven. However, while they were coasting along their own shore, there were the Athenians sailing along in line with them, and when they tried to cross over from Patre in Achaea to the mainland on the other side, on their way to Carnania, they saw them again coming out from Chalcis and the river Evenus to meet them. They slipped from their moorings in the night, but were observed, and were at length compelled to fight in mid-passage. 
Each state that contributed to the armament had its own general. The Corinthian commanders were Machaon, Isocrates, and Agatharchidas. The Peloponnesians ranged their vessels in as large a circle as possible, without leaving an opening, with the prows outside and the sterns in, and placed within all the small craft in company, and their five best sailors to issue out at a moment's notice and strengthen any point threatened by the enemy. The Athenians, formed in line, sailed round and round them, and forced them to contract their circle by continually brushing past and making as though they would attack at once having been previously cautioned by Formio, not to do so till he gave the signal. His hope was that the Peloponnesians would not retain their order like a force on shore, but that the ships would fall foul of one another, and the small craft cause confusion, and if the wind should blow from the gulf, in expectation of which he kept sailing round them, and which usually rose toward morning, they would not, he felt sure, remain steady an instant. He also thought that it rested with him to attack when he pleased, as his ships were better sailors, and then an attack timed by the coming of the wind would tell best. When the wind came down, the enemy's ships were now in a narrow space, and what with the wind and the small craft dashing against them, at once fell into confusion. Ship fell foul of ship, while the crews were pushing them off with poles, and by their shouting, swearing, and struggling with one another, made captain's orders and boatswain's cries alike inaudible and through being unable for want of practice to clear their oars in the rough water, prevented the vessels from obeying their helmsmen properly. At this moment Formio gave the signal, and the Athenians attacked. Sinking first one of the admirals, they then disabled all they came across, so that no one thought of resistance for the confusion, but fled for Patri and Dime in Achaea. The Athenians gave chase and captured twelve ships, and taking most of the men out of them, sailed to Malacrium and after setting up a trophy on the promontory of Rheum, and dedicating a ship to Poseidon, returned to Napactus. As for the Peloponnesians, they at once sailed with their remaining ships along the coast from Dime and Patri to Silene, the Elean arsenal, where Snemus and the ships from Lucas that were to have joined them also arrived after battle at Stratus. The Lacedaemonians now sent their fleet to Snemus. Three commissioners, Timocrates, Bradidus, and Lycophron, with orders to prepare to engage again with better fortune, and not to be driven from the sea by a few vessels, for they could not at all account for their discomfiture, the less so as it was their first attempt at sea, and they fancied that it was not that their marine was so inferior, but that there had been a misconduct somewhere, not considering the long experience of the Athenians as compared with the little practice which with they had themselves. The commissioners were accordingly sent in anger. As soon as they arrived, they set up to work with Snamus to order ships from the different states, and to put those which they had already had in fighting order. Meanwhile, Formio sent word to Athens of their preparations and his own victory, and desired as many ships as possible to be speedily sent to him, as he stood in daily expectation of a battle. Twenty were accordingly sent, but instructions were given to their commander to go first to Crete. For Nicias, a Cretan of Gordus, who was Proxenus of the Athenians, and persuaded them to sail against Sidonia, promising to procure the reduction of that hostile town, his real wish being to oblige the Polycnetans, neighbors of the Sidonians. He accordingly went with the ships to Crete, and accompanied by the Polycnetans, laid waste the lands of the Sidonians, and with that adverse wind and stress of weather wasted no little time there. While the Athenians were thus detained in Crete, the Peloponnesians and Silene got ready for battle, and coasted along to Panormus in Achaea, where their land army had come to support them. Formio also coasted along to Malacrian Rium, and anchored outside it with twenty ships, the same as he had fought with before. This Rium was friendly to the Athenians. The other, in Peloponnese, lies opposite to it. The sea between them is about three-quarters of a mile broad, and forms the mouth of the Chrysaean Gulf. At this, the Achaean Rheum, not far off Panormus, where their army lay, the Peloponnesians now cast anchor with twenty-seven ships, when they saw the Athenians do so. For six or seven days they remained opposite each other, practicing and preparing for battle. The one resolved not to sail out of the Rhea into the open sea, for fear of the disaster which had already happened to them, the other not to sail into the straits, thinking it advantageous to the enemy 
to fight in the Narrows. At last Namus, Ambrasidas, and the rest of the Peloponnesian commanders, being desirous of bringing on a battle as soon as possible, before reinforcements should arrive from Athens, and noticing that the men were most of them cowed by the previous defeat and out of heart for the business, first called them together and encouraged them as follows. Peloponnesians, the late engagement, which may have made some of you afraid of the one now in prospect, really gives no just ground for apprehension. Preparation for it, as you know, there was little enough, and the object of our voyage was not so much to fight at sea as an expedition by land. Besides this, the chances of war were largely against us, and perhaps also inexperience had something to do with our failure in our first naval action. It was not, therefore, cowardice that produced our defeat, nor ought the determination which force has not quelled, but which still has a word to say with its adversary, to lose its edge from the result of an accident. But admitting the possibility of a chance miscarriage, we should know that brave hearts must be always brave, and while they remain so, can never put forward inexperience as an excuse for misconduct. Nor are you so behind the enemy in experience as you are ahead of him in courage, and although the science of your opponents would, if valor accompanied it, have also the presence of mind to carry out at an emergency the lesson it has learnt, yet a faint heart will make all art powerless in the face of danger, for fear takes away presence of mind, and without valor art is useless. Against their superior experience set your superior daring, and against the fear induced by defeat the fact of your having been them unprepared. Remember, too, that you have always the advantage of superior numbers, and of engaging off your own coast, supported by your heavy infantry, and as a rule, numbers and equipment give victory. At no point, therefore, is defeat likely, and as for our previous mistakes, the very fact of their occurrence will teach us better for the future. Steersmen and sailors may, therefore, confidently attend to their several duties, none quitting the station assigned to them. As for ourselves, we promise to prepare for the engagement at least as well as your previous commanders, and to give no excuse for any one misconducting himself. Should any insist on doing so, he shall meet with the punishment he deserves, while the brave shall be honored with the appropriate rewards of valor. The Peloponnesian commanders encouraged their men after this fashion. Formio, meanwhile, being himself not without fears for the courage of his men, and noticing that they were forming in groups among themselves and were alarmed at the odds against them, desired to call them together and give them confidence and counsel in the present emergency. He had therefore continually told them, and had accustomed their minds to the idea, that there was no numerical superiority that they could not face, and the men themselves had long been persuaded that Athenians need never retire before any quantity of Peloponnesian vessels. At the moment, however, he saw that they were dispirited by the sight before them, and wishing to refresh their confidence, called them together and spoke as follows. I see, my men, that you are frightened by the number of the enemy, and I have accordingly called you together, not liking you to be afraid of what is not really terrible. In the first place, the Peloponnesians, already defeated, and not even thinking themselves that they are a match for us, have not ventured to meet us on equal terms, but have equipped this multitude of ships against us. Next, as to that upon which they most rely, the courage which they suppose constitutional to them, their confidence here only arises from the successes which their experience in land service usually gives them, and which they fancy will do the same for them at sea. But this advantage will in all justice belong to us on this element, if to them on that, as they are not superior to us in courage, but we are each of us more confident, according to our experience in particular department. Besides, as the Lacedaemonians use their supremacy over their allies to promote their own glory, they are most of them being brought into danger against their will, or they would never, after such a decided defeat, have ventured upon a fresh engagement. You need not, therefore, be afraid of their dash. You, on the contrary, inspire a much greater and better founded alarm, both because of your late victory, and also because of their belief that we should not face them, unless about to do something worthy of a success so signal. An adversary no, numerically superior, like the one before us, comes into action trusting more to strength than to resolution, while he who, who voluntarily confronts tremendous odds must have very great internal resources to draw upon. 
For these reasons the Peloponnesians fear our irrational audacity more than they would ever have done a more commensurate preparation. Besides, many armaments have before now succumbed to an inferior through want of skill or sometimes of courage, neither of which defects certainly are ours. As to the battle, it shall not be, if I can help it, in the strait, nor will I sail in there at all, seeing that in a contest between a number of clumsily managed vessels and a small, fast, well-handled squadron, want of sea-room is an undoubted disadvantage. One cannot run down an enemy properly without having a sight of him a good way off, nor can one retire at need when pressed. One can neither break the line nor return upon his rear, the proper, proper tactics for a fast sailor. But the naval action necessarily becomes a land one, in which our numbers must decide the matter. For all this I will provide as far as can be. Do you stay at your posts by your ships, and be sharp at catching the word of command, the more so as we are observing one another from so short a distance, and in action think order and silence all important qualities, useful in war generally, and in naval engagements in particular, and behave before the enemy in a manner worthy of your past exploits. The issues you will fight for are great, to destroy the naval hopes of the Peloponnesians, or to bring nearer to the Athenians their fears for the sea. And I may once more remind you that you have defeated most of them already, and beaten men do not face a danger twice with the same determination. Such was the exhortation of Formio. The Peloponnesians, finding that the Athenians did not sail into the gulf in the narrows, in order to lead them into whether they wished it or not, put out at dawn, and forming four abreast, sailed inside the gulf in the direction of their own country, the right wing leading as they had lain at anchor. In this wing were placed twenty of their best sailors, so that in the event of Formio thinking that their object was Napactus, and coasting along thither to save the place, the Athenians might not be able to escape their onset by getting outside their wing, but might be cut off by the vessels in question. As they expected, Formio, in alarm for the place at that moment emptied of its garrison, as soon as he saw them put out, reluctantly and hurriedly embarked and sailed along shore. The Messanian land forces moving along also to support him. The Peloponnesians, seeing him coasting along with his ships in a single file, and by this inside the gulf and close in, so in shore as they so much wished, at one signal attacked suddenly and bore down in line at their best speed on the Athenians, hoping to cut off the whole squadron. The eleven leading vessels, however, escaped the Peloponnesian wing and its sudden movement, and reached the more open water. But the rest were overtaken as they tried to run through, driven ashore and disabled, such of the crews being slain as had not swum out, out of them. Some of the ships the Peloponnesians lashed to their own, and towed off empty. One they took with the men in it. Others were just being towed off, when they were saved by the Messanians dashing into the sea with their armor and fighting from the decks that they had boarded. Thus far victory was with the Peloponnesians, and the Athenian fleet destroyed, the twenty ships in the right wing being meanwhile in chase of the eleven Athenian vessels that had escaped their sudden movement and reached the more open water. These, with the exception of one ship, all outsailed them and got safe into Napactus, and forming close in shore opposite the Temple of Apollo, with their prows facing the enemy, prepared to defend themselves in case the Peloponnesians should sail inshore against them. After a while the Peloponnesians came up, chanting the peon for their victory as they sailed on, the single Athenian ship remaining being chased by a Lacadian, far ahead of the rest. But there happened to be a merchantman lying at anchor in the roadstead, which the Athenian ship found time to sail around, and struck the Lacadian in chase amid ships and sank her. An exploit so sudden and unexpected produced a panic among the Peloponnesians. And having fallen out of order in the, in the excitement of victory, some of them dropped their oars, and stopped their way in order to let the main body come up, an unsafe thing to do considering how near they were to the enemy's prows, while others ran aground in the shallows, in the ignorance of the localities. Elated at this incident, the Athenians at one word gave a cheer, and dashed at the enemy, who, embarrassed by his mistakes and the disorder in which he found himself, only stood for an instant, and then fled for Panormus, whence he had put out. Put out. The Athenians, following on his heels, took the six vessels nearest them, and recovered those of their own which had been disabled, close in shore, and then taken in tow at the beginning of the action. They killed some of the crews and took some prisoners. On board the Lucadian which went down off the merchantmen, 
was the Lacedaemonian Timocrates, who killed himself when the ship was sunk, and was cast up in the harbour of Nepactus. The Athenians on their return set up a trophy on the spot from which they had put out and turned the day, and picking up the wrecks and dead that were on their shore, gave back to the enemy their dead under truce. The Peloponnesians also set up a trophy as victors for the defeat, inflicted upon the ships they had disabled in shore, and dedicated the vessel which they had taken at Achaean Rheum, side by side with the trophy. After this, apprehensive of the reinforcement expected from Athens, all except the Leucadians sailed into the Crissian Gulf for Corinth. Not long after the retreat, the twenty Athenian ships which were to have joined Formio before the battle arrived at Napactus. Thus the summer ended. Winter was now at hand, but dispersing the fleet, which had retired to Corinth in the Crissian Gulf, Snamus, Brasidas, and the other Peloponnesian captains allowed themselves to be persuaded by the Megarians to make an attempt upon Piraeus, the port of Athens, which from her decided superiority at sea had been naturally left unguard unguarded and open. Their plan was this. The men were each to take their oar, cushion, and rowlock thong, and, going overland from Corinth to the sea on the Athenian side, to get to Megara as quickly as they could, and, launching forty vessels, which happened to be in the docks at Nicaea, to sail at once to Piraeus. There was no fleet on the lookout in the harbor, and no one had the least idea of the enemy attempting a surprise. While an open attack would, it was thought, never be delivered, deliberately ventured on, or if, in contemplation, would be speedily known in Athens. Their plan formed, the next step was to put it in execution. Arriving by night, and launching the vessels from Nicaea, they sailed out, not to Piraeus as they had originally intended, being afraid of the risk, besides which there was some talk of a wind having stopped them, but to the point of Salamis that looks toward Megara, where there was a fort and a squadron of three ships to prevent anything sailing in or out of Megara. This fort they assaulted, and towed off the, en off the galleys empty, and surprising the inhabitants began to lay waste to the rest of the island. Meanwhile fire signals were raised to alarm Athens, and a panic ensued there as serious as any that occurred during the war. The idea in the city was that the enemy had already sailed into Piraeus. In Piraeus it was thought that they had taken Salamis, and might at any moment arrive in the port, as indeed might easily have been done if their hearts had been a little firmer. Certainly no wind would have prevented them. As soon as day broke, the Athenians assembled in full force, launched their ships, and embarking in haste and uproar went with the fleet to Salamis, while their soldiery mounted guard in Piraeus. The Peloponnesians, on, being becoming, on becoming aware of the coming relief, after they had overrun most of Salamis, hastily sailed off with their plunder and captives, and the three ships from Fort Bedorum to Nicaea, the state of their ships also causing them some anxiety, as it was a long while since they had been launched, and they were not watertight. Arrived at Megara, they returned back on foot to Corinth. The Athenians, finding them no longer at Salamis, sailed back themselves, and after this made arrangements for guiding guarding Piraeus more diligently in future, by closing the harbors and by other suitable precautions. About the same time, at the beginning of this winter, Cetalces, son of Tiris, the Odrysian king of Thrace, made an expedition against per Perdixus, son of Alexander, king of Macedonia, and the Chalcidians in the neighborhood of Thrace, his object being to enforce one promise and fulfill another. On the one hand, Perdixus had made him a promise, when hard-pressed at the commencement of the war, upon condition that Cetalces should reconcile the Athenians to him, and not attempt to restore his brother and enemy, the pretender Philip, but had not offered to fulfill his engagement. On the other, he, Cetalces, on entering into alliance with the Athenians, had agreed to put an end to the Chalcidian War in Thrace. These were the two objects of his invasion. With him he brought Amintas, the son of Philip, whom he destined for the throne of Macedonia, and some Athenian envoys then at his court on this business and Hagnon as general, for the Athenians were to join him against the Chalcidians with a fleet and as many soldiers as they could get together. Beginning with the Odrysians, he first called out the Thracian tribes subject to him between Mounts Hemus and Rhodope, and the Euxin and Hellespont, next to the Gete beyond Hemus, and the other hordes settled south of the Danube in the neighborhood of the Exun, who, like the Geti, border on the Scythians, and are armed in the same manner, being all mounted archers. Besides these, he summoned many of the hill 
Thracian independent swordsmen, called D, and mostly inhabiting Mount Rhodope, some of whom came as mercenaries, others as volunteers. Also the Agrians and Lassians, and the rest of the Paeonian tribes in his empire, at the confines of which these lay, extending up to the Lyaean Paeonians and the river Strymon, which flows from Mount Scombrus through the country of the Agrians and the Lyans, there being the empire of Cetalces, ends and the territory of the independent Paeonians begins. Bordering on the Triballi, also independent, were the Treres and Telatians, who dwell to the north of Mount Scombrus and extend toward the setting sun as far as the river Oscius. This river rises in the same mountains as the Nestus and Hebrus, a wild and extensive range connected with Rhodope. The empire of the Odrysians extended along the seaboard from Abdera to the mouth of the Danube in the Euxine. The navigation of this coast by the shortest route takes a merchantman four days and four nights with a wind astern the whole way. By land, an active man, traveling by the shortest road, can get from Abdera to the Danube in eleven days. Such was the length of its coastline. Inland from Byzantium to the Laeans and the Strymon, the farthest limit of its extension into the interior, is a journey of thirteen days for an active man. The tribute from all the barbarian districts and the Hellenic cities, taking what they brought in under Suths, the successor of Cetelces, who raised it to his greatest height, amounted to about four hundred talents in gold and silver. There were also presents in gold and silver to a no less amount, besides stuff, plain and embroidered, and other articles made not only for the king, but also for the Odrysian lords and nobles. For there was here established a custom opposite to that prevailing in the Persian kingdom, namely, of taking rather than giving, more disgrace being attached to not giving when asked than to, than to asking and being refused. And although this prevailed elsewhere in Thrace, it was practiced most extensively among the powerful Odrysians, it being impossible to get anything done without a present. It was thus a very powerful kingdom, in revenue and general prosperity, surpassing all in Europe between the Ionian Gulf and the Euxine, and in numbers and military resources coming decidedly next to Scythians, with whom indeed no people in Europe can bear a comparison, there not being even in Asia any nation singly a match for them if unanimous, though of course they are not on a level with other races in general intelligence and the arts of civilized life. It was the master of this empire that now prepared to take the field. When everything was ready, he set out on his march for Macedonia, first the through his own dominions, next over the desolate range of Cercene that divides the Scythians and Paeonians, crossing by a road which he had made by felling the timber on a former campaign against the latter people. Passing over these mountains, with the Paeonians on his right and the Scythians and Medians on the left, he finally arrived at Doberus, in Paeonia, losing none of his army on the march, except perhaps by sickness, but receiving some augmentations many of the independent Thracians volunteering to join him in the hope of plunder, so that the whole is said to have formed a grand total of a hundred and fifty thousand. Most of this was infantry, though there was about a third cavalry, furnished principally by the Odrysians themselves, and next to them by the Gete. The most warlike of the infantry were the independent swordsmen who came down from Merodope, the rest of the mixed multitude that followed him being chiefly formidable by their numbers. Assembling in Doberus, they prepared for descending from the heights upon lower Macedonia, where the dominions of Perdixus lay. For the Lincesti, Elimiots, and other tribes more inland, though Macedonians by blood and allies and dependents of their kindred, still have their own separate governments. The country on the sea coast, now called Macedonia, was first acquired by Alexander, the father of Perdixus, and his ancestors, originally Temenids from Argos. This was effected by the expulsion from Pyrrha of the Pyrians, who afterwards inhabited Philagres and other places under Mount Panangius, beyond the Strymon. Indeed, the country between the Pangaeus and the sea is still called the Pyrian Gulf. Of the Boeotians, at present, neighbors of the Chalcidians from Badia, and by the acquisition in Paeonia of a narrow strip along the river Axius, extending to Pella and the sea. The district of Magdonia between the Axius and the Strymon, being also added by the expulsion of the Adonians. From Eordia also were driven the Eordians, most of whom perished, though a few of them still live around Fisca, and the Almopians from Almopia. 
These Macedonians also conquered places belonging to other tribes, which are still theirs, Anthemus, Christonia, Basaltia, and much of Macedonia proper. The whole is now called Macedonia, and at the time of the invasion of Satalces, Perdixus, Alexander's son, was the reigning king. These Macedonians, unable to take the field against so numerous an invader, shut themselves up in such strong places and fortresses as the country possessed. Of these there was no great number, most of those now found in the country having been erected subsequently by Archelaus, the son of Perdixus, on his accession, who also cut straight roads and otherwise put the kingdom on a better footing as regards horses, heavy infantry, and other more material than had been done by all the eight kings that preceded him. Advancing from Doberus, the Thracian host first invaded what had once been Philip's government, and took Idemone by assault, Gort Gortinia, Atalanta, and some other places by negotiation. These last coming over for the love of Philip's son, Amyntas, then with Satalces. Laying siege to Europus, and failing to take it, he next advanced into the rest of Macedonia to the left of Pella and Cyrus, not proceeding beyond this into Boeotia and Pieria, but, but staying to lay waste Mygdonia, Crestonia, and Anthemus. The Macedonians never even thought of meeting him with infantry, but the Thracian host was, as opportunity offered, attacked by handfuls of their horse, which had been reinforced from their allies in the interior. Armed with cuirasses and excellent horsemen, wherever these charged they overthrew all before them, but ran considerable risk in entangling themselves in the masses of the enemy and so finally desisted from these efforts, deciding that they were not strong enough to venture against numbers so superior. Meanwhile, Satalces opened negotiations with Perdixus on the objects of his expedition, and finding that the Athenians, not believing that he would come, did not appear with their fleet, though they sent presents and envoys, dispatched a large part of his army against the Chalcidians and Bautians, and shutting them upside inside their walls, laid waste their country. While he remained in these parts, the people farther south, such as the Thessalians, Magnetes, and the other tribes subject to the Thessalians, and the Hellenes as far as Thermopylae, all feared that the army might advance against them, and prepared accordingly. These fears were shared by the Thracians beyond the Strymon to the north, who inhabited the plains, such as the Paneans, the Odomanti, the Droi, and the Dersians, all of whom are independent. It was even matter of conversation among the Hellenes, who were enemies of Athens, whether he might not be invited by his ally to advance also against them. Meanwhile he held Chalcides and Bautis and Macedonia, and was ravaging them all, but finding that he was not succeeding in any of the objects of his invasion, and that his army was without provisions, and was suffering from the severity of the season, he listened to the advice of Suthes, son of Spartacus, his nephew and highest officer, and decided to retreat without delay. This Suthes had been secretly gained by Perdixus by the promise of his sister in marriage with a rich dowry. In accordance with his advice, with this advice, and after a stay of thirty days in all, eight of which were spent in Chalcides, he retired home as quickly as he could, and Perdixus afterwards gave his sister Stratonis to Suthes, as he had promised. Such was the history of the expedition of Satalces. In the course of this winter, after the dispersion of the Peloponnesian fleet, the Athenians in Napactus, under Formio, coasted along to Astacus and disembarked, and marched into the interior of Acarnania with four hundred Athenian heavy infantry and four hundred Messenians. After expelling some suspected persons from Stratus, Caranta, and other places, and restoring Sinese, son of Theolitus, to Caranta, they returned to their ships deciding that it was impossible in the winter season to march against Onidia, a place which, unlike the rest of Acarnania, had always been hostile to them, for the river Achilos, flowing from Mount Pindus through the Dilapia and the country of the Agrians and Amphilochians, and the plain of Acarnania, past the town of Stratus in the upper part of its course, forms lakes where it falls into the sea round Onidia, and thus makes it impracticable for an army in winter by reason of the water. Opposite to Onidia lie most of the islands called Echinades, so close to the mouths of the Achilles that that powerful stream is constantly forming deposits against them, and has already joined some of the islands to the continent, 
and seems likely in no long while to do the same with the rest. For the current is strong, deep, and turbid, and the islands are so thick together that they serve to imprison the alluvial deposit and prevent its dispersing, lying as they do, not in one line, but irregularly, so as to leave no direct passage for the water into the open sea. The islands in question are, in are uninhabited and of no great size. There is also a story that Alcmeon, son of Amphorus, during his wanderings after the murder of his mother, was bidden by Apollo to inhabit this spot, through an oracle which intimated that he would have no release from his terrors until he should find a country to dwell in, which had not been seen by the sun, or existed as land at the time he slew his mother, else, all else being to, to him polluted ground. Perplexed at this, the story goes on to say he at last observed this deposit of the Achilles, and considered that a place sufficient to support life upon might have been thrown up during the long interval that had elapsed since the death of his mother and the beginning of his wanderings. Settling, therefore, in the district round Onidae, he founded a, dom a dominion, and left the country its name from his son Acharnon. Such is the story we have received, consider considering Alcmeon. The Athenians in Formio, putting back from Acarnania, and arriving at Nepactus, sailed home to Athens in the spring, taking with them the ships that they had captured, and such of the prisoners made in the light actions as were freemen, who were exchanged man for man. And so ended this winter, and the third year of this war, of which Thucydides was the historian. This is the end of chapter 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith of Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com. The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, translated by Richard Crawley. Chapter 9. Fourth and Fifth Years of the War, Revolt of Mytilene The next summer, just as the corn was getting ripe, the Peloponnesians and their allies invaded Attica under the command of Archidamus, son of Zeuxidamus, king of the Lacedaemonians, and sat down and ravaged the land, the Athenian horse as usual attacking them wherever it was practicable, and preventing the mass of the light troops from advancing from their camp and wasting the parts near the city. After staying the time for which they had taken provisions, the invaders retired and dispersed to their several cities. Immediately after the invasion of the Peloponnesians, all Lesbos, except Methymna, revolted from the Athenians. The Lesbians had wished to revolt even before the war, but the Lacedaemonians would not receive them, and yet now when they did revolt, they were compelled to do so sooner than they had intended. While they were waiting until the moles for their harbors and the ships and walls that they had in building should be finished, and for the arrival of archers and corn and other things that they were engaged in fetching from the Pontus, the Tenedians, with whom they were at enmity, and the Methymnians, and some factious persons in Mytilene itself, who were proxeny of Athens, informed the Athenians that the Mytilenians were forcibly uniting the island under their sovereignty, and that the preparations about which they were so active were all concerted with the Boeotians, their kindred, and the Lacedaemonians with a view to a revolt, and that, unless they were immediately prevented, Athens would lose Lesbos. However, the Athenians, distressed by the plague, and by the war that had recently broken out and was now raging, thought it a serious matter to add Lesbos with its fleet and untouched resources to the list of their enemies, and at first would not believe the charge, giving too much weight to their wish that it might not be true. But when an embassy which they sent had failed to persuade the Mytilenians to give up the union and preparations complained of, they became alarmed and resolved to strike the first blow. They accordingly suddenly set off forty ships that had been got ready to sail round Peloponnese, under the command of Cleopides, son of Deinias, and two others. 
word having been brought them of a festival in honor of the Malian Apollo outside the town, which is kept by the whole people of Mytilene, and at which, if haste were made, they might hope to take them by surprise. If this plan succeeded, well and good. If not, they were to order the Mytileneans to deliver up their ships and pull down their walls, and if they did not obey, to declare war. The ships accordingly set out, the ten galleys forming the contingent of the Mytileneans present with the fleet according to the terms of the alliance, being detained by the Athenians, and their crews placed in custody. However, the Mytileneans were informed of the expedition by a man who crossed from Athens to Euboea, and going overland to Gerestus, sailed from thence by a merchantman which he found on the point of putting to sea, and so arrived at Mytilene the third day after leaving Athens. The Mytileneans accordingly refrained from going out to the temple at Malia, and moreover barricaded and kept guard round the half-finished parts of their walls and harbors. When the Athenians sailed in not long after, and saw how things stood, the generals delivered their orders, and upon the Mytileneans refusing to obey, commenced hostilities. The Mytileneans, thus compelled to go to war without notice and unprepared, at first sailed out with their fleet and made some show of fighting, a little in front of the harbor, but being driven back by the Athenian ships, immediately offered to treat with the commanders, wishing, if possible, to get the ships away for the present upon any tolerable terms. The Athenian commanders accepted their offers, being themselves fearful that they might not be able to cope with the whole of Lesbos, and an armistice having been concluded, the Mytileneans sent to Athens one of the informers, already repentant of his conduct, and others with him, to try to persuade the Athenians of the innocence of their intentions, and to get the fleet recalled. In the meantime, having no great hope of a favorable answer from Athens, they also sent off a galley with envoys to Lacedaemon, unobserved by the Athenian fleet which was anchored at Malia to the north of the town. While these envoys, reaching Lacedaemon after a difficult journey across the open sea, were negotiating for succors being sent them, the ambassadors from Athens returned without having effected anything, and hostilities were at once begun by the Mytileneans and the rest of Lesbos, with the exception of the Methymnians, who came to the aid of the Athenians with the Imbrians and Lemnians and some few of the other allies. The Mytileneans made a sortie with all their forces against the Athenian camp, and a battle ensued in which they gained some slight advantage, but retired notwithstanding, not feeling sufficient confidence in themselves to spend the night upon the field. After this they kept quiet, wishing to wait for the chance of reinforcements arriving from Peloponnese before making a second venture, being encouraged by the arrival of Malias, a Laconian, and Hermaeondas, a Theban, who had been sent off before the insurrection, but had been unable to reach Lesbos before the Athenian expedition, and who now stole in in a galley after the battle, and advised them to send another galley and envoys back with them, which the Mytileneans accordingly did. Meanwhile the Athenians, greatly encouraged by the inaction of the Mytileneans, summoned allies to their aid, who came in all the quicker from seeing so little vigor displayed by the lesbians, and bringing round their ships to a new station to the south of the town, fortified two camps, one on each side of the city, and instituted a blockade of both the harbors. The sea was thus closed against the Mytileneans, who, however, commanded the whole country, with the rest of the lesbians who had now joined them, the Athenians only holding a limited area around their camps, and using Malia more as the station for their ships and their market. While the war went on in this way at Mytilene, the Athenians, about the same time in this summer, also sent thirty ships to Peloponnese under Esopius, son of Formio, the Acarnanians insisting that the commander sent should be some son or relative of Formio. As the ships coasted along shore, they ravaged the seaboard of Laconia, after which Asopius sent most of the fleet home, and himself went on with twelve vessels to Naupactus, and afterwards, raising the whole Acarnanian population, made an expedition against Oniade, the fleet sailing along the Acolos, while the army laid waste to the country. The inhabitants, however, showing no signs of submitting, he dismissed the land forces, and himself sailed to Lucas, and making a descent upon Nericus was cut off during his retreat, and most of his troops with him, by the people in those parts aided by some coast guards, after which the Athenians sailed away, recovering their dead from the Leucadians under truce. 
Meanwhile, the envoys of the Mytilenians, sent out in the first ship, were told by the Lacedaemonians to come to Olympia, in order that the rest of the allies might hear them and decide upon their matter, and so they journeyed thither. It was the Olympiad in which the Rhodian Dureus gained his second victory, and the envoys having been introduced to make their speech after the festival spoke as follows. Lacedaemonians and allies, the rule established among the Hellenists is not unknown to us. Those who revolt in war and forsake their former confederacy are favorably regarded by those who receive them, in so far as they are of use to them, but otherwise are thought less well of, through being considered traitors to their former friends. Nor is this an unfair way of judging, where the rebels and the power from whom they secede are at one in policy and sympathy, and a match for each other in resources and power, and where no reasonable ground exists for the rebellion. But with us and the Athenians this was not the case, and no one need think the worse of us from revolting from them in danger, after having been honored by them in time of peace." Justice and honesty will be the first topics of our speech, especially as we are asking for alliance, because we know that there can never be any solid friendship between individuals or union between communities that is worth the name unless the parties be persuaded of each other's honesty and be generally congenial the one to the other, since from difference in feeling springs also difference in conduct. Between ourselves and the Athenians, alliance began when you withdrew from the Median War and they remained to finish the business. But we did not become allies of the Athenians for the subjugation of the Hellenists, but allies of the Hellenists for their liberation from the Mede. And as long as the Athenians led us fairly, we followed them loyally. But when we saw them relax their hostility to the Mede, to try to compass the subjection of the allies, then our apprehensions began. Unable, however, to unite and defend themselves, on account of the number of confederates that had votes, all the allies were enslaved except ourselves and the Chians, who continued to send our contingents as independent and nominally free. Trust in Athens as a leader, however, we could no longer feel, judging by the examples already given. It being unlikely that she would reduce our fellow confederates, and not do the same by us who were left, if ever she had the power." Had we all been still independent, we could have had more faith in their not attempting any change. But the greater number being their subjects, while they were treating us as equals, they would naturally chafe under the solitary instance of independence as contrasted with the submission of the majority, particularly as they daily grew more powerful and we more destitute. Now the only sure basis of an alliance is for each party to be equally afraid of the other. He who would like to encroach is then deterred by the reflection that he will not have odds in his favor. Again, if we were left independent, it was only because they thought they saw their way to empire more clearly by specious language and by the paths of policy than by those of force. Not only were we useful as evidence that powers who had votes, like themselves, would not surely join them in their expeditions against their will without the party attacked being in the wrong, but the same system also enabled them to lead the stronger states against the weaker first, and so to leave the former to the last, stripped of their natural allies, and less capable of resistance. But if they had begun with us, while all the states still had their resources under their own control, and there was a center to rally round, the work of subjugation would have been found less easy. Besides this, our navy gave them some apprehension. It was always possible that it might unite with you, or with some other power, and become dangerous to Athens. The court which we paid to their commons and its leaders for the time being also helped us to maintain our independence. However, we did not expect to be able to do so much longer if this war had not broken out from the examples that we had had of their conduct to the rest. How then could we put our trust in such friendship or freedom as we had here? We accepted each other against our inclination. Fear made them court us in war, and us them in peace. Sympathy, the ordinary basis of confidence, had its place supplied by terror, fear having more share than friendship in detaining us in the alliance. And the first party that should be encouraged by the hope of impunity was certain to break faith with the other. So that to condemn us for being the first to break off, because they delay the blow that we dread, instead of ourselves delaying to know for certain whether it will be dealt or not, is to take a false view of the case. For if we were equally able with them to meet their plots and imitate their delay, we should be their equals and should be under no necessity of being their subjects. 
but the liberty of offense being always theirs, that of defense ought clearly to be ours. Such Lacedaemonians and allies are the grounds and the reasons of our revolt, clear enough to convince our hearers of the fairness of our conduct, and sufficient to alarm ourselves, and to make us turn to some means of safety. This we wished to do long ago, when we sent to you on the subject while the peace yet lasted, but were balked by your refusing to receive us, and now, upon the Boeotians inviting us, we at once responded to the call, and decided upon a twofold revolt, from the Hellenists and from the Athenians, not to aid the latter in harming the former, but to join in their liberation, and not to allow the Athenians in the end to destroy us, but to act in time against them. Our revolt, however, has taken place prematurely and without preparation, a fact which makes it all the more incumbent on you to receive us into alliance and to send us speedy relief, in order to show that you support your friends, and at the same time do harm to your enemies. You have an opportunity such as you never had before. Disease and expenditure have wasted the Athenians. Their ships are either cruising round your coasts, or engaged in blockading us, and it is not probable that they will have any to spare if you invade them a second time this summer by sea and land, but they will either offer no resistance to your vessels, or withdraw from both our shores. Nor must it be thought that this is a case of putting yourselves into danger for a country which is not yours. Lesbos may appear far off, but when help is wanted she will be found near enough. It is not in Attica that the war will be decided, as some imagine, but in the countries by which Attica is supported, and the Athenian revenue is drawn from the allies, and will become still larger if they reduce us, as not only will no other state revolt, but our resources will be added to theirs, and we shall be treated worse than those that were enslaved before. But if you will frankly support us, you will add to your side a state that has a large navy, which is your great want. You will smooth away to the overthrow of the Athenians by depriving them of their allies, who will be greatly encouraged to come over, and you will free yourselves from the imputation made against you of not supporting insurrection. In short, only show yourselves as liberators, and you may count upon having the advantage in the war. Respect, therefore, the hopes placed in you by the Hellenists, and that Olympian Zeus, in whose temple we stand as very suppliants, become the allies and defenders of the Mytilenians, and do not sacrifice us who put our lives upon the hazard, in a cause in which general good will result to all from our success, and still more general harm if we fail through your refusing to help us. But be the men that the Hellenists think you, and our fears desire. Such were the words of the Mytilenians. After hearing them out, the Lacedaemonians and Confederates granted what they urged, and took the Lesbians into alliance, and deciding in favor of the invasion of Attica, told the allies present to march as quickly as possible to the Isthmus with two-thirds of their forces, and arriving there first themselves, got ready hauling machines to carry their ships across from Corinth to the sea on the side of Athens, in order to make their attack by sea and land at once. However, the zeal which they displayed was not imitated by the rest of the confederates, who came in but slowly, being engaged in harvesting their corn, and sick of making expeditions. Meanwhile the Athenians, aware that the preparations of the enemy were due to his conviction of their weakness, and wishing to show him that he was mistaken, and that they were able, without moving the lesbian fleet, to repel with ease that with which they were menaced from Peloponnese manned a hundred ships by embarking the citizens of Athens, except the knights and Pentecosio Medimni, and the resident aliens, and putting out to the Isthmus, displayed their power, and made descents upon Peloponnese wherever they pleased. A disappointment so signal made the Lacedaemonians think that the Lesbians had not spoken the truth, and embarrassed by the non-appearance of the Confederates, coupled with the news that the thirty ships round Peloponnese were ravaging the lands near Sparta, they went back home. Afterwards, however, they got ready a fleet to send to Lesbos, and ordering a total of forty ships from the different cities in the league, appointed Alcadus to command the expedition in his capacity of high admiral. Meanwhile the Athenians in the hundred ships, upon seeing the Lacedaemonians go home, went home likewise. If, at the time that this fleet was at sea, Athens had almost the largest number of first-rate ships in commission that she ever possessed at any one moment, she had as many or even more when the war began. 
At that time one hundred guarded Attica, Euboea, and Salamis. A hundred more were cruising round Peloponnese, besides those employed at Potidea and in other places, making a grand total of two hundred and fifty vessels employed on active service in a single summer. It was this, with Potidea, that most exhausted her revenues, Potidaea being blockaded by a force of heavy infantry, each drawing two drachmae a day, one for himself and another for his servant, which amounted to three thousand at first, and was kept at this number down to the end of the siege, besides sixteen hundred with Formio, who went away before it was over, and the ships being all paid at the same rate. In this way her money was wasted at first, and this was the largest number of ships ever manned by her. About the same time that the Lacedaemonians were at the Isthmus, the Mytilenians marched by land with their mercenaries against Methymna, which they thought to gain by treachery. After assaulting the town, and not meeting with the success that they anticipated, they withdrew to Antissa, Pyrrha, and Erisus, and taking measures for the better security of these towns and strengthening their walls, hastily returned home. After their departure the Methymnians marched against Antissa, but were defeated in a sortie by the Antissians and their mercenaries, and retreated in haste after losing many of their number. Word of this reaching Athens, and the Athenians learning that the Mytilenians were masters of the country and their own soldiers unable to hold them in check, they sent out about the beginning of autumn Pachys, son of Epicurus, to take the command, and a thousand Athenian heavy infantry, who worked their own passage and, arriving at Mytilene, built a single wall all round it, forts being erected at some of the strongest points. Mytilene was thus blockaded strictly on both sides, by land and by sea, and winter now drew near. The Athenians, needing money for the siege, although they had for the first time raised a contribution of two hundred talents from their own citizens, now sent out twelve ships to levy subsidies from their allies, with Lysicles and four others in command. After cruising to different places and laying them under contribution, Lysicles went up the country from Myas, in Caria, across the plain of the Meander, as far as the hills of Sandias, and being attacked by the Carians and the people of Anaya, was slain with many of his soldiers. The same winter, the Plataeans, who were still being besieged by the Peloponnesians and Boeotians, distressed by the failure of their provisions, and seeing no hope of relief from Athens, nor any other means of safety, formed a scheme with the Athenians besieged with them for escaping, if possible, by forcing their way over the enemy's walls, the attempt having been suggested by Thyanetus, son of Tolmides, a soothsayer, and Eupompides, son of Dimachus, one of their generals. At first all were to join, afterwards half hung back, thinking the risk great. About two hundred and twenty, however, voluntarily persevered in the attempt, which was carried out in the following way. Ladders were made to match the height of the enemy's wall, which they measured by the layers of bricks, the side turned towards them not being thoroughly whitewashed. These were counted by many persons at once, and though some might miss the right calculation, most would hit upon it, particularly as they counted over and over again, and were no great way from the wall, but could see it easily enough for their purpose. The length required for the ladders was thus obtained, being calculated from the breadth of the brick. Now the wall of the Peloponnesians was constructed as follows. It consisted of two lines drawn round the place, one against the Plataeans, the other against any attack on the outside from Athens, about sixteen feet apart. The intermediate space of sixteen feet was occupied by huts portioned out among the soldiers on guard, and built in one block, so as to give the appearance of a single thick wall with battlements on either side. At intervals of every ten battlements were towers of considerable size, and the same breadth as the wall, reaching right across from its inner to its outer face, with no means of passing except through the middle. Accordingly, on stormy and wet nights the battlements were deserted, and guard kept from the towers, which were not far apart and roofed in above. Such being the structure of the wall by which the Plataeans were blockaded, when their preparations were completed, they waited for a stormy night of wind and rain and without any moon, and then set out, guided by the authors of the enterprise. Crossing first the ditch that ran round the town, they next gained the wall of the enemy unperceived by the sentinels, who did not see them in the darkness or hear them, as the wind drowned with its roar the noise of their approach, besides which they kept a good way off from each other, that they might not be betrayed by the clash of their weapons. 
They were also lightly equipped, and had only the left foot shod to preserve them from slipping in the mire. They came up to the battlements at one of the intermediate spaces where they knew them to be unguarded. Those who carried the ladders went first and planted them. Next, twelve light-armed soldiers with only a dagger and a breastplate mounted, led by Amias, son of Corobus, who was the first on the wall, his followers getting up after him and going six to each of the towers. After these came another party of light troops armed with spears, whose shields, that they might advance the easier, were carried by men behind, who were to hand them to them when they found themselves in presence of the enemy. After a good many had mounted, they were discovered by the sentinels in the towers, by the noise made by a tile which was knocked down by one of the Plataeans as he was laying hold of the battlements. The alarm was instantly given, and the troops rushed to the wall, not knowing the nature of the danger, owing to the dark night and stormy weather, the Plataeans in the town having also chosen that moment to make a sortie against the wall of the Peloponnesians upon the side opposite to that on which their men were getting over, in order to divert the attention of the besiegers. Accordingly they remained distracted at their several posts, without any venturing to stir to give help from his own station, and at a loss to guess what was going on. Meanwhile the three hundred set aside for service on emergencies went outside the wall in the direction of the alarm. Fire signals of an attack were also raised towards Thebes, but the Plataeans in the town at once displayed a number of others, prepared beforehand for this very purpose, in order to render the enemy's signals unintelligible and to prevent his friends getting a true idea of what was passing and coming to his aid before their comrades who had gone out should have made good their escape and be in safety. Meanwhile, the first of the scaling party that had got up, after carrying both the towers and putting the sentinels to the sword, posted themselves inside to prevent any one coming through against them, and rearing ladders from the wall sent several men up on the towers, and from their summit and base kept in check all of the enemy that came up, with their missiles, while their main body planted a number of ladders against the wall, and knocking down the battlements, passed over between the towers, each as soon as he had got over taking up his station at the edge of the ditch, and plying from thence with arrows and darts any who came along the wall to stop the passage of his comrades. When all were over, the party on the towers came down, the last of them not without difficulty, and proceeded to the ditch just as the three hundred came up carrying torches. The Plataeans, standing on the edge of the ditch in the dark, had a good view of their opponents, and discharged their arrows and darts upon the unarmed parts of their bodies, while they themselves could not be so well seen in the obscurity for the torches, and thus even the last of them got over the ditch, though not without effort and difficulty, as ice had formed in it, not strong enough to walk upon, but of that watery kind which generally comes with a wind more east than north and the snow which this wind had caused to fall during the night had made the water in the ditch rise, so that they could scarcely breast it as they crossed. However, it was mainly the violence of the storm that enabled them to effect their escape at all. Starting from the ditch, the Plataeans went all together along the road leading to Thebes, keeping the chapel of the hero Andocrates upon their right, considering that the last road which the Peloponnesians would suspect them of having taken would be that towards their enemy's country. Indeed, they could see them pursuing with torches upon the Athens road towards Catheron, and through Oscephali, or Oakheads. After going for rather more than half a mile upon the road to Thebes, the Plataeans turned off and took that leading to the mountain, to Erythrae and Hysiae, and reaching the hills, made good their escape to Athens, two hundred and twelve men in all, some of their number having turned back into the town before getting out over the wall, and one archer having been taken prisoner at the outer ditch. Meanwhile the Peloponnesians gave up the pursuit and returned to their posts, and the Plataeans in the town, knowing nothing of what had passed, and informed by those who had turned back that not a man had escaped, sent out a herald as soon as it was day to make a truce for the recovery of the dead bodies, and then, learning the truth, desisted. In this way the Plataean party got over and were saved. Towards the close of the same winter, Salethus, a Lacedaemonian, was sent out in a galley from Lacedaemon to Mytilene. Going by sea to Pyrrha, and from thence overland, he passed along the bed of a torrent, where the line of circumvallation was passable, and thus entering unperceived into Mytilene, told the magistrates that Attica would certainly be invaded, and the forty ships destined to relieve them arrive, and that he had been sent on to announce this, and to superintend matters generally. 
The Mytilenians upon this took courage, and laid aside the idea of treating with the Athenians, and now this winter ended, and with it entered the fourth year of the war of which Thucydides was the historian. The next summer the Peloponnesians sent off the forty-two ships for Mytilene, under Alcides, their high admiral, and themselves and their allies invaded Attica, their object being to distract the Athenians by a double movement, and thus to make it less easy for them to act against the fleet sailing to Mytilene. The commander in this invasion was Cleomenes, in the place of King Pausanias, son of Pleistoanax, his nephew, who was still a minor. Not content with laying waste whatever had shot up in the parts which they had before devastated, their invaders now extended their ravages to lands passed over in their previous incursions, so that this invasion was more severely felt by the Athenians than any except the second, the enemy staying on and on until they had overrun most of the country, in the expectation of hearing from Lesbos of something having been achieved by their fleet, which they thought must now have got over. However, as they did not obtain any of the results expected, and their provisions began to run short, they retreated and dispersed to their different cities. In the meantime, the Mytilenians, finding their provisions failing, while the fleet from Peloponnese was loitering on the way instead of appearing at Mytilene, were compelled to come to terms with the Athenians in the following manner. Salathus, having himself ceased to expect the fleet to arrive, now armed the commons with heavy armor, which they had not before possessed, with the intention of making a sortie against the Athenians. The commons, however, no sooner found themselves possessed of arms than they refused any longer to obey their officers, and forming in knots together, told the authorities to bring out in public the provisions and divide them amongst them all, or they would themselves come to terms with the Athenians and deliver up the city. The government, aware of their inability to prevent this, and of the danger they would be in if left out of the capitulation, publicly agreed with Pacis and the army to surrender Mytilene at discretion, and to admit the troops into the town, upon the understanding that the Mytileneans should be allowed to send an embassy to Athens to plead their cause, and that Pacis should not imprison, make slaves of, or put to death any of the citizens until its return. Such were the terms of the capitulation, in spite of which the chief authors of the negotiation with Lacedaemon were so completely overcome by terror when the army entered that they went and seated themselves by the altars, from which they were raised up by Pacis under promise that he would do them no wrong, and lodged by him in Tenedos until he should learn the pleasure of the Athenians concerning them. Pacis also sent some galleys and seized Antissa, and took such other military measures as he thought advisable. Meanwhile, the Peloponnesians in the forty ships, who ought to have made all haste to receive Mytilene, lost time in coming round Peloponnese itself, and proceeding leisurely on the remainder of the voyage, made Delos without having been seen by the Athenians at Athens, and from thence arriving at Icarus and Mykonos, there first heard of the fall of Mytilene. Wishing to know the truth, they put into Embatum, in the Erythriad, about seven days after the capture of the town. Here they learned the truth, and began to consider what they were to do. And Tutioplos and Ilion addressed them as follows. Alcidas and Peloponnesians who share with me the command of this armament, my advice is to sail just as we are to Mytilene, before we have been heard of. We may expect to find the Athenians as much off their guard as men generally are who have just taken a city. This will certainly be so by sea, where they have no idea of any enemy attacking them, and where our strength, as it happens, mainly lies. While even their land forces are probably scattered about the houses in the carelessness of victory. If therefore we were to fall upon them suddenly and in the night, I have hopes, with the help of the well-wishers that we may have left inside the town, that we shall become masters of that place. Let us not shrink from the risk, but let us remember that this is just the occasion for one of the baseless panics common in war, and that to be able to guard against these in one's own case, and to detect the moment when an attack will find an enemy at this disadvantage, is what makes a successful general. These words of Tutioplus failing to move Alcidas, some of the Ionian exiles and the lesbians with the expedition began to urge him, since this seemed too dangerous, to seize one of the Ionian cities or the Aeolic town of Chime, to use as a base for effecting the revolt of Ionia. This was by no means a hopeless enterprise, as their coming was welcome everywhere. 
their object would be by this move to deprive Athens of her chief source of revenue, and at the same time to saddle her with expense if she chose to blockade them, and they would probably induce Pisuthnes to join them in the war. However, Alcides gave this proposal as bad a reception as the other, being eager, since he had come too late for Mytilene, to find himself back in Peloponnese as soon as possible. Accordingly, he put out from Imbatum and proceeded along shore, and touching at the Teian town Mionessus, there butchered most of the prisoners that he had taken on his passage. Upon his coming to anchor at Ephesus, envoys came to him from the Samians at Anaya, and told him that he was not going the right way to free Hellas in massacring men who had never raised a hand against him, and who were not enemies of his, but allies of Athens against their will and that if he did not stop, he would turn many more friends into enemies than enemies into friends. Alcides agreed to this, and let go all the Chians still in his hands, and some of the others that he had taken. The inhabitants, instead of flying at the sight of his vessels, rather coming up to them, taking them for Athenian, having no sort of expectation that while the Athenians commanded the sea, Peloponnesian ships would venture over to Ionia. From Ephesus, Alcides set sail in haste and fled. He had been seen by the Salaminian and Paralian galleys, which happened to be sailing from Athens, while still at anchor off Claris. And fearing pursuit, he now made across the open sea, fully determined to touch nowhere if he could help it, until he got to Peloponnese. Meanwhile, news of him had come into Pacis from the Erythriad, and indeed from all quarters. As Ionia was unfortified, great fears were felt that the Peloponnesians coasting along shore, even if they did not intend to stay, might make descents in passing and plunder the towns. And now the Perellian and Salaminian, having seen him at Claris, themselves brought intelligence of the fact. Pacis accordingly gave hot chase, and continued the pursuit as far as the Isle of Patmos, and then finding that Alcidas had got on too far to be overtaken, came back again. Meanwhile he thought it fortunate that, as he had not fallen in with them out at sea, he had not overtaken them anywhere where they would have been forced to encamp, and so give him the trouble of blockading them. On his return along shore he touched, among other places, at Notium, the port of Colophon, where the Colophonians had settled after the capture of the upper town by Itamenes and the barbarians, who had been called in by certain individuals in a party quarrel. The capture of the town took place about the time of the second Peloponnesian invasion of Attica. However, the refugees, after settling at Notium, again split up into factions, one of which called in Arcadian and Barbarian mercenaries from Pasuthenes, and, entrenching these in a quarter apart, formed a new community with the Median party of the Colophonians, who joined them from the upper town. Their opponents had retired into exile, and now called in Pacis, who invited Hippias, the commander of the Arcadians in the fortified quarter, to a parley, upon condition that, if they could not agree, he was to be put back safe and sound in the fortification. However, upon his coming out to him, he put him into custody, though not in chains, and attacked suddenly and took by surprise the fortification, and putting the Arcadians and the barbarians found in it to the sword, afterwards took Hippias into it, as he had promised, and as soon as he was inside, seized him and shot him down. Pacis then gave up Notium to the Colophonians, not of the Median party, and settlers were afterwards sent out from Athens, and the place colonized according to Athenian laws, after collecting all of the Colophonians found in any of the cities. Arrived at Mytilene, Pacis reduced Pyrrha and Erisus, and finding the Lacedaemonian Solathus in hiding in the town, sent him off to Athens, together with the Mytilenians that he had placed in Tenedos, and any other persons that he thought concerned in the revolt. He also sent back the greater part of his forces, remaining with the rest to settle Mytilene, and the rest of Lesbos, as he thought best. Upon the arrival of the prisoners with Silethus, the Athenians at once put the latter to death, although he offered, among other things, to procure the withdrawal of the Peloponnesians from Plataea, which was still under siege. And after deliberating as to what they should do with the former, in the fury of the moment determined to put to death not only the prisoners at Athens, but the whole adult male population of Mytilene, and to make slaves of the women and children. 
it was remarked that Mytilene had revolted without being, like the rest, subjected to the empire, and what above all swelled the wrath of the Athenians was the fact of the Peloponnesian fleet having ventured over to Ionia her support, a fact which was held to argue a long-meditated rebellion. They accordingly sent a galley to communicate the decree to Pacis, commanding him to lose no time in dispatching the Mytilenians. The morrow brought repentance with it, and reflection on the horrid cruelty of a decree which condemned a whole city to the fate merited only by the guilty. This was no sooner perceived by the Mytilenian ambassadors at Athens and their Athenian supporters than they moved the authorities to put the question again to the vote, which they the more easily consented to do, as they themselves plainly saw that most of the citizens wished some one to give them an opportunity for reconsidering the matter. An assembly was therefore at once called, and after much expression of opinion on both sides, Cleon, son of Cleonitus, the same who had carried the former motion of putting the Mytilenians to death, the most violent man at Athens, and at that time by far the most powerful with the commons, came forward again and spoke as follows. I have often before now been convinced that a democracy is incapable of empire, and never more so than by your present change of mind in the matter of Mytilene. Fears of plots being unknown to you in your daily relations with each other, you feel just the same with regard to your allies, and never reflect that the mistakes into which you may be led by listening to their appeals, or by giving way to your own compassion, are full of danger to yourselves, and bring you no thanks for your weakness from your allies entirely forgetting that your empire is a despotism, and your subjects disaffected conspirators, whose obedience is ensured not by your suicidal concessions, but by the superiority given you by your own strength and not their loyalty. The most alarming feature in the case is the constant change of measures with which we appear to be threatened, and our seeming ignorance of the fact that bad laws which are never changed are better for a city than good ones that have no authority that unlearned loyalty is more serviceable than quick-witted insubordination, and that ordinary men usually manage public affairs better than their more gifted fellows. The latter are always wanting to appear wiser than the laws, and to overrule every proposition brought forward, thinking that they cannot show their wit in more important matters, and by such behavior too often ruin their country, while those who mistrust their own cleverness are content to be less learned than the laws, and less able to pick holes in the speech of a good speaker, and being fair judges rather than rival athletes, generally conduct affairs successfully. These we ought to imitate, instead of being led on by cleverness and intellectual rivalry to advise your people against our real opinions. For myself, I adhere to my former opinion, and wonder at those who have proposed to reopen the case of the Mytilenians, and who are thus causing a delay which is all in favor of the guilty, by making the sufferer proceed against the offender with the edge of his anger blunted, although where vengeance follows most closely upon the wrong, it best equals it and most amply requites it. I wonder also who will be the man who will maintain the contrary, and will pretend to show that the crimes of the Mytilenians are of service to us, and our misfortunes injurious to the Allies. Such a man must plainly either have such confidence in his rhetoric as to adventure to prove that what has been once for all decided is still undetermined, or be bribed to try to delude us by elaborate sophisms. In such contests the state gives the rewards to others, and takes the dangers for herself. The persons to blame are you who are so foolish as to institute these contests, who go to see an oration as you would to see a sight, take your facts on hearsay, judge of the practicability of a project by the wit of its advocates, and trust for the truth as to past events, not to the fact which you saw more than to the clever strictures which you heard, the easy victims of new-fangled arguments, unwilling to follow received conclusions, slaves to every new paradox, despisers of the commonplace, the first wish of every man being that he could speak himself, the next arrival those who can speak by seeming to be quite up with their ideas, by applauding every hit almost before it is made, and by being as quick in catching an argument as you are slow in foreseeing its consequences. Asking, if I may so say, for something different from the conditions under which we live, and yet comprehending inadequately those very conditions, very slaves to the pleasure of the ear, and more like the audience of a rhetorician than the counsel of a city. 
in order to keep you from this i proceed to show that no one state has ever injured you as much as mitilini i can make allowance for those who revolt because they cannot bear our empire or who have been forced to do so by the enemy but for those who possessed an island with fortifications who could fear our enemies only by sea and there had their own force of galleys to protect them who were independent and held in the highest honor by you to act as these have done this is not revolt revolt implies oppression it is deliberate and wanton aggression an attempt to ruin us by siding with our bitterest enemies a worse offence than a war undertaken on their own account in the acquisition of power the fate of those of their neighbors who had already rebelled and had been subdued was no lesson to them their own prosperity could not dissuade them from affronting danger but blindly confident in the future and full of hopes beyond their power though not beyond their ambition they declared war and made their decision to prefer might to right their attack being determined not by provocation but by the moment which seemed propitious the truth is that great good fortune coming suddenly and unexpectedly tends to make a people insolent in most cases it is safer for mankind to have success in reason than out of reason and it is easier for them one may say to stave off adversity than to preserve prosperity our mistake has been to distinguish the mitilenians as we have done had they been long ago treated like the rest they would never would have so far forgotten themselves human nature being as surely made arrogant by consideration as it is awed by firmness let them now therefore be punished as their crime requires and do not while you condemn the aristocracy absolve the people this is certain that all attacked you without distinction although they might have come over to us and been now again in possession of their city but no they thought it safer to throw in their lot with the aristocracy and so joined their rebellion consider therefore if you subject to the same punishment the ally who is forced to rebel by the enemy and him who does so by his own free choice which of them think you is there that will not rebel upon the slightest pretext when the reward of success is freedom and the penalty of failure nothing so very terrible we meanwhile shall have to risk our money and our lives against one state after another and if successful shall receive a ruined town from which we can no longer draw the revenue upon which our strength depends while if unsuccessful we shall have an enemy the more upon our hands and shall spend the time that might be employed in combating our existing foes in warring with our own allies no hope therefore that rhetoric may instill or money purchase of the mercy due to human infirmity must be held out to the mytilenians their offence was not involuntary but of malice and deliberate and mercy is only for unwilling offenders i therefore now as before persist against your reversing your first decision or giving way to the three failings most fatal to empire pity sentiment and indulgence compassion is due to those who can reciprocate the feeling not to those who will never pity us in return but are our natural and necessary foes the orators who charm us with sentiment may find other less important arenas for their talents in the place of one where the city pays a heavy penalty for a momentary pleasure themselves receiving fine acknowledgments for their fine phrases while indulgence should be shown towards those who will be our friends in future instead of towards men who will remain just what they were and as much our enemies as before to sum up shortly i say that if you follow my advice you will do what is just towards the mytilenians and at the same time expedient while by a different decision you will not oblige them so much as pass sentence upon yourselves for if they were right in rebelling you must be wrong in ruling however if right or wrong you determine to rule you must carry out your principle and punish the mytilenians as your interest requires or else you must give up your empire and cultivate honesty without danger make up your minds therefore to give them like for like do not let the victims who escaped the plot be more insensible than the conspirators who hatched it but reflect what they would have done if victorious over you especially they were the aggressors it is they who wrong their neighbor without a cause that pursue their victim to the death on account of the danger which they foresee in letting their enemy survive since the object of a wanton wrong is more dangerous if he escape than an enemy who has not this to complain of.
do not therefore be traitors to yourselves but recall as nearly as possible the moment of suffering and the supreme importance which you then attach to their reduction and now pay them back in turn without yielding to present weakness or forgetting the peril that once hung over you punish them as they deserve and teach your other allies by a striking example that the penalty of a rebellion is death let them once understand this and you will not have so often to neglect your enemies while you are fighting with your own confederates such were the words of cleon after him diodotus son of eucrates who had also in the previous assembly spoken most strongly against putting the mytilenians to death came forward and spoke as follows i do not blame the persons who have reopened the case of the mytilenians nor do i approve the protests which we have heard against important questions being frequently debated i think the two things most opposed to good counsel are haste and passion haste usually goes hand in hand with folly passion with coarseness and narrowness of mind as for the argument that speech ought not to be the exponent of action the man who uses it must be either senseless or interested senseless if he believes it is possible to treat of the uncertain future through any other medium interested if wishing to carry a disgraceful measure and doubting his ability to speak well in a bad cause he thinks to frighten opponents and hearers by well-aimed calumny what is still more intolerable is to accuse a speaker of making a display in order to be paid for it if ignorance only were imputed an unsuccessful speaker might retire with a reputation for honesty if not for wisdom while the charge of dishonesty makes him suspected if successful and thought if defeated not only a fool but a rogue the city is no gainer by such a system since fear deprives it of its advisers although in truth if our speakers are to make such assertions it would be better for the country if they could not speak at all as we should then make fewer blunders the good citizen ought to triumph not by frightening his opponents but by beating them fairly in argument and a wise city without over distinguishing its best advisers will nevertheless not deprive them of their due and far from punishing an unlucky counsellor will not even regard him as disgraced in this way successful orators would be least tempted to sacrifice their convictions to popularity in the hope of still higher honors and unsuccessful speakers to resort to the same popular arts in order to win over the multitude this is not our way and besides the moment that a man is suspected of giving advice however good from corrupt motives we feel such a grudge against him for the gain which after all we are not certain he will receive that we deprive the city of its certain benefit plain good advice has thus come to be no less suspected than bad and the advocate of the most monstrous measures is not more obliged to use deceit to gain the people than the best counsellor is to lie in order to be believed the city and the city only owing to these refinements can never be served openly and without disguise he who does serve it openly being always suspected of serving himself in some secret way in return still considering the magnitude of the interests involved and the position of affairs we orators must make it our business to look a little farther than you who judge offhand especially as we your advisers are responsible while you our audience are not so for if those who gave the advice and those who took it suffered equally you would judge more calmly as it is you visit the disasters into which the whim of the moment may have led you upon the single person of your adviser not upon yourselves his numerous companions in error however i have not come forward either to oppose or to accuse in the matter of mytilene indeed the question before us as sensible men is not their guilt but our interests though i prove them ever so guilty i shall not therefore advise their death unless it be expedient nor though they should have claims to indulgence shall i recommend it unless it be dearly for the good of the country i consider that we are deliberating for the future more than for the present and where cleon is so positive as to the useful deterrent effects that will follow from making rebellion capital i who consider the interests of the future quite as much as he as positively maintain the contrary and i require you not to reject my useful considerations for his specious ones his speech may have the attraction of seeming the more just in your present temper against mytilene but we are not in a court of justice but in a political assembly and the question is not justice but how to make the mytilenians useful to athens 
Now, of course, communities have enacted the penalty of death for many offenses far lighter than this. Still, hope leads men to venture, and no one ever yet put himself in peril without the inward conviction that he would succeed in his design. Again, was there ever city rebelling that did not believe that it possessed, either in itself or in its alliances, resources adequate to the enterprise? All states and individuals are alike prone to error, and there is no law that will prevent them. Or why should men have exhausted the list of punishments in search of enactments to protect them from evil doers? It is probable that in early times the penalties for the greatest offenses were less severe, and that, as these were disregarded, the penalty of death has been by degrees in most cases arrived at, which is itself disregarded in like manner. Either then some means of terror more terrible than this must be discovered, or it must be owned that this restraint is useless, and that as long as poverty gives men the courage of necessity, or plenty fills them with the ambition which belongs to insolence and pride, and the other conditions of life remain each under the thraldom of some fatal and master passion, so long will the impulse never be wanting to drive men into danger. Hope also and cupidity, the one leading and the other following, the one conceiving the attempt, the other suggesting the facility of succeeding, cause the widest ruin, and although invisible agents, are far stronger than the dangers that are seen. Fortune, too, powerfully helps the delusion, and by the unexpected aid that she sometimes lends, tempts men to venture with inferior means, and this is especially the case with communities, because the stakes played for are the highest, freedom or empire, and when all are acting together, each man irrationally magnifies his own capacity. In fine, it is impossible to prevent, and only great simplicity can hope to prevent, human nature doing what it has once set its mind upon, by force of law or by any other deterrent force whatsoever. We must not, therefore, commit ourselves to a false policy through a belief in the efficacy of the punishment of death, or exclude rebels from the hope of repentance and an early atonement of their error. Consider a moment. At present, if a city that has already revolted perceive that it cannot succeed, it will come to terms while it is still able to refund expenses and pay tribute afterwards. In the other case, what city, think you, would not prepare better than it is now done, and hold out to the last against its besiegers, if it is all one whether it surrender late or soon? And how can it be otherwise than hurtful to us to be put to the expense of a siege, because surrender is out of the question? And if we take the city to receive a ruined town from which we can no longer draw the revenue which forms our real strength against the enemy? We must not, therefore, sit as strict judges of the offenders to our own prejudice, but rather see how by moderate chastisements we may be enabled to benefit in future by the revenue-producing powers of our dependencies. And we must make up our minds to look for our protection, not to legal terrors, but to careful administration. At present we do exactly the opposite. When a free community, held in subjection by force, rises, as is only natural, and asserts its independence, it is no sooner reduced than we fancy ourselves obliged to punish it severely. Although the right course with freemen is not to chastise them rigorously when they do rise, but rigorously to watch them before they rise, and to prevent their ever entertaining the idea, and the insurrection suppressed, to make as few responsible for it as possible. Only consider what a blunder you would commit in doing as Cleon recommends. As things are at present, in all the cities the people is your friend, and either does not revolt with the oligarchy, or, if forced to do so, becomes at once the enemy of the insurgents, so that in the war with a hostile city you have the masses on your side. But if you butcher the people of Mytilene, who had nothing to do with the revolt, and who, as soon as they got arms, of their own motion surrendered the town, first you will commit the crime of killing your benefactors, and next you will play directly into the hands of the higher classes, who, when they induce their cities to rise, will immediately have the people on their side, through your having announced, in advance, the same punishment for those who are guilty and for those who are not. On the contrary, even if they were guilty, you ought to seem not to notice it, in order to avoid alienating the only class still friendly to us. In short, I consider it far more useful for the preservation of our empire voluntarily to put up with injustice, than to put to death, however justly, those whom it is our interest to keep alive. As for Cleon's idea that in punishment the claims of justice and expediency can both be satisfied, 
facts do not confirm the possibility of such a combination. Confess, therefore, that this is the wisest course, and without conceding too much either to pity or to indulgence, by neither of which motives do I any more than Cleon wish you to be influenced, upon the plain merits of the case before you, be persuaded by me to try calmly those of the Mytilenians whom Pacchus sent off as guilty, and to leave the rest undisturbed. This is at once best for the future, and most terrible to your enemies at the present moment, inasmuch as good policy against an adversary is superior to the blind attacks of brute force. Such were the words of Diodotus. The two opinions thus expressed were the ones that most directly contradicted each other, and the Athenians, notwithstanding their change of feeling, now proceeded to a division in which the show of hands was almost equal, although the motion of Diodotus carried the day. Another galley was at once sent off in haste, for fear that the first might reach Lesbos in the interval, and the city be found destroyed, the first ship having about a day and a night's start. Wine and barley cakes were provided for the vessel by the Mytilenian ambassadors, and great promises made if they arrived in time, which caused the men to use such diligence upon the voyage that they took their meals of barley cakes kneaded with oil and wine as they rowed, and only slept by turns while the others were at the oar. Luckily they met with no contrary wind, and, the first ship making no haste upon so horrid an errand, while the second pressed on in the manner described, the first arrived so little before them, that Pacchus had only just had time to read the decree, and to prepare to execute the sentence, when the second put into port and prevented the massacre. The danger of Mytilene had indeed been great. The other party whom Pacchus had sent off as the prime movers in the rebellion were upon Cleon's motion put to death by the Athenians, the number being rather more than a thousand. The Athenians also demolished the walls of the Mytilenians, and took possession of their ships. Afterwards tribute was not imposed upon the Lesbians, but all their land, except that of the Methymnians, was divided into three thousand allotments, three hundred of which were reserved as sacred for the gods, and the rest assigned by lot to Athenian shareholders, who were sent out to the island. With these the Lesbians agreed to pay a rent of two minae a year for each allotment, and cultivated the land themselves. The Athenians also took possession of the towns on the continent belonging to the Mytilenians, which thus became for the future subject to Athens. Such were the events that took place at Lesbos. End of chapter 9「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public The History of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Translated by Richard Crawley Book 3, Chapter 10 Fifth Year of the War Trial and Execution of the Plataeans Corsarian Revolution During the same summer, after the reduction of Lesbos, the Athenians under Nicias, son of Niceratus, made an expedition against the island of Minoa, which lies off Megara, and was used as a fortified post by the Megarians, who had built a tower upon it. Nicias wished to enable the Athenians to maintain their blockade from this nearer station, instead of from Budorum and Salamis, to stop the Peloponnesian galleys and privateers sailing out unobserved from the island, as they had been in the habit of doing, and at the same time prevent anything from coming into Megara. Accordingly, after taking two towers projecting on the side of Nicaea by engines from the sea, and clearing the entrance into the channel between the island and the shore, he next proceeded to cut off all communication by building a wall on the mainland at the point where a bridge across a morass enabled suckers to be thrown into the island, which was not far from the continent. A few days sufficing to accomplish this, he afterwards raised some works in the island also, and leaving a garrison there, departed with his forces." About the same time in this summer, the Plataeans, being now without provisions and unable to support the siege, surrendered to the Peloponnesians in the following manner. An assault had been made upon the wall, which the Plataeans were unable to repel. The Lacedaemonian commander, perceiving their weakness, wished to avoid taking the place by storm, 
his instructions from Lacedaemon having been so conceived, in order that if at any future time peace should be made with Athens, and they should agree each to restore the places that they had taken in the war, Plataea might be held to have come over voluntarily, and not be included in the list. He accordingly sent a herald to them to ask if they were willing voluntarily to surrender the town to the Lacedaemonians, and accept them as their judges, on the understanding that the guilty should be punished, but no one without form of law. The Plataeans were now in the last state of weakness, and the herald had no sooner delivered his message than they surrendered the town. The Peloponnesians fed them for some days until the judges from Lacedaemon, who were five in number, arrived. Upon their arrival no charge was preferred. They simply called up the Plataeans, and asked them whether they had done the Lacedaemonians and allies any service in the war then raging. The Plataeans then asked leave to speak at greater length, and deputed two of their number to represent them, Astymachus, son of Asipaleus, and Lacon, son of Aemnestus, Proxenus of the Lacedaemonians, who came forward and spoke as follows. Lacedaemonians, when we surrendered our city, we trusted in you, and looked forward to a trial more agreeable to the forms of law than those present, to which we had no idea of being subjected. The judges also, in whose hands we consented to place ourselves, were you, and you only, from whom we thought we were most likely to obtain justice, and not other persons, as is now the case. As matters stand, we are afraid that we have been doubly deceived. We have good reason to suspect, not only that the issue to be tried is the most terrible of all, but that you will not prove impartial, if we may argue from the fact that no accusation was first brought forward for us to answer, but we had ourselves to ask leave to speak, and from the question being put so shortly, that a true answer to it tells against us, while a false one can be contradicted. In this dilemma, our safest, and indeed our only course, seems to be to say something at all risks. Placed as we are, we could scarcely be silent without being tormented by the damning thought that speaking might have saved us. Another difficulty that we have to encounter is the difficulty of convincing you. Were we unknown to each other, we might profit by bringing forward new matters with which you were unacquainted. As it is, we can tell you nothing that you do not know already. And we fear, not that you have condemned us in your own minds of having failed our duty towards you, and make this our crime, but that to please a third party we have to submit to a trial the result of which is already decided. Nevertheless, we will place before you what we can justly urge, not only on the question of the quarrel which the Thebans have against us, but also as addressing you and the rest of the Hellenes, and we will remind you of our good services, and endeavor to prevail with you. To your short question, whether we have done the Lacedaemonians and allies any service in this war, we say, if you ask us as enemies, that to refrain from serving you was not to do you injury, if as friends, then you are more in fault for having marched against us. During the peace, and against the Mede, we acted very well. We have not now been the first to break the peace, and we were the only Boeotians then joined in defending against the Mede the liberty of Hellas. Although an inland people, we were present at the action at Artemisium, in the battle that took place in our territory, we fought by the side of yourselves and Pausanias, and in all the other Hellenic exploits of the time, we took a part quite out of proportion to our strength. Besides, you, as Lacedaemonians, ought not to forget that at the time of the great panic at Sparta, after the earthquake, caused by the secession of the Helots to Ithome, we sent the third part of our citizens to assist you. On these great and historical occasions, such was the part that we chose— although afterwards we became your enemies. For this you were to blame. When we asked for your alliance against our Theban oppressors, you rejected our petition, and told us to go to the Athenians who were our neighbors, as you lived too far off. In the war we never have done to you, and never should have done to you, anything unreasonable. If we refused to desert the Athenians when you asked us, we did no wrong. They had helped us against the Thebans when you drew back, and we could no longer give them up with honor, especially as we had obtained their alliance, and had been admitted to their citizenship at our own request, and after receiving benefits at their hands, but it was plainly our duty loyally to obey their orders. Besides, the faults that either of you may commit in your supremacy must be laid not upon the followers, but upon the chiefs that led them astray." With regard to the Thebans, they have wronged us repeatedly, and their last aggression, which has been the means of bringing us into our present position, is within your own knowledge. 
in seizing our city in time of peace, and what is more, at a holy time in the month, they justly encountered our vengeance, in accordance with the universal law which sanctions resistance to an invader, and it cannot now be right that we should suffer on their account. By taking your own immediate interest and their animosity as the test of justice, you will prove yourselves to be rather waiters on expediency than judges of right, although if they seem useful to you now, we and the rest of the Hellenes give you much more valuable help at a time of greater need. Now you are the assailants, and others fear you, but at the crisis to which we allude, when the barbarian threatened all with slavery, the Thebans were on his side. It is just, therefore, to put our patriotism then against our error now, if error there has been, and you will find the merit outweighing the fault, and displayed at a juncture when there were few Hellenes who had set their valor against the strength of Xerxes, and when greater praise was theirs who preferred the dangerous path of honor to the safe course of consulting their own interest with respect to the invasion. To these few we belonged, and highly were we honored for it, and yet we now fear to perish by having again acted on the same principles, and chosen to act well with Athens sooner than wisely with Sparta. Yet in justice the same cases should be decided in the same way, and policy should not mean anything else than lasting gratitude for the service of good ally, combined with a strong proper attention to one's immediate interest. Consider also that at present the Hellenes generally regard you as a pattern of worth and honor, and if you pass an unjust sentence upon us in this, which is no obscure cause, but one in which you, the judges, are as illustrious as we, the prisoners, are blameless, take care that displeasure be not felt at an unworthy decision in the matter of honorable men, made by men yet more honorable than they, and at the consecration in the national temples of spoils taken from the Plataeans, the benefactors of Hellas." Shocking indeed will it seem for Lacedaemonians to destroy Plataea, and for the city whose name your fathers inscribed on the tripod at Delphi for its good service, to be by you blotted out from the map of Hellas, to please the Thebans. To such a depth of misfortune have we fallen, that while the Medes' success had been our ruin, Thebans now supplant us in your once fond regards, and we have been subjected to two dangers, the greatest of any, that of dying of starvation then, if we had not surrendered our town, and now of being tried for our lives. So that we Plataeans, after exertions beyond our power in the cause of the Hellenes, are rejected by all, forsaken and unassisted, helped by none of our allies, and reduced to doubt the stability of our only hope, yourselves. Still, in the name of the gods who once presided over our confederacy, and of our own good service in the Hellenic cause, we adjure you to relent, to recall the decision which we fear that the Thebans may have obtained from you, to ask back the gift that you have given them, that they not disgrace you by slaying us, to gain a pure instead of a guilty gratitude, and not to gratify others to be yourselves rewarded with shame. Our lives may quickly be taken, but it will be a heavy task to wipe away the infamy of the deed, as we are no enemies whom you might justly punish, but friends, forced into taking arms against you. To grant us our lives would be, therefore, a righteous judgment. If you consider also that we are prisoners who surrendered of their own accord, stretching out our hands for quarter, whose slaughter Hellenic law forbids, and who besides were always your benefactors— Look at the sepulchres of your fathers, slain by the Medes and buried in our country, whom year by year we honored with garments and all other dues, and the first fruits of all that our land produced in their season, as friends from a friendly country, and allies to our old companions in arms. Should you not decide aright, your conduct would be the very opposite to ours. Consider only, Pausanias buried them thinking that he was laying them in friendly ground, and among men as friendly. But you, if you kill us and make the Plataean territory Theban, will leave your fathers and kinsmen in a hostile soil, and among their murderers, deprived of the honors which they now enjoy. What is more, you will enslave the land in which the freedom of the Hellenes was won, make desolate the temples of the gods to whom they prayed before they overcame the Medes, and take away your ancestral sacrifices from those who founded and instituted them." It were not to your glory, Lacedaemonians, either to offend in this way against the common law of the Hellenes, and against your own ancestors, or to kill us, your benefactors, to gratify another's hatred without having been wronged yourselves. It were more so to spare us, and to yield to the impressions of a reasonable compassion, 
reflecting not merely on the awful fate in store for us, but also on the character of the sufferers, and on the impossibility of predicting how soon misfortune may fall even upon those who deserve it not. We, as we have a right to do, and as our need impels us, entreat you, calling aloud upon the gods at whose common altar all the Hellenes worship, to hear our request, to not be unmindful of the oaths which your fathers swore, and which we now plead. We supplicate you by the tombs of your fathers, and appeal to those that are gone to save us from falling into the hands of the Thebans, and their dearest friends, from being given up to their most detested foes. We also remind you of that day on which we did the most glorious deeds, by your father's sides, we who now on this are like to suffer the most dreadful fate. Finally, to do what is necessary and yet most difficult for men in our situation, that is, to make an end of speaking, since with that ending the peril of our lives draws near. In conclusion we say that we did not surrender our city to the Thebans, to that we would have preferred inglorious starvation, but trusted in and capitulated to you. And it would be just, if we fail to persuade you, to put us back in the same position and let us take the chance that falls to us. And at the same time, we adjure you not to give us up. Your suppliants, Lacedaemonians, out of your hands and faith, Plataeans foremost of the Hellenic patriots, to Thebans, our most hated enemies, but to be our saviors, and not, while you free the rest of the Hellenes, to bring us to destruction. Such were the words of the Plataeans. The Thebans, afraid that the Lacedaemonians might be moved by what they had heard, came forward and said that they too desired to address them, since the Plataeans had, against their wish, been allowed to speak at length, instead of being confined to a simple answer to the question. Leave being granted, the Thebans spoke as follows. We should never have asked to make this speech if the Plataeans on their side had contented themselves with shortly answering the question, and had not turned around and made charges against us, coupled with a long defense of themselves upon matters outside the present inquiry, and not even the subject of accusation, and with praise of what no one finds fault with. However, since they have done so, we must answer their charges and refute their self-praise, in order that neither our bad name nor their good may help them, but that you may hear the real truth on both points, and so decide. The origin of our quarrel was this. We settled Plataea some time after the rest of Boeotia, together with other places out of which we had driven the mixed population. The Plataeans not choosing to recognize our supremacy, as had been first arranged, but separating themselves from the rest of the Boeotians, and proving traitors to their nationality, we used compulsion, upon which they went over to the Athenians, and with them did as much harm for which we retaliated. Next, when the barbarian invaded Hellas, they say that they were the only Boeotians who did not meet eyes, and that is where they most glorify themselves and abuse us. We say that if they did not meet eyes, it was because the Athenians did not do so either, just as afterwards, when the Athenians attacked the Hellenes, they, the Plataeans, were again the only Boeotians who atticized. And yet consider the forms of our respective governments when we so acted. Our city at that juncture had neither an oligarchical constitution in which all the nobles enjoyed equal rights, nor a democracy, but that which is most opposed to law and good government and nearest a tyranny, the rule of a close cabal. These, hoping to strengthen their individual power by the success of the Mede, kept down by force the people, and brought him into the town. The city as a whole was not its own mistress when it so acted, and ought not to be reproached for the errors that it committed when deprived of its constitution. Examine only how we acted after the departure of the Mede, and the recovery of the constitution, when the Athenians attacked the rest of Hellas, and endeavored to subjugate our country, of the greater part of which faction had already made them masters. Did we not fight and conquer at Coronea and liberate Boeotia? And do we not now actively contribute to the liberation of the rest, providing horses to the cause, and a force unequaled by that of any other state in the Confederacy? Let this suffice to excuse us for our medism. We will now endeavor to show that you have injured the Hellenes more than we, and are more deserving of condign punishment. It was in defense against us, say you, that you became allies and citizens of Athens. If so, you ought only to have called in the Athenians against us, instead of joining them in attacking others. It was open to you to do this if you ever felt that they were leading you where you did not wish to follow, as Lacedaemon was already your ally against the Mede, as you so much insist. And this was surely sufficient to keep us off, and above all, to allow you to deliberate in security." 
Nevertheless, of your own choice and without compulsion, you chose to throw your lot in with Athens, and you say that it had been base for you to betray your benefactors, but it was surely far baser and more iniquitous to sacrifice the whole body of the Hellenes, your fellow confederates, who were liberating Hellas, than the Athenians only, who were enslaving it. The return that you made them was therefore neither equal nor honorable, since you called them in, as you say, because you were being oppressed yourselves, and then became accomplices in oppressing others. Although baseness rather consists in not returning like for like, than in not returning what is justly due, but what must be unjustly paid." Meanwhile, after thus plainly showing that it was not for the sake of the Hellenes that you alone then did not Medize, but because the Athenians did not do so either, and you wished to side with them and be against the rest, you now claim the benefit of good deeds done to please your neighbors. This cannot be admitted. You chose the Athenians, and with them you must stand or fall. Nor can you plead the league then made and claim that it should now protect you. You abandoned that league and defended against it by helping instead of hindering the subjugation of the Aegeanetans and others of its members, and that not under compulsion, but while in enjoyment of the same institutions that you enjoy to the present hour, and no one forcing you, as in our case. Lastly, an invitation was addressed to you before you were blockaded to be neutral and join neither party. This you did not accept. Who then merit the detestation of the Hellenes more justly than you, you who sought their ruin under the mask of honor? The former virtues that you allege you now show not to be proper to your character. The real bent of your nature has been at length damningly proved. When the Athenians took the path of injustice, you followed them. Of our unwilling metism and your willful atticizing, this then is our explanation. The last wrong of which you complain consists in our having, as you say, lawlessly invaded your town in time of peace and festival. Here again we cannot think that we were more in fault than yourselves. If of our own proper motion we made an armed attack upon your city and ravaged your territory, we are guilty. But if the first men among you in a state and family, wishing to put an end to the foreign connection, and to restore you to the common Boeotian country, of their own free will invited us, wherein is our crime? Where wrong is done, those who lead, as you say, are more to blame than those who follow. Not that, in our judgment, wrong was done either by them or by us. Citizens like yourselves, and with more at stake than you, they opened their own walls and introduced us into their own city, not as foes, but as friends, to prevent the bad among you from becoming worse, to give honest men their due, to reform principles without attacking persons, since you were not to be banished from your city, but brought home to your kindred, nor to be made enemies to any, but friends alike to all. That our intention was not hostile is proved by our behavior— we did harm to no one, but publicly invited those who wished to live under a national Boeotian government to come over to us, which at first you gladly did, and made an agreement with us, and remained tranquil, until you became aware of the smallness of our numbers. Now it is possible that there may have been something not quite fair in our entering without the consent of your commons. At any rate, you did not repay us in kind. Instead of refraining, as we had done from violence, and inducing us to retire by negotiation, you fell upon us in violation of your agreement, and slew some of us in fight, of which we did not so much complain, for in that there was a certain justice. But others, who held out their hands and received quarter, and whose lives you subsequently promised us, you lawlessly butchered. If this was not abominable, what is? And after these three crimes committed one after the other— the violation of your agreement, the murder of the men afterward, and the lying breach of your promise not to kill them. If we refrained from injuring your property in the country, you still affirm that we are the criminals, and yourselves pretend to escape justice. Not so, if these your judges decide aright, but you will be punished for all together. Such, Lacedaemonians, are the facts. We have gone into them at some length, both on your account and on our own, that you will justly condemn the prisoners, and we— that we have given an additional sanction to our vengeance. We would also prevent you from being melted by the hearing of their past virtues, if any they such had. These may be fairly appealed to by the victims of injustice, but only aggravate the guilt of criminals, since they offend against their better nature. Nor let them gain anything by crying and wailing, by calling upon your father's tombs and their own desolate condition. Against this we point to the far more dreadful fate of our youth, 
butchered at their hands, the fathers of whom either fell at Corinea, bringing Boeotia over to you, or seated forlorn old men by desolate hearts, with far more reason implore your justice upon the prisoners. The pity which they appeal to is rather due to men who suffer unworthily. Those who suffer justly as they do are the contrary subjects for triumph. For their present desolate condition they have themselves to blame, since they willfully rejected the better alliance. Their lawless act was not provoked by an action of ours. Hate, not justice, inspired their decision. And even now the satisfaction which they afford us is not adequate. They will suffer by a legal sentence, not as they pretend as suppliants asking for quarter in battle, but as prisoners, who have surrendered upon agreement to take their trial. Vindicate, therefore, Lacedaemonians, the Hellenic law which they have broken." and to us, the victims of its violation, grant the reward merited by our zeal. Nor let us be supplanted in your favor by their harangues, but offer an example to the Hellenes, that the contests to which you invite them are of deeds, not words. Good deeds can be shortly stated, but where wrong is done a wealth of language is needed to veil its deformity. However, if leading powers were to do what you are now doing, and putting one short question to all alike were to decide accordingly, men would be less tempted to seek fine phrases to cover bad actions. Such were the words of the Thebans. The Lacedaemonian judges decided that the question whether they had received any service from the Plataeans in the war was a fair one for them to put, as they had always invited them to be neutral, agreeably to the original covenant of Pausanias after the defeat of the Mede, and had again definitely offered them the same conditions before the blockade. This honor having been refused, they were now, they conceived, by the loyalty of their intention, released from their covenant, and having, as they considered, suffered evil at the hands of the Plataeans, they brought them in again, one by one, and asked each of them the same question, that is to say, whether they had done the Lacedaemonians and allies any service in the war, and upon their saying that they had not, took them out and slew them, all without exception." The number of Plataeans thus massacred was not less than two hundred, with twenty-five Athenians who had shared in the siege. The women were taken as slaves. The city the Thebans gave for about a year to some political emigrants from Megara, and to the surviving Plataeans of their own party to inhabit, and afterwards raised it to the ground from the very foundations, and built on to the precinct of Hera an inn two hundred feet square, with rooms all round, above and below, making use for this purpose of the roofs and doors of the Plataeans, of the rest of the materials in the wall, the brass and iron, they made couches which they dedicated to Hera, for whom they also built a stone chapel of a hundred feet square. The land they confiscated, and let out on a ten years' lease to Theban occupiers. The adverse attitude of the Lacedaemonians in the whole Plataean affair was mainly adopted to please the Thebans, who were thought to be useful in the war at the moment raging. Such was the end of the Plataeans, in the ninety-third year after she became an ally of Athens. Meanwhile, the forty ships of the Peloponnesians had gone to the relief of the Lesbians, and which we left flying across the open sea, pursued by the Athenians, were caught in a storm off Crete, and scattering from thence made their well to Peloponnesus, where they found at Silene thirteen Leucadian and Ambrosiate galleys, with Brasidas, son of Tellus, lately arrived as counsellor to Alcidas. The Lacedaemonians, upon the failure of the lesbian expedition, having resolved to strengthen their fleet and sail to Corsera, where a revolution had broken out, so as to arrive there before the twelve Athenian ships at Naupactus could be reinforced from Athens, Brasidas and Alcidas began to prepare accordingly. The Corsarian revolution began with a return of the prisoners taken in the sea fights off Epidamnus. These the Corinthians had released, nominally upon the security of eight hundred talents given by their proxeni, but in reality upon their engagement to bring over Corsera to Corinth. These men proceeded to canvass each of the citizens, and to intrigue with the view of detaching the city from Athens. Upon the arrival of an Athenian and a Corinthian vessel, with envoys on board, a conference was held in which the Corsarians voted to remain allies of the Athenians, according to their agreement, but to be friends of the Peloponnesians as they had been formerly. Meanwhile, the returned prisoners brought Patheus, a volunteer proxenus of the Athenians and leader of the commons, to trial, upon the charge of enslaving Corsaira to Athens. He being acquitted, retorted by accusing five of the richest of their number of cutting stakes in the ground sacred to Zeus and Alcinous, the legal penalty being a stator for each stake. 
upon their conviction, the amount of the penalty being very large, they seated themselves as suppliants in the temples to be allowed to pay it by installments. But Patheus, who was one of the Senate, prevailed upon that body to enforce the law, upon which the accused, rendered desperate by the law, and also learning that Patheus had the intention, while still a member of the Senate, to persuade the people to conclude a defensive and offensive alliance with Athens, banded together armed with daggers, and suddenly bursting into the Senate, killed Patheus and sixty others, senators and private persons, some few only of the party of Patheus, taking refuge in the Athenian galley, which had not yet departed. After this outrage, the conspirators summoned the Corsarians to an assembly, and said that this would turn out for the best, and would save them from being enslaved by Athens. For the future, they moved to receive neither party unless they came peacefully in a single ship, treating any larger number as enemies. This motion made, they compelled it to be adopted, and instantly sent off envoys to Athens to justify what had been done, and to dissuade the refugees there from any hostile proceedings which might lead to a reaction." Upon the arrival of the embassy, the Athenians arrested the envoys and all who listened to them as revolutionists and lodged them in Aegina. Meanwhile, a Corinthian galley arriving in the island with Lacedaemonian envoys, the dominant Corsiran party attacked the commons and defeated them in battle. Night coming on, the commons took refuge in the Acropolis and the higher parts of the city and concentrated themselves there, having also possession of the Hylaic harbor their adversaries occupying the market-place where most of them lived, and the harbour adjoining, looking towards the mainland. The next day passed in skirmishes of little importance, each party sending into the country to offer freedom to the slaves and to invite them to join them. The mass of the slaves answered the appeal of the commons, their antagonists being reinforced by eight hundred mercenaries from the continent. After a day's interval, hostilities recommenced, victory remaining with the commons, who had the advantage in numbers and position, the women also valiantly assisting them, pelting with tiles from the houses, and supporting the melee with a fortitude beyond their sex. Towards dusk, the oligarchs in full rout, fearing that the victorious commons might assault and carry the arsenal, and put them to the sword, fired the houses round the market-place and the lodging-houses, in order to bar their advance sparing neither their own nor those of their neighbors, by which much stuff of the merchants was consumed, and the city risked total destruction, if a wind had come to help the flame by blowing on it. Hostilities now ceasing, both sides kept quiet, passing the night on guard, while the Corinthian ships stole out to sea upon the victory of the commons, and most of the mercenaries passed over secretly to the continent. The next day, the Athenian general, Nicostratus, son of Diatrophes, came up from Naupactus with twelve ships and five hundred Messenian heavy infantry. He at once endeavoured to bring about a settlement, and persuaded the two parties to agree together to bring to trial ten of the ringleaders, who presently fled, while the rest were to live in peace, making terms with each other, and entering into a defensive and offensive alliance with the Athenians. This arranged, he was about to sail away, when the leaders of the commons induced him to leave five of his ships to make their adversaries less disposed to move, while they manned and sent with him an equal number of their own. He had no sooner consented than they began to enroll their enemies for the ships, and these, fearing that they might be sent off to Athens, seated themselves as suppliants in the temple of the Dioscuri. An attempt on the part of Nicostratus to reassure them, and to persuade them to rise, proving unsuccessful, the commons armed upon this pretext, alleging the refusal of their adversaries to sail with them as a proof of the hollowness of their intentions, and took their arms out of their houses, and would have dispatched some whom they fell in with, if Nicostratus had not prevented it. The rest of the party, seeing what was going on, seated themselves as suppliants in the temple of Hera, being not less than four hundred in number, until the commons, fearing that they might adopt some desperate resolution, induced them to rise, and conveyed them over to the island in front of the temple, where provisions were sent across to them. At this stage in the revolution, on the fourth or fifth day after the removal of the men to the island, the Peloponnesian ships arrived from Silene, where they had been stationed since their return from Ionia, fifty-three in number, still under the command of Alcides, but with Brasidas also on board as his adviser, and dropping anchor at Sibota, a harbour on the mainland, at daybreak made sail for Corsira. 
The Corsirians, in great confusion and alarm at the state of things in the city and at the approach of the invader, at once proceeded to equip sixty vessels, which they sent out, as fast as they were manned, against the enemy, in spite of the Athenians recommending them to let them sail out first, and to follow themselves afterwards with all their ships together. Upon their vessels coming up to the enemy in this straggling fashion, two immediately deserted. In others the crew were fighting among themselves, and there was no order in anything that was done, so that the Peloponnesians, seeing their confusion, placed twenty ships to oppose the Corsirians, and ranged the rest against the twelve Athenian ships, amongst which were the two vessels Selaminia and Perilous. While the Corsirians, attacking without judgment and in small detachments, were already crippled by their own misconduct, the Athenians, afraid of the numbers of the enemy and of being surrounded, did not venture to attack the main body, or even the centre of the division opposed to them, but fell upon its wing, and sank one vessel. After which the Peloponnesians formed in a circle, and the Athenians rode around them and tried to throw them into disorder. Perceiving this, the division opposed to the Corsirians, fearing a repetition of the disaster of Naupactus, came to support their friends, and the whole fleet now bore down, united, upon the Athenians, who retired before it, backing water, retiring as leisurely as possible, in order to give the Corsirians time to escape, while the enemy was thus kept occupied. Such was the character of this sea-fight, which lasted until sunset." The Corsirians now feared that the enemy would follow up their victory, and sail against the town and rescue the men in the island, or strike some other blow equally decisive, and accordingly carried the men over again to the temple of Hera, and kept guard over the city. The Peloponnesians, however, although victorious in the sea-fight, did not venture to attack the town, but took the thirteen Corsirian vessels which they had captured, and with them sailed back to the continent from whence they had put out. The next day equally they refrained from attacking the city, although the disorder and panic were at their height, and though Brasidas, it is said, urged Alcidas, his superior officer, to do so. But they landed upon the promontory of Leukimi, and laid waste to the country. Meanwhile the commons in Corsera, being still in great fear of the fleet attacking them, came to a parley with the suppliants and their friends, in order to save the town and prevailed upon some of them to go on board the ships, of which they still manned thirty, against the expected attack. But the Peloponnesians, after ravaging the country until midday, sailed away, and towards nightfall were informed by beacon signals of the approach of sixty Athenian vessels from Leucas, under the command of Eurymedon, son of Thucles, who had been sent off by the Athenians upon the news of the revolution, and of the fleet with Alcidas being about to sail for Corsera. The Peloponnesians, accordingly, at once set off in haste by night for home, coasting along shore, and hauling their ships across the isthmus of Leucas, in order not to be seen doubling it. So departed. The Corsirians, made aware of the approach of the Athenian fleet, and of the departure of the enemy, brought the Messenians from outside the walls into the town, and ordered the fleet which they had manned to sail round into the Hellaic harbour and while it was so doing, slew such of their enemies as they laid hands on, dispatching afterwards, as they landed them, those whom they had persuaded to go on board the ships. Next they went to the sanctuary of Hera, and persuaded about fifty men to take their trial, and condemned them all to death. The mass of the suppliants who had refused to do so, on seeing what was taking place, slew each other there in the consecrated ground— while some hanged themselves upon the trees, and others destroyed themselves as they were severally able. During seven days that Eurymedon stayed with his sixty ships, the Corsirians were engaged in butchering those of their fellow citizens whom they regarded as their enemies, and although the crime imputed was that of attempting to put down the democracy, some were slain also for private hatred, others by their debtors because of monies owed to them. Death thus raged in every shape, and as usually happens at some times, there was no length to which violence did not go. Sons were killed by their fathers, and suppliants dragged from the altar or slain upon it, while some were even walled up in the temple of Dionysus, and died there. So bloody was the march of the revolution, and the impression which it made was the greater, as it was one of the first to occur. Later on, one may say, the whole Hellenic world was convulsed, struggles being everywhere made by the popular chiefs to bring in the Athenians, and by the oligarchs to introduce the Lacedaemonians. In peace there would have been neither the pretext nor the wish to make such an invitation, but in war, 
with an alliance always at the command of either faction for the hurt of their adversaries and their own corresponding advantage, opportunities for bringing in the foreigner were never wanting to the revolutionary parties. The sufferings which revolution entailed upon the cities were many and terrible, such as have occurred and will always occur, as long as the nature of man remains the same, though in a severer or milder form, and varying in their symptoms, according to the variety of the particular cases. In peace and prosperity, states and individuals have better sentiments, because they do not find themselves suddenly confronted with imperious necessities, but war takes away the easy supply of daily wants, and so proves a rough master, that brings most men's characters to a level with their fortunes. Revolution thus ran its course from city to city, and the places which it arrived at last, from having heard what had been done before, carried to a still greater excess the refinement of their inventions, as manifested in the cunning of their enterprises and the atrocity of their reprisals. Words had to change their ordinary meaning, and to take that which was now given to them. Reckless audacity came to be considered the courage of a loyal ally, prudent hesitation, specious cowardice. Moderation was held to be a cloak for unmanliness, ability to see all sides of a question, inaptness to act on any. Frantic violence became the attribute of manliness, cautious plotting a justifiable means of self-defense. The advocate of extreme measures was always trustworthy, his opponent a man to be suspected. To succeed in a plot was to have a shrewd head, to divine a plot still shrewder, but to try and provide against having to do either was to break up your party and to be afraid of your adversaries. In fine, to forestall an intending criminal, or to suggest the idea of a crime where it was wanting, was equally commended until even blood became a weaker tie than party, from the superior readiness of those united by the latter to dare everything without reserve. For such associations had not in view the blessings derivable from established institutions, but were formed by ambition for their overthrow and the confidence of their members in each other rested less on any religious sanction than upon complicity in crime. The fair proposals of an adversary were met with jealous precautions by the stronger of the two, and not with generous confidence. Revenge also was held of more account than self-preservation, Oaths of reconciliation, being only proffered on either side to meet an immediate difficulty, only held good so long as no other weapon was at hand. But when opportunity offered, he who first ventured to seize it and to take his enemy off his guard, thought this perfidious vengeance sweeter than an open one, since considerations of safety apart, success by treachery won him the palm of superior intelligence. Indeed, it is generally the case that men are readier to call rogues clever than simpletons honest, and are as ashamed of being the second as they are proud of being the first. The cause of all these evils was the lust for power arising from greed and ambition, and from these passions proceeded the violence of parties once engaged in contention. The leaders in the cities, each provided with the fairest professions, on the one side with the cry of political equality of the people, on the other of a modest aristocracy, sought prizes for themselves in those public interests which they pretended to cherish, and recoiling from no means in their struggles for ascendancy, engaged in the direst excesses. In their acts of vengeance they went to even greater lengths, not stopping at what justice or the good of the state demanded, but making the party caprice of the moment their only standard, and invoking with equal readiness the condemnation of an unjust verdict or the authority of the strong arm to glut the animosities of the hour. Thus religion was in honor with neither party, but the use of fair phrases to arrive at guilty ends was in high reputation. Meanwhile, the moderate part of the citizens perished between the two, either for not joining in the quarrel, or because envy would not suffer them to escape. Thus every form of iniquity took root in the Hellenic countries by reason of the troubles. The ancient simplicity into which honor so largely entered was laughed down, and disappeared and society became divided into camps in which no man trusted his fellow. To put an end to this, there was neither promise to be depended upon, nor oath that could command respect, but all parties dwelling rather in their calculation upon the hopelessness of a permanent state of things, were more intent upon self-defense than capable of confidence. In this contest, the blunter wits were the most successful." 
apprehensive of their own deficiencies and of the cleverness of their antagonists, they feared to be worsted in debate and to be surprised by the combinations of their more versatile opponents, and so at once boldly had recourse to action, while their adversaries, arrogantly thinking that they should know in time and that it was unnecessary to secure by action what policy afforded, often fell victims to their want of precaution. Meanwhile, Corsera gave the first example of most of the crimes alluded to, of the reprisals exacted by the governed, who had never experienced equitable treatment, or indeed aught but insolence from their rulers, when their hour came, of the iniquitous resolves of those who desired to get rid of their accustomed poverty, and ardently coveted their neighbor's goods, and lastly, of the savage and pitiless excesses into which men who had begun the struggle, not in a class, but in a party spirit, were hurried by their ungovernable passions." In the confusion into which life was now thrown in the cities, human nature, always rebelling against the law and now its master, gladly showed itself ungoverned in passion, above respect for justice, and the enemy of all superiority, since revenge would not have been set above religion, and gain above justice, had it not been for the fatal power of envy. Indeed, men too often take upon themselves in the prosecution of revenge to set the example of doing away with those general laws to which all alike can look for salvation in adversity, instead of allowing them to subsist against the day of danger when their aid may be required. While the revolutionary passions thus for the first time displayed themselves in the factions of Corsera, Eurymedon and the Athenian fleet sailed away. After which, some five hundred Corsarian exiles who had succeeded in escaping took some forts on the mainland, and becoming masters of the Corsarian territory over the water, made this their base to plunder their countrymen in the island, and did so much damage as to cause a severe famine in the town. They also sent envoys to Lacedaemon and Corinth to negotiate their restoration, but meeting with no success, afterwards got together boats and mercenaries and crossed over to the island, being about six hundred in all, and burning their boats so as to have no hope except in becoming masters of the country, went up to Mount Istoni, and fortifying themselves there, began to annoy those in the city, and obtained command of the country. At the close of the same summer the Athenians sent twenty ships under the command of Lachis, son of Melanopus, and Caroades, son of Euphilitus, to Sicily, where all the Syracusans and Leontines were at war. The Syracusans had for allies all the Dorian cities except Camarina. These had been included in the Lacedaemonian Confederacy from the commencement of the war, though they had not taken any active part in it. The Leontines had Camarina and the Chalcidian cities. In Italy the Locrians were for the Syracusans, the Regians for their Leontine kinsmen. The allies of the Leontines now sent for Athens, and appealed to their ancient alliance and to their Ionian origin, to persuade the Athenians to send them a fleet, as the Syracusans were blocking them by land and sea. The Athenians sent it upon the plea of their common descent, but in reality, to prevent the exportation of Sicilian corn to the Peloponnese, and to test the possibility of bringing Sicily into subjection. Accordingly, they established themselves at Regium in Italy, and from thence carried on the war in concert with their allies. End of Book 3, Chapter 10 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Book 3, Chapter 11 Summer was now over. The winter following, the plague a second time attacked the Athenians, for although it had never entirely left them, still there had been a notable abatement in its ravages. The second visit lasted no less than a year, the first having lasted two, and nothing distressed the Athenians and reduced their power more than this. No less than 4,400 heavy infantry in the ranks died of it, and 300 cavalry, besides a number of the multitude that was never ascertained. At the same time took place the numerous earthquakes in Athens, Euboea, and Boeotia, particularly at Orchomenus, in the last-named country. The same winter the Athenians in Sicily and the Regians, with thirty ships, made an expedition against the islands of Aeolus, it being impossible to invade them in summer owing to the want of water. These islands are occupied by the Liparians, a Canadian colony who live in one of them of no great size called Lipara, and from this, as their headquarters, cultivate the rest— Didymi, Strongyle, and Hiera. 
In Hiera, the people in those parts believe that Hephaestus has his forge from the quantity of flame which they see it send out by night and of smoke by day. These islands lie off the coast of the Sicils and Messenes, and were allies of the Syracusans. The Athenians laid waste their land, and as the inhabitants did not submit, sailed back to Regium. Thus the winter ended, and with it ended the fifth year of the war, of which Thucydides was the historian. The next summer the Peloponnesians and their allies set out to invade Attica under the command of Agus, son of Archidamus, and went as far as the Isthmus, but numerous earthquakes occurring turned back again without the invasion taking place. About the same time that these earthquakes were so common, the sea at Orobii in Euboea, retiring from the then line of coast, returned in a huge wave and invaded a great part of the town and retreated, leaving some of it still under water, so that what was once land is now sea, such of the inhabitants perishing as could not run up to the higher ground in time. A similar inundation also occurred at Atalanta, the island off the Opuntian Locrian coast, carrying away part of the Athenian fort and wrecking one of two ships which were drawn up on the beach. At Pepherethus also the sea retreated a little, without, however, any inundation following, and an earthquake threw down part of the wall, the town hall, and a few other buildings. The cause, in my opinion, of this phenomenon must be sought in the earthquake. At the point where its shock has been the most violent, the sea is driven back, and, suddenly recoiling with redoubled force, causes the inundation. Without an earthquake, I do not see how such an accident could happen. During the same summer, different operations were carried on by the different belligerents in Sicily, by the Sicaliots themselves against each other, and by the Athenians and their allies. I shall, however, confine myself to the actions in which the Athenians took part, choosing the most important. The death of the Athenian general, Caraeades, killed by the Syracusans in battle, left Laches in the sole command of the fleet, which he now directed in concert with the allies against Milai, a place belonging to the Messenese. Two Messenese battalions in garrison at Milai laid an ambush for the party landing from the ships, but were routed with great slaughter by the Athenians and their allies, who thereupon assaulted the fortification and compelled them to surrender the Acropolis, and to march with them upon Messina. This town afterwards also submitted upon the approach of the Athenians and their allies, and gave hostages and all other securities required. The same summer the Athenians sent thirty ships round Peloponnese under Demosthenes, son of Alcisthenes, and Procles, son of uh, Theodorus, and sixty others with two thousand heavy infantry, against Milos, under Nicias, son of Nicaratus, wishing to reduce the Melians, who, although islanders, refused to be subject of Athens, or even to join her confederacy. The devastation of their land not procuring their submission, the fleet, weighing from Milos, sailed to Europus in the territory of Graia, and landing at nightfall, the heavy infantry started at once from the ships by land for Tanagra and Boeotia, where they were met by the whole levy from Athens, agreeably to a concerted signal, under the command of Hipponicus, son of Calias, and Eurymedon, son of Thucles. They encamped, and passing that day in ravaging the Tanagrian territory, remained there for the night, and next day, after defeating those of the Tanagrians who sailed out against them, and some Thebans who had come up to help the Tanagrians, took some arms, set up a trophy, and retired the troops to the city, and the others to the ships. Nicias with his sixty ships coasted along shore and ravaged the Locrian seaboard, and so returned home. About this time the Lacedaemonians founded their colony of Heraclea in Trachis, their object being the following. The Malians form in all three tribes, the Peralians, the Hiraeans, and the Trachinians. The last of these, having suffered severely in a war with their neighbors, the Oiteans, at first intended to give themselves up to Athens, but afterwards, fearing not to find in her the security that they sought, sent to Lacedaemon, having chosen Tisamenus for their ambassador. In this embassy joined also the Dorians from the mother country of the Lacedaemonians, with the same request, as they themselves also suffered from the same enemy. After hearing them, the Lacedaemonians determined to send out the colony, wishing to assist the Trachinians and Dorians, and also because they thought that the proposed town would lie conveniently for the purposes of the war against the Athenians. A fleet might be got ready there against Euboea, with the advantage of a short passage to the island, and the town would also be useful as a station on the road to Thrace. In short, everything made the Lacedaemonians eager to found the place. After first consulting the god at Delphi, and receiving a favorable answer, they sent off the colonists, Spartans and Perioiki, inviting also any of the rest of the Hellenes who might wish to accompany them except Ionians, Achaeans, and certain other nationalities, three Lacedaemonians leading as founders of the colony, Leon, Alcidas, and Damagon. 
The settlement effected, they fortified anew the city, now called Heraclea, distant about four miles and a half from Thermopylae, and two miles and a quarter from the sea, and commenced building docks, closing the side towards Thermopylae just by the pass itself, in order that they might be easily defended. The foundation of the town evidently meant to annoy Euboea, the passage across to Canaim and that island being a short one, at first caused some alarm at Athens, which the event, however, did nothing to justify, the town never giving them any trouble. The reason of this was as follows. The Thessalians, who were sovereign in those parts, and whose territory was menaced by its foundation, were afraid that it might prove a very powerful neighbor, and accordingly continually harassed and made war upon the new settlers, until they at last wore them out in spite of their originally considerable numbers, people flocking from all quarters to a place founded by the Lacedaemonians, and thus thought secure of prosperity. On the other hand, the Lacedaemonians themselves, in the persons of their governors, did their full share toward ruining its prosperity and reducing its population, as they frightened away the greater part of the inhabitants by governing harshly, and in some cases not fairly, and thus made it easier for their neighbors to prevail against them. The same summer, about the same time that the Athenians were detained at Milos, their fellow citizens in the thirty ships cruising around Peloponnese, after cutting off some guards in an ambush at Elamenos in Leucadia, subsequently went against Lucas itself with a large armament, having been reinforced by the whole levy of the Acarnanians except Oeneidae, and by the Zacynthians and Cephalanians and fifteen ships from Corsira. While the Leucadians witnessed the devastation of their land, without and within the isthmus upon which the town of Lucas and the temple of Apollo stand, without making any movement on account of the overwhelming numbers of the enemy, the Acarnanians urged Demosthenes, the Athenian general, to build a wall so as to cut off the town from the continent, a measure which they were convinced would secure its capture and rid them once and for all of a most troublesome enemy. Demosthenes had, however, in the meanwhile, been persuaded by the Messenians that it was a fine opportunity for him, having so large an army assembled, to attack the Aetolians, who were not only the enemies of Nopactus, but whose reduction would further make it easy to gain the rest of that part of the continent for the Athenians. The Aetolian nation, although numerous and warlike, yet dwelt in unwalled villages scattered far apart and had nothing but light armor, and might, according to the Messenians, be subdued without much difficulty before succors could arrive. The plan which they recommended was to attack first the Apodotians, next the Ophionians, and after these the Eurotanians, who were the largest tribe in Aetolia, and speak, as is said, a language exceedingly difficult to understand, and eat their flesh raw. These once subdued, the rest would easily come in. To this plan Demosthenes consented, not only to please the Messenians, but also in the belief that by adding the Aetolians to his other continental allies, he would be able, without aid from home, to march against the Boeotians by way of Azolian Locris to Catinium in Doris, keeping Parnassus on his right until he descended to the Phocians, whom he could force to join if their ancient friendship for Athens did not, as he anticipated, at once decide them to do so. Arrived in Phocis, he was already upon the frontier of Boeotia. He accordingly weighed from Lucas against the wish of the Acarnanians, and with his whole armament sailed along the coast to Solom, where he communicated to them his intention, and upon their refusing to agree to it, on account of the non-investment of Lucas, himself with the rest of the forces, the Cephalanians, the Messenians, and Zacynthians, and three hundred Athenian marines from his own ships, the fifteen Corsarian vessels having departed, started on his expedition against the Aetolians. His base he established at Oenoion in Locris, as the Azolian Locrians were allies of Athens, and were to meet him with all their forces in the interior. Being neighbors of the Aetolians and armed in the same way, it was thought that they would be of great service upon the expedition, from their acquaintance with the localities and the warfare of the inhabitants. After bivouacking with the army in the precinct of Nemean Zeus, in which the poet Hesiod is said to have been killed by the people of the country, according to an oracle which had foretold that he should die in Nemea, Demosthenes set out at daybreak to invade Aetolia. The first day he took Potidania, the next Crocilla, and the third Tychium, where he halted and sent back the booty to Eupalium in Locris, having determined to pursue his conquests as far as the Ophionians, and in the event of their refusing to submit, to return to Nopactus and make them the objects of a second expedition. Meanwhile, the Aetolians had been aware of his design from the moment of its formation, and as soon as the army invaded their country, came up in great force with all their tribes, even the most remote Ophionians, the Bomiensians and Caliensians, who extend toward the Malian Gulf, being among the number. The Messenians, however, adhered to their original advice. Assuring Demosthenes that the Aetolians were an easy conquest, they urged him to push on as rapidly as possible, and to try to take the villages as fast as he came up to them, 
without waiting until the whole nation should be in arms against him. Led on by his advisers and trusting in his fortune, as he had met with no opposition, without waiting for his Locrian reinforcements, who were to have supplied him with the light-armed darters in which he was most deficient, he advanced and stormed Agitium, the inhabitants flying before him and posting themselves upon the hills above the town, which stood on high ground about nine miles from the sea. Meanwhile the Aetolians had gathered to the rescue, and now attacked the Athenians and their allies, running down from the hills on every side and darting their javelins, falling back when the Athenian army advanced and coming on as it retired, and for a long while the battle was of this character, alternate advance and retreat, in both which operations the Athenians had the worst. Still, as long as their archers had arrows left and were able to use them, they held out, the light-armed Aetolians retiring before the arrows. But after the captain of the archers had been killed and his men scattered, the soldiers, wearied out with the constant repetition of the same exertions, and hard-pressed by the Aetolians with their javelins, at last turned and fled, and falling into pathless gullies in places that were they were unacquainted with, thus perished, the Messenian Cromon, their guide, having also unfortunately been killed. A great many were overtaken in the pursuit by the swift-footed and light-armed Aetolians, and fell beneath their javelins. The greater number, however, missed their road and rushed into the wood, which had no ways out, and which was soon fired and burnt round them by the enemy. Indeed, the Athenian army fell victims to death in every form, and suffered all the vicissitudes of flight. The survivors escaped with difficulty to the sea and Oinean in Locris, once they had set out. Many of the allies were killed, and about 120 Athenian heavy infantry, not a man less, and all in the prime of life. These were by far the best men in the city of Athens that fell during this war. Among the slain was also Procles, the colleague of Demosthenes. Meanwhile the Athenians took up their dead under truce from the Aetolians, and retired to Napactus, and from thence went in their ships to Athens, Demosthenes staying behind in Napactus, and in the neighborhood, being afraid to face the Athenians after the disaster. About the same time, the Athenians on the coast of Sicily sailed to Locris, and in a descent which they made from the ships defeated the Locrians who came against them, and took a fort upon the river Halix. The same summer, the Aetolians, who before the Athenian expedition had sent an embassy to Corinth and Lacedaemon, composed of Tolophus, an Ophionian, Boreades, a Euritanian, and Tisander, an Apodotian, obtained that an army should be sent them against Nopactus, which had invited the Athenian invasion. The Lacedaemonians accordingly sent off towards autumn 3,000 heavy infantry of the Allies, 500 of whom were from Heraclea, the newly founded city in Trachis, under the command of Eurylochus, a Spartan, accompanied by Macarius and Menedelaus, also Spartans. The army having assembled at Delphi, Eurylochus sent a herald to the Azolian Locrians, the road to Napactus lying through their territory, and he having besides conceived the idea of detaching them from Athens. His chief abettors in Locris were the Amphysians, who were alarmed at the hostility of the Phocians. These first gave hostages themselves and induced the rest to do the same for fear of the invading army. First their neighbors the Meonians, who held the most difficult of the passes, and after them the Ipnians, Mesapians, Tritaeans, Coleans, Telophians, Hessians, and Oriartians, all of whom joined in the expedition, the Olpaeans contenting themselves with giving hostages without accompanying the invasion, and the Hyaeans refusing to do either until the capture of Polis, one of their villages. His preparations completed, Eurylochus lodged the hostages in Catinium, in Doris, and advanced upon Napactus through the country of the Locrians, taking upon his way Oneon and Eupalium, two of their towns that refused to join him. Arrived in the Napactian territory, and having been now joined by the Aetolians, the army laid waste the land, and took the suburb of the town, which was unfortified, and after this Molycrium also a Corinthian colony subject to Athens. Meanwhile, the Athenian Demosthenes, who since the affair in Aetolia had remained near Napactus, having had notice of the army and fearing for the town, went and persuaded the Acarnanians, although not without difficulty because of his departure from Lucas, to go to the relief of Napactus. They accordingly sent with him on board his ships a thousand heavy infantry, who threw themselves into the place and saved it, the extent of its wall and the small number of its defenders otherwise placing it in the greatest danger. Meanwhile, Eurylochus and his companions, finding that his force had entered and that it was impossible to storm the town, withdrew, not to Peloponnese, but to the country once called Aeolus, and now Calydon, and Pluron, and to the places in that neighborhood, and Proschium in Aetolia the Ambraciots having come and urged them to combine with them in attacking Amphilochia and Arcos, and the rest of Amphilochia and Acarnania, affirming that the conquest of these countries would bring all the continent into alliance with Lacedaemon. 
To this Eurylochus consented, and dismissing the Aetolians, now remained quiet with his army in those parts, until the time should come for the Ambraciots to take the field, and for him to join them before Argos. Summer was now over. The winter ensuing, the Athenians in Sicily, with their Hellenic allies and such of the Sicel subjects or allies of Syracuse as had revolted from her and joined their army, marched against the Sicel town in Nessa, the Acropolis of which was held by the Syracusans, and after attacking it, without being able to take it, retired. In the retreat, the allies retreating after the Athenians were attacked by the Syracusans from the fort, and a large part of their army routed with great slaughter. After this, Laches and the Athenians from the ships made some descents in Locris, and defeating the Locrians, who came against them with Proxenus, son of Capiton, upon the river Caiconus, took some arms and departed. The same winter the Athenians purified Delos, in compliance, it appears, with a certain oracle. It had been purified before by Pisistratus the tyrant, not indeed the whole island, but as much of it as could be seen from the temple. All of it was, however, now purified in the following way. All the sepulchres of those who had died on Delos were taken up, and for the future it was commanded that no one should be allowed either to die or to give birth to a child in the island, but that they should be carried over to Renea, which is so near to Delos that Polycrates, tyrant of Samos, having added Renea to his other island conquests during his period of naval ascendancy, dedicated it to the Delian Apollo by binding it to Delos with a chain. The Athenians, after the purification, celebrated for the first time the quinquennial festival of the Delian Games. Once upon a time, indeed, there was a great assemblage of the Ionians and the neighboring islanders at Delos, who used to come to the festivals, as the Ionians now do to that of Ephesus, and athletic and poetical contests took place there, and the cities brought choirs of dancers. Nothing can be clearer on this point than the following verses of Homer taken from a hymn to Apollo. Phoebus, wherever thou strayest, far or near, Delos was still of all thy haunts most dear. Thither the robed Ionians take their way, with wife and child to keep thy holiday. Invoke thy favor on each manly game, and dance and sing in honor of thy name. That there was also a poetical contest in which the Ionians went to contend, again is shown by the following, taken from the same hymn. After celebrating the Delian dance of the women, he ends his song of praise with these verses, in which he also alludes to himself. Well may Apollo keep you all, and so, sweethearts, good-bye. Yet, tell me not I go out from your hearts, and, if in after hours, some other wanderer in this world of ours, touch at your shores and ask your maidens here, who sings the songs the sweetest to your ear. Think of me, then, and answer with a smile, a blind old man of Scio's rocky isle. Homer thus attests that there was annually a great assembly and festival at Delos. In later times, although the islanders and the Athenians continued to send the choirs of dancers with sacrifices, the contests and most of the ceremonies were abolished, probably through adversity, until the Athenians celebrated the games upon this occasion, with the novelty of horse races. The same winter the Ambraciots, as they had promised Eurylochus when they retained his army, marched out against Amphilochian Argos with three thousand heavy infantry, and invading the Argive territory, occupied Olpea, a stronghold on a hill near the sea, which had been formerly fortified by the Acarnanians and used as the place of Assises for their nation, and which is about two miles and three-quarter from the city of Argos upon the seacoast. Meanwhile, the Acarnanians went with a part of their forces to the relief of Argos, and with the rest encamped in Amphilochia at the place called Crinea, or the Wells, to watch for Eurylochus and his Peloponnesians, and to prevent their passing through and effecting their junction with the Ambraciots, while they also sent for Demosthenes, the commander of the Aetolian expedition, to be their leader, and for the twenty Athenian ships that were cruising off Peloponnese under the command of Aristotle, son of Timocrates, and Hierophon, son of Antimestus. On their part, the Ambraciots at Olpi sent a messenger to their own city to beg them to come with their whole levy to their assistance, fearing that the army of Eurylochus might not be able to pass through the Acarnanians, and that they might themselves be obliged to fight single-handed, or be unable to retreat, if they wished it, without danger. Meanwhile, Eurylochus and his Peloponnesians, learning that the Ambraciots at Olpi had arrived, set out from Proscium with all haste to join them, and crossing the Achilloas, advanced through Acarnania, which they found deserted by its population, who had gone to the relief of Argos, keeping on their right the city of the Stratians and its garrison, and on their left the rest of Acarnania. Traversing the territory of the Stratians, they advanced through Phytia, next skirting Medion, through Limnei, after which they left Acarnania behind him, and entered a friendly country, that of the Agraeans, 
From thence they reached and crossed Mount Thymaeus, which belongs to the Agrians, and descended into the Argive territory after nightfall, and passing between the city of Argos and the Acronanian posts at Crenae, joined the Ambraciots at Olpi. Uniting here at daybreak, they sat down at the place called Metropolis, and encamped. Not long afterwards, the Athenians and their twenty ships came into the Ambracian Gulf to support the Argives, with Demosthenes and two hundred Messenian heavy infantry, and sixty Athenian archers. While the fleet off Olpi blockaded the hill from the sea, the Acarnanians and a few of the Amphilochians, most of whom were kept back by force by the Ambraciots, had already arrived at Argos, and were preparing to give battle to the enemy, having chosen Demosthenes to command the whole of the allied army, in concert with their own generals. Demosthenes led them near to Olpi and encamped, a great ravine separating the two armies. During five days they remained inactive. On the sixth, both sides formed an order of battle. The army of the Peloponnesians was the largest, and outflanked their opponents, and Demosthenes, fearing that his right might be surrounded, placed an ambush in a hollow way overgrown with bushes, some four hundred heavy infantry and light troops, who were to rise up at the moment of the onset behind the projecting left wing of the enemy and take them in the rear. When both sides were ready, they joined battle, Demosthenes being on the right wing with the Messenians and a few Athenians, while the rest of the line was made up of the different divisions of the Acarnanians and of the Amphilochian carters. The Peloponnesians and Ambraciots were drawn up pell-mell together, with the exception of the Mantineans, who were massed on the left, without, however, reaching the extremity of the wing, where Eurylochus and his men confronted the Messenians and Demosthenes. The Peloponnesians were now well engaged, and with their outflanking wing were upon the point of turning their enemies right, when the Acarnanians from the ambuscade set upon them from behind and broke them at the first attack, without their staying to resist, while the panic into which they fell caused the flight of many of their army, terrified beyond measure at seeing the division of Eurylochus and their best troops cut to pieces. Most of the work was done by Demosthenes and his Messenians, who were posted in this part of the field. Meanwhile, the Ambraciots, who are the best soldiers in those countries, and the troops upon the right wing, defeated the division opposed to them, and pursued it to Argos. Returning from the pursuit, they found their main body defeated and hard-pressed by the Acarnanians, with difficulty made good their passage to Olpi, suffering heavy loss on the way, as they dashed on without discipline or order, the Mantineans excepted, who kept their wrecks best of any in the army during the retreat. The battle did not end until the evening. The next day, Menadius, who, on the death of Eurylochus and Macarius, had succeeded to the sole command, being at a loss after so signal a defeat, how to stay and sustain a siege, cut off as he was by land and by the Athenian fleet by sea, and equally so how to retreat in safety, opened a parley with Demosthenes and the Acarnanian generals for a truce and permission to retreat, and at the same time for the recovery of the dead. The dead they gave back to him, and setting up a trophy, took up their own also to the number of about three hundred. The retreat demanded... They refused publicly to the army, but permission to depart without delay was secretly granted to the Mantineans and to Menadius and the other commanders, and principal men of the Peloponnesians, by Demosthenes and his Acarnanian colleagues, who desired to strip the Ambraciots and the mercenary host of foreigners of their supporters, and above all to discredit the Lacedaemonians and Peloponnesians with the Hellenes in those parts as traitors and self-seekers. While the enemy was taking up his dead and hastily burying them as he could, and those who obtained permission were secretly planning their retreat, word was brought to Demosthenes and the Acarnanians that the Ambraciots from the city, in compliance with the first message from Olpi, were on the march with their whole levy through Amphilochia to join their countrymen at Olpi, knowing nothing of what had occurred. Demosthenes prepared to march with his army against them, and meanwhile sent on at once a strong division to beset the roads and occupy the strong positions. In the meantime, the Mantineans and others, included in the agreement, went out under the pretense of gathering herbs and firewood, and stole off by twos and threes, picking on the way the things which they professed to have come out for, until they had gone some distance from Olpi, when they quickened their pace. The Ambraciots and such of the rest as had accompanied them in larger parties, seeing them going on, pushed on in their turn, and began running in order to catch them up. The Acarnanians at first thought that all alike were departing without permission, and began to pursue the Peloponnesians and believing that they were being betrayed even through a dart or two at some of their generals who tried to stop them and told them that leave had been given. Eventually, however, they let pass the Mantineans and Peloponnesians and slew only the Ambraciots, there being much dispute and difficulty in distinguishing whether a man was an Ambraciot or a Peloponnesian. The number thus slain was about two hundred, 
The rest escaped into the bordering territory of Agraia and found refuge with Salinthius, the friendly king of the Agraeans. Meanwhile, the Ambraciots from the city arrived at Idomene. Idomene consists of two lofty hills, the higher of which the troops sent on by Demosthenes succeeded in occupying after nightfall, unobserved by the Ambraciots, who had meanwhile ascended the smaller and bivouacked under it. After supper, Demosthenes set out with the rest of the army as soon as it was evening, himself with half his force making for the pass, and the remainder going by the Amphilochian hills. At dawn he fell upon the Ambraciots while they were still abed, ignorant of what had passed, and fully thinking that it was their own countrymen, Demosthenes having purposely put the Messenians in front with orders to address them in the Doric dialect, and thus to inspire confidence in the sentinels, who would not be able to see them as it was still night. In this way he routed their army as soon as he attacked it, slaying most of them where they were, the rest breaking away in flight over the hills. The roads, however, were already occupied, and while the Amphilochians knew their own country, the Ambraciots were ignorant of it and could not tell which way to turn, and had also heavy armor as against a light-armed enemy, and so fell into ravines and into the ambushes which had been set for them, and perished there. In their manifold efforts to escape, some even turned to the sea, which was not far off, and seeing the Athenian ships coasting along shore just while the action was going on, swam off to them, thinking it better in the panic they were in, to perish, if perish they must, by the hands of the Athenians, than by those of the barbarous and detested Amphilochians. Of the large Ambraciot force destroyed in this manner, a few only reached the city in safety, while the Acarnanians, after stripping the dead and setting up a trophy, returned to Argos. The next day arrived a herald from the Ambraciots who had fled from Olpi to the Agraeans, to ask leave to take up the dead that had fallen after the first engagement, when they left the camp with the Mantineans and their companions, without, like them, having had permission to do so. At the sight of the arms of the Ambraciots from the city, the herald was astonished at their number, knowing nothing of the disaster, and fancying that they were those of their own party. Someone asked him what he was so astonished at, and how many of them had been killed, fancying in his turn that this was the herald from the troops at Idomene. He replied, about two hundred, upon which his interrogator took him up, saying, why, the arms you see here are of more than a thousand. The herald replied, then they are not the arms of those who fought with us? The other answered, yes, they are if at least you fought at Idomene yesterday. But we fought with no one yesterday, but the day before in the retreat. However that may be, we fought yesterday with those who came in to reinforce you from the city of the Ambraciots. When the herald heard this and knew that the reinforcements from the city had been destroyed, he broke into wailing, and stunned at the magnitude of the present evils went away at once without having performed his errand, or again asking for the dead bodies. Indeed, this was by far the greatest disaster that befell any one Hellenic city in an equal number of days during this war, and I have not set down the number of the dead, because the amount stated seems to be so out of proportion to the size of the city as to be incredible. In any case, I know that if the Acarnanians and Amphilochians had wished to take Ambracia, as the Athenians and Demosthenes advised, they would have done so without a blow. As it was, they feared that if the Athenians had it, they would be worse neighbors to them than the present. After this, the Acarnanians allotted a third of the spoils to the Athenians, and divided the rest among their own different towns. The share of the Athenians was captured on the voyage home. The arms now deposited in the Attic temples are three hundred panoplies, which the Acarnanians set apart for Demosthenes, in which he brought to Athens in person, his return to his country after the Aetolian disaster, being rendered less hazardous by this exploit. The Athenians in the twenty ships also went off to Napactus. The Acarnanians and Amphilochians, after the departure of Demosthenes and the Athenians, granted the Ambraciots and Peloponnesians, who had taken refuge with Salinthius and the Agraeans, a free retreat from Oeniadae, to which place they had removed from the country of Salinthius, and for the future concluded with the Ambraciots a treaty and alliance for one hundred years, upon the terms following. It was to be a defensive, not an offensive alliance. The Ambraciots could not be required to march with the Acarnanians against the Peloponnesians, nor the Acarnanians with the Ambraciots against the Athenians. For the rest, the Ambraciots were to give up the places and hostages that they held of the Amphilochians, and not to give help to Anactorium, which was at enmity with the Acarnanians. With this arrangement, they put an end to the war. After this, the Corinthians sent a garrison of their own citizens to Ambracia, composed of three hundred heavy infantry under the command of Xenocleides, son of Euthycles, who reached their destination after a difficult journey across the continent. Such was the history of the affair of Ambracia. The same winter the Athenians in Sicily made a descent from their ships upon the territory of Himera, in concert with the Sicils, who had invaded its borders from the interior, 
and also sailed to the islands of Aeolus. Upon their return to Regium, they found the Athenian general, Pythodorus, son of Isolochus, come to supersede Laches in command of the fleet. The allies in Sicily had sailed to Athens and induced the Athenians to send out more vessels to their assistance, pointing out that the Syracusans, who already commanded their land, were making efforts to get together a navy, to avoid being any longer excluded from the sea by a few vessels. The Athenians proceeded to man forty ships and to send to them, thinking that the war in Sicily would thus be the sooner ended, and also wishing to exercise their navy. One of the generals, Pythodorus, was accordingly sent out with a few ships, Sophocles, son of Sostratides, and Eurymedon, son of Thucles, being destined to follow with the main body. Meanwhile, Pythodorus had taken the command of Laches' ships, and toward the end of winter sailed against the Locrian fort, which Laches had formerly taken, and returned after being defeated in battle by the Locrians. In the first days of this spring, the stream of fire issued from Etna, as on former occasions, and destroyed some land of the Catanians, who live upon Mount Etna, which is the largest mountain in Sicily. Fifty years, it is said, had elapsed since the last eruption, there having been three in all since the Hellenes have inhabited Sicily. Such were the events of this winter, and with it ended the sixth year of the war, of which Thucydides was the historian. This is the end of chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Translated by Richard Crawley Book 4, Chapter 12 Next summer, about the time of the corns coming into ear, ten Syracusan and as many Locrian vessels sailed to Messina in Sicily, and occupied the town upon the invitation of the inhabitants, and Messina revolted from the Athenians. The Syracusans contrived this chiefly because they saw that the place afforded an approach to Sicily, and feared that the Athenians might hereafter use it as a base for attacking them with a larger force. The Locrians, because they wished to carry on hostilities from both sides of the strait, and to reduce their enemies, the people of Regium. Meanwhile, the Locrians had invaded the Regian territory with all their forces, to prevent their succoring Messina, and also at the instance of some exiles from Regium who were with them, the long factions by which that town had been torn rendering it for the moment incapable of resistance, and thus furnishing an additional temptation to the invaders. After devastating the country, the Locrian land forces retired, their ships remaining to guard Messina, while others were being manned for the same destination to carry on the war from thence. About the same time in the spring, before the corn was ripe, the Peloponnesians and their allies invaded Attica under Agus, the son of Archidamus, king of the Lacedaemonians, and sat down and laid waste the country. Meanwhile the Athenians sent off the forty ships which they had been preparing to Sicily, with the remaining generals Eurymedon and Sophocles, their colleague Pythodorus having already proceeded from thither. These had also instructions as they sailed to look to the Corsirians in the town who were being plundered by the exiles in the mountains. To support these exiles, sixty Peloponnesian vessels had lately sailed, it being thought that the famine raging in the city would make it easy for them to reduce it. Demosthenes also, who had remained without employment since his return from Acarnania, applied and obtained permission to use the fleet, if he wished it, upon the coast of Peloponnese. Off Laconia they heard that the Peloponnesian ships were already at Corsera, upon which Eurymedon and Sophocles wished to hasten to the island, but Demosthenes required them first to touch at Pylos, and do what was wanted there, before continuing their voyage. While they were making objections, a squall chanced to come on and carried the fleet into Pylos. Demosthenes at once urged them to fortify the place, it being for this that he had come on the voyage, and made them observe that there was plenty of stone and timber on the spot, and that the place was strong by nature, and together with much of the country round unoccupied. Pylos, or Corypheseum, as the Lacedaemonians call it, being about forty-five miles distant from Sparta, and situated in the old country of the Messenians. The commanders told him that there was no lack of desert headlands in Peloponnese if he wished to put the city to expense by occupying them. He, however, thought that this place was distinguished from others of the kind by having a harbor close by, while the Messenians, the old natives of the country, speaking the same dialect as the Lacedaemonians, could do them the greatest mischief by their incursions from it, and would at the same time be a trusty garrison. 
After speaking to the captains of companies on the subject and failing to persuade either the generals or the soldiers, he remained inactive with the rest from stress of weather, until the soldiers themselves wanting occupation were seized with a sudden impulse to go round and fortify the place. Accordingly they set to work in earnest, and having no iron tools, picked up stones and put them together as they happened to fit, and where mortar was needed carried it on their backs, for want of hods, stooping down to make it stay on, and clasping their hands together behind to prevent it falling off, sparing no effort to be able to complete the most vulnerable points before the arrival of the Lacedaemonians, most of the place being sufficiently strong by nature without further fortifications. Meanwhile the Lacedaemonians were celebrating a festival, and also at first made light of the news, in the idea that whenever they chose to take the field the place would be immediately evacuated by the enemy, or easily taken by force, the absence of their army before Athens having also something to do with their delay. The Athenians fortified the place on the land side, and where it most required it, in six days, and leaving Demosthenes with five ships to garrison it, with the main body of the fleet, hastened on their voyage to Corsera and Sicily. As soon as the Peloponnesians in Attica heard of the occupation of Pylos, they hurried back home, the Lacedaemonians and their king Agus thinking that the matter touched them nearly. Besides having made the invasion early in the season, and while the corn was still green, most of their troops were short of provisions. The weather also was unusually bad for the time of year, and greatly distressed their army. Many reasons thus combined to hasten their departure, and to make this invasion a very short one. Indeed, they only stayed fifteen days in Attica. About the same time, the Athenian general Simonides, getting together a few Athenians from the garrisons, and a number of the allies in those parts, took Aeon in Thrace, a Mendaean colony, and hostile to Athens, by treachery, but had no sooner done so than the Chalcidians and Bodiaeans came up and beat him out of it, with the loss of many of his soldiers. On the return of the Peloponnesians from Attica, the Spartans themselves and the nearest of the Perioiki at once set out for Pylos, the other Lacedaemonians following more slowly, as they had just come in from another campaign. Word was also sent round Peloponnese to come up as quickly as possible to Pylos, while the sixty Peloponnesian ships were sent for from Corsera, and being dragged by their crews across the Isthmus of Leucas, passed unperceived by the Athenian squadrons at Zakynthus, and reached Pylos, where the land forces had arrived before them. Before the Peloponnesian fleet sailed in, Demosthenes found time to send out unobserved two ships to inform Eurymedon and the Athenians on board the fleet at Zakynthus of the danger of Pylos, and to summon them to his assistance. While the ships hastened on their voyage in obedience to the orders of Demosthenes, the Lacedaemonians prepared to assault the fort by land and sea, hoping to capture with ease a work constructed in haste and held by a feeble garrison. Meanwhile, as they expected, the Athenian ships to arrive from Zakynthos, they intended, if they failed to take the place before, to block up the entrances of the harbor to prevent their being able to anchor inside it. For the island of Sphacteria, stretching along in a line close to the front of the harbor, at once makes it safe and narrows its entrances, leaving a passage for two ships on the side nearest Pylos and the Athenian fortifications, and for eight or nine on that next the rest of the mainland. For the rest, the island was entirely covered with wood and without paths through not being inhabited, and about one mile and five furlongs in length. The inlets the Lacedaemonians meant to close with a line of ships placed close together, with their prows turned toward the sea, and meanwhile, fearing that the enemy might make use of the island to operate against them, carried over some heavy infantry thither, stationing others along the coast. By this means the island and the continent would be alike hostile to the Athenians, as they would be unable to land on either, and the shore of Pylos itself outside the inlet toward the open sea having no harbor, and therefore presenting no point which they could use as a base to relieve their countrymen, they, the Lacedaemonians, without sea fight or risk, would in all probability become masters of the place, occupied as it had been on the spur of the moment, and unfurnished with provisions. This being determined, they carried over to the island the heavy infantry, drafted by lot from all the companies. Some others had crossed over before in relief parties, but these last who were left there were four hundred and twenty in number, with their helot attendants, commanded by Epitadas, son of Molobrus. Meanwhile, Demosthenes, seeing the Lacedaemonians about to attack him by sea and land at once, himself was not idle. He drew up under the fortification, and enclosed in a stockade the galleys remaining to him of those which had been left him, arming the sailors taken out of them with poor shields made most of them from osier, it being impossible to procure arms in such a desert place, and even these having been obtained from a thirty-oared Messenian privateer, and a boat belonging to some Messenians who happened to have come to them. Among these Messenians were forty heavy infantry, whom he made use of with the rest. 
posting most of his men, unarmed and armed, upon the best fortified and strong points of the place towards the interior, with orders to repel any attack of the land forces, he picked sixty heavy infantry and a few archers from his whole force, and with these went outside the wall down to the sea, where he thought that the enemy would most likely attempt to land. Although the ground was difficult and rocky, looking towards the open sea, the fact that this was the weakest part of the wall would, he thought, encourage their ardor, as the Athenians, confident in their naval superiority, had here paid little attention to their defenses, and the enemy, if he could force a landing, might feel secure of taking the place. At this point, accordingly, going down to the water's edge, he posted his heavy infantry to prevent it, if possible, a landing, and encouraged them in the following terms. Soldiers and comrades in this adventure, I hope that none of you in our present strait will think to show his wit by exactly calculating all the perils that encompass us, but that you will rather hasten to close with the enemy without staying to count the odds, seeing in this your best chance of safety. In emergencies like ours, calculation is out of place. The sooner the danger is faced, the better. To my mind also, most of the chances are for us, if we will only stand fast and not throw away our advantages, overawed by the numbers of the enemy. One of the points in our favor is the awkwardness of the landing. This, however, only helps us if we stand our ground. If we give way, it will be practicable enough, in spite of its natural difficulty, without a defender. And the enemy will instantly become more formidable from the difficulty he will have in retreating, supposing that we succeed in repulsing him, which we shall find it easier to do while he is on board his ships than after he has landed and meets us on equal terms. As to his numbers, these need not too much alarm you. Large as they may be, he can only engage in small detachments, from the impossibility of bringing two. Besides, the numerical superiority that we have to meet is not that of an army on land with everything else equal, but of troops on board ship, upon an element where many favorable accidents are required to act with effect. I therefore consider that his difficulties may be fairly set against our numerical deficiencies, and at the same time I charge you, as Athenians who know by experience what landing from ships on hostile territory means, and how impossible it is to drive back an enemy determined enough to stand his ground, and not to be frightened away by the surf and the terrors of the ships sailing in, to stand fast in this present emergency, beat back the enemy at the water's edge, and save yourselves, and the place. Thus encouraged by Demosthenes, the Athenians felt more confident and went down to meet the enemy, posting themselves along the edge of the sea. The Lacedaemonians now put themselves in movement and simultaneously assaulted the fortifications with their land forces and with their ships, forty-three in number, under their admiral Thrasymelidas, son of Cretesicles, a Spartan who made his attack just where Demosthenes expected. The Athenians had thus to defend themselves on both sides, from the land and from the sea, the enemy rowing up in small detachments, the one relieving the other, it being impossible for many to bring two at once, and showing great ardor and cheering each other on, in the endeavor to force a passage and to take the fortification. He who most distinguished himself was Brasidas, captain of a galley, and seeing that the captains and steersmen, impressed by the difficulty of the position, hung back even where a landing might have seemed possible for fear of wrecking their vessels, he shouted out to them that they must never allow the enemy to fortify themselves in their country for the sake of saving timber, but must shiver their vessels and force a landing and bade the allies, instead of hesitating in such a moment, to sacrifice their ships for Lacedaemon in return for her many benefits, to run them boldly aground, land in one way or another, and make themselves master of the place and its garrison. Not content with this exhortation, he forced his own steersman to run his ship ashore, and stepping on to the gangway was endeavoring to land when he was cut down by the Athenians, and after receiving many wounds fainted away. Falling into the bows, his shield slipped off his arm into the sea, and being thrown ashore was picked up by the Athenians, and afterwards used for the trophy which they set up for this attack. The rest also did their best, but were not able to land, owing to the difficulty of the ground, and the unflinching tenacity of the Athenians. It was a strange reversal of the order of things, for Athenians to be fighting from the land, and from Laconian land, too, against Lacedaemonians coming from the sea, while Lacedaemonians were trying to land from shipboard in their own country, now become hostile, to attack Athenians, although the former were chiefly famous at that time as an inland people and superior by land, the latter as a maritime people with a navy that had no equal. After continuing their attacks during that day and most of the next, the Peloponnesians desisted, and the day after sent some of their ships to Asini for timber to make engines, hoping to take by their aid, in spite of its height, the wall opposite the harbor, where the landing was easiest. 
At this moment the Athenian fleet from Zakynthos arrived, now numbering fifty sail, having been reinforced by some of the ships on guard at Napactus, and by four Chian vessels. Seeing the coast and the island both crowded with heavy infantry, and the hostile ships in harbor showing no signs of sailing out, at a loss where to anchor, they sailed for the moment to the desert island of Prote, not far off where they passed the night. The next day they got under way in readiness to engage in the open sea if the enemy chose to put out to meet them, being determined in the event of his not doing so to sail in and attack him. The Lacedaemonians did not put out to sea, and having omitted to close the inlets as they had intended, remained quiet on shore, engaged in manning their ships, and getting ready, in case of anyone sailing in, to fight in the harbor, which is a fairly large one. Perceiving this, the Athenians advanced against them by each inlet, and falling on the enemy's fleet, most of which was by this time afloat and in line, at once put it to flight, and giving chase as far as the short distance allowed, disabled a good many vessels and took five, one with its crew on board, dashing in at the rest that had taken refuge on shore, and battering some that were still being manned before they could put out, and lashing onto their own ships and towing off empty others whose crews had fled. At this sight the Lacedaemonians, maddened by a disaster which cut off their men on the island, rushed to the rescue, and going into the sea with their heavy armor, laid hold of the ships and tried to drag them back, each man thinking that success depended on his individual exertions. Great was the melee, and great in contradiction to the naval tactics usual to the two combatants, the Lacedaemonians in their excitement and dismay being actually engaged in a sea fight on land, while the victorious Athenians, in their eagerness to push their success as far as possible, were carrying on a land fight from their ships. After great exertions and numerous wounds on both sides, they separated, the Lacedaemonians saving their empty ships except those first taken, and both parties returning to their camps. The Athenians set up a trophy, gave back the dead, secured the wrecks, and at once began to cruise round and jealously watch the island, with its intercepted garrison, while the Peloponnesians on the mainland, whose contingents had now all come up, stayed where they were before Pylos. When the news of what had happened at Pylos reached Sparta, the disaster was thought so serious that the Lacedaemonians resolved that the authorities should go down to the camp and decide on the spot what was best to be done. There, seeing that it was impossible to help their men, and not wishing to risk their being reduced by hunger or overpowered by numbers, they determined, with the consent of the Athenian generals, to conclude an armistice at Pylos and send envoys to Athens to obtain a convention, and to endeavor to get back their men as quickly as possible. The generals accepting their offers, an armistice was concluded upon the terms following that the Lacedaemonians should bring to Pylos and deliver up to the Athenians the ships that had fought in the late engagement, and all in Laconia that were vessels of war, and should make no attack on the fortification, either by land or by sea. That the Athenians should allow the Lacedaemonians on the mainland to send the men in the island a certain fixed quantity of corn ready needed, that is to say, two quarts of barley meal, one pint of wine, and a piece of meat for each man, and half the same quantity for a servant that this allowance should be sent in under the eyes of the Athenians, and that no boat should sail to the island except openly. That the Athenians should continue to the island same as before, without however landing upon it, and should refrain from attacking the Peloponnesian troops either by land or by sea. That if either party should infringe any of these terms in the slightest particular, the armistice should be at once void. That the armistice should hold good until the return of the Lacedaemonian envoys from Athens, the Athenians, sending them thither in a galley, and bringing them back again, and upon the arrival of the envoys, should be at an end, and the ships be restored by the Athenians in the same state as they received them. Such were the terms of the armistice, and the ships were delivered over to the number of sixty, and the envoys sent off accordingly. Arrived at Athens, they spoke as follows. Athenians, the Lacedaemonians sent us to try to find some way of settling the affair of our men on the island that shall at once be satisfactory to our interests, and as consistent with our dignity and our misfortune as circumstances permit. We can venture to speak at some length without any departure from the habit of our country. Men of few words where many are not wanted, we can be less brief when there is a matter of importance to be illustrated, and an end to be served by its illustration. Meanwhile, we beg you to take what we may say, not in a hostile spirit, nor as if we thought you ignorant and wished to lecture you, but rather as a suggestion on the best course to be taken, addressed to intelligent judges. You can now, if you choose, employ your present success to advantage, so as to keep what you have got and gain honor and reputation besides, and you can avoid the mistake of those who meet with an extraordinary piece of good fortune, and are led on by hope to grasp continually at something further, 
through having already succeeded without expecting it. While those who have known most vicissitudes of good and bad have also justly least faith in their prosperity, and to teach your city and ours this lesson experience has not been wanting. To be convinced of this, you have only to look at our present misfortune. What power in Hellas stood higher than we did, and yet we are come to you, although we formerly thought ourselves more able to grant what we are now here to ask. Nevertheless, we have not been brought to this by any decay in our power, or through having our heads turned by aggrandizement. No, our resources are what they have always been, and our error has been an error of judgment, to which all are equally liable. Accordingly, the prosperity which your city now enjoys, and the accession that it has lately received, must not make you fancy that fortune will always be with you. Indeed, sensible men are prudent enough to treat their gains as precarious, just as they would also keep a clear head in adversity, and think that war, so far from staying within the limit to which a combatant may wish to confine it, will run the course that its chances prescribe. And thus, not being puffed up by confidence in military success, they are less likely to come to grief, and most ready to make peace, if they can, while their fortune lasts. This, Athenians, you have a good opportunity to do now with us, and thus to escape the possible disasters which may follow upon your refusal, and the consequent imputation of having owed to accident even your present advantages, when you might have left behind you a reputation for power and wisdom which nothing could endanger. The Lacedaemonians accordingly invite you to make a treaty and to end the war, and offer peace and alliance and the most friendly and intimate relations in every way and on every occasion between us, and in return ask for the men on the island, thinking it better for both parties not to stand out to the end, on the chance of some favorable accident enabling the men to force their way out, or of their being compelled to succumb under the pressure of blockade. Indeed, if great enmities are ever to be really settled, we think it will be not by the system of revenge and military success, and by forcing an opponent to swear to a treaty to his disadvantage, but when the more fortunate combatant waives these his privileges, to be guided by gentler feelings, conquers his rival in generosity, and accords peace on more moderate conditions than he expected. From that moment, instead of the debt of revenge which violence must entail, his adversary owes a debt of generosity to be paid in kind, and is inclined by honor to stand to his agreement. And men oftener act in this manner towards their greatest enemies than where the quarrel is of less importance. They are also by nature as glad to give way to those who first yield to them, as they are apt to be provoked by arrogance, to risks condemned by their own judgment. To apply this to ourselves, if peace was ever desirable for both parties, it is surely so at the present moment, before anything irremediable befall us and force us to hate you eternally, personally as well as politically, and you to miss the advantages that we now offer you. While the issue is still in doubt and you have reputation in our friendship in prospect, and we the compromise of our misfortune before anything fatal occur, let us be reconciled, and for ourselves choose peace instead of war, and grant to the rest of Hellenes a remission from their sufferings, for which be sure they will think they have chiefly you to thank. The war that they labor under they know not which began, but the peace that concludes it, as it depends on your decision, will by their gratitude be laid at your door. By such a decision you can become firm friends with the Lacedaemonians at their own invitation, which you do not force from them, but oblige them by accepting. And from this friendship consider the advantages that are likely to follow. When Attica and Sparta are at one, the rest of Hellas, be sure, will remain in respectful inferiority before its heads. Such were the words of the Lacedaemonians, their idea being that the Athenians, already desirous of a truce and only kept back by their opposition, would joyfully accept a peace freely offered and give back the men. The Athenians, however, having the men on the island, thought that the treaty would be ready for them whenever they chose to make it, and grasped at something further. Foremost to encourage them in this policy was Cleon, son of Cleonetus, a popular leader of the time and very powerful with the multitude, who persuaded them to answer as follows. First, the men in the island must surrender themselves and their arms and be brought to Athens. Next, the Lacedaemonians must restore Nicaea, Pegae, Troizen, and Achaea, all places acquired not by arms, but by the previous convention, under which they had been ceded by Athens herself at a moment of disaster, when a truce was more necessary to her than at present. This done, they might take back their men and make a truce for as long as both parties might agree. To this answer the envoys made no reply, but asked that commissioners might be chosen with whom they might confer on each point, and quietly talk the matter over and try to come to some agreement. 
Hereupon Cleon violently assailed them, saying that he knew from the first that they had no right intentions, and that it was clear enough now by their refusing to speak before the people and wanting to confer in secret with a committee of two or three. No, if they meant anything honest, let them say it out before all. The Lacedaemonians, however, seeing that whatever concessions they might be prepared to make in their misfortune, it was impossible for them to speak before the multitude and lose credit with their allies for a negotiation which might, after all, miscarry and on the other hand, that the Athenians would never grant what they asked upon moderate terms, returned from Athens without having effected anything. Their arrival at once put an end to the armistice at Pylos, and the Lacedaemonians asked back their ships according to the convention. The Athenians, however, alleged an attack on the fort in contravention of the truce, and other grievances seemingly not worth mentioning, and refused to give them back, insisting upon the clause by which the slightest infringement made the armistice void. The Lacedaemonians, after denying the contravention and protesting against their bad faith in the matter of the ships, went away and earnestly addressed themselves to the war. Hostilities were now carried on at Pylos upon both sides with vigor. The Athenians cruised round the island all day with two ships going different ways, and by night, except on the seaward side in windy weather, anchored round it with their whole fleet. Which, having been reinforced by twenty ships from Athens come to aid in the blockade, now numbered seventy sail while the Peloponnesians remained encamped on the continent, making attacks on the fort, and on the lookout for any opportunity which might offer itself for the deliverance of their men. Meanwhile the Syracusans and their allies in Sicily had brought up to the squadron guarding Messina the reinforcement which we left them preparing, and carried on the war from thence, incited chiefly by the Locrians from hatred of the Regians, whose territory they had invaded with all their forces. The Syracusans also wished to try their fortune at sea, seeing that the Athenians had only a few ships actually at Regium, and hearing that the main fleet destined to join them was engaged in blockading the island. A naval victory, they thought, would enable them to blockade Regium by sea and land, and easily to reduce it, a success which would at once place their affairs upon a solid basis, the promontory of Regium in Italy and Messina in Sicily being so near each other that it would be impossible for the Athenians to cruise against them and command the strait. The strait in question consists of the sea between Regium and Messina, at the point where Sicily approaches nearest to the continent, and is the Charybdis through which the story makes Ulysses sail, and the narrowness of the passage and the strength of the current that pours in from the vast Tyrrhenian and Sicilian mains have rightly given it a bad reputation. In this strait the Syracusans and their allies were compelled to fight, late in the day, about the passage of a boat, putting out with rather more than thirty ships against sixty Athenians and eight Regian vessels. Defeated by the Athenians, they hastily set off each for himself to their own stations at Messina and Regium, with the loss of one ship, night coming on before the battle was finished. After this, the Locrians retired from the Regian territory, and the ships of the Syracusans and their allies united and came to anchor at Cape Polaris, in the territory of Messina, where their land forces joined them. Here the Athenians and Regians sailed up, and seeing the ships unmanned, made an attack, in which they in turn lost one vessel, which was caught by a grappling iron, the crew saving themselves by swimming. After this the Syracusans got on board their ships, and while they were being towed along shore to Messina, were again attacked by the Athenians, but suddenly got out to sea and became the assailants, and caused them to lose another vessel. After thus holding their own in the voyage along shore, and in the engagement as above described, the Syracusans sailed on into the harbor of Messina. Meanwhile, the Athenians, having received warning that Camarina was about to be betrayed to the Syracusans by Archias and his party, sailed thither, and the Messinese took this opportunity to attack by sea and land, with all their forces, their Chalcidian neighbor Naxos. The first day they forced the Naxians to keep their walls, and laid waste their country. The next they sailed round with their ships, and laid waste the land on the river Akesines, while their land forces menaced the city. Meanwhile, the Sickles came down from the high country in great numbers to aid against the Messinese, and the Naxians, elated at the sight and animated by a belief that the Leontines and their other Hellenic allies were coming to their support, suddenly sallied out from the town and attacked and routed the Messinese, killing more than a thousand of them, while the remainder suffered severely in their retreat home, being attacked by the barbarians on the road, and most of them cut off. The ships put into Messina and afterwards dispersed for their different homes, the Leontines and their allies, with the Athenians, upon this at once turned their arms against the now weakened Messina, and attacked, the Athenians with their ships on the one side of the harbor, and the land forces on that of the town. The Messinese, however, sallying out with Demoteles and some Locrians who had been left to garrison the city after the disaster, suddenly attacked and routed most of the Leontine army, killing a great number, 
upon seeing which the Athenians landed from their ships, and falling on the Messenese in disorder, chased them back into the town, and setting up a trophy, retired to Regium. After this the Hellenes in Sicily continued to make war on each other by land, without the Athenians. Meanwhile the Athenians at Pylos were still besieging the Lacedaemonians in the island, the Peloponnesian forces on the continent remaining where they were. The blockade was very laborious from the Athenians for want of food and water. There was no spring except one in the citadel of Pylos itself, and that not a large one. And most of them were obliged to grub up the shingle on the sea beach and drink such water as they could find. They also suffered from want of room, being encamped in a narrow space, and as there was no anchorage for the ships, some took their meals on shore in their turn, while the others were anchored out at sea. But their greatest discouragement arose from the unexpectedly long time which it took to reduce a body of men shut up in a desert island, with only brackish water to drink, a matter which they had imagined would take them only a few days. The fact was that the Lacedaemonians had made an advertisement for volunteers to carry into the island ground corn, wine, cheese, and any other food useful in a siege, high prices being offered, and freedom promised to any of the helots who should succeed in doing so. The helots, accordingly, were most forward to engage in this risky traffic, putting off from this or that part of Peloponnese, and running in by night on the seaward side of the island. They were best pleased, however, when they could catch a wind to carry them in. It was more easy to elude the lookouts of the galleys, when it blew from the seaward, as it became impossible for them to anchor round the island, while the helots had their boats rated at their value in money, and ran them ashore, without caring how they landed, being sure to find the soldiers waiting for them, at the landing places. But all who risked it in fair weather were taken. Divers also swam in under water from the harbor, dragging by a cord in skins, poppy seed mixed with honey, and bruised linseed. These at first escaped notice, but afterwards a lookout was kept for them. In short, both sides tried every possible contrivance, the one to throw in provisions, the other to prevent their introduction. At Athens, meanwhile, the news that the army was in great distress, and that corn found its way into the men on the island, caused no small perplexity, and the Athenians began to fear that winter might come on and find them still engaged in the blockade. They saw that the convoying of provisions round Peloponnese would then be impossible. The country offered no resources in itself, and even in summer they could not send round enough. The blockade of a place without harbors could no longer be kept up, and the men would either escape by the siege being abandoned, or would watch for bad weather and sail out in the boats that brought in their corn. What caused still more alarm was the attitude of the Lacedaemonians, who must, it was thought by the Athenians, feel themselves on strong ground not to send them any more envoys, and they began to repent having rejected the treaty. Cleon, perceiving the disfavor with which he was regarded for having stood in the way of the convention, now said that their informants did not speak the truth, and upon the messengers recommending them, if they did not believe them, to send some commissioners to see. Cleon himself and Theogenes were chosen by the Athenians as commissioners. Aware that he would now be obliged either to say what had been already said by the men whom he was slandering, or be proved a liar if he said the contrary, he told the Athenians, whom he saw to be not altogether disinclined for a fresh expedition, that instead of sending and wasting their time and opportunities, if they believed what was told them, they ought to sail against the men. And pointing at Nicias, son of Nicaratus, then general, whom he hated, he tauntingly said that it would be easy, if they had men for generals, to sail with a force and take those in the island, and that if he had himself been in command, he would have done it. Nicias, seeing the Athenians murmuring against Cleon for not sailing now if it seemed him so easy, and further seeing himself the object of attack, told him that for all the generals cared, he might take what force he chose and make the attempt. At first Cleon fancied that this resignation was merely a figure of speech, and was ready to go, but finding that it was seriously meant, he drew back and said that Nicias, not he, was general, being now frightened, and having never supposed that Nicias would go so far as to retire in his favor. Nicias, however, repeated his offer, and resigned the command against Pylos, and called the Athenians to witness that he did so. And as the multitude is wont to do, the more Cleon shrank from the expedition and tried to back out of what he had said, the more they encouraged Nicias to hand over his command, and clamored at Cleon to go. At last, not knowing how to get out of his words, he undertook the expedition, and came forward and said that he was not afraid of the Lacedaemonians, but would sail without taking any one from the city with him, except the Lemnians and Imbrians that were at Athens, with some targeteers that had come up from Aeneas, and four hundred archers from other quarters. With these and the soldiers at Pylos, he would within twenty days either bring the Lacedaemonians alive, or kill them on the spot. The Athenians could not help laughing at this fatuity, while sensible men comforted themselves with the reflection 
that they must gain in either circumstance. Either they would be rid of Cleon, which they rather hoped, or, if disappointed in this expectation, would reduce the Lacedaemonians. After he had settled everything in the assembly, and the Athenians had voted him the command of the expedition, he chose as his colleague Demosthenes, one of the generals at Pylos, and pushed forward the preparations for his voyage. His choice fell upon Demosthenes, because he heard that he was contemplating a descent on the island. The soldiers, distressed by the difficulties of the position, and rather besieged than besiegers, being eager to fight it out, while the firing of the island had increased the confidence of the general. He had been at first afraid, because the island, having never been inhabited, was almost entirely covered with wood and without paths, thinking this to be in the enemy's favor, as he might land with a large force, and yet might suffer loss by an attack from an unseen position. The mistakes and forces of the enemy the wood would be in great measure concealed from him, while every blunder of his own troops would be at once detected, and they would thus be able to fall upon him unexpectedly, just where they pleased, the attack being always in their power. If, on the other hand, he should force them to engage in the thicket, the smaller number who knew the country would, he thought, have advantage over the larger who were ignorant of it, while his own army might be cut off imperceptibly, in spite of its numbers, as the men would not be able to see where to succor each other. The Aetolian disaster, which had been mainly caused by the wood, had not a little to do with these reflections. Meanwhile, one of the soldiers who were compelled by want of room to land on the extremities of the island and take their dinners, with outposts fixed to prevent a surprise, set fire to a little of the wood without meaning to do so, and as it came on to blow soon afterward, almost the whole was consumed before they were aware of it. Demosthenes was now able for the first time to see how numerous the Lacedaemonians really were, having up to this moment been under the impression that they took in provisions for a smaller number. He also saw that the Athenians thought success important and were anxious about it, and that it was now easier to land on the island, and accordingly got ready for the attempt, sent for troops from the allies in the neighborhood, and pushed forward his other preparations. At this moment Cleon arrived in Pylos with the troops which he had asked for, having sent on word to say that he was coming. The first step taken by the two generals after their meeting was to send a herald to the camp on the mainland, and to ask if they were disposed to avoid all risk, and to order the men on the island to surrender themselves in their arms, to be kept in gentle custody until some general convention should be concluded. On the rejection of this proposition, the generals let one day pass, and the next, embarking all their heavy infantry on board a few ships, put out by night, and a little before dawn landed on both sides of the island from the open sea and from the harbor, being about eight hundred strong, and advanced with a run against the first post in the island. The enemy had distributed his force as follows. In the first post there were about thirty heavy infantry. The center and most level part where the water was was held by the main body, and by Epitadas, their commander, while a small party guarded the very end of the island toward Pylos, which was precipitous on the seaside, and very difficult to attack from the land, and where there was also a sort of old fort of stones rudely put together, which they thought might be useful to them, in case they should be forced to retreat. Such was their disposition. The advanced post thus attacked by the Athenians was at once put to the sword, the men being scarcely out of bed and still arming, the landing having taken them by surprise, as they fancied the ships were only sailing as usual to their stations for the night. As soon as day broke, the rest of the army landed, that is to say, all the crews of rather more than seventy ships, except the lowest rank of oars, with the arms they carried, eight hundred archers, and as many targeteers, the Messenian reinforcements, and all the other troops on duty round Pylos, except the garrison of the fort. The tactics of Demosthenes had divided them into companies of two hundred, more or less, and made them occupy the highest points in order to paralyze the enemy, by surrounding him on every side and thus leaving him, without any tangible adversary, exposed to the cross-fire of their host, plied by those in his rear if he attacked in front, and by those on one flank if he moved against those on the other. In short, wherever he went, he would have assailants behind him, and these light-armed assailants the most awkward of all. Arrows, darts, stones, and slings making them formidable at a distance, and there being no means of getting at them in close quarters, as they could conquer flying, and the moment their pursuer turned they were upon him. Such was the idea that inspired Demosthenes in his conception of the descent, and presided over its execution. Meanwhile, the main body of the troops in the island, that is, that, that under Epitadas, seeing their outpost cut off and an army advancing against them, serried their ranks and pressed forward to close with the Athenian heavy infantry in front of them, the light troops being upon their flanks and rear. However, they were not able to engage or profit by their superior skill, 
the light troops keeping them in check on either side with their missiles, and the heavy infantry remaining stationary instead of advancing to meet them and although they routed the light troops wherever they ran up and approached too closely, yet they retreated fighting, being lightly equipped, and easily getting the start in their flight, from the difficult and rugged nature of the ground in an island hitherto desert, over which the Lacedaemonians could not pursue them with their heavy armor. After the skirmishing had lasted some little while, the Lacedaemonians became unable to dash out with the same rapidity as before upon the points attacked, and the light troops, finding that they now fought with less vigor, became more confident. They could see with their own eyes that they were many times more numerous than the enemy. They were now more familiar with his aspect, and found him less terrible, the result not having justified the apprehensions which they had suffered, when they first landed in slavish dismay at the idea of attacking Lacedaemonians. And accordingly, their fear changing to disdain, they now rushed all together with loud shouts upon them, and pelted them with stones, darts, and arrows, whichever came first to hand. The shouting accompanying their onset confounded the Lacedaemonians, unaccustomed to this mode of fighting. Dust rose from the newly burnt wood, and it was impossible to see in front of one with the arrows and stones flying through clouds of dust from the hands of numerous assailants. The Lacedaemonians had now to sustain a rude conflict. Their caps would not keep out the arrows, darts had broken off in the armor of the wounded, while they themselves were helpless for offense, being prevented from using their eyes to see what was before them, and unable to hear the word of command for the hubbub raised by the enemy. Danger encompassed them on every side, and there was no hope of any means of defense or safety. At last, after many had already been wounded in the confined space in which they were fighting, they formed in close order and retired on the fort at the end of the island, which was not far off, and to their friends who held it. The moment they gave way, the light troops became bolder and pressed upon them, shouting louder than ever, and killed as many as they came up with in their retreat, but most of the Lacedaemonians made good their escape to the fort, and with it the garrison ranged themselves all along its whole extent to repulse the enemy wherever it was assailable. The Athenians pursuing, unable to surround and hem them in, owing to the strength of the ground, attacked them in front and tried to storm the position. For a long time indeed, for most of the day, both sides held out against all torments of the battle, thirst and sun, the one endeavoring to drive the enemy from the high ground, the other to maintain himself upon it, it being now more easy for the Lacedaemonians to defend themselves than before, as they could not be surrounded on the flanks. The struggle began to seem endless when the commander of the Messenians came to Cleon and Demosthenes and told them that they were losing their labor, but if they would give him some archers and light troops to go round the enemy's rear by a way he would undertake to find. He thought he could force the approach. Upon receiving what he asked for, he started from a point out of sight in order not to be seen by the enemy, and creeping on wherever the precipices of the island permitted, and where the Lacedaemonians, trusting to the strength of the ground, kept no guard, succeeded after the greatest difficulty in getting round without their seeing him, and suddenly appeared on the high ground in their rear, to the dismay of the surprised enemy, and the still greater joy of his expectant friends. The Lacedaemonians, thus placed between two fires, and in the same dilemma, to compare small things with great, as at Thermopylae, where the defenders were cut off through the Persians getting round the path, being now attacked in front and behind, began to give way, and overcome by the odds against them, and exhausted from want of food, retreated. The Athenians were already masters of the approaches when Cleon and Demosthenes, perceiving that if the enemy gave way a single step further they would be destroyed by their soldiery, put a stop to the battle and held their men back, wishing to take the Lacedaemonians alive to Athens, and hoping that their stubbornness might relax on hearing the offer of terms, and that they might surrender and yield to the present overwhelming danger. Proclamation was accordingly made, to know if they would surrender themselves and their arms to the Athenians to be dealt with at their discretion. The Lacedaemonians hearing this offer, most of them lowered their shields and waved their hands to show that they accepted it. Hostilities now ceased, and a parley was held between Cleon and Demosthenes, and Stephon, son of Pharax, on the other side, since Epitadas, the first of the previous commanders, had been killed, and Hippogretas, the next in command, left for dead among the slain, though still alive, and thus the command had devolved upon Stephon, according to the law, in case of anything happening to his superiors. Stephon and his companions said they wished to send a herald to the Lacedaemonians on the mainland to know what they were to do. The Athenians would not let any of them go, but themselves called for heralds from the mainland, and after questions had been carried backwards and forwards two or three times, the last men that passed over from the Lacedaemonians on the continent brought this message. The Lacedaemonians bid you to decide for yourselves, so long as you do nothing dishonorable. Upon which, after consulting together, they surrendered themselves and their arms. The Athenians, after guarding them that day and night, 
the next morning set up a trophy in the island and got ready to sail, giving their prisoners in batches to be guarded by the captains of the galleys, and the Lacedaemonians sent a herald and took up their dead. The number of the killed and prisoners taken in the island was as follows. 420 heavy infantry passed over, 300 all but 8 were taken alive to Athens, the rest were killed. About 120 of the prisoners were Spartans. The Athenian loss was small, the battle not having been fought at close quarters. The blockade in all, counting from the fight at sea to the battle in the island, had lasted 72 days. For 20 of these, during the absence of the envoys sent to treat for peace, the men had provisions given them. For the rest, they were fed by the smugglers. Corn and other victual was found in the island, the commander Epitadas having kept the men upon half rations. The Athenians and Peloponnesians now each withdrew their forces from Pelos and went home, and crazy as Cleon's promise was, he fulfilled it by bringing the men to Athens within the twenty days, as he had pledged himself to do. Nothing that happened in the war surprised the Hellenes so much as this. It was the opinion that no force or famine could make the Lacedaemonians give up their arms, but that they would fight on as they could and die with them in their hands. Indeed, people could scarcely believe that those who had surrendered were of the same stuff as the fallen, and an Athenian ally, who some time after insultingly asked one of the prisoners from the island if those that had fallen were men of honor, received for answer that the atractos, that is the arrow, would be worth a great deal if it could tell men of honor from the rest, in allusion to the fact that the killed were those whom the stones and arrows happened to hit. Upon the arrival of the men, the Athenians determined to keep them in prison until the peace, and if the Peloponnesians invaded their country in the interval, to bring them out and put them to death. Meanwhile, the defense of Pelos was not forgotten. The Messenians from Napactus sent to their old country, to which Pelos formerly belonged, some of the likeliest of their number, and began a series of incursions into Laconia, which their common dialect rendered most destructive. The Lacedaemonians, hitherto without experience of incursions, or a warfare of the kind, finding the helots deserting, and fearing the march of revolution in their country, began to be seriously uneasy, and in spite of their unwillingness to betray this to the Athenians, began to send envoys to Athens, and tried to recover Pelos and the prisoners. The Athenians, however, kept grasping at more, and dismissed envoy after envoy, without their having effected anything. Such was the history of the affair of Pelos. This is the end of chapter 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Peloponnesian War by Thucydides Translated by Richard Crawley Book 4, Chapter 13 the same summer, directly after these events, the Athenians made an expedition against the territory of Corinth, with eighty ships and two thousand Athenian heavy infantry, and two hundred cavalry on board horse transports, accompanied by the Milesians, Andrians, and Caristians from the Allies, under the command of Nicias, son of Nicaratus, with two colleagues. Putting out to sea, they made land at daybreak between Chersonese and Rhytus, at the beach of the country underneath the Silesian hill, upon which the Dorians in old times established themselves and carried on war against the Aeolian inhabitants of Corinth, and where a village now stands, called Silegia. The beach where the fleet came to is about a mile and a half from the village, seven miles from Corinth, and two and a quarter from the Isthmus. The Corinthians had heard from Argos of the coming of the Athenian armament, and had all come up the Isthmus long before, with the exception of those who lived beyond it, and also of five hundred who were away in garrison in Ambracia and Leucadia, and they were there in full force watching for the Athenians to land. These last, however, gave them the slip by coming in the dark, and being informed by signals of the fact that the Corinthians left half their number at Cenchreae, in case the Athenians should go against Chromion, and marched in all haste to the rescue. Battus, one of the two generals present at the action, went with a company to defend the village of Solegia, which was unfortified. Lycophron remained to give battle with the rest. The Corinthians first attacked the right wing of the Athenians, which had just landed in front of Chersonese, and afterwards the rest of the army. The battle was an obstinate one, and fought throughout hand to hand. The right wing of the Athenians and Caristians, who had been placed at the end of the line, received, and with some difficulty repulsed the Corinthians, who thereupon retreated to a wall upon the rising ground behind, and throwing down the stones upon them, came on again singing the paean, and being received by the Athenians, were again engaged at close quarters. 
At this moment a Corinthian company, having come to the relief of the left wing, routed and pursued the Athenian right to the sea, whence they were in their turn driven back by the Athenians and Caristians from the ships. Meanwhile the rest of the army on either side fought on tenaciously, especially the right wing of the Corinthians, where Lycophron sustained the attack of the Athenian left, which it was feared might attempt the village of Solegia. After holding on for a long while without either giving way, the Athenians, aided by their horse, of which the enemy had none, at length routed the Corinthians, who retired to the hill, and halting, remained quiet there, without coming down again. It was in this rout of the right wing that they had the most killed, Lycophron their general being among the number. The rest of the army, broken and put to flight in this way, without being seriously pursued or hurried, retired to the high ground, and there took up its position. The Athenians, finding that the enemy no longer offered to engage them, stripped his dead and took up their own, and immediately set up a trophy. Meanwhile the half of the Corinthians left at Cenchreae to guard against the Athenians sailing on Chromion, although unable to see the battle from Mount Oineon, found out what was going on by the dust and hurried up to the rescue, as did also the older Corinthians from the town, upon discovering what had occurred. The Athenians, seeing them all coming against them, and thinking that they were reinforcements arriving from the neighboring Peloponnesians, withdrew in haste to their ships with their spoils and their own dead, except two that they left behind, not being able to find them, and going on board crossed over to the islands opposite, and from thence sent a herald, and took up under truce the bodies which they had left behind. Two hundred and twelve Corinthians fell in the battle, and rather less than fifty Athenians. Weighing from the islands, the Athenians sailed the same day to Cromion in the Corinthian territory, about thirteen miles from the city, and coming to anchor laid waste the country, and passed the night there. The next day, after first coasting along to the territory of Epidaurus, and making a descent there, they came to Methana between Epidaurus and Troizen, and drew a wall across, and fortified the isthmus of the peninsula, and left a post there from which incursions were, were henceforth made upon the country of Troizen, Haliae, and Epidaurus. After walling off this spot, the fleet sailed off home. While these events were going on, Eurymedon and Sophocles had put to sea with the Athenian fleet from Pylos on their way to Sicily, and arriving at Corsera joined the townsmen in an expedition against the party established on Mount Istone, who had crossed over, as I have mentioned, after the revolution and become masters of the country, to the great hurt of the inhabitants. Their stronghold having been taken by an attack, the garrison took refuge in a body upon some high ground, and there capitulated, agreeing to give up their mercenary auxiliaries, lay down their arms, and commit themselves to the discretion of the Athenian people. The generals carried them across under truce to the island of Ptychia, to be kept in custody until they could be sent to Athens, upon the understanding that, if any were caught running away, all would lose the benefit of the treaty. Meanwhile the leaders of the Corsarian commons, afraid that the Athenians might spare the lives of the prisoners, had recourse to the following stratagem. They gained over some few men on the island by secretly sending friends with instructions to provide them with a boat, and to tell them, as if for their own sakes, that they had best escape as quickly as possible, as the Athenian generals were going to give them up to the Corsarian people. These representations succeeding, it was so arranged that the men were caught sailing out in the boat that was provided, and the treaty became void accordingly, and the whole body were given up to the Corsarians. For this result the Athenian generals were in a great measure responsible, their evident disinclination to sail for Sicily, and thus to leave to others the honor of conducting the men to Athens, encouraged the intriguers in their design, and seemed to affirm the truth of their representations. The prisoners thus handed over were shut up by the Corsarians in a large building, and afterwards taken out by twenties, and led past two lines of heavy infantry, one on each side, being bound together, and beaten and stabbed by the men in the lines, whenever any saw pass a personal enemy while men carrying whips went by their side and hastened on the road those that walked too slowly. As many as sixty men were taken out and killed in this way without the knowledge of their friends in the building, who fancied they were merely being moved from one prison to another. At last, however, someone opened their eyes to the truth, upon which they called upon the Athenians to kill them themselves, if such was their pleasure, and refusing any longer to go out of the building, and said that they would do all they could to prevent anyone coming in. The Corsarians, not liking themselves to force a passage by the doors, got up on top of the building, and breaking through the roof, threw down the tiles, and let fly arrows at them, from which the prisoners sheltered themselves as well as they could. Most of their number, meanwhile, were engaged in dispatching themselves, by thrusting into their throats the arrows shot by the enemy, and hanging themselves with the cords taken from some beds that happened to be there, and with strips made from their clothing, adopting, in short, every possible means of self-destruction, and also falling victims to the missiles of their enemies on the roof. 
Night came on while these horrors were enacting, and most of it had passed before they were concluded. And when it was day, the Corsarians threw them in layers upon wagons and carried them out of the city. All the women taken in the stronghold were sold as slaves. In this way the Corsarians of the mountain were destroyed by the commons, and so after terrible excesses the party strife came to an end, and at least as far as the period of this war is concerned, for of one party there was practically nothing left. Meanwhile the Athenians sailed off to Sicily, their primary destination, and carried on the war with their allies there. At the close of the summer the Athenians at Napactus and the Acarnanians made an expedition against Anactorium, the Corinthian town lying at the mouth of the Ambracian Gulf, and took it by treachery, and the Acarnanians themselves, sending settlers from all parts of Acarnania, occupied the place. Summer was now over. During the winter ensuing, Aristides, son of Archippus, one of the commanders of the Athenian ships sent to collect money from the allies, arrested at Eion, on the Strymon, Artophernes, a Persian, on his way from the king to Lacedaemon. He was conducted to Athens, where the Athenians got his dispatches translated from the Assyrian characters, and read them. With numerous references to other subjects, they in substance told the Lacedaemonians that the king did not know what they wanted, as of the many ambassadors they had sent him, no two ever told the same story. If, however, they were prepared to speak plainly, they might send him some envoys with this Persian. The Athenians afterwards sent back Artophernes in a galley to Ephesus, and ambassadors with him, who heard there of the death of King Artaxerxes, son of Xerxes, which took place about that time, and so returned home. The same winter the Chians pulled down their new wall at the command of the Athenians, who suspected them of medita meditating an insurrection, after first, however, obtaining pledges from the Athenians, and security as far as this was possible, for their continuing to treat them as before. Thus the winter ended, and with it ended the seventh year of this war, of which Thucydides is the historian. In the first days of the next summer, there was an eclipse of the sun at the time of new moon, and in the early part of the same month an earthquake. Meanwhile, the Mytilenean and other lesbian exiles set out, for the most part from the continent, with mercenaries hired in Peloponnese, and others levied on the spot, and took Roetium, but restored it without injury on the receipt of two thousand Phocian staters. After this they marched against Antandrus, and took the town by treachery, their plan being to free Antandrus and the rest of the Actaean towns, formerly owned by Mytilene, but now held by the Athenians. Once fortified there, they would have every facility for shipbuilding from the vicinity of Ida, and the consequent abundance of timber, and plenty of other supplies, and might from this base easily ravage Lesbos, which was not far off, and make themselves masters of the Aeolian towns on the continent. While these were the schemes of the exiles, the Athenians in the same summer made an expedition with sixty ships, two thousand heavy infantry, a few cavalry, and some allied troops from Miletus and other parts against Cythera, under the command of Nicias, son of Nicaratus, Nicostratus, son of Diotrephes, and Autocles, son of Ptolemaeus. Cythera is an island lying off Laconia, opposite Malia. The inhabitants are Lacedaemonians of the class of the Perioiki, and an officer called the Judge of Cythera went over to the place annually from Sparta. A garrison of heavy infantry was also regularly sent there, and great attention paid to the island, as it was the landing place for the merchantmen from Egypt and Libya, and at the same time secured Laconia from the attacks of privateers from the sea, at the only point where it is assailable, as the whole coast rises abruptly toward the Sicilian and Cretan seas. Coming to land here with their armament, the Athenians with ten ships and two thousand Milesian heavy infantry took the town of Scandia on the sea and with the rest of their forces landing on the side of the island looking towards Malia, went against the lower town of Cythera, where they found all the inhabitants encamped. A battle ensuing, the Cytherians held their ground for some little while, and then turned and fled into the upper town, where they soon afterwards capitulated to Nicias and his colleagues, agreeing to leave their fate to the decision of the Athenians, their lives only being safe. A correspondence had previously been going on between Nicias and certain of the inhabitants, which caused the surrender to be effected more speedily, and upon terms more advantageous present and future, for the Cytherians, who would otherwise have been expelled by the Athenians on account of their being Lacedaemonians, and their island being so near to Laconia. After the capitulation, the Athenians occupied the town of Scandia near the harbor, and appointing a garrison for Cythera, sailed to Asini, Hellas, and most of the places on the sea, and making descents and passing the night on shore at such spots as were convenient, continued ravaging the country for about seven days. The Lacedaemonians, seeing the Athenians masters of Cythera, and expecting descents of the kind upon their coasts, nowhere opposed them in force, but sent garrisons here and there through the country, consisting of as many heavy infantry as the points menaced seemed to require, 
and generally stood very much upon the defensive. After the severe and unexpected blow that had befallen them in the island, the occupation of Pylos and Cythera, and the apparition on every side of a war whose rapidly defied precaution, they lived in constant fear of internal revolution, and now took the unusual step of raising four hundred horse and a force of archers, and became more timid than ever in military matters, finding themselves involved in a maritime struggle, which their organization had never contemplated, and that against Athenians, with whom an enterprise unattempted was always looked upon as a success sacrificed. Besides this, their late numerous reverses of fortune, coming close upon one another without any reason, had thoroughly unnerved them, and they were always afraid of a second disaster like that on the island, and thus scarcely dared to take the field, but fancied that they could not stir without a blunder, for being new to the experience of adversity, they had lost all confidence in themselves. Accordingly, they now allowed the Athenians to ravage their seaboard without making any movement, the garrisons in whose neighborhood the descents were made, always thinking their numbers insufficient, and sharing the general feeling. A single garrison which ventured to resist near Cotirta and Aphrodisia struck terror by its charge into the scattered mob of light troops, but retreated, upon being received by the heavy infantry, with the loss of a few men and some arms, for which the Athenians set up a trophy, and then sailed off to Cythera. From thence they sailed round to Epidaurus Limera, ravaged part of the country, and so came to Thraea in the Canurian territory, upon the Argive and Laconian border. This district had been given by its Lacedaemonian owners to the expelled Aeginetans to inhabit, in return for their good offices at the time of the earthquake and the rising of the Helots, and also because, although subject of, of Athens, they had always sided with Lacedaemon. While the Athenians were still at sea, the Aeginetans evacuated a fort which they were building upon the coast, and retreated into the upper town where they lived, rather more than a mile from the sea. One of the Lacedaemonian district garrisons, which was helping them in the work, refused to enter here with them at their entreaty, thinking it dangerous to shut themselves up within the wall, and retiring to the high ground remained quiet, not considering themselves a match for the enemy. Meanwhile the Athenians landed, and instantly advanced with all their forces, and took Thraea. The town they burnt, pillaging what was in it. The Aeginetans, who were not slain in action, they took with them to Athens, with Tantalus, son of Patrocles, their Lacedaemonian commander, who had been wounded and taken prisoner. They also took with them a few men from Cythera, whom they thought it safest to remove. These the Athenians determined to lodge in the islands. The rest of the Cytherians were to retain their lands and pay four talents tribute. The Aeginetans captured to be all put to death on account of the old inveterate feud, and Tantalus to share the imprisonment of the Lacedaemonians taken on the island. That same summer, the inhabitants of Camarina and Gela in Sicily first made an armistice with each other, after which embassies from all the other Sicilian cities assembled at Gela to try to bring about a pacification. After many expressions of opinion on one side and the other, according to the griefs and pretensions of the different parties complaining, Hermocrates, son of Hermon, a Syracusan, the most influential man among them, addressed the following words to the assembly. If I now address you, Sicilians, it is not because my city is the least in Sicily, or the greatest sufferer by the war, but in order to state publicly what appears to me to be the best policy for the whole island. That war is an evil is a proposition so familiar to every one that it would be tedious to develop it. No one is forced to engage in it by ignorance, or kept out of it by fear, if he fancies there is anything to be gained by it. To the former the gain appears greater than the danger, while the latter would rather stand the risk than put up with any immediate sacrifice. But if both should happen to have chosen the wrong moment for acting in this way, advice to make peace would not be unserviceable. And this, if we did but see it, is just what we stand most in need of at the present juncture. I suppose that no one will dispute that we went to war at first in order to serve our own several interests, that we are now, in view of the same interests, debating how we can make peace, and that if we separate without having as we think our rights, we shall go to war again. And yet, as men of sense, we ought to see that our separate interests are not alone at stake in the present Congress. There is also the question whether we still have time to save Sicily, the whole of which, in my opinion, is menaced by Athenian ambition. And we ought to find in the name of that people more imperious arguments for peace than any which I can advance, when we see that the first power in Hellas watching our mistakes with the few ships that she has at present in our waters, and under the fair name of alliance speciously seeking to turn to account the natural hostility that exists between us. If we go to war and call in to help us a people that are ready enough to carry their arms even where they are not invited, and if we injure ourselves at our own expense, and at the same time serve as the pioneers of their dominion, we may expect, when they see us worn out, 
that they will one day come with a larger armament, and seek to bring all of us into subjection. And yet, as sensible men, if we call in allies and court danger, it should be in order to enrich our different countries with new acquisitions, and not to ruin what they possess already. And we should understand that the intestine discords, which are so fatal to communities generally, will be equally so to Sicily, if we, its inhabitants, absorbed in our local quarrels, neglect the common enemy. These considerations should reconcile individual with individual, and city with city, and unite us in a common effort to save the whole of Sicily. Nor should any one imagine that the Dorians only are enemies of Athens, while the Chalcidian race is secured by its Ionian blood. The attack in question is not inspired by hatred of one of two nationalities, but by desire for the good things in Sicily, the common property of us all. This is proved by the Athenian reception of the Chalcidian invitation. An ally who has never given them any assistance whatever at once receives from them almost more than the treaty entitles him to. That the Athenians should cherish this ambition and practice this policy is very excusable, and I do not blame those who wish to rule, but those who are over-ready to serve. It is just as much in men's nature to rule those who submit to them, as it is to resist those who molest them. One is not less invariable than the other. Meanwhile, all who see these dangers and refuse to provide for them properly, or who have come here without having made up their minds that our first duty is to unite to get rid of the common peril, are mistaken. The quickest way to be rid of it is to make peace with each other, since the Athenians menace us not from their own country, but from that of those who invited them here. In this way, instead of war issuing in, of peace issuing in war, peace quietly ends our quarrels, and the guests who come hither under fair pretenses for bad ends will have good reason for going away without having attained them. So far as regards the Athenians, such are the great advantages proved inherent in a wise policy. Independently of this, in the face of the universal consent that peace is the first of blessings, how can we refuse to make it amongst ourselves, or do you not think that the good which you have, and the ills that you complain of, would be better preserved and cured by quiet than war, that peace has its honors and splendors of a less perilous kind, not to mention the numerous other blessings that one might dilate on, with the not less numerous miseries of war? These considerations should teach you not to disregard my words, but rather to look in them every one for his own safety." If there be any here who feels certain either by right or might to effect his object, let not this surprise be to him too severe a disappointment. Let him remember that many before now have tried to chastise a wrongdoer, and failing to punish their enemy have not even saved themselves, while many who have trusted in force to gain an advantage, instead of gaining anything more, have been doomed to lose what they had. Vengeance is not necessarily successful because wrong has been done, or strength sure because it is confident but the incalculable element in the future exercises the widest influence, and is the most treacherous, and yet in fact the most useful of all things, as it frightens us all equally, and thus makes us consider before attacking each other. Let us therefore now allow the undefined fear of this unknown future, and the immediate terror of the Athenians' presence to produce their natural impression, and let us consider any failure to carry out the programs that may that we may each have sketched out for ourselves as sufficiently accounted for by these obstacles, and send away the intruder from the country. And if everlasting peace be impossible between us, let us at all events make a treaty for as long a term as possible, and put off our private differences to another day. In fine, let us recognize that the adoption of my advice will leave us each citizens of a free state, and as such arbiters of our own destiny, able to return good or bad offices with equal effect while its rejection will make us dependent on others, and thus not only impotent to repel an insult, but on the most favorable supposition, friends to our direst enemies, and at feud with our natural friends. For myself, though as I said at first the representative of a great city, and able to think less of defending myself than of attacking others, I am prepared to concede something in provision of these dangers. I am not inclined to ruin myself for the sake of hurting my enemies, or so blinded by animosity as to think myself equally master of my own plans, and of fortune which I cannot command. But I am ready to give up anything in reason. I call upon the rest of you to imitate my conduct of your own free will, without being forced to do so by the enemy. There is no disgrace in connections giving way to one another, a Dorian to a Dorian, or a Chalcidian to his brethren. Above and beyond this we are neighbors, live in the same country, are girt by the same sea, and go by the same name of Sicilians. We shall go to war again, I suppose, when the time comes, and again make peace among ourselves by means of future congresses. But the foreign invader, if we are wise, will always find us united against him, since the hurt of one is in danger of all. And we shall never in future invite into the island either allies or mediators. 
by so acting we shall at the present moment do for sicily a double service ridding her at once of the athenians and of civil war and in future shall live in freedom at home and be less menaced from abroad such were the words of hermocrates the sicilians took his advice and came to an understanding among themselves to end the war each keeping what they had the Camerinians taking Morgantina at a price fixed to be paid to the Syracusans, and the allies of the Athenians called the officers in command, and told them that they were going to make peace, and that they would be included in the treaty. The generals assenting, the peace was concluded, and the Athenian fleet afterwards sailed away from Sicily. Upon their arrival at Athens, the Athenians banished Pythodorus and Sophocles, and fined Eurymedon for having taken bribes to depart when they might have subdued Sicily. So thoroughly had the present prosperity persuaded the citizens that nothing could withstand them, and that they could achieve what was possible and impractical alike, with means ample or inadequate it mattered not. The secret of this was their general extraordinary success, which made them confuse their strength with their hopes. The same summer the Megarians in the city, pressed by the hostilities of the Athenians who invaded their country twice every year with all their forces, and harassed by the incursions of their own exiles at Pegai, who had been ex expelled in a revolution by the popular party, began to ask each other whether it would not be better to receive back their exiles and free the town from one of its two scourges. The friends of the emigrants, perceiving the agitation, now more openly than before demanded the adoption of this proposition, and the leaders of the commons, seeing that the sufferings of the times had tired out the constancy of their supporters, entered in their alarm into correspondence with the Athenian generals, Hippocrates, son of Ariphon, and Demosthenes, son of Alcisthenes, and resolved to betray the town, thinking this less dangerous to themselves than the return of the party which they had banished. It was accordingly arranged that the Athenians should first take the long walls extending for nearly a mile from the city to the port of Nicaea, to prevent the Peloponnesians coming to the rescue from that place, where they formed the sole garrison to secure the fidelity of Megara, and that after this it the attempt should be made to put into their hands the upper town, which it was thought would come over with less difficulty. The Athenians, after plans had been arranged between themselves and their correspondence both as to words and actions, sailed by night to Minoa, the island off Megara, with six hundred heavy infantry, under the command of Hippocrates, and took post in a quarry not far off, out of which bricks used to be taken for the walls, while Demosthenes, the other commander, with a detachment of Plataean light troops, and another of Peripoli, placed himself in ambush in the precinct of Enialius, which was still nearer. No one knew of it except those whose business it was to know that night. A little before daybreak the traitors in Megara began to act. Every night for a long time back, under pretense of marauding, in order to have a means of opening the gates, they had been used, with the consent of the officer in command, to carry by night a sculling boat upon a cart along the ditch to the sea, and so to sail out, bringing it back again before day upon the cart, and taking it within the wall through the gates, in order, as they pretended to baffle the Athenian blockade at Minoa, there being no boat to be seen in the harbor. On the present occasion the cart was already at the gates, which had been opened in the usual way for the boat, when the Athenians, with whom this had been concerted, saw it, and ran at the top of their speed from the ambush, in order to reach the gates before they were shut again. And while the cart was still there to prevent their being closed, their Megarian accomplices at the same moment killing the guard at the gates. The first to run in was Demosthenes with his Plataeans and Peripoli, just where the trophy now stands, and he was no sooner within the gates than the Plataeans engaged and defeated the nearest party of Peloponnesians, who had taken the alarm and came to the rescue, and secured the gates for the approaching Athenian heavy infantry. After this, each of the Athenians, as fast as they entered, went against the wall. A few of the Peloponnesian garrisons stood their ground at first, and tried to repel the assault, and some of them were killed, but the main body took fright and fled, the night attack and the sight of the Megarian traitors in arms against them, making them think that all Megara had gone over to the enemy. It so happened also that the Athenian herald of his own idea called out and invited any of the Megarians that wished to join the Athenian ranks, and this was no sooner heard by the garrison than they gave way, and, convinced that they were victims of a concerted attack, took refuge in Nicaea. By daybreak, the walls being now taken, and the Megarians in the city in great agitation, the persons who had negotiated with the Athenians, supported by the rest of the popular party which was privy to the plot, said that they ought to open the gates and march out to battle. It had been concerted between them that the Athenians should rush in the moment that the gates were opened, while the conspirators were to be distinguished from the rest by being anointed with oil, and so to avoid being hurt. They could open the gates with more security, as four thousand Athenian heavy infantry from Eleusis, and six hundred horse had marched all night, according to agreement, and were now close at hand. 
the conspirators were already anointed and at their posts by the gates when one of their accomplices denounced the plot to the opposite party who gathered together and came in a body and roundly said that they must not march out a thing they had never yet ventured on even when in greater force than at present or wantonly compromise the safety of the town and that if what they said was not attended to the battle would have to be fought in megara for the rest they gave no sign of their knowledge of the intrigue but stoutly maintained that their advice was the best and meanwhile kept close by and watched the gates making it impossible for the conspirators to effect their purpose the athenian generals seeing that some obstacle had arisen and, the, and that the capture of the town by force was no longer practicable at once proceeded to invest nicaea thinking that if they could take it before relief arrived the surrender of megara would soon follow iron and stonemasons and everything else required quickly coming up from athens the Athenians started from the wall which they occupied, and from this point built a cross wall looking towards Megara down to the sea on either side of Nicaea, the ditch and the walls being divided among the army, stones and bricks taken from the suburb, and the fruit trees and timber cut down to make a palisade wherever this seemed necessary, the houses also in the suburb with the addition of battlements sometimes entering into the fortification. The whole of this day the work continued, and by the afternoon of the next the wall was all but completed, when the garrison in Nicaea, alarmed by the absolute want of provisions, which they used to take in from the day from the upper town, not anticipating any speedy relief from the Peloponnesians, and supposing Megara to be hostile, capitulated to the Athenians on condition that they should give up their arms, and should each be ransomed for a stipulated sum. Their Lacedaemonian commander, and any, of, any others of his countrymen in the place, being left to the discretion of the Athenians, on these conditions they surrendered and came out, and the Athenians broke down the long walls at their point of junction with Megara, took possession of Nicaea, and went on with their other preparations. Just at this time, the Lacedaemonian Brasidas, son of Tellus, happened to be in the neighborhood of Sicyon and Corinth, getting ready an army for Thrace. As soon as he heard of the capture of the walls, fearing for the Peloponnesians in Nicaea and the safety of Megara, he sent to the Boeotians to meet him as quickly as possible at Tripodiscus, a village so called of the Megarid, under Mount Geronea, and went himself with two thousand seven hundred Corinthian heavy infantry, four hundred Phliasians, six hundred Sicyonians, and such troops of his own as he had already levied, expecting to find Nicaea not yet taken. Hearing of its fall, he had marched out by night to Tripodiscus. He took three hundred picked men from the army without waiting till his coming should be known, and came up to Megara unobserved by the Athenians who were down by the sea, ostensibly, and really, if possible, to attempt Nicaea, but above all to get into Megara and secure the town. He accordingly invited the townspeople to admit his party, saying that he had hopes of recovering Nicaea. However, one of the Megarian factions feared that he might expel them and restore the exiles, the other that the commons, apprehensive of this very danger, might set upon them, and the city be thus destroyed by a battle within its gates under the eyes of the ambushed Athenians, he was accordingly refused admittance, both parties electing to remain quiet and await the event, each expecting a battle between the Athenians and the relieving army, and thinking it safer to see their friends victorious before declaring in their favor. Unable to carry his point, Brasidas went back to the rest of the army. At daybreak the Boeotians joined him. Having determined to relieve Megara, whose danger they considered their own, even before hearing from Brasidas, they were already in full force at Plataea, when his messenger arrived to add spurs to their resolution, and they at once sent on to him two thousand two hundred heavy infantry and six hundred horse, returning home with the main body. The whole army thus assembled numbered six thousand heavy infantry. The Athenian heavy infantry were drawn up by Nicaea and the sea, but the light troops being scattered over the plain were attacked by the Boeotian horse and driven to the sea, being taken entirely by surprise, as on previous occasions no relief had ever come to the Megarians from any quarter. Here the Boeotians were in their turn charged and engaged by the Athenian horse, and a cavalry action ensued which lasted a long time, and in which both parties claimed the victory. The Athenians killed and stripped the leader of the Boeotian horse and some few of his comrades who had charged right up to Nicaea, and remaining masters of the bodies gave them back under truce and set up a trophy. But regarding the action as a whole, the forces separated without either side having gained a decisive advantage, the Boeotians returning to their army and the Athenians to Nicaea. After this, Brasidas and the army came nearer to the sea and to Megara, and taking up a convenient position, remained quiet in order of battle, 
expecting to be attacked by the Athenians, and knowing that the Megarians were waiting to see which would be the victor. This attitude seemed to present two advantages. Without taking the offensive, or willingly provoking the hazards of a battle, they openly showed their readiness to fight, and thus without bearing the burden of the day would fairly reap its honors, while at the same time they effectually served their interests at Megara. For if they had failed to show themselves they would not have had a chance, but would have certainly been considered vanquished, and have lost the town. As it was, the Athenians might possibly not be inclined to accept their challenge, and their object would be attained without fighting. And so it turned out. The Athenians formed outside the long walls, and the enemy not attacking, there remained motionless, their generals having decided that the risk was too unequal. In fact, most of their objects had already been attained, and they would have they would have to begin a battle against superior numbers, and if victorious could only gain Megara, while a defeat would destroy the flower of their heavy soldiery. For the enemy it was different, as even the states actually represented in his army risked each only a part of its entire force. He might well be more audacious. Accordingly, after waiting for some time without either side attacking, the Athenians withdrew to Nicaea, and the Peloponnesians after them to the point from which they had set out. The friends of the Megarian exiles now threw aside their hesitation, and opened the gates to Brasidas, and the commanders from the different states. Looking upon him as the victor, and upon the Athenians as having declined the battle, and receiving them into the town, proceeded to discuss matters with them, the party in correspondence with the Athenians being paralyzed by the turn things had taken. Afterwards Brasidas let the allies go home, and himself went back to Corinth to prepare for his expedition to Thrace, his original destination. The Athenians also returned home, the Megarians in the city most implicated in the Athenian negotiation, knowing that they had been detected, presently disappeared, while the rest conferred with the friends of the exiles and restored the party at Pegai, after binding them under solemn oaths to take no vengeance for the past, and only to consult the real interests of the town. However, as soon as they were in office, they held a review of the heavy infantry, and separating the battalions, picked out about a hundred of their enemies, and of those who were thought to be the most involved in the correspondence with the Athenians, brought them before the people, and compelling the vote to be given openly, had them condemned and executed, and established a close oligarchy in the town, a revolution which lasted a very long while, although affected by a very few partisans. This is the end of Book 4, Chapter 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Peloponnesian War, by Thucydides, translated by Richard Crawley. Book 4, Chapter 14. The same summer the Mytilineans were about to fortify Antandrus, as they had intended, when Demodocus and Aristides, the commanders of the Athenian squadron engaged in levying subsidies, heard on the Hellespont of what was being done to the place, Lamachus, their colleague, having sailed with ten ships into the Pontus, and conceived fears of its becoming a second Anaya, the place in which the Samian exiles had established themselves to annoy Samos, helping the Peloponnesians by sending pilots to their navy, and keeping the city in agitation and receiving all its outlaws. They accordingly got together a force from the allies and set sail, defeated in battle the troops that met them from Antandrus, and retook the place. Not long after, Lamachus, who had sailed into the Pontus, lost his ships at anchor in the river Calex, in the territory of Heraclea, rain having fallen in the interior, and the flood coming suddenly down upon them, and himself and his troops passed by land through the Bithynian Thracians on the Asiatic side, and arrived at Chalcedon, the Megarian colony at the mouth of the Pontus. The same summer, the Athenian general Demosthenes arrived at Nopactus with forty ships immediately after the return from the Megarid. Hippocrates and himself had had overtures made to them by certain men in the cities in Boeotia, who wished to change the constitution and introduce a democracy as at Athens, Toyodorus, a Theban exile, being the chief mover in this intrigue. The seaport town of Siphi in the Bay of Chrysi, in the Thespian territory, was to be betrayed to them by one party, Chironea, a dependency of what was formerly called the Minyan, now the Boeotian or Comenos, to be put into their hands by another from that town, whose exiles were very active in the business, hiring men in Peloponnese. Some Phocians also were in the plot, Chironea being the frontier town of Boeotia and close to Phenotus in Phocia. Meanwhile, the Athenians were to seize Delium, the sanctuary of Apollo, in the territory of Tanagra, looking towards Euboea, 
and all these events were to take place simultaneously upon a day appointed, in order that the Boeotians might be unable to unite to oppose them at Delium, being everywhere detained by disturbances at home. Should the enterprise succeed and Delium be fortified, its authors confidently expected that even if no revolution should immediately follow in Boeotia, yet with these places in their hands and the country being harassed by incursions, and a refuge in each instance near for the partisans engaged in them, things would not remain as they were, but that the rebels being supported by the Athenians and the forces of the oligarchs divided, it would be possible after a while to settle matters according to their wishes. Such was the plot in contemplation. Hippocrates with a force raised at home awaited the proper moment to take the field against the Boeotians, while he sent on Demosthenes with the forty ships above mentioned to Nopactus, to raise in those parts an army of Acarnanians, and of the other allies, and sail and receive Siphi from the conspirators, a day having been agreed on for the simultaneous execution of both these operations. Demosthenes on his arrival found Oeneidae already compelled by the united Acarnanians to join the Athenian confederacy, and himself raising all the allies in those countries, marched against and subdued Salinthius and the Agrians, after which he devoted himself to the preparations necessary to enable him to be at Siphi by the time appointed. About the same time in the summer, Brasidas set out for his march for the Thracian places, with seventeen hundred heavy infantry, and arriving at Heraclea and Trachis, from thence sent on a messenger to his friends at Pharsalus, to ask them to conduct himself and his army through the country. Accordingly there came to Melitia in Achaia Paneris, Doris, Hippolochidas, Torileus, and Strophacus, the Chalcidian Proxenus, under whose escort he resumed his march, being accompanied also by other Thessalians, among whom was Niconidas Larissa, a friend of Perdiccas. It was never very easy to traverse Thessaly without an escort, and throughout all Hellas for an armed force to pass without leave through a neighbor's country was a delicate step to take. Besides this, the Thessalian people had always sympathized with the Athenians. Indeed, if instead of the customary close oligarchy there had been a constitutional government in Thessaly, he would never have been able to proceed, since even as it was, he was met on his march at the river Enipeus by certain of the opposite party, who forbade his further progress, and complained of his making the attempt without the consent of the nation. To this his escort answered that they had no intention of taking him through against their will, they were only friends in attendance on an unexpected visitor. Brasidas himself added that he came as a friend to Thessaly and its inhabitants, his arms not being directed against them, but against the Athenians, with whom he was at war, and that although he knew of no quarrel between the Thessalians and Lacedaemonians to prevent the two nations having access to each other's territory, he neither would nor could proceed against their wishes. He could only beg them not to stop him. With this answer they went away, and he took the advice of his escort and pushed on without halting, before a greater force might gather to prevent him. Thus in the day that he set out from Melitia he performed the whole distance to the Pharsalus, and encamped on the river Apidanus and so to Phacium and from thence to Perabea. Here his Thessalian escort went back, and the Perabeans, who are subjects of Thessaly, sent him down at Dium in the dominions of Perdiccas, a Macedonian town under Mount Olympus, looking toward Thessaly. In this way Brasidas hurried through Thessaly before anyone could be got ready to stop him, and reached Perdiccas in Chalcidice. The departure of the army from Peloponnese had been procured by the Thracian towns in revolt against Athens, and by Perdiccas, alarmed at the successes of the Athenians. The Chalcidians thought that they would be the first objects of an Athenian expedition, not that the neighboring towns which had not yet revolted did not also secretly join in the invitation. And Perdiccas also had his apprehensions on account of his old quarrels with the Athenians, although not openly at war with them, and above all wished to reduce Arabaeus, king of the Lancastians. It had been less difficult for them to get an army to leave Peloponnese because of the ill fortune of the Lacedaemonians at the present moment. The attacks of the Athenians upon Peloponnese and in particular upon Laconia, might, it was hoped, be diverted most effectually by sending them in return, and by sending an army to their allies, especially as they were willing to maintain it, and asked for it to aid them in revolting. The Lacedaemonians were also glad to have an excuse for sending some of the helots out of the country, for fear that the present aspect of affairs and the occupation of Pelos might encourage them to move. Indeed, fear of their numbers and obstinacy even persuaded the Lacedaemonians to the action which I shall now relate, their policy at all times having been governed by the necessity of taking precautions against them. The Helots were invited by a proclamation to pick out those of their number who claimed to have most distinguished themselves against the enemy, in order that they might receive their freedom, the object being to test them, as it was thought that the first to claim their freedom would be the most high-spirited and the most apt to rebel. As many as two thousand were selected accordingly, who crowned themselves and went round the temples rejoicing in their new freedom. 
The Spartans soon afterwards did away with them, however, and no one ever knew how each of them perished. The Spartans now therefore gladly sent seven hundred as heavy infantry with Brasidas, who recruited the rest of his force by means of money in Peloponnese. Brasidas himself was sent out by the Lacedaemonians mainly at his own desire, although the Chalcidians also were eager to have a man so thorough as he had shown himself whenever there was anything to be done at Sparta, and whose after-service abroad proved of the utmost use to his country. At the present moment, his just and moderate conduct toward the towns generally succeeded in procuring their revolt, besides the places which he managed to take by treachery. And thus, when the Lacedaemonians desired to treat, as they ultimately did, they had places to offer in exchange, and the burden of war meanwhile shifted from Peloponnese. Later in the war, after the events in Sicily, the present valor and conduct of Brasidas, known by experience to some, by hearsay to others, was what mainly created in the allies of Athens a feeling for the Lacedaemonians. He was the first who went out and showed himself so good a man at all points, as to leave behind him the conviction that the rest were like him. Meanwhile, his arrival in the Thracian country no sooner became known to the Athenians than they declared war against Perdiccas, whom they regarded as the author of the expedition, and kept a closer watch on their allies in that quarter. Upon the arrival of Brasidas and his army, Perdiccas immediately started with them and with his own forces against Arabaeus, son of Bromerus, king of the Lincastian Macedonians, his neighbor, with whom he had a quarrel and whom he wished to subdue. However, when he arrived with his army and Brasidas at the pass leading into Lincus, Brasidas told him that before commencing hostilities he wished to go and try to persuade Arabaeus to become the ally of Lacedaemon, this latter having already made overtures intimating his willingness to make Brasidas arbitrator between them, and the Chalcidian envoys accompanying him, having warned him not to remove the apprehensions of Perdiccas, in order to ensure his greater zeal in their cause. Besides, the envoys of Perdiccas had talked at Lacedaemon about his bringing many of the places round him into alliance with them, and thus Brasidas thought he might take a larger view of the question of Arabaeus. Perdiccas, however, retorted that he had not brought him with him to arbitrate in their quarrel, but to put down the enemies whom he might point out to him, and that while he, Perdiccas, maintained half his army, it was a breach of faith for Brasidas to parley with Arabaeus. Nevertheless, Brasidas disregarded the wishes of Perdiccas and held the parley in spite of him, and suffered himself to be persuaded to lead off the army without invading the country of Arabaeus, after which Perdiccas, holding that faith had not been kept with him, contributed only a third instead of half of the support of the army. The same summer, without loss of time, Brasidas marched with the Chalcidians against Acanthus, a colony of the Andrians, a little before vintage. The inhabitants were divided into two parties on the question of receiving him, those who had joined the Chalcidians in inviting him, and the popular party. However, fear for their fruit, which was still out, enabled Brasidas to persuade the multitude to admit him alone, and to hear what he had to say before making a decision, and he was admitted accordingly, and appeared before the people, and not being a bad speaker for a Lacedaemonian, Address them as follows. Acanthians, the Lacedaemonians have sent out me and my army to make good the reason that we gave for the war when we began it, viz., that we were going to war with the Athenians in order to free Hellas. Our delay in coming has been caused by mistaken expectation as to the war at home, which led us to hope, by our own unassisted efforts and without your risking anything, to effect the speedy downfall of the Athenians. And you must not blame us for this, as we are now come to the moment that we were able prepared with your aid to do your best to subdue them. Meanwhile, I am astonished at finding your gates shut against me, and at not meeting with a better welcome. We Lacedaemonians thought of you as allies eager to have us, to whom we should come in spirit even before we were with you in body, and in this expectation undertook all the risks of a march of many days through a strange country, so far did our zeal carry us. It will be a terrible thing if after this you have other intentions, and mean to stand in the way of your own and Hellenic freedom, it is not merely that you oppose me yourselves, but wherever I may go, people will be less inclined to join me, on the score that you, to whom I first came, an important town like Acanthus, and prudent men like the Acanthians, refuse to admit me. I shall have nothing to prove that the reason which I advance is the true one. It will be said either that there is something unfair in the freedom which I offer, or that I am in insufficient force and unable to protect you against an attack from Athens. Yet when I went with the army which I now have to the relief of Nicaea, the Athenians did not venture to engage me, although in greater force than I, and it is not likely they will ever send across sea against you an army as numerous as they had at Nicaea. And for myself, I have come here not to hurt, but to free the Hellenes, witness the solemn oaths by which I have bound my government, that the allies that I may bring over shall be independent. And besides my object in coming is not by force or fraud to obtain your alliance, but to offer you mine, 
to help you against your Athenian masters. I protest, therefore, against any suspicions of my intentions after the guarantees which I offer, and equally so against doubts of my ability to protect you, and I invite you to join me without hesitation. Some of you may hang back because they have private enemies, and fear that I may put the city in the hands of a party. None need be more tranquil than they. I am not come here to help this party or that, and I do not consider that I should be bringing you freedom in any real sense, if I should disregard your constitution, and enslave the many to the few, or the few to the many. This would be heavier than a foreign yoke, and we Lacedaemonians, instead of being thanked for our pain, should get neither honor nor glory, but contrariwise reproaches. The charges which strengthen our hands in the war against the Athenians would on our own showing be merited by ourselves, and more hateful in us than in those who make no pretensions to honesty, as it is more disgraceful for persons of character to take what they covet by fair-seeming fraud than by open force. The one aggression having for its justification the might which fortune gives, the other being simply a piece of clever roguery. A matter which concerns us thus nearly we naturally look to most jealously, and over and above the oaths which, that I have mentioned, what stronger assurance can you have, when you see that our words, compared with the actual facts, produce the necessary conviction that it is our interest to act as we say. If to these considerations of mine you put in the plea of inability, and claim that your friendly feelings should save you from being hurt by your refusal, if you say that freedom, in your opinion, is not without its dangers, and that it is right to offer it to those who can accept it, but not to force it on any against their will, then I shall take the gods and heroes of your country to witness that I came for your good and was rejected, and shall do my best to compel you by laying waste your land. I shall do so without scruple, being justified by the necessity which constrains me, first, to prevent the Lacedaemonians from being damaged by you, their friends, in the event of your non-adhesion, through the monies that you pay to the Athenians, and secondly, to prevent the Hellenes from being hindered by you in shaking off their servitude. Otherwise, indeed, we should have no right to act as we propose, except in the name of some public interest. What call should we Lacedaemonians have to free those who do not wish it? Empire we do not aspire to. It is what we are laboring to put down, and we should wrong the greater number if we allowed you to stand in the way of the independence that we offer to all. Endeavor, therefore, to decide wisely, and strive to begin the work of liberation for the Hellenes, and lay up for yourselves endless renown, while you escape private loss, and cover your commonwealth with glory. Such were the words of Brasidas. The Acanthians, after much had been said on both sides of the question, gave their votes in secret, and the majority, influenced by the seductive arguments of Brasidas and by fear for their fruit, decided to revolt from Athens, not, however, admitting the army until they had taken his personal security for the oaths sworn by his government before they sent him out, assuring the independence of the allies whom he might bring over. Not long after, Stagyrus, a colony of the Andrians, followed their example and revolted. Such were the events of this summer. It was in the first days of the winter following that the places in Boeotia were to be put in the hands of the Athenian generals, Hippocrates and Demosthenes, the latter of whom was to go with his ships to Siphi, the former to Delium. A mistake, however, was made in the days on which they were to start, and Demosthenes, sailing first to Siphi, with the Acarnanians and many of the allies from those parts on board, failed to effect anything through the plot having been betrayed by Nicomachus, a Phocian from Phanotis, who told the Lacedaemonians, and they the Boeotians. Succors accordingly flocked in from all parts of Boeotia, Hippocrates not being yet there to make his diversion, and Siphi and Chironia were promptly secured, and the conspirators, informed of the mistake, did not venture on any movement in the towns. Meanwhile, Hippocrates made a levy in mass of the citizens, resident aliens, and foreigners in Athens, and arrived at his destination after the Boeotians had already come back from Siphi, and encamping his army began to fortify Delium, the sanctuary of Apollo, in the following manner. A trench was dug all round the temple and the consecrated ground, and the earth thrown up from the excavation was made to do duty as a wall, in which stakes were also planted, the vines round the sanctuary being cut down and thrown in, together with stones and bricks pulled down from the houses near, every means in short being used to run up the rampart. Wooden towers were also erected where they were wanted, and where there was no part of the temple buildings left standing, as on the side where the gallery once existing had fallen in. The work was begun on the third day after leaving home, and continued during the fourth, until dinner-time on the fifth, when most of it being now finished, the army removed from Delium about a mile and a quarter on its way home. From this point most of the light troops went straight on, while the heavy infantry halted and remained where they were, 
Hippocrates having stayed behind at Delium to arrange the posts, and to give directions for the completion of such part of the outworks as had been left unfinished. During the days thus employed the Boeotians were mustering at Tanagra, and by the time that they had come in from all the towns found the Athenians already on their way home. The rest of the eleven Boeotarchs were against giving battle, as the enemy was no longer in Boeotia, the Athenians being just over the Oropian border, when they halted. But Pagonandas, son of Aeolidas, one of the Boeotarchs of Thebes, Arianthides, son of Lysimachidas, being the other, and then commander-in-chief, thought it best to hazard a battle. He accordingly called the men to him, company after company, to prevent their all leaving their arms at once, and urged them to attack the Athenians, and stand the issue of a battle, speaking as follows. Boeotians, the idea that we ought not to give battle to the Athenians unless we came up with them in Boeotia is one which should never have entered into the heads of any of us, your generals. It was to annoy Boeotia that they crossed the frontier and built a fort in our country, and they are therefore, I imagine, our enemies wherever we may come up with them, and from wheresoever they may have come to act as enemies do. And if any one has taken up with the idea in question for reasons of safety, it is high time for him to change his mind. The party attacked, whose own country is in danger, can scarcely discuss what is prudent with the calmness of men who are in full enjoyment of what they have got, and are thinking of attacking a neighbor in order to get more. It is your national habit, in your country or out of it, to oppose the same resistance to a foreign invader, and when that invader is Athenian and lives upon your frontier besides, it is doubly imperative to do so. As between neighbors generally, freedom means simply a determination to hold one's own, and with neighbors like these who are trying to enslave near and far alike, there is nothing for it but to fight it out to the last. Look at the condition of the Eubians and most of the rest of Hellas, and be convinced that others have to fight with their neighbors for this frontier or that, but that for us conquest means one frontier for the whole country, about which no dispute can be made, for they will simply come and take by force what we have. So much more have we to fear from this neighbor than from another. Besides, people who, like the Athenians in the present instance, are tempted by pride of strength to attack their neighbors, usually march most confidently against those who keep still, and only defend themselves in their own country, but think twice before they grapple with those who meet them outside their frontier and strike the first blow if opportunity offers. The Athenians have shown us this themselves. The defeat which we inflicted upon them at Coronea, at the time when our quarrels had allowed them to occupy the country, has given great security to Boeotia until the present day. Remembering this, the old must equal their ancient exploits, and the young, the sons of the heroes of that time, must endeavor not to disgrace their native valor, and trusting in the help of the god whose temple has been sacrilegiously fortified, and in the victims which in our sacrifices have proved propitious, we must march against the enemy, and teach him that he must go and get what he wants by attacking someone who will not resist him, but that men whose glory it is to be always ready to give battle for the liberty of their own country, and never unjustly to enslave that of others, will not let him go without a struggle. By these arguments, Pagandas persuaded the Boeotians to attack the Athenians, and quickly breaking up his camp led his army forward, it being now late in the day. On nearing the enemy, he halted in a position where a hill intervening prevented the two armies from seeing each other, and then formed and prepared for action. Meanwhile, Hippocrates at Delium, informed of the approach of the Boeotians, sent orders to his troops to throw themselves into line, and himself joined them not long afterwards, leaving about three hundred horse behind him at Delium at once to guard the place in case of attack, and to watch their opportunity and fall upon the Boeotians during the battle. The Boeotians placed a detachment to deal with these, and when everything was arranged to their satisfaction appeared over the hill, and halted in the order which they had determined on, to the number of seven thousand heavy infantry, more than ten thousand light troops, one thousand horse, and five hundred targeteers. On their right were the Thebans and those of their province in the center, the Haliartians, Coronaeans, Copaeans, and the other people around the lake, and on the left the Thespians, Tanagrians, and Orchomanians, the cavalry and the light troops being at the extremity of each wing. The Thebans formed twenty-five shields deep, the rest as they pleased. Such was the strength and disposition of the Boeotian army. On the side of the Athenians, the heavy infantry throughout the whole army formed eight deep, being in numbers equal to the enemy, with the cavalry upon the two wings. Light troops regularly armed, there were none in the army, nor had there ever been any at Athens. Those who had joined in the invasion, though many times more numerous than those of the enemy, had mostly followed unarmed as part of the levy and mass of the citizens and foreigners at Athens, and having started first on their way home were not present in any number. The armies being now in line, and upon the point of engaging, 
Hippocrates, the general, passed along the Athenian ranks and encouraged them as follows. Athenians, I shall only say a few words to you, but brave men require no more, and they are addressed more to your understanding than to your courage. None of you must fancy that we are going out of our way to run this risk in the country of another. Fought in their territory, the battle will be ours. If we conquer, the Peloponnesians will never invade your country without the Boeotian horse, and in one battle you will win Boeotia, and in a manner free Attica. Advance to meet them, then, like citizens of a country, in which you all glory as the first in Hellas, and like sons of the fathers who beat them at Oinophyta with Moronides, and thus gained possession of Boeotia. Hippocrates had got halfway through the army with his exhortation when the Boeotians, after a few more hasty words from Pagondas, struck up the pion and came against them from the hill, the Athenians advancing to meet them and closing at a run. The extreme wing of neither army came into action, one like the other being stopped by the watercourses in the way, the rest engaged with the utmost obstinacy, shield against shield. The Boeotian left as far as the center was worsted by the Athenians. The thespians in that part of the field suffered most severely. The troops alongside them having given way, they were surrounded in a narrow space and cut down fighting hand to hand. Some of the Athenians also fell into confusion in surrounding the enemy, and mistook and so killed each other. In this part of the field the Boeotians were beaten and retreated upon the troops still fighting, but the right, where the Thebans were, got the better of the Athenians, and shoved them further and further back, though gradually at first. It so happened also that Pagondas, seeing the distress of his left, had sent two squadrons of horse where they could not be seen round the hill, and their sudden appearance struck a panic into the victorious wing of the Athenians, who thought that it was another army coming against them. At length in both parts of the field, disturbed by this panic and with their line broken by the advancing Thebans, the whole Athenian army took to flight. Some made for Delium in the sea, some for Oropus, others for Mount Parnas, or wherever they had hopes of safety, pursued and cut down by the Boeotians, and in particular by the cavalry, comprised partly of Boeotians and partly of Locrians, who had come up just as the rout began. Night, however, coming on to interrupt the pursuit, the mass of the fugitives escaped more easily than they would otherwise have done. The next day the troops at Oropus and Delium returned home by sea, after leaving a garrison in the latter place, which they continued to hold, notwithstanding the defeat. The Boeotians set up a trophy, took up their own dead, and stripped those of the enemy, and leaving a guard over them, retired to Tanagra, there to take measures for attacking Delium. Meanwhile, a herald came from the Athenians to ask for the dead, but was met and turned back by a Boeotian herald, who told him that he would effect nothing until the return of himself, the Boeotian herald, and who then went on to the Athenians, and told them on the part of the Boeotians that they had done wrong in transgressing the law of the Hellenes. Of what use was the universal custom protecting the temples in an invaded country, if the Athenians were to fortify Delium and live there, acting exactly as if they were on unconsecrated ground, and drawing and using for their purposes the water which they, the Boeotians, never touched except for sacred uses? Accordingly, for the god as well as for themselves, in the name of the deities concerned and of Apollo, the Boeotians invited them first to evacuate the temple, if they wished to take up the dead that belonged to them. After these words from the herald, the Athenians sent their own herald to the Boeotians to say that they had not done any wrong to the temple, and for the future would do it no more harm than they could help not having occupied it originally in any such design, but to defend themselves from it against those who were really wronging them. The law of the Hellenes was that conquest of a country, whether more or less extensive, carried with it possession of the temples in that country, with the obligation to keep up the usual ceremonies, at least as far as possible. The Boeotians and most other people who had turned out the owners of a country and put themselves in their place by force, now held as of right the temples which they originally entered as usurpers. If the Athenians could have conquered more of Boeotia, this would have been the case with them. As things stood, the piece of it which they had got they should treat as their own, and not quit unless obliged. The water they had disturbed under the impulsion of a necessity which they had not wantonly incurred, having been forced to use it in defending themselves against the Boeotians who first invaded Attica. Besides, anything done under the pressure of war and danger might reasonably claim indulgence, even in the eyes of the god, or why, pray, were the altars the asylum for involuntary offenses? Transgression also was a term applied to presumptuous offenders, not to the victims of adverse circumstances. In short, which were the most impious, the Boeotians who wished to barter dead bodies for holy places, or the Athenians who refused to give up holy places to obtain what was theirs by right? The condition of evacuating Boeotia must therefore be withdrawn. They were no longer in Boeotia. They stood where they stood by the right of the sword. All that the Boeotians had to do was tell them to take up their dead under a truce according to the national custom. 
The Boeotians replied that if they were in Boeotia, they must evacuate that country before taking up their dead. If they were in their own country, they could do as they pleased, for they knew that, although the Europid were the bodies as it chanced were lying, the battle having been fought on the border was subject to Athens, yet the Athenians could not get them without their leave. Besides, why should they grant a truce for Athenian ground? And what could be fairer than to tell them to evacuate Boeotia if they wished to get what they asked? The Athenian herald accordingly returned with this answer, without having accomplished his object. Meanwhile the Boeotians at once sent for darters and slingers from the Malian Gulf, and with two thousand Corinthian heavy infantry who had joined them after the battle, the Peloponnesian garrison which had evacuated Nicaea, and some Megarians with them, marched against Delium, and attacked the fort, and after diverse efforts finally succeeded in taking it by an engine of the following description. They saw it in two, and scooped out a great beam from end to end, and fitting it nicely together again like a pipe, hung by chains a cauldron at one extremity, from which communicated an iron tube projecting from the beam, which was itself in great part plated with iron. This they brought up from a distance upon carts to the part of the wall principally composed of vines and timber, and when it was near, inserted huge bellows into their end of the beam and blew with them. The blast passing closely confined into the cauldron, which was filled with lighted coals, sulfur, and pitch, made a great blaze and set fire to the wall, which soon became untenable for its defenders, who left it and fled, and in this way the fort was taken. Of the garrison, some were killed and two hundred made prisoner. Most of the rest got on board their ships and returned home. Soon after the fall of Delium, which took place seventeen days after the battle, the Athenian herald, without knowing what had happened, came again for the dead which were now restored by the Boeotians, who no longer answered as at first. Not quite five hundred Boeotians fell in the battle, and nearly one thousand Athenians, including Hippocrates the general, besides a great number of light troops and camp followers. Soon after this battle, Demosthenes, after the failure of his voyage to Siphi, and of the plot on the town, availed himself of the Acarnanian and Agrian troops, and of the four hundred Athenian heavy infantry which he had on board, to make a descent on the Sicyonian coast. Before, however, all his ships had come to shore, the Sicyonians came up and routed and chased to their ships those that had landed, killing some and taking others prisoner, after which they set up a trophy, and gave back the dead under truce. About the same time with the affair of Delium took place the death of Sitalces, king of the Adrisians, who was defeated in battle in a campaign against the Tribali. Suthes, son of Sporadicus, his nephew, succeeded to the kingdom of the Adrisians, and of the rest of Thrace ruled by Sitalces. The same winter Brasidas, with his allies in the Thracian places, marched against Amphipolis, the Athenian colony on the river Strymon. A settlement upon the spot on which the city now stands was before attempted by Aristagoras, the Milesian, when he fled from King Darius, who was, however, dislodged by the Edonians, and thirty-two years later by the Athenians, who sent thither ten thousand settlers of their own citizens, and whoever else chose to go. These were cut off at Drabescus by the Thracians. Twenty-nine years after, the Athenians returned, Hagnon, son of Nicias, being sent out as leader of the colony, and drove out the Edonians, and founded a town on the spot, formerly called Enia Hodoi, or Nine Ways. The base from which they started was Aeon, their commercial seaport at the mouth of the river, not more than three miles from the present town, which Hagnon named Amphipolis, because the Strymon flows round it on two sides, and he built it so as to be conspicuous from the sea and land alike, running a long wall across from river to river to complete the circumference. Brasidas now marched against this town, starting from Arne and Chalcidice, arriving about dusk at Aulon and Bramiscus, where the lake of Bolbe runs into the sea. He supped there, and went on during the night. The weather was stormy, and it was snowing a little, which encouraged him to hurry on, in order, if possible, to take everyone at Amphipolis by surprise, except the party who were to betray it. The plot was carried on by some natives of Argilus, an Andrian colony, residing in Amphipolis, where they had also other accomplices gained over by Perticus or the Chalcidians. But the most active in the matter were the inhabitants of Argilus, itself which is close by, who had always been suspected by the Athenians, and had had designs on the place. These men now saw their opportunity arrive with Brasidas, and having for some time been in correspondence with their countrymen in Amphipolis for the betrayal of the town, at once received him into Argilus, and revolted from the Athenians, and that same night took him to the bridge over the river, where he found only a small guard to oppose him, the town being at some distance from the passage, and the walls not reaching down to it as at present. This guard he easily drove in, partly through there being treason in their ranks, partly from the stormy state of the weather and the suddenness of his attack, 
and so got across the bridge and immediately became master of all the property outside, the Amphipolitans having houses all over the quarter. The passage of Brasidas was a complete surprise to the people in the town, and the capture of many of those outside and the flight of the rest within the wall combined to produce great confusion among the citizens, especially as they did not trust one another. It is even said that if Brasidas, instead of stopping to pillage, had advanced straight against the town, he would probably have taken it. In fact, however, he established himself where he was, and overran the country outside, and for the present remained inactive, vainly awaiting a demonstration on the part of his friends within. Meanwhile, the party opposed to the traitors proved numerous enough to prevent their gates being immediately thrown open, and in concert with Eucles, the general who had come from Athens to defend the place, sent to the other commander in Thrace, Thucydides, son of Alorus, the author of this history, who was at the isle of Thassos, a Parian colony, half a day's sail from Amphipolis, to tell him to come to their relief. On receipt of this message, he at once set sail with seven ships which he had with him in order, if possible, to reach Amphipolis in time to prevent its capitulation, or in any case to save Aeon. Meanwhile, Brasidas, afraid of succors arriving by sea from Thassos, and learning that Thucydides possessed the right of working the gold mines in that part of Thrace, and had thus great influence with the inhabitants of the continent, hastened to gain the town, if possible, before the people of Amphipolis should be encouraged by his arrival to hope that he could save them by getting together a force of allies from the sea and from Thrace, and so refused to surrender. He accordingly offered moderate terms, proclaiming that any of the Amphipolitans and Athenians who chose might continue to enjoy their property with full rights of citizenship, while those who did not wish to stay had five days to depart, taking their property with them. The bulk of the inhabitants upon hearing this began to change their minds, especially as only a small number of the citizens were Athenians, the majority having come from different quarters, and many of the prisoners outside had relations within the walls. They found the proclamation a fair one in comparison of what their fear had suggested, the Athenians being glad to go out, as they thought they ran more risk than the rest, and further did not expect any speedy relief, and the multitude generally being content at being left in possession of their civic rights, and at such an unexpected reprieve from danger. The partisans of Brasidas now openly advocated this course, seeing that the feeling of the people had changed, and that they no longer gave ear to the Athenian general present, and thus the surrender was made, and Brasidas was admitted by them on the terms of his proclamation. In this way they gave up the city, and late in the same day, Thucydides and his ships entered the harbor of Aeon, Brasidas having just got hold of Amphipolis, and having been within a night of taking Aeon. Had the ships been less prompt in relieving it, in the morning it would have been his. After this, Thucydides put all in order at Aeon to secure it against any present or future attack of Brasidas, and received such as had elected to come there from the interior according to the terms agreed on. Meanwhile, Brasidas suddenly sailed with a number of boats down the river to Aeon, to see if he could not seize the point running out from the wall, and so command the entrance. At the same time he attempted it by land, but was beaten off on both sides, and had to content himself with arranging matters at Amphipolis and in the neighborhood. Myrcinus, an Edonian town, also came over to him, the Edonian king Pitacus, having been killed by the sons of Goaxis and his own wife Brauro, and Galepsus and Oisime, which are Thasian colonies not long after followed its example. Perdiccas, too, came up immediately after the capture, and joined in these arrangements. The news that Amphipolis was in the hands of the enemy caused great alarm at Athens. Not only was the town valuable for the timber it afforded for shipbuilding and the money that it brought in, but also, although the escort of the Thessalians gave the Lacedaemonians a means of reaching the allies of Athens as far as the Strymon, yet as long as they were not masters of the bridge, but were watched on the side of Aeon by the Athenian galleys, and on the land side impeded by a large and extensive lake formed by the waters of the river, it was impossible for them to go any further. Now, on the contrary, the path seemed open. There was also the fear of the allies revolting, owing to the moderation displayed by Brasidas in all his conduct, and to the declarations which he was everywhere making that he set out to free Hellas. The town subject to the Athenians, hearing of the capture of Amphipolis, and of the terms accorded to it, and of the gentleness of Brasidas, felt most strongly encouraged to change their condition, and sent secret messages to him, begging him to come on to them, each wishing to be the first to revolt. Indeed, there seemed to be no danger in so doing. Their mistake in their estimate of the Athenian power was as great as that power afterwards turned out to be, and their judgment was based more on blind wishing than upon any sound provision, for it is a habit of mankind to entrust to careless hope what they long for, and to use sovereign reason to thrust aside what they do not fancy. 
Besides, the late severe blow which the Athenians had met with in Boeotia, joined to the seductive, though untrue, statements of Brasidas about the Athenians not having ventured to engage his single army at Nicaea, made the allies confident, and caused them to believe that no Athenian force would be sent against them. Above all, the wish to do what was agreeable at the moment, and the likelihood that they should find the Lacedaemonians full of zeal at starting, made them eager to venture. Observing this, the Athenians sent garrisons to the different towns, as far as was possible at such short notice and in winter, while Brasidas sent dispatches to Lacedaemon asking for reinforcements, and himself made preparations for building galleys in the Strymon. The Lacedaemonians, however, did not send him any, partly through envy on the part of their chief men, partly because they were more bent on recovering the prisoners of the island and ending the war. The same winter the Megarians took and raised to the foundations the long walls which had been occupied by the Athenians, and Brasidas, after the capture of Amphipolis, marched with his allies against Acte, a promontory running out from the king's dyke with an inward curve, and ending in Athos, a lofty mountain looking towards the Aegean Sea. In it are various towns, Sane, an Andrian colony close to the canal and facing the sea in the direction of Euboea, the others being Thissus, Cleone, Acrothi, Odophixus, and Dium, inhabited by mixed barbarian races speaking the two languages. There is also a small Chalcidian element, but the greater numbers are tyreno pelasgians once settled in Lemnos and Athens, and Basaltians, Crestonians, and Edonians, the towns being all small ones. Most of these came over to Brasidas, but Sane and Dium held out and saw their land ravaged by him and his army. Upon their not submitting, he at once marched against Tyrone and Chalcidice, which was held by an Athenian garrison, having been invited by a few persons who were prepared to hand over the town. Arriving in the dark, a little before daybreak, he sat down with his army near the temple of the Dioscuri, rather more than a quarter of a mile from the city. The rest of the town of Tyrone and the Athenians in garrison did not perceive his approach, but his partisans knowing that he was coming, a few of them had secretly gone out to meet him, were on the march for his arrival, and were no sooner aware of it than they took to them seven light-armed men with daggers, who alone of twenty men ordered on this service dared to enter, commanded by Lysistratus, an Olynthian. These passed through the sea-wall, and without being seen went up and put to the sword the garrison of the highest post in the town, which stands on a hill, and broke open the postern on the side of Canestrium. Brasidas, meanwhile, came a little nearer, and then halted with his main body, sending on one hundred targeteers to be ready to rush in first the moment that a gate should be thrown open, and the beacon lighted as agreed. After some time passed in waiting and wondering at the delay, the targeteers by degrees got up close to the town. The Toronaeans, inside at work with the party that had entered, had by this time broken down the postern, and opened the gates leading to the marketplace by cutting through the bar, and first brought some men round, and let them in by the postern, in order to strike a panic into the surprised townsmen, by suddenly attacking them from behind and on both sides at once, after which they had raised the fire signal, as had been agreed, and took in by the market gates the rest of the targeteers. Brasidas, seeing the signal, told the troops to rise, and dashed forward amid the loud hurrahs of his men, which carried dismay among the astonished townspeople. Some burst in straight by the gate, others over some square pieces of timber placed against the wall, which had fallen down and was being rebuilt, to draw up stones. Brasidas and the greater number making straight uphill for the higher part of the town, in order to take it from top to bottom, and once for all, while the rest of the multitude spread in all directions. The capture of the town was effected before the great body of the Tornaeans had recovered from the surprise and confusion, but the conspirators and the citizens of their party at once joined the invaders. About fifty of the Athenian heavy infantry happened to be sleeping in the marketplace when the alarm reached them. A few of these were killed fighting, the rest escaped, some by land, others to the two ships on station, and took refuge in Lakynthus, a fort garrisoned by their own men in the corner of the town, running out into the sea and cut off by a narrow isthmus, where they were joined by the Tornaeans of their party. They now arrived, and the town being secured, Brasidas made a proclamation to the Tornaeans who had taken refuge with the Athenians to come out, as many as chose, to their homes without fearing for their rights or persons, and sent a herald to invite the Athenians to accept a truce, and to evacuate Lakythus with their property, as being Chalcidian property. The Athenians refused this offer, but asked for a truce for a day to take up their dead. Brasidas granted it for two days, which he employed in fortifying the houses near, and the Athenians in doing the same to their positions. Meanwhile, he called a meeting of the Tornaeans, and said very much what he had said at Acanthus, namely that they must not look upon those who had negotiated with him for the capture of the town as bad men or as traitors, as they had not acted as they had done from corrupt motives, 
or in order to enslave the city, but for the good and freedom of Tyrone. Nor again must those who had not shared in the enterprise fancy that they would not equally reap its fruits, as he had not come to destroy either city or individual. This was the reason of his proclamation to those that had fled for refuge to the Athenians. He thought none the worse of them for their friendship for the Athenians. He believed that they had only to make trial of the Lacedaemonians, to like them as well, or even much better, as acting much more justly. It was for want of such a trial that they were now afraid of them. Meanwhile, he warned all of them to prepare to be staunch allies, and for being held responsible for all faults in future. For the past, they had not wronged the Lacedaemonians, but had been wronged by others who were too strong for them, and any opposition that they might have offered him could be excused. Having encouraged them with this address, as soon as the truce expired, he made his attack upon Lachithus, the Athenians defending themselves from a poor wall and from some houses with parapets. One day they beat him off, the next the enemy were preparing to bring up an engine against them, from which they meant to throw fire upon the wooden defenses, and the troops were already coming up to the point where they fancied they could best bring up the engine, and where place was most assailable. Meanwhile the Athenians put a wooden tower upon a house opposite, and carried up a quantity of jars and casks of water and big stones, and a large number of men also climbed up. The house thus laden too heavily suddenly broke down with a loud crash, at which the men who were near and saw it were more vexed than frightened, but those not so near, and still more those furthest off, thought that the place was already taken at that point, and fled in haste to the sea and the ships. Brasidas, perceiving that they were deserting the parapet, and seeing what was going on, dashed forward with his troops, and immediately took the fort, and put to the sword all whom he found in it. In this way the place was evacuated by the Athenians, who went across in their boats and ships to Pallene. Now there is a temple of Athena in Lachithus, and Brasidas had proclaimed, in the moment of making the assault, that he would give thirty silver minae to the first on the wall. Being now of opinion that the capture was scarcely due to human means, he gave the thirty minae to the goddess for her temple, and raised and cleared Lachithus, and made the whole of it consecrated ground. The rest of the winter he spent in settling the places in his hands, and in making designs upon the rest, and with the expiration of the winter the eighth year of this war ended. In the spring of the summer following, the Lacedaemonians and Athenians made an armistice for a year, the Athenians thinking that they would thus have full leisure to take their precautions before Brasidas could procure the revolt of any more of their towns, and might also, if it suited them, conclude a general peace. The Lacedaemonians, divining the actual fears of the Athenians, and thinking that after tasting a respite from trouble and misery they would be more disposed to consent to a reconciliation, and to give back the prisoners, and make a treaty for the longer period. The great idea of the Lacedaemonians was to get their men back while Brasidas's good fortune lasted. Further successes might make the struggle a less unequal one in Chalcidice, but would leave them still deprived of their men, and even in Chalcidice not more than a match for the Athenians, and by no means certain of victory. An armistice was accordingly concluded by Lacedaemon, and her allies upon the terms following. As to the temple and the oracle of the Pythian Apollo, we are agreed that whosoever will shall have access to it, without fraud or fear, according to the usages of his forefathers. The Lacedaemonians and the allies present agree to this, and promise to send heralds to the Boeotians and Phocians, and to do their best to persuade them to agree likewise. 2. As to the treasure of the god, we agree to exert ourselves to detect all malversators, truly and honestly following the customs of our forefathers, we and you and all others willing to do so, all following the customs of our forefathers. As to these points, the Lacedaemonians and the other allies are agreed, as has been said. 3. As to what follows, the Lacedaemonians and the other allies agree, if the Athenians conclude a treaty, to remain, each of us in our own territory, retaining our respective acquisitions the garrison in Corypheseum keeping within Bufras and Timaeus, that in Cythera attempting no communication with the Peloponnesian confederacy, neither we with them nor they with us, that in Nicaea and Minoa, not crossing the road leading from the gates of the temple of Nisus to that of Poseidon, and from thence straight to the bridge at Minoa, the Megarians and the allies being equally bound not to cross this road, and the Athenians retaining the island they have taken, without any communication on either side, as to Troizen, each side retaining what it has, and as was arranged with the Athenians. 4. As to the use of the sea, so far as refers to their own coast, and to that of their confederacy, that the Lacedaemonians and their allies may voyage upon it any vessel rowed by oars, and of not more than five hundred talents tonnage, not a vessel of war. 5. 
that all heralds and embassies, with as many attendants as they please for concluding the war and adjusting claims, shall have free passage, going and coming, to Peloponnese or Athens, by land and by sea. That during the truce, deserters, whether bond or free, shall be received neither by you nor by us. 7. Further, that satisfaction shall be given by you to us, and by us to you, according to the public law of our several countries, all disputes being settled by law without recourse to hostilities. The Lacedaemonians and allies agree to these articles, but if you have anything fairer or juster to suggest, come to Lacedaemon and let us know whatever shall be just will meet with no objection from either the Lacedaemonians or from the allies. Only let those who come, come with full powers, as you desire us. The truce shall be for one year. Approved by the people. The tribe of Acamantis had the Prytany. Phoenippus was secretary, Nicaides chairman. Laches moved, in the name of the good luck of the Athenians, that they should conclude the armistice upon the terms agreed upon by the Lacedaemonians and the allies. It was agreed accordingly in the popular assembly that the armistice should be for one year, beginning that very day, the fourteenth of the month of Elaphabolion, during which term ambassadors and heralds should go and come between the two countries to discuss the bases of a pacification that the generals and Prytanes should call an assembly of the people, in which the Athenians should first consult on the peace, and on the mode in which the embassy for putting an end to the war should be admitted, that the embassy now present should at once take the engagement before the people to keep well and truly this truce for one year. On these terms the Lacedaemonians concluded with the Athenians and their allies on the twelfth day of the Spartan month, Gerastius, the allies also taking the oaths. Those who concluded and poured the libations were Tyrus, son of Echitimides, Athenaeus, son of Pericleidas, and Philocaridas, son of Eryxidiades, Lacedaemonians, Aeneas, son of Octius, and Euphamidas, son of Aristonemus, Corinthians, Damotemus, son of Nocrates, and Onesimus, son of Megacles, Sicyonians, Nicasus, son of Cecalus, and Menecrates, son of Amphidorus, Megarians, and Amphius, son of Eupiodas, an Apidorian, and the Athenian generals Nicostratus, son of Detrephus, Nicias, son of Nicaratus, and Autocles, son of Ptolemaeus. Such was the armistice, and during the whole of it conferences went on with the subject of a pacification. In the days in which they were going backwards and forwards to these conferences, Scione, a town in Pallene, revolted from Athens and went over to Brasidas. The Scionians say they are Pallenians from Peloponnese, and that their first founders on their voyage from Troy were carried into this spot by the storm which the Achaeans were caught in, and there settled. The Scionians had no sooner revolted than Brasidas crossed over by night to Scione, with a friendly galley ahead and himself in a small boat some way behind, his idea being that if he fell in with a vessel larger than the boat he would have the galley to defend him, while a ship that was a match for the galley would probably neglect the small vessel to attack the larger one, and thus leave him time to escape. His passage effected, he called a meeting of the Scionians, and spoke to the same effect as at Acanthus and Tyrone, adding that they merited the utmost commendation, in that, in spite of Pallene within the Isthmus being cut off by the Athenian occupation of Potidaea, and of their own practically insular position, they had of their own free will gone forward to meet their liberty, instead of timorously waiting until they had been, by force, compelled to their own manifest good. This was a sign that they would valiantly undergo any trial, however great, and if he should order affairs as he intended, he should count them among the truest and sincerest friends of the Lacedaemonians, and would in every other way honor them. The Scionians were elated by his language, and even those who had at first disapproved of what was being done, catching the general confidence, they determined on a vigorous conduct of the war, and welcomed Brasidas with all possible honors, publicly crowning him with a crown of gold as the liberator of Hellas, while private persons crowded round him and decked him with garlands as though he had been an athlete. Meanwhile, Brasidas left them a small garrison for the present, and crossed back again, and not long afterwards sent over a larger force, intending with the help of the Scionians to attempt Mende and Potidaea before the Athenians should arrive. Scione, he felt, being too like an island for them not to relieve it. He had besides intelligence in the above towns about their betrayal. In the midst of his designs upon the towns in question, a galley arrived with the commissioners carrying round the news of the armistice, Aristonemus for the Athenians, and Athenaeus for the Lacedaemonians. The troops now crossed back to Tyrone, and the commissioners gave Brasidas notice of the convention. All the Lacedaemonian allies in Thrace accepted what had been done, 
and Aristonemus made no difficulty about the rest. But finding, on counting the days, that the Scionians had revolted after the date of the convention, refused to include them in it. To this Brasidas earnestly objected, asserting that the revolt took place before and would not give up the town. Upon Aristonemus reporting the case to Athens, the people at once prepared to send an expedition to Scione. Upon this, envoys arrived from Lacedaemon, alleging that this would be a breach of the truce, and laying claim to the town upon the faith of the assertion of Brasidas, and meanwhile offering to submit the question to arbitration. Arbitration, however, was what the Athenians did not choose to risk, being determined to send troops at once to the place, and furious at the idea of even the islanders now daring to revolt, in a vain reliance upon the power of the Lacedaemonians by land. Besides, the facts of the revolt were rather as the Athenians contended, the Scionians having revolted two days after the convention. Cleon accordingly succeeded in carrying a degree to reduce and put to death the Scionians, and the Athenians employed the leisure which they now enjoyed in preparing for the expedition. Meanwhile, Mende revolted, a town in Pauline and a colony of the Eretrians, and was received without scruple by Brasidas, in spite of its having evidently come over during the armistice, on account of certain infringements of the truce alleged by him against the Athenians. This audacity of Mende was partly caused by seeing Brasidas forward in the manner, and by the conclusions drawn from his refusal to betray Scione, and besides, the conspirators in Mende were few, and, as I have already intimated, had carried on their practices too long not to fear detection for themselves, and not to wish to force the inclination of the multitude. This news made the Athenians more furious than ever, and they at once prepared against both towns. Brasidas, expecting their arrival, conveyed away to Olynthus and Chalcidice the women and children of the Scionians and Mendians, and sent over to them five hundred Peloponnesian heavy infantry and three hundred Chalcidian targeteers, all under the command of Polydamidas. Leaving these two towns to prepare together against the speedy arrival of the Athenians, Brasidas and Perdiccas started on a second joint expedition into Lyncus against Arabaeus, the latter with the forces of Macedonian subjects and a corps of heavy infantry composed of Hellenes domiciled in the country, the former with the Peloponnesians whom he still had with him, and the Chalcidians, Acanthians, and the rest in such force as they were able. In all there were about three thousand Hellenic heavy infantry, accompanied by all the Macedonian cavalry with the Chalcidians, near one thousand strong, besides an immense crowd of barbarians. On entering the country of Arbaeus, they found the Lancastians encamped awaiting them, and themselves took up a position opposite. The infantry on either side were upon a hill with a plain between them, into which the horse of both armies first galloped down and engaged a cavalry action. After this, the Lancastian heavy infantry advanced from their hill to join their cavalry and offered battle, upon which Brasidas and Perdiccas also came down to meet them, and engaged and routed them with heavy loss, the survivors taking refuge upon the heights and there remaining inactive. The victors now set up a trophy, and waited two or three days for the Illyrian mercenaries who were to join Perdiccas. Perdiccas then wished to go on and attack the villages of Arabaeus, and to sit still no longer, but Brasidas, afraid that the Athenians might sail up during his absence, and of something happening to Mende, and seeing besides that the Illyrians did not appear, far from seconding this wish, was anxious to return. While they were thus disputing, the news arrived that the Illyrians had actually betrayed Perdiccas and had joined Arabaeus, and the fear inspired by their warlike character made both parties now think it best to retreat. However, owing to the dispute, nothing had been settled as to when they should start, and night coming on, the Macedonians and the barbarian crowd took fright in a moment in one of those mysterious panics to which great armies are liable, and persuaded that an army many times more numerous than that which had really arrived was advancing in all but upon them, suddenly broke and fled in the direction of home, and thus compelled Perdiccas, who at first did not perceive what had occurred, to depart without seeing Brasidas, the two armies being encamped at a considerable distance from each other. At daybreak, Brasidas, perceiving that the Macedonians had gone on, and that the Illyrians and Arabaeus were on the point of attacking him, formed his heavy infantry into a square, with the light troops in the center, and himself also prepared to retreat. Posting his youngest soldiers to dash out wherever the enemy should attack them, he himself with three hundred picked men in the rear intended to face about during the retreat and beat off the most forward of their assailants. Meanwhile, before the enemy approached, he sought to sustain the courage of his soldiers with the following hasty exhortation. Peloponnesians, if I did not suspect you of being dismayed at being left alone to sustain the attack of a numerous and barbarian enemy, I should just have said a few words to you as usual without further explanation. 
As it is, in the face of the desertion of our friends and the numbers of the enemy, I have some advice and information to offer, which, brief as they must be, will, I hope, suffice for the more important points. The bravery that you habitually display in war does not depend on your having allies at your side in this or that encounter, but on your native courage, nor have numbers any terrors for citizens of states like yours, in which the many do not rule the few, but rather the few the many, owing their position to nothing else than to superiority in the field. Inexperience now makes you afraid of barbarians, and yet the trial of strength which you had with the Macedonians among them, and my own judgment, confirmed by what I hear from others, should be enough to satisfy you that they will not prove formidable. Where an enemy seems strong, but is really weak, a true knowledge of the facts makes his adversary the bolder, just as a serious antagonist is encountered most confidently by those who do not know him. Thus the present enemy might terrify an inexperienced imagination. They are formidable in outward bulk, their loud yelling is unbearable, and the brandishing of their weapons in the air has a threatening appearance. But when it comes to real fighting with an opponent who stands his ground, they are not what they have seemed. They have no regular order that they should be ashamed of deserting their positions when hard-pressed. Flight and attack are with them equally honorable, and afford no test of courage. Their independent mode of fighting never leaving anyone who wants to run away without a fair excuse for so doing. In short, they think frightening you at a secure distance a surer game than meeting you hand to hand. Otherwise they would have done the one and not the other. You can thus plainly see that the terrors with which they were at first invested are in fact trifling enough, though to the eye and ear very prominent. Stand your ground, therefore, when they advance, and again wait your opportunity to retire in good order, and you will reach a place of safety all the sooner, and will know forever afterwards that rabble such as these, to those who sustain their first attack, do but show off their courage by threats of the terrible things that they are going to do at a distance, but with those who give way to them are quick enough to display their heroism in pursuit when they can do so without danger. With this brief address, Brasidas began to lead off his army. Seeing this, the barbarians came on with much shouting and hubbub, thinking that he was flying and that they would overtake him and cut him off. But wherever they charged, they found the young men ready to dash out against them, while Brasidas, with his picked company, sustained their onset. Thus the Peloponnesians withstood the first attack to the surprise of the enemy, and afterwards received and repulsed them as fast as they came on, retiring as soon as their opponents became quiet. The main body of the barbarians ceased therefore to molest the Hellenes, with Brasidas in the open country, and leaving behind a certain number to harass their march, the rest went on after the flying Macedonians, slaying those with whom they came up, and so arrived in time to occupy the narrow pass between two hills that leads into the country of Arabes. They knew that this was the only way by which Brasidas could retreat, and now proceeded to surround him just as he entered the most impracticable part of the road, in order to cut him off. Brasidas, perceiving their intention, told his three hundred to run on without order, each as quickly as he could to the hill which seemed easiest to take, and to try to dislodge the barbarians already there before they should be joined by the main body closing round him. These attacked and overpowered the party upon the hill, and the main army of the Hellenes now advanced with less difficulty toward it. The barbarians, being terrified at seeing their men on that side, driven from the height and no longer following the main body, who they considered had gained the frontier and made good their escape. The heights once gained, Brasidas now proceeded more securely, and the same day arrived in Arnissa, the first town in the dominions of Perdiccas. The soldiers, enraged at the desertion of the Macedonians, vented their rage on all their yokes of oxen which they found on the road, and on any baggage which had tumbled off, as might easily happen in the panic of a night retreat, by unyoking and cutting down the cattle, and taking the baggage for themselves. From this moment Perdiccas began to regard Brasidas as an enemy, and to feel against the Peloponnesians a hatred which could not be congenial to the adversary of the Athenians. However, he departed from his natural interests, and made it his endeavor to come to terms with the latter, and to get rid of the former. On his return from Macedonia to Tyrone, Brasidas found the Athenians already masters of Mende, and remained quiet where he was, thinking it now out of his power to cross over into Pallene and assist the Mendaeans. But he kept good watch over Tyrone, for about the same time as the campaign in Lyncus, the Athenians sailed upon the expedition which we left them preparing against Mende and Scione, with fifty ships, ten of which were Chians, one thousand Athenian heavy infantry, and six hundred archers, one hundred Thracian mercenaries, and some targeteers drawn from their allies in the neighborhood, under the command of Nicias, son of Nicaratus, and Nicostratus, son of D. Trephes. 
Wang from Panadea, the fleet came to land opposite the temple at Poseidon, and proceeded against Mende, the men of which town reinforced by three hundred Scionians, with their Peloponnesian auxiliaries, seven hundred heavy infantry in all, under Polydamidas. They found encamped upon a strong hill outside the city. These Nicias, with one hundred and twenty light-armed Methonians, sixty picked men from the Athenian heavy infantry, and all the archers, tried to reach by a path running up the hill, but received a wound, and found himself unable to force the position, while Nicostratus, with all the rest of the army, advancing upon the hill, which was naturally difficult, by a different approach further off, was thrown into utter disorder, and the whole Athenian army narrowly escaped being defeated. For that day, as the Mendaeans and their allies showed no signs of yielding, the Athenians retreated and encamped, and the Mendaeans at nightfall returned into the town. The next day the Athenians sailed round to the Scioni side, and took the suburb, and all day plundered the country, without any one coming out against them, partly because of intestine disturbances in the town, and the following night the three hundred Scionians returned home. On the morrow Nicias advanced with half the army to the frontier of Scioni, and laid waste the country, while Nicostratus with the remainder sat down before the town near the upper gate on the road to Potidaea. The arms of the Mendaeans and of their Peloponnesian auxiliaries within that wall happened to be piled in that quarter, where Polydamidas accordingly began to draw them up for battle, encouraging the Mendaeans to make a sortie. At this moment, one of the popular party answered him factiously that they would not go out and did not want a war, and for thus answering was dragged by the arm and knocked about by Polydamidas. Hereupon the infuriated commons at once seized their arms and rushed at the Peloponnesians and at their allies of the opposite faction. The troops thus assaulted were at once routed, partly from the suddenness of the conflict, and partly through fear of the gates being opened to the Athenians, with whom they imagined that the attack had been concerted. As many as were not killed on the spot took refuge in the citadel, which they had held from the first, and the whole Athenian army, Nicias having by this time returned and being close to the city, now burst into Mende, which had opened its gates without any convention, and sacked it just as if they had taken it by storm, the generals even finding some difficulty in restraining them from also massacring the inhabitants. After this the Athenians told the Mendaeans that they might retain their civil rights, and themselves judged their supposed authors of the revolt, and cut off the party in the citadel by a wall built down to the sea on either side, appointing troops to maintain the blockade. Having thus secured Mende, they proceeded against Scione. The Scionians and Pel Peloponnesians marched out against them, occupying a strong hill in front of the town, which had to be captured by the enemy before they could invest the place. The Athenians stormed the hill, defeated and dislodged its occupants, and having encamped and set up a trophy, prepared for the work of circumvallation. Not long after they had begun their operations, the auxiliaries besieged in the citadel of Mende forced the guard by the seaside, and arrived by night at Scione, into which most of them succeeded in entering, passing through the besieging army. While the investment of Scione was in progress, Perdiccas sent a herald to the Athenian generals, and made peace with the Athenians, through spite against Brasidas for the retreat from Lyncus, from which moment indeed he had begun to negotiate. The Lacedaemonian Iskagoras was just then upon the point of starting with an army overland to join Brasidas, and Perdiccas, being now required by Nicias to give some proof of the sincerity of his reconciliation to the Athenians, and being himself no longer disposed to let the Peloponnesians into his country, put in motion his friends in Thessaly, with whose chief men he always took care to have relations, and so effectually stopped the army and its preparations, that they did not even try the Thessalians. Iscagoras himself, however, with Amianius and Aristeus, succeeded in reaching Brasidas. They had been commissioned by the Lacedaemonians to inspect the state of affairs, and brought out from Sparta, in violation of all precedent, some of their young men to put in command of the towns, to guard against their being entrusted to the persons upon the spot. Brasidas accordingly placed Clearidas, son of Cleonymus, in Amphipolis, and Pasitalidas, son of Hegesander, in Torone. The same summer the Thebans dismantled the wall of the Thespians on the charge of Atticism. Having always wished to do so, and now finding it an easy matter as the flower of the Thespian youth had perished in the battle with the Athenians. The same summer also the temple of Hera at Argos was burnt down, through Chrysus, the priestess, placing a lighted torch near the garlands and then falling asleep, so that they all caught fire and were in a blaze before she observed it. Chrysus that very night fled to Phleas for fear of the Argives, who agreeably to the law in such a case appointed another priestess named Phineas. 
crisis at the time of her flight had been priestess for eight years of the present war and half the ninth. At the close of the summer the investment of Scione was completed, and the Athenians, leaving a detachment to maintain the blockade, returned with the rest of their army. During the winter following, the Athenians and Lacedaemonians were kept quiet by the armistice, but the Mantineans and Tegeans and their respective allies fought a battle at Laodicum in the Orested. The victory remained doubtful, as each side routed one of the wings opposed to them, and both set up trophies and sent spoils to Delphi. After heavy loss on both sides, the battle was undecided, and night interrupted the action. Yet the Tegeans passed the night on the field and set up a trophy at once, while the Mantineans withdrew to Bucolion and set up theirs afterwards. At the close of the same winter, in fact almost in spring, Brasidas made an attempt upon Potidaea. He arrived by night, and succeeded in planting a ladder against the wall without being discovered, the ladder being planted just in the interval between the passing round of the bell and the return of the man who brought it back. Upon the garrison, however, taking the alarm immediately afterwards before his men came up, he quickly let off his troops without waiting until it was day. So entered the winter, and the ninth year of this war, of which Thucydides is the historian. End of Book 4, Chapter 14「the death of Cleon and Brasidas, and the peace of Nicias. The next summer the truce for a year ended, after lasting until the Pythian games. During the armistice the Athenians expelled the Delians from Delos, concluding that they must have been polluted by some old offense at the time of their consecration, and that this had been the omission in the previous purification of the island, which, as I have related, had been thought to have been duly accomplished by the removal of the graves of the dead. The Dalians had Atramitium in Asia given them by Pharnaces, and settled there as they removed from Delos. Meanwhile, Cleon prevailed on the Athenians to let him sail at the expiration of the armistice for the towns in the direction of Thrace with twelve hundred heavy infantry and three hundred horse from Athens, a large force of allies, and thirty ships. First touching at the still besieged Sion, and taking some heavy infantry from the army there, he next sailed into Kophos, a harbor in the territory of Tyrone, which is not far from the town. From thence, having learnt from deserters that Brasidas was not in Tyrone, and that its garrison was not strong enough to give him battle, he advanced with his army against the town, sending ten ships to sail round into the harbour. He first came to the fortification lately thrown up in front of the town by Brasidas, in order to take in the suburb, to do which he had pulled down part of the original wall and made it all one city. To this point, Pasitalidas, the Lacedaemonian commander, with such garrison as there was in the place, hurried to repel the Athenian assault. But finding himself hard-pressed, and seeing the ships that had been sent round sailing into the harbour, Pasitalidas began to be afraid that they might get up to the city before its defenders were there, and, the fortification being also carried, he might be taken prisoner, and so abandoned the outwork and ran into the town. But the Athenians from the ship had already taken Tyrone, and their land forces following at the heels burst in with him with a rush over the part of the old wall that had been pulled down, killing some of the Peloponnesians and Toronaeans in the melee, and making prisoners of the rest, and Pasitalidas their commander amongst them. Brasidas, meanwhile, had advanced to relieve Tyrone, 
and had only about four miles more to go when he heard of its fall on the road and turned back again. Cleon and the Athenians set up two trophies, one by the harbor, the other by the fortification, and, making slaves of the wives and children of the Toronaeans, sent the men with the Peloponnesians and any Chalcidians that were there to the number of seven hundred to Athens. Whence, however, they all came home afterwards, the Peloponnesians on the conclusion of peace, and the rest by being exchanged against other prisoners with the Olynthians. About the same time Panactum, a fortress on the Athenian border, was taken by treachery by the Boeotians. Meanwhile, Cleon, after placing a garrison in Tyron, weighed anchor and sailed around Athos on his way to Amphipolis. About the same time, Phaeax, son of Erisistratus, set sail with two colleagues as ambassador from Athens to Italy and Sicily. The Leontines, upon the departure of the Athenians from Sicily after the pacification, had placed a number of new citizens upon the roll, and the commons had a design for redividing the land. But the upper classes, aware of their intention, called in the Syracusans and expelled the commons. These last were scattered in various directions, but the upper classes came to an agreement with the Syracusans, abandoned and laid waste their city, and went and lived at Syracuse, where they were made citizens. Afterwards, some of them were dissatisfied, and leaving Syracuse occupied Phocei, a quarter of the town of Leontini, and Brasinii, a strong place in the Leontine country, and being there joined by most of the exiled commons carried on war from the fortifications. The Athenians, hearing this, sent Phaeax to see if they could not by some means so convince their allies there and the rest of the Sicilians of the ambitious designs of Syracuse as to induce them to form a general coalition against her, and thus save the commons of Leontini. Arrived in Sicily, Phaeax succeeded at Camarina and Agrigentum, but meeting with a repulse at Gala, did not go on to the rest, as he saw that he should not succeed with them, but returned through the country of the Sicels to Catana, and after visiting Brasinii as he passed, and encouraging its inhabitants, sailed back to Athens. During his voyage along the coast to and from Sicily, he treated with some cities in Italy on the subject of friendship with Athens, and also fell in with some Locrian settlers exiled from Messina, who had been sent thither when the Locrians were called in by one of the factions that divided Messina after the pacification of Sicily, and Messina came for a time into the hands of the Locrians. These being met by Phaeax on their return home received no injury at his hands, as the Locrians had agreed with him for a treaty with Athens. They were the only people of the allies who, when the reconciliation between the Sicilians took place, had not made peace with her, nor indeed would they have done so now, if they had not been pressed by a war with the Hipponians and Medmaeans who lived on their border and were colonists of theirs. Phaeax, meanwhile, proceeded on his voyage, and at length arrived at Athens. Cleon, whom we left on his voyage from Tyrone to Amphipolis, made Aeon his base, and after an unsuccessful assault upon the Andrian colony of Stagyrus, took Galepsis, a colony of Thasos by storm. He now sent envoys to Perdiccas to command his attendance with an army, as provided by the alliance, and others to Thrace, to Polis, king of the Ottomantians, who was to bring as many Thracian mercenaries as possible, and himself remained inactive in Aeon, awaiting their arrival. Informed of this, Brasidas on his part took up a position of observation upon Cordilium 
a place situated in the Argilian country on the high ground across the river, not far from Amphipolis, and commanding a view on all sides, and thus made it impossible for Cleon's army to move without his seeing it. For he fully expected that Cleon, despising the scanty numbers of his opponent, would march against Amphipolis with the force that he had got with him. At the same time Brasidas made his preparations, calling to his standard fifteen hundred Thracian mercenaries and all the Adonians, horse and targeteers. He also had a thousand Mercinian and Chalcidian targeteers, besides those in Amphipolis, and a force of heavy infantry numbering altogether about two thousand and three hundred Hellenic horse. Fifteen hundred of these he had with him upon Cerdylium. The rest were stationed with Clearidas in Amphipolis. After remaining quiet for some time, Cleon was at length obliged to do as Brasidas expected. His soldiers, tired of their inactivity, began also seriously to reflect on the weakness and incompetence of their commander, and the skill and valor that would be opposed to him, and on their own original unwillingness to accompany him. These murmurs coming to the ears of Cleon, he resolved not to disgust his army by keeping it in the same place, and broke up his camp and advanced. The temper of the general was what it had been at Pylos, his success on that occasion having given him confidence in his capacity. He never dreamed of any one coming out to fight him, but said that he was rather going up to view the place and if he waited for his reinforcements, it was not in order to make victory secure in case he should be compelled to engage, but to be enabled to surround and storm the city. He accordingly came and posted his army upon a strong hill in front of Amphipolis, and proceeded to examine the lake formed by the Strymon, and how the town lay on the side of Thrace. He thought to retire at pleasure without fighting, as there was no one to be seen upon the wall or coming out of the gates, all of which were shut. Indeed, it seemed a mistake not to have brought down engines with him. He could then have taken the town, there being no one to defend it. As soon as Brasidas saw the Athenians in motion, he descended himself from Cerdylium and entered Amphipolis. He did not venture to go out in regular order against the Athenians, he mistrusted his strength, and thought it inadequate to the attempt. Not in numbers, these were not so unequal, but in quality, the flower of the Athenian army being in the field with the best of the Lemnians and Imbrians. He therefore prepared to assail them by stratagem, by showing the enemy the number of his troops and the shifts which he had been put to to arm them, he thought that he should have less chance of beating him than by not letting him have a sight of them, and thus learn how good a right he had to despise them. He accordingly picked out a hundred and fifty heavy infantry, and, putting the rest under Clearidas, determined to attack suddenly before the Athenians retired. Thinking that he should not have again such a chance of catching them alone, if their reinforcements were once allowed to come up, and so calling all his soldiers together in order to encourage them and explain his intention, spoke as follows. Peloponnesians, the character of the country from which we have come, one which has always owed its freedom to valor, and the fact that you are Dorians and the enemy you are about to fight Ionians, whom you are accustomed to beat, are things that do not need further comment. But the plan of attack that I propose to pursue, this it is as well to explain, in order that the fact of our adventuring with a part instead of with the whole of our forces may not damp your courage by the apparent disadvantage at which it places you. I imagine it is the poor opinion that he has of us, and the fact that he has no idea of any one coming out to engage him, that has made the enemy march up to the place and carelessly look about him as he is doing without noticing us. But the most successful soldier will always be the man who most happily detects a blunder like this, 
and who carefully consulting his own means makes his attack not so much by open and regular approaches as by seizing the opportunity of the moment, and these stratagems which do the greatest service to our friends by completely deceiving our enemies have the most brilliant name in war. Therefore, while their careless confidence continues, and they are still thinking, as in my judgment they are now doing, more of retreat than of maintaining their position, while their spirit is slack and not high-strung with expectation, I with the men under my command will, if possible, take them by surprise and fall with a run upon their center. And do you, Chloridas, afterwards, when you see me already upon them, and, as is likely, dealing terror among them, take with you the Amphipolitans and the rest of the allies, and suddenly open the gates and dash at them, and hasten to engage as quickly as you can. That is our best chance of establishing a panic among them, as a fresh assailant has always more terrors for an enemy than the one he is immediately engaged with. Show yourself a brave man as a Spartan should, and do you allies follow him like men, and remember that zeal, honor, and obedience mark the good soldier, and that this day will make you either free men and allies of Lacedaemon, or slaves of Athens. Even if you escape without personal loss of liberty or life, your bondage will be on harsher terms than before." and you will also hinder the liberation of the rest of the Hellenes. No cowardice then on your part, seeing the greatness of the issues at stake, and I will show that what I preach to others I can practice myself. After this brief speech, Brasidas himself prepared for the sally, and placed the rest with Chloridas at the Thracian gates to support him as had been agreed. Meanwhile, he had been seen coming down from Cardilium, and then in the city, which is overlooked from the outside, sacrificing near the temple of Athena. In short, all his movements had been observed, and word was brought to Cleon, who had at the moment gone on to look about him, that the whole of the enemy's force could be seen in the town, and that the feet of horses and men in great numbers were visible under the gates, as if a sally were intended. Upon hearing this, he went up to look, and having done so, being unwilling to venture upon the decisive step of a battle before his reinforcements came up, and fancying that he would have time to retire, bid the retreat be sounded and sent orders to the men to effect it by moving on the left wing in the direction of Aeon, which was indeed the only way practicable. This, however, not being quick enough for him, he joined the retreat in person and made the right wing wheel round, thus turning its unarmed side to the enemy. It was then that Brasidas, seeing the Athenian force in motion and his opportunity come, said to the men with him and the rest, Those fellows will never stand before us. One can see that by the way their spears and heads are going. Troops which do as they do seldom stand a charge. Quick, someone, and open the gates I spoke of, and let us be out and at them with no fears for the result. Accordingly, issuing out by the palisade gate and by the first in the long wall then existing, he ran at the top of his speed along the straight road, where the trophy now stands as you go by the steepest part of the hill, and fell upon and routed the center of the Athenians, panic-stricken by their own disorder and astounded at his audacity. At the same moment, Clearidas, in execution of his orders, issued out from the Thracian gates to support him, and also attacked the enemy. The result was that the Athenians, suddenly and unexpectedly attacked on both sides, fell into confusion, and their left towards Aeon, which had already got on some distance, at once broke and fled. Just as it was in full retreat and Brasidas was passing on to attack the right, he received a wound, but his fall was not perceived by the Athenians, and he was taken up by those near him and carried off the field. 
The Athenian right made a better stand, and though Cleon, who from the first had no thought of fighting, at once fled and was overtaken and slain by a Mercinian targeteer, his infantry forming in close order upon the hill twice or thrice repulsed the attacks of Chloridas, and did not finally give way until they were surrounded and routed by the missiles of the Mercinian and Chalcidian horse and the targeteers. Thus the Athenian army was all now in flight, and such as escaped being killed in the battle or by the Chalcidian horse and the targeteers dispersed among the hills, and with difficulty made their way to Aeon. The men who had taken up and rescued Brasidas brought him into the town with the breath still in him. He lived to hear of the victory of his troops, and not long after expired. The rest of the army returning with Clearidas from the pursuit stripped the dead and set up a trophy. After this, all the allies attended in arms and buried Brasidas at the public expense in the city, in front of what is now the marketplace, and the Amphipolitans, having enclosed his tomb, ever afterwards sacrificed to him as a hero and have given to him the honor of games and annual offerings. They constituted him the founder of their colony, and pulled down the hagnonic erections, and obliterated everything that could be interpreted as a memorial of his having founded the place. For they considered that Brasidas had been their preserver, and courting as they did the alliance of Lacedaemon for fear of Athens, in their present hostile relations with the latter, they could no longer with the same advantage or satisfaction pay Hagnon his honors. They also gave the Athenians back their dead. About six hundred of the latter had fallen, and only seven of the enemy— owing to there having been no regular engagement but the affair of accident and panic that I have described. After taking up their dead, the Athenians sailed off home, while Clearidas and his troops remained to arrange matters at Amphipolis. About the same time three Lacedaemonians, Ramphias, Autocaridas, and Epicididas, led a reinforcement of nine hundred heavy infantry to the towns in the direction of Thrace, and, arriving at Heraclea in Thracis, reformed matters there as seemed good to them. While they delayed there, this battle took place, and so the summer ended. With the beginning of the winter following, Ramphius and his companions penetrated as far as Pierium in Thessaly but as the Thessalians opposed their further advance, and Brasidas, whom they came to reinforce, was dead, they turned back home, thinking that the moment had gone by, the Athenians being defeated and gone, and themselves not equal to the execution of Brasidas's designs. The main cause, however, of their return was because they knew that when they set out, Lacedaemonian opinion was really in favor of peace. Indeed, it so happened that directly after the battle of Amphipolis and the retreat of Ramphius from Thessaly, both sides ceased to prosecute the war and turned their attention to peace. Athens had suffered severely at Delium, and again shortly afterwards at Amphipolis, and had no longer that confidence in her strength which had made her before refuse to treat, in the belief of ultimate victory which her success at the moment had inspired. Besides, she was afraid of her allies being tempted by her reverses to rebel more generally, and repented having let go the splendid opportunity for the peace which the affair of Pylos had offered. Lacedaemon, on the other hand, found the event of the war to falsify her notion that a few years would suffice for the overthrow of the power of the Athenians by the devastation of their land. She had suffered on the island a disaster hitherto unknown at Sparta. She saw her country plundered from Pylos and Kythera, the helots were deserting, and she was in constant apprehension that those who remained in Peloponnese would rely upon those outside and take advantage of the situation to renew their old attempts at revolution. Besides this, as chance would have it, 
her thirty years' truce with the Argives was upon the point of expiring, and they refused to renew it unless Kynuria were restored to them, so that it seemed impossible to fight Argos and Athens at once. She also suspected some of the cities in Peloponnese of intending to go over to the enemy, and that was indeed the case. These considerations made both sides disposed for an accommodation, the Lacedaemonians being probably the most eager, as they ardently desired to recover the men taken upon the island, the Spartans among whom belonged to the first families and were accordingly related to the governing body in Lacedaemon. Negotiations had begun directly after their capture, but the Athenians, in their hour of triumph, would not consent to any reasonable terms, though after their defeat at Delium, Lacedaemon, knowing that they would be now more inclined to listen, at once concluded the armistice for a year, during which they were to confer together and see if a longer period could not be agreed upon. Now, however, after the Athenian defeat at Amphipolis and the death of Cleon and Brasidas, who had been the two principal opponents of peace on either side, the latter from the success and honor which war gave him, the former because he thought that, if tranquillity were restored, his crimes would be more open to detection and his slanders less credited. The foremost candidates for power in either city, Pleistoanax, son of Pausanias, king of Lacedaemon, and Nicias, son of Niceratus, the most fortunate general of his time, each desired peace more ardently than ever. Nicias, while still happy and honored, wished to secure his good fortune to obtain a present release from trouble for himself and his countrymen, and hand down to posterity a name as an ever-successful statesman, and thought the way to do this was to keep out of danger and commit himself as little as possible to fortune, and that peace alone made this keeping out of danger possible. Pleistoanax, again, was assailed by his enemies for his restoration, and regularly held up by them to the prejudice of his countrymen, upon every reverse that befell them, as though his unjust restoration were the cause, the accusation being that he and his brother Aristocles had bribed the prophetess of Delphi to tell the Lacedaemonian deputations which successively arrived at the temple to bring home the seed of the demigod son of Zeus from abroad, else they would have to plow with a silver share. In this way, it was insisted, in time he had induced the Lacedaemonians in the nineteenth year of his exile to Lyceum, whither he had gone when banished on suspicion of having been bribed to retreat from Attica, and had built half his house within the consecrated precinct of Zeus for fear of the Lacedaemonians to restore him with the same dances and sacrifices with which they had instituted their kings upon the first settlement of Lacedaemon. The smart of this accusation, and the reflection that in peace no disaster could occur, and that when Lacedaemon had recovered her men there would be nothing for his enemies to take hold of, whereas, while war lasted, the highest station must always bear the scandal of everything that went wrong made him ardently desire a settlement. Accordingly, this winter was employed in conferences, and as spring rapidly approached, the Lacedaemonians sent round orders to the cities to prepare for a fortified occupation of Attica, and held this as a sword over the heads of the Athenians to induce them to listen to their overtures, and at last... After many claims had been urged on either side at the conferences, a peace was agreed on upon the following basis. Each party was to restore its conquests, but Athens was to keep Nicaea, her demand for Plataea being met by the Thebans, asserting that they had acquired the place not by force or treachery, but by the voluntary adhesion upon agreement of its citizens and the same, according to the Athenian account, being the history of her acquisition of Nicaea. This arranged, the Lacedaemonians summoned their allies, and all voting for peace except the Boeotians, 
Corinthians, Eleans, and Megarians, who did not approve of these proceedings. They concluded the treaty and made peace, each of the contracting parties swearing to the following articles. The Athenians and Lacedaemonians and their allies made a treaty and swore to it, city by city, as follows. 1. Touching the national temples, there shall be a free passage by land and by sea to all who wish it, to sacrifice, travel, consult, and attend the oracle or games, according to the customs of their countries. 2. The temple and shrine of Apollo at Delphi, and the Delphians, shall be governed by their own laws, taxed by their own state, and judged by their own judges, the land and the people, according to the custom of their country. 3. The treaty shall be binding for fifty years upon the Athenians and the allies of the Athenians, and upon the Lacedaemonians and the allies of the Lacedaemonians, without fraud or hurt by land or by sea. 4. It shall not be lawful to take up arms with intent to do hurt either for the Lacedaemonians and their allies against the Athenians and their allies, or for the Athenians and their allies against the Lacedaemonians and their allies, in any way or means whatsoever. But should any difference arise between them, they are to have recourse to law and oaths, according as may be agreed between the parties. 5. The Lacedaemonians and their allies shall give back Amphipolis to the Athenians. Nevertheless, in the case of cities given up by the Lacedaemonians to the Athenians, the inhabitants shall be allowed to go where they please and to take their property with them, and the cities shall be independent, paying only the tribute of Aristides, and it shall not be lawful for the Athenians or their allies to carry on in war against them after the treaty has been concluded, so long as the tribute is paid. The cities referred to are Argylus, Stagyrus, Acanthus, Scolus, Olynthus, and Spartolus. These cities shall be neutral, allies neither of the Lacedaemonians nor of the Athenians. But if the cities consent, it shall be lawful for the Athenians to make them their allies, provided always that the cities wish it. The May Cybernaeans, Sinaeans, and Singaeans shall inhabit their own cities, as also the Olynthians and the Acanthians. But the Lacedaemonians and their allies shall give back Panactum to the Athenians. 6. The Athenians shall give back Coraphasium, Kythera, Methana. Lacedaemonians that are in the prison at Athens or elsewhere in the Athenian dominions, and shall let go the Peloponnesians besieged in Sion, and all others in Sion that are allies of the Lacedaemonians, and all whom Brasidas sent in there, and any others of the allies of the Lacedaemonians that may be in prison at Athens or elsewhere in the Athenian dominions. 7. The Lacedaemonians and their allies shall in like manner give back any of the Athenians or their allies that they may have in their hands. 8. In the case of Sion, Tyrone, and Sermilium, and any other cities that the Athenians may have, the Athenians may adopt such measures as they please. 9. The Athenians shall take an oath to the Lacedaemonians and their allies city by city. Every man shall swear by the most binding oath of his country, seventeen from each city. The oath shall be as follows. I will abide by this agreement and treaty honestly and without deceit. In the same way, an oath shall be taken by the Lacedaemonians and their allies to the Athenians, and the oath shall be renewed annually by both parties. Pillars shall be erected at Olympia, Pythia, the Isthmus, and Athens in the Acropolis, and at Lacedaemon in the temple at Amaclae. 10. If anything be forgotten, whatever it be, and on whatever point, it shall be consistent with their oath for both parties, the Athenians and Lacedaemonians, to alter it according to their discretion. The treaty begins from the Ephralty of Pleistolus and Lacedaemon, 
on the twenty-seventh day of the month of Artemisium, and from the archon ship of Alcaeus at Athens on the twenty-fifth day of the month of Elephabolion. Those who took the oath and poured the libations for the Lacedaemonians were Pleistoanix, Aegis, Pleistolus, Damagetus, Chionis, Patagenes, Acanthus, Dithus, Iscagoras, Philocoridus, Suxidus, Antipas, Telus, Alcinatus, Ampedius, Menos, and Lophilus. For the Athenians, Lampon, Istmonicus, Nicias, Lachis, Euthydemus, Procles, Pythodorus, Hagnon, Myrtilus, Thrasicles, Theogenes, Aristocrates, Eosius, Timocrates, Leon, Lamachus, and Demosthenes. This treaty was made in the spring, just at the end of winter, directly after the city festival of Dionysus, just ten years, with the difference of a few days, from the first invasion of Attica and the commencement of this war. This must be calculated by the seasons rather than by trusting to the enumeration of the names of the several magistrates or offices of honor that are used to mark past events. Accuracy is impossible where an event may have occurred in the beginning or middle or at any period in their tenure of office. But by computing by summers and winters, the method adopted in this history, it will be found that, each of these amounting to half a year, there were ten summers and as many winters contained in this first war. Meanwhile, the Lacedaemonians, to whose lot it fell to begin the work of restitution, immediately set free all the prisoners of war in their possession, and sent Ascagoras, Menas, and Philocoridus as envoys to the towns in the direction of Thrace, to order Clearidas to hand over Amphipolis to the Athenians, and the rest of their allies each to accept the treaty as it affected them. They, however, did not like its terms and refused to accept it. Clearidas also, willing to oblige the Chalcidians, would not hand over the town, averring his inability to do so against their will. Meanwhile he hastened in person to Lacedaemon with envoys from the place to defend his disobedience against the possible accusations of his Cagoras and his companions, and also to see whether it was too late for the agreement to be altered. And on finding the Lacedaemonians were bound, quickly set out back again with instructions from them to hand over the place, if possible, or at all events to bring out the Peloponnesians that were in it. The allies happened to be present in person at Lacedaemon, and those who had not accepted the treaty were now asked by the Lacedaemonians to adopt it. This, however, they refused to do for the same reasons as before, unless a fairer one than the present were agreed upon, and remaining firm in their determination were dismissed by the Lacedaemonians, who now decided on forming an alliance with the Athenians, thinking that Argos, who had refused the application of Ampelidus and Lycus for a renewal of the treaty, would without Athens be no longer formidable, and that the rest of the Peloponnese would be most likely to keep quiet, if the coveted alliance of Athens were shut against them. Accordingly, after conference with the Athenian ambassadors, an alliance was agreed upon and oaths were exchanged upon the terms following. 1. The Lacedaemonians shall be allies of the Athenians for fifty years. 2. Should any enemy invade the territory of Lacedaemon and injure the Lacedaemonians, the Athenians shall help in such way as they most effectively can, according to their power. But if the invader be gone after plundering the country, that city shall be the enemy of Lacedaemon and Athens, and shall be chastised by both, and one shall not make peace without the other, this to be honestly, loyally, and without fraud. 3. Should any enemy invade the territory of Athens and injure the Athenians, the Lacedaemonians shall help them in such way as they most effectively can, according to their power. 
But if the invader be gone after plundering the country, that city shall be the enemy of Lacedaemon and Athens, and shall be chastised by both, and one shall not make peace without the other. This to be honestly, loyally, and without fraud. 4. Should the slave population rise, the Athenians shall help the Lacedaemonians with all their might, according to their power. 5. This treaty shall be sworn to by the same persons on either side that swore to the other. It shall be renewed annually by the Lacedaemonians going to Athens for the Dionysia, and the Athenians to Lacedaemon for the Hyacinthia. And a pillar shall be set up by either party, at Lacedaemon near the statue of Apollo at Amyclae, and at Athens on the Acropolis near the statue of Athena. Should the Lacedaemonians and Athenians see to add to or take away from the alliance in any particular, it shall be consistent with their oaths for both parties to do so, according to their discretion. Those who took the oath for the Lacedaemonians were Pleistoanax, Aegis, Pleistolus, Damagetus, Chionis, Metagenes, Acanthus, Dithus, Iscagoras, Philocoridus, Soixidus, Antipas, Alcinatus, Talus, Empedius, Manus, and Lephilus. For the Athenians, Lampon, Istmonicus, Lachis, Nicias, Euthydemus, Procles, Pythodorus, Hagnon, Myrtilus, Thrasicles, Theogenes, Aristocrates, Eosius, Timocrates, Leon, Lamachus, and Demosthenes. This alliance was made not long after the treaty, and the Athenians gave back the men from the island to the Lacedaemonians, and the summer of the eleventh year began. This completes the history of the first war, which occupied the whole of the ten years previously. Here ends Book 5, Chapter 15.